just begins to melt slowly <laughs> before your eyes. Well, that, see, whatever, because if I get a, especially if I get a thumbnail done, like, a week ahead of time, and I set everything with all the description titles and everything, so all I have to do is hit go live once we're in a call, I'm like, nah. Something's gonna happen, lightning, or... Like, well, I mean, that happened to me time. yesterday. I just wanted to play Call of Duty and stream, and then my internet just sporadically started cutting out. And then I later found out there was a sh outage in my area that day. So that was that was fantastic. I was actually having a walk the other night, uh, and it was it was one of the very hot nights, and uh, there was it was three hits of lightning with no sound, very near, and it was like creepy as hell. <laughs> like, three hits of lightning and no sound. Yeah, I couldn't. There was nothing to listen to. There was no like. It was just, it was just the flash, and there was, there was only one of them that I saw that the actual lightning for, and I was just like, jeez. Um, Watch out for the tripods, man. Like, well, the funny thing was you. that uh, once, the, the, I didn't hear lightning for ages then, but then I heard this huge, like, you know, like the, the sound of, of someone moving a cupboard, but that, but cranked up to like a galactic level just all around me, coming from like the sky, and I was just like, God's moving the oh. cupboard. <laughs> 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 That was, actually sounds pretty terrifying. It, well, that's right, yeah, no, I was thinking to myself, like, man, you could put this in media in some way, it'd be creepy, just because it's such a bizarre sound to have on that scale. You have it be uh, a, a horror movie called The Lightning Man. He's a man who travels by lightning <laughs> or something, and he walks people. <laughs> okay, but how does the cupboard fit into this? I need, like... <laughs> Well, okay, here, Okay, so here's the pitch. So a man was moving his cupboard and then uh, it fell over and crushed him. And now he is Lightning Man. And um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird so, and it doesn't work properly. I was so say, it makes about as much sense down, as the origin of power that fucking Captain Marvel has. <laughs> so it's just, I don't know. Oh, yeah. It's a better origin shot, story than Captain Marvel. It, well, I shot a you thing know, and I, it did stuff. I would argue that it is, again, yeah, I shot an engine and now I have space magic. Just covered in, like, acidic goo and <laughs> turned her into a superhero. <laughs> Rather, being struck by lightning while falling under a cupboard or something. I don't know, I feel like that makes more oh, sense. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and then he's like, <laughs> just, he lives in the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> struck by lightning <laughs> while under a cupboard, yeah. thus lives in the clouds. It's like, don't question it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea that the writer's like, yeah, but if you give them that, the, the work itself is very deep, the character work, everything about it is just so good. It's just that bit, yeah, it's well, a bit weird. Remember, if, if you have if you have a couple of really cool shots and really good special effects, and that's all it takes oh, man, for yeah. it to be, like, a work of art now. Describing every miniseries that exists in the past, like, two, three years. Uh, just... Yeah, I, I have we talked about that like on I feel like we or... haven't um cuz it's not even it feels like it's not even TV shows anymore cuz the funny one with devs that me and Rags are slowly getting through over the next few decades um I was like season 1 so you know it, it, how many seasons are going to be and uh, Jay was like oh it's just the one I was like it's another mini series like there's so many mini series now it's like one season one and done which is not something I'm against by the way Yeah I'm just fine with that It's just strange it's how much they've popped good. up compared to how TV shows and movies were like definitively separate, but mini series seem to be like we want to do a movie, but we want it to be longer. But we also don't want to do like fucking five years of stuff. So mini series. Maybe that's kind of like the magic number we're sort of figuring out. Well, it always depends on what kind of content you've got to give out, right? Like how much you I got to say, like, do. Like a mini series is probably approaching what a video game is as on its own. I guess, you know, like yeah, a video kinda. game isn't as long as like an entire TV show, but it's certainly longer than a film. Well, uh, think about like Harry Potter. That could have been like eight seasons of TV, probably, right? You could just rejig it all. Uh, yeah, you pro probably could yeah. stand to do, yeah, eight seasons of that. Dare I say, it may have benefited from that, actually, because the school year would feel a lot more natural over a season than it does over one movie, right? Well, here's an interesting thing. I mean, we know that they're making a Lord of the Rings show on Amazon. But none of us want that. <laughs> to the dread of everyone. <laughs> like, yeah. oh no. But you think that that would uh, work well as a, uh, a mini series? Well, not a mini series, but, you know, three or four seasons. Well, even longer than that, really. You can um, really balloon that. So you're talking about, like, the Peter Jackson ones now being converted into seasons instead of movies? Uh, I'm talking, like, well, I, I guess the thing is, like, I'm very against making a new one because I think that it's basically, like, the greatest it could have been. Yeah. But I guess if you wanted to adapt the books, you could probably make it into, like, a few seasons of TV. 
I, th yeah, I think so. Um, it could work. I just don't. We don't need to touch them. They're just so good. No, you know? we don't. We, we, they just. Yeah, they nailed it. <laughs> Go do something else. <laughs> as as Red Alert Media point out, it's just like remake stuff that's either okay or sucks. Do that because then we can get yeah. them yeah. better. I'm reading chat now, and I feel like Bart in that episode of The Simpsons when he had the "I didn't do it" catchphrase, and he was on <laughs> Conan O'Brien, and everybody's just like, "Just say the line." <laughs> so the issue is. <laughs> It's been, it's it's exploded <laughs> since you were last on EFAB, so... Yeah, I know, I know it has. I keep hearing about it. It's, it's fun. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to explain. <laughs> like, it's just the way you say no. That's the meme. That's it. I can't help it. <laughs> it's my accent. I don't think they want you to help it. <laughs> they think they like it. Oh, wait. They just got it. I just said it. it this is what I mean. No. It's, it's impossible to not say no. Yeah, someone just say the line. Just say, <laughs> say yes. the line. Yes, then, man. Then you see me just like tucked down in the corner of my room, just rocking back and forth. No. No, they, no, 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 no. They no. only like me for my nose. <laughs> I, I Like I told him, uh, do, you re do you remember your reaction to the finale of Batwoman? Yeah, I do. You, you um, say many a no. I do say many a It was a bit of an overload. My you... brain almost couldn't handle it. Yeah. I almost shut off. So <laughs> much was... Batwoman to come, EFAB chat. Be excited. Be oh, well, all of the things. I mean, it depends, because I'm not sure how excited I am. Because, like, I'm kind of dreading Season 2 legitimately. Oh, no, I meant our coverage of it, which is, you know, fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that would be fun. But Season 2 is going to be painful. Um, Didn't they just watched, lose uh, their lead actress? Yes. They did. So they have to have, is it the Batwoman role? Like, they need a new Batwoman now? <laughs> of all the roles yeah. to lose. <laughs> like, well, that only sounds Batwoman like a herself. disaster. The queen herself. Yeah, they're going to the be rewriting it. it, so a new girl just arrives and becomes Batwoman. I'm, and, and I'm sure they'll Batwoman. do it in one episode, and it's going to be the most jarring and funny thing ever. Oh, good yeah. lord. Batwoman is barely serialized. Like, it, it, it feels like it doesn't take advantage of the fact that it's a TV show at all. Like, things happen so <laughs> no. quickly, and they've got so many episodes that they could do But something. we could still point out that it... Plot... It, it was either about Mouse and Alice, or it was about some random who walks into Gotham that week to be a bad guy. Which, um... They didn't even account for, like other shows did. You remember uh, Smallville did the whole, like, a bunch of... People got different kind of powers from the yeah from the meteor thing yeah and the then freak of the week format yeah 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 um, Buffy was the Hellmouth generates them um, Flash did uh, I remember because I saw the first few episodes of the CW Flash um, what happens with that one it's whatever gave him his powers gave a bunch of other people other powers right well because these metahumans so it would have been that there were a bunch of other metahumans what's um, a metahuman probably... so in the DC continuity metahumans is basically uh the the easiest way to describe it is in marvel there's mutants and then there's human mutate and human mutate just describes anybody who has superpowers who isn't a mutant that's basically what a metahuman is it's just somebody who got powers so like um flash is a metahuman because he's a human being who's got these crazy powers but like wonder woman and superman aren't because they're like not human strictly so ba that's women. basically what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, Batwoman was just like, I don't know, they just showed up. <laughs> it's just these weird yeah, people. Like, you just had Magpie just show up to uh, to steal some things with her um, gonna... exploding... What was it? What'd she have? She, had a, she, had, like, she replaced she had Martha Wade's ink. necklace with an explosive, <laughs> or series of explosives, yeah. Right, the, explo we... the explosives were specifically the ink. It was the ink that was explosive, because remember, she had the little plastic birds, but they were painted in the explosive Right. Ink. And she could that throw them and they'd explode. And... Yeah, they would yeah. explode and annoy people. And then you had the executioner, who was a guy who would, would, would herd people into puddles and then electrocute them. And then electrocute them. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was something else. Uh... Who else? <laughs> who, who, who were the other monsters of the week for that fucking show? We had the Judgman. We had the Judge Man. You talking about um, the Executioner? Guy? Remember the Executioner? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, I mean, we had the girl who nearly killed everybody on the train that got stuck. Right, makeup, yeah, makeup. Oh yeah, villain. I was thinking yeah. of the makeup girl. So that's oh, another yeah, one. Makeup uh, girl. What was the one who uh, cut people's see. faces? Remember, she just—it was in the episode you just published. The one who. Yeah, the makeup. That's what I meant by the makeup girl. She hates makeup or whatever, right? 
I wonder what Gotham was like before there was some masked vigilante with magic plot armor powers to just stop all these <laughs> horrible people. It, well, if you're uh, so maybe I kind of lied there actually. They do um kind of try to address it. They're like the fact that she's around is attracting evilmans to the to Gotham because they think Batman is back. Do you remember her saying that? Yeah, that's how they tried to explain it, but that's <laughs> yeah. dumb. That's like that saying the more sense. police there are, the more people are going to try to go out and commit crimes just to show them, you know? It's a, it's a very weird motivation. It's like, the only one it makes sense with is Hush, because he was he hated yeah. Batman, so he wanted to yeah, find him. Personal, yeah, personal vendetta against that person. Yeah, but like if, if it was me, if I was a super criminal, and I wanted to steal all of the Gotham jewels, or whatever the fuck I wanted... I would wait for the, I would do it specifically at the period between Batman leaving and another Batman character arriving. I would do it in that no, big that's stupid. window of like three that makes years. No sense. Yeah, clearly. Well, yeah, I mean, where's like the your... honor in that? <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be too easy. Like Jewels undefended. Ugh. And the crows are so incompetent and terrible. I mean, it's just not a challenge, really. <laughs> what a wonderful show. Also, welcome to EFAP 92, everybody. That was that was the preamble, I guess. Talking about Batwoman. Talking about Batwoman. <laughs> um, well, it's, welcome to brand new guest, John CJG. Is that what? Wait, do you want to go by that? Or do you want to go by anything else? I don't know. I'm assuming it's John is cool. <laughs> just, just John is fine. Yeah, Sweet, totally. Uh, welcome. How do you do? Thank you very much. I'm doing great. Um, um I just, uh, I want to start by um, apologizing to you guys and your audience for being a no-show the, the first time we tried to um, get this organized. I read the time zone wrong, and it was my bad. I felt like trash when That's I all realized good. the mistake I made. So um, very sorry, and uh, I'm really happy to be here that you decided to have me on in spite of that. So, oh, so thank you. Like, the time zone thing gets really confusing for all of us, because not only do you have it so that all three of the people you're talking to right now live in different time zones, but they also change for summer. So... It starts to get like, right. which hours is everybody actually on? Which is funny because wow. all my European friends, it's really easy because they're within, a, you know, one or two hours of every time. But, you know, Rags and Fringy, whenever I fucking get into a call with them, I'm like, wait, so is it like midnight? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, yeah, it's like quarter past one for me in the, in the afternoon. It feels like, yeah, because everybody's in totally, it's like every corner of the planet. <laughs> There's somebody. <laughs> yep. It's like 3.17 p.m. 9 yeah. p.m. for me. Nice. It's a nice wow. time for me. It's nice and normal-ish. Uh, like, it won't be by the time of the end of this podcast. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, we brought we 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 heard. I think through super chats, uh, someone said that it was mentioned to you in some way, shape, or form, and that you'd be on board. And we were like, oh my god, really? Because it's like you're the guy I've always known as the maker of the machinima that. Funnily enough, I don't know. I don't know if this means anything to anybody in any way, but I watched all of Red vs. Blue, and I thought it was okay. But I watched Army of the Chief, and I loved it. So I I, yeah. Oh, thank sure. you so much. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I don't mind uh, Red vs. Blue either. I've I've actually I've worked with those guys. Uh, I went to their. They had a studio in Texas. That was the guy. I went over there studio, for that? a few days. Yeah, that was one of them. Another one was a, a sketch about piracy that I wrote. They wrote the Gary Busey one. I wrote the one about uh, piracy. And uh, I had a great time working with those guys. They're, they're really funny. I didn't actually... They wrote the Gary Busey sketch, and I didn't get the joke at first. I was just like, is that it? They, they think I'm Gary Busey? Like, I don't look anything like him. Like, I just I didn't see the humor in it. But then in the process of making it, and once I saw it all cut together, I thought it was really funny. So, yeah, they're, they're great uh, improv guys like they, they yeah, make up a lot of stuff on the fly mm-hmm. yeah um so yeah th- this is pretty pretty freeform but i mean you, you're pretty much going to be the object of many many questions to, 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 to i'll try and catch what i can if uh, if some are left in chat for, for different things but i mean it's fun for me because uh I get to be like, I guess be all like, hey, so uh, how did how did it? Uh, you've probably been asked this before, and you've probably answered it on different things. But how did I be the chief get started? Uh, so, um, I have been, I mean, I've been gaming my whole life, pretty much, and uh, I was way. I didn't really get into online gaming until like console broadband started being a thing. Actually, I've. I've my first experience with uh, playing online on consoles was uh, with Dreamcast via dial-up because uh, Sega didn't have the foresight to mm-hmm. launch the Dreamcast with a broadband connection. 
Um, and so Xbox came out and uh, I started an Xbox Live account and Digital Fear was what I came up with in a rush to uh, to just get on and start playing. Well, you, you know? have to commit to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that ends up being my handle for fucking ever. And I, I didn't I didn't think that far ahead, you know, like I just thought whatever stupid name. That'll be my alias, I guess, and that ended up sticking. I mean, it's in the link for like my channel, you know, my my username on YouTube. So that's what people search for when they're looking for me. And uh, so I played uh, Return to Castle Wolfenstein: Tides of War for Xbox. I was way into that, and then Halo, Halo Combat Evolved didn't have Xbox Live, of course. But then Halo Two came out, and I was way into that. And then. Um, a game called Crackdown came out for Xbox 360. I remember that. And that, yeah. And it came with access to the Halo 3 multiplayer beta. So once the beta became active, you would be able to access it through the Crackdown main menu. And uh, so I played, so playing Halo 2, um, I became really immersed in like that culture. Not not just Halo Two, but uh, Castle Wolfenstein before that, where there was a lot of trash talk. Yeah, like broadband uh, console gaming was in its infancy at this point, and and uh, I really dug the whole trash talk thing. Like I didn't really participate in in myself, but I I really enjoyed sure, listening sure. to people lose their shit. It's and, funny. Uh, yeah, it's hilarious. It is, yeah. <laughs> Some of the funniest great. shit I've ever seen. It's just like people losing their shit online because it's it's always fascinated me. Like when you you, you bring people together um, in an online space where everyone's anonymous, nobody's face to face, and um, it's in a hyper competitive environment where people are constantly getting endorphin spikes in their brains. Or depletions in endorphins when they're like losing, right? And they get they're prone to anger, and because mm -hmm. they don't, there's no face to face repercussions for anything that people say, people are much more there's no filter, right? So people will just yeah. say the most obscene shit, and uh, that part of online gaming has always really fascinated me. And uh, I don't want that culture to go away, and I'm kind of worried about what what's that's yeah. turning into like because like, it's, it's kind of getting it's it's almost like it's been neutered a there's lot loads of the, systems that are going to be put in place to prevent yeah. and destroy it right which yes most people would consider that a plus or at least they'd be like ah see but it's nice now well, I, everything's I feel nice like it's people who haven't been playing video games for a long time because i yeah. like, remember playing modern warfare 2 you know like damn 10 years ago basically at this point well i remember I and that's the classic one that everyone remembers is like yeah. modern, modern warfare 2, 2 the modern ultimate Warhammer. xbox live trash, <laughs> trash talking talk. this yeah. is how you developed your thin skin or your thick skin, thick skin. was yeah. you played free-for-alls on fucking modern warfare 2 heard every word and invented words and it's you, a real trial by fire yeah, and you like, just well, got you, you went around, and then you get three messages you like kill yourself, and you're like, wait, <laughs> what? Like, yeah, wait, that doesn't sound like a good idea. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> oh, did you guys remember getting voice messages from like people? You just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah I do. Hey, you little yeah. bitch camping with forty one, you will fucking one v one me on Rust intervention only. Do you, yeah. do you guys? Do you guys ever get the whole like you respond nicely and then they're like, okay, what a team up? <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Yeah. I have accept uh, I'll accept your part. Right. Um, so I was so I'm reading stuff now currently about like online the online gaming sphere being an inherently toxic place that needs to be moderated and policed. And there's talks about using artificial intelligence systems to detect and censor speech. And also uh, or to get rid of voice chat entirely. I've heard that being proposed. And uh, I just, I think that's a step in the wrong direction. Like if, like the, what I said before, the conditions of online gaming where everyone's anonymous and everyone's in a competitive environment, people are going to say hateful stuff. And I just think stepping in and trying to police what everybody is saying is not it's the way to go. Like, I think if anyone's offended, they can just mute their fucking, you know, just mute whoever it is you, you don't want to hear from and it's as easy mm -hmm. as that 
but there's a bunch of people who are just like oh oh i'm so offended by what i'm hearing right now it's like just well, turn remember. off your console or mute people like what's the fucking problem no like i'm not naming dropping her for any other reason than it was it was her that made me aware that this was a problem but like when anita sarkeesian was like there are people online who tell women to go and kill themselves in video games i remember being like what <laughs> no they tell everyone to do that <laughs> do exactly mean? men included no. i mean it's not a gender specific thing right it's it's like the most standard thing that you get it's said to you. A sandwich. Like, go kill yeah. yourself. And, and, you know, it's getting to the point now where it's like, did you just suggest that I commit suicide? That is disgusting. And it's like, the, the person who said it is probably like, wait, what? No, okay. <laughs> like, I, I right. shudder to think of how pure this place was before I, a woman, came here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, dynamics certainly changed since those days. Like, people are much more clean oh, these days. Bully hunters. <laughs> Remember that? Bully hunt. <laughs> <laughs> right, that was yeah. dude you you called that shit with uh yeah. tosses, tosses didn't you <laughs> 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 it's it's almost the exact same shit and it, it, it failed just as miserably but hey yeah what's really so, great about the xbox live stuff and online gaming and kind of you know having your metal tested and having your you know, your skin tempered and all that sort of thing is that it's it's kind of the ideal environment in which to have that happen because you can mm -hmm. leave whenever you want. There's no obligation to continue. You can mute and block whoever you want. No one can actually hurt you in any real way. It's the safest, most oddly clinical sort of way to, to sort of get used to that sort of thing. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to take that away from young people because when you go in the real world and people you know, talk shit to your face and yell at you and all that stuff, there's always like the threat that they could actually do something and sometimes you can't just walk away and stuff like that. So online gaming is really a great, not like a microcosm, but it's a good, it's like a good training for the real game. world. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I agree with that. Yeah, because people agree. are pricks. People can really be pricks in real life. But it, it, just yeah. be ready. That's all. Yeah. And you really get no filter when it comes to, to online gaming, just the nature of it. People are mm -hmm. just going to say whatever hateful shit is on their mind and you know, hate is always going to be a part of human existence, no matter what you try well, to you, do. To you wouldn't like, have humans without hate, right? That's kind of how it works. Exactly. There's a, there's, it's like a, it's a Taoist thing of like, it's, it's an essential half of existence that you're not going to be able to police out of existence. And, uh, just, just leave it alone is my, is my position. But, uh, but anyway, it was all, it was that whole, it was that volatility that I found really funny and fascinating, and it was what informed the Master Chief character for me in R.B. and the Chief, right? Because I, I wanted to create a character that kind of embodied all of that hatred yeah. and st stupidity. That is cool. And that's what he would, uh, that's what all of his traits sort of derive from, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I was playing the Halo 3 beta, right? And then um, at the time, I had this Master Chief action figure that I can't remember, my mom might have bought it for me or something. And uh, and at the same time, I also happened to be playing around with like text-to-speech synthesizers. And for all some reason- All the pieces reason, are coming together. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, and it was also, it was a Microsoft voice. And like the reason I was toying around with Microsoft Sam in particular is because of how primitive it sounded. Like it's a very dated yeah. speech engine. Mm -hmm. And so, I would do like the typical kid thing of typing swear words into it and hearing it <laughs> said back to me, and I got a big kick out of that. I thought yeah, it was hilarious. I think everybody tried that once they found out it was really yeah, easy to do. Fuck. Yeah, you just so type funny. the most heinous shit into it. the text field and then just hear it played back, and I, I got a childish kick out of that. So I eventually it popped in my head, like, what if I put that on a character? Oh, what if it was you know, the Master Chief thing came to life and started saying that shit. And I was a big fan of like Toy Story. So like that that was that was a factor in the creation of it as well. And um so I put the two together and I wanted to I wanted to this was before like the company Machinima that I became affiliated with them. This is just I had a YouTube account and I thought I'll just make something stupid and upload it and see what happens. You know. Uh, just as a hobby, you know, I just thought it was funny, and um, so I I had a I had a tape camcorder at the time, and uh, I just recorded the action figure with the controller in his lap, and then 
I wrote a little script and then had Chief say those things and intercut it with like Halo 3 beta gameplay. And um, he just characterized all the hostility that I was observing on the, you know, playing online. And um, it was a way of satirizing it, you know. And also I was taking that, tr that iconic Master Chief character and kind of flipping... The, yeah, the it's role. not what anyone would expect the personality of Master Chief to be like at all. It's just like, wait, what's going on? Right, exactly. It's like the exact opposite, right? He's just so petty and childish and crude. And, um, yeah. So I created this video called Master Chief Sucks at Halo. That was about, that was in 2008, maybe. I think I created my channel in 2006. And then I uploaded that in 2007 or eight. I can't remember. And it, it got, it went viral. I got really, really lucky with that. And, um, it got like millions of hits on YouTube. And, um, I made another one. Master Chief sucks at Halo two, where he literally plays Halo two, uh, <laughs> instead of the Halo three beta. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I made a third one. But it was between the second and the third one that uh, I was approached by uh, Machinima, the company, right? Who was just starting out at the time. Oh, man, that's, they... that's a whole yeah. journey in that <laughs> Machinima. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a whole thing. And so uh, they, were, they were looking for content creators at the time. They were a very small team. Um, the very, very talented, creative people. And um, I can't really say the same about the management, but their creative team at the time, there was really solid people working there, but not very many. It was like a team of three or four or five people. And then I, was, I, I became one of their content creators and I signed a contract with them. And um, I think the original deal was that uh, I would get paid like five dollars per thousand views or something like that mm -hmm. but i ended up doing so well that it would have bankrupted them <laughs> <laughs> if, if if uh we kept going with that contract so luckily for them they had the foresight to put in a clause saying that they could terminate the agreement at any time and so they revoked it and wrote up a new one and that then, doesn't uh, sound fun no no and I, I was I was pretty young at the time. I mean, I, I wasn't that young. I was in my twenties, so I can't. Unfortunately, I can't fall back on saying that I was a stupid teenager because I wasn't a teenager at the time. I should have. I probably should have known better at, at that age. But uh, it probably I was all young. happened so fast, though, right? I imagine. Exactly. I was naive to all this. Stuff. I mean, I just I just graduated from school, and I was just a very homely kind of you know, just making stupid shit in my bedroom. And, uh, and this all seemed like a huge thing to me, you know, it's like, wow, a company in LA wants to work with me. That's so, that's so awesome. Like I'll, yeah, I'll do whatever, whatever contract you give me, I'll sign I feel it. Like, uh, like anybody in, uh, in like the light two thousands, if they were on the internet and a big company again in LA were like, Ooh, here's money. So like, you know, make a show that everybody would probably take that deal. I feel like now, Hollywood has very much been like deglamorized almost. It feels like nobody really, at least on the internet, people don't really yes. care about Hollywood anymore. I, I mean, I don't personally like <laughs> I'm interested in LA. No, I think it's terrible. I, I, I never hate go. Yeah, I hate that whole culture, like LA, Hollywood. I mean, LA is kind of nice. I like the humidity there, but that's about it. <laughs> well, see, I don't. I, uh... I live in that scorched land down here and I want to be somewhere cold. I don't think I would really <laughs> enjoy LA. It's just like, oh, it's the same as here, except it's really smoggy. Yeah. Um, but I, I was I I didn't relocate to LA or anything like that. I was still just doing I was in uh, uh Vancouver and I would just work remotely for them, producing content, and then I would send it over to them and it would get thrown into their programming queue. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how it started. And then I, I made Master Chief Sucks at Halo 3. And then Arby and the Chief came along when 
I kind of re- after the third one, I kind of realized that Master Chief needed a foil. Mm-hmm. It only so, makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. So I felt like I could get much more comedic value out of it if there was like a straight man to like play off of Chief, right? And then I could turn the show into sort of like uh, the arguments that happen in my head. Basically, I would just personify them as Arbiter and Chief. And mm-hmm. I've been accused of like making Arbiter a Mary Sue, and it is true. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, where it's just like. But those people I, hate all, him. All my opinions are Arbiter. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, okay. And, like uh, as a self insert, maybe there's probably some degree of that in Chief as well, though, right? Like you'll say some stuff yes, that's on your it, mind. Exactly. That I mean that dialogue from Chief doesn't come out of nowhere. Like yeah. that shit that goes through my head in a, a very childish part of me, you know. Well, but I luckily, I have the I have the maturity to keep a lid on it and, and not actually mm. be that person you know so uh but yeah it's and i, I always liked immature kind of humor and um and so yeah so i created the arbiter character arbiter was actually introduced in the master chief sucks at halo series but he was just as stupid as chief was <laughs> and i i realized like that's not the right way to do this like he should be smarter and like the straight role to like play off of chief nowadays people and... would call you racist <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well it's, that's uh that, i lose sleep over that to be honest with the whole political correctness thing and like whether the, the words that i use in my show are still okay to use well and, yeah you uh, can be retroactively uh hung up for whatever you said because uh i'll be the chief was definitely just no filter Right, yeah. So I'm not going to repeat any of the words on this stream because I don't want you to get flagged or demonetized <laughs> or whatever. But the, the F word, the R word, those are all words that I used straight from episode one, you know? So if I suddenly start censoring myself now, it just seems like, I don't know, dishonest. Well, it's the way I guess. Um, we get confused. It's the way it confusingly works. Once enough people are annoyed by it, we're sort of just conditioned to be like, I guess I shouldn't use it. I guess. And right, with yeah. the internet, it's just a g- g- combination of so many different cultures and attitudes that it's all trying to morph into one, but it's constantly fighting because there's so many cultures that are just like, what do you mean? That word's fine. And, it's, and then another culture's like, no, it's not, though. And it's like, yeah, it is. No, it's not. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, the, right. we, we know what that pertains to, right? All of the, uh, the massive story. Oh, well, <laughs> sure, but I thought you were going to mention... Um, uh, cunt, because in America that's much oh, strong. Yeah. In Britain, it's not that strong, and in Australia, I don't even know if it really is considered it's, a swear word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm from Britain. I'm. I was born in Glasgow, so like, I understand that it cunt over there is like a term of endearment almost. Yeah, and uh, I, the word was never never struck me as a big deal. Um, but w- whatever the the bad words that I use, it was always used as a reflection of the volatility that i observed mm-hmm. you know playing online because those are the words people used and yeah, um i feel like uh any attempt to portray online gaming without actually just leaning into the fact that people are going to say whatever they want which includes a lot of offensive things would almost be dishonest well that's the like, that's the art of it isn't it because like internet. you can't say this word and it's like but that person would say this word so yes Yes, exactly. And I, I that from the get go, I wanted to make a show that depicted online gaming for what it was, for just just how volatile it was. And I hated, uh, you know, how like publishers and developers would release trailers for video games, and they would do like mock online gaming banter. Oh, oh my god! Chat. Yeah. What what was <laughs> wasn't it uh fuck what was the game the division, was, uh, the division. division yeah that was it that's yeah. the f- yeah. they, they did it for and Anthem it's as Anthem's well Anthem. yeah it is Anthem. the cringiest <laughs> fucking shit in the universe <laughs> it's not how people talk yeah it's so They're unnatural and so anybody who's little NPCs. yeah anybody who's played on an online game for more than ten minutes knows that that's not how people fucking talk on there. Uh, and uh, you know, I wanted Rainbow to make a show Siege. that actually reflected how what it was like. Mm-hmm. What was it? It was Rainbow Six Siege, wasn't it? Yeah, where they had like oh, they God, yeah. did that, and they're like, "All right, we're going to insert on the roof, guys. You ready? Yeah, yes. we're ready. Let's go." Exactly. <laughs> it's just awful. It's so crap. 
nobody coordinates on an online game. Everybody's a lone wolf just swearing yeah, at each other. You talk. We're talking nope. niche shit for like because I, I remember the, the you know yeah, the you people have to who get to role play army <coughs> servers for that. Kind yeah, of like thing. high level yeah. World of Warcraft or even Left 4 Dead had had like at, at the peak of its players there'd be people who play verses like incredibly seriously. Like you need to tell people yeah. when you're reloading. I think my yep. favorite part of the Rainbow Six Siege one was that there was this enemy player. I think he was called Havoc, and they would constantly be oh. like, "Oh shit, Havoc! He's coming!" Havoc. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Havoc. Calm down oh, there, God. Sonic. Yeah, they're right. And, yeah. and nobody has like really nobody has like any crazy ass online names that you would actually <laughs> see like XXX smoke weed every day. Yeah. Double X sixty nine mom boner sixty nine XX and you're like, ah oh, shit, it's him again. Uh, instead yeah. you see mom like Marine again. Seven. So it's my name, yes. Marine <laughs> Seven. You're like, okay. I see in chat a guy called White Light. I like your reviews. Of... <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> Why's it gotta be White Light? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't. I haven't. I haven't watched this stuff. I hope it's good. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello, White Light. I have never heard of you, but don't worry. Most people haven't. Just most, like people most people haven't people heard have of everyone. Heard of um... most be statistically, most people have not heard of you. So this goes to. Yeah, th th those videos were hilarious, uh, and I don't know why they thought that would encourage, like, people to, either people to want to play more online, or that people would be like, oh, the online looks so good, it's like, nah, off-putting, if anything, if that's how everybody operates on it, it'd be like, Ew. Yeah, I don't want to be in a room where that's the discourse. Not that that, that, that dis discourse is totally fucking phony anyway. No, <laughs> yeah, I got enough, uh, like I got that. enough got enough issues in my life going on right now. I work a little bit too hard on this, that, and the other thing to go home, sit down at my computer, open up a game, and call a 12-year-old sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sir, would you... Do, you... do you need some resources? You I will can address me them. as sir in this roleplay server? Do you understand but I see, will ban you? I, that already sounds like a great sketch, though, doesn't it? Everyone's operating that way, and there's this one dude, a chief-like character, who's just like... What's up, fuckers? It's like, wait, you can't, you can't say that. <laughs> just that sort of shit. Is, you already want to do that, because that's how it actually goes. It's just way more fun. You'd find that character more endearing than any of the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's why straight guys are so popular, and why it's almost just always a good idea to kind of have one, just a normal person. Yeah. So that it, it helps you yeah. think that this what you're watching is real, because there's a realish person involved in it. So you yeah, can't like, take Batwoman seriously. There's, I, not a there's no man. normal people in Batwoman. Think, oh my um, god, there isn't a straight man in that, is there? Think, Jesus Christ. I think there is a reason. Yeah, there probably is a reason why like the the idiot and the straight man is such an endearing and recurring comedy tr uh, like combination. It just it works really well if you have a guy. I mean, that's what Wallace and Gromit is effectively, you know, like yes, Gromit yeah. is the straight man and Wallace is this wacky crazy dude and they play off of each other really well. Totally. Everyone yeah, I, I grew up watching a lot of, like, British sitcoms, like, comedy shows and, yes. like, comedy duos. Uh, oh, like yeah, we Will had a whole Hardy, bunch. Markham and Wise. Like, uh, they all informed me on some level you, uh, in my comedic writing. Even though these these are technically considered old now, but the newer ones, like um, Mitchell and Webb or even uh, French and Saunders. Yes, Mitchell and Webb, French and Saunders, both brilliant, yep. So many good oh. pairings, so many good sketch shows, and that's the thing, it was, it's funny we're on this, because Fringy and I were watching a bit of Mitchell and Webb like two days ago, so it's like, convenient, yeah. but the, uh, the, particularly it was the one where they suggest killing all of the poor to solve uh, problems in, uh, I can't remember the economic no. problems, I think. It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Listen, you guys wanted a war on poverty, this is what that means. <laughs> yeah. The, Kill the, the poor. The whole joke is like, we wouldn't do that. He's like, no, of course we wouldn't do it, but would it work? We need to find <laughs> out. <laughs> and, uh, it reminds me of that Jonathan Swift essay about eating the homeless. A solution oh, yeah. for homelessness or poverty. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, the British. This is the thing. Like, it's not that other places don't have great comedy as well. It's just a good thing to grow up on, especially if you had, like, like I'm assuming, do you watch Blackadder? Yeah. Yes, love it. So good. <laughs> Faulty Towers. Yeah. This, is, this is all stuff yes. you gotta watch when you're growing up so you get a good sense like of humor. Required, yeah, yeah, required viewing if you wanna... Oh, especially with the... Uh, they've censored, or they've gotten rid of one of the Faulty Tower episodes now. The... Yeah, they got rid of the German one. Yeah. yeah. That sucks. Which yes. is really, 
which is specifically upsetting. because of the scene with the black doctor. Yeah. Dude, it's like, the I think best. that was the reason. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the best episode. Like, yeah. Funny as hell. And once, as we and just it's... mentioned before as well, the most offensive part of Basil Fawlty in that episode is the fact that he's like, that's the point. That's him. That's he's the character. Mm. The other characters get to condemn him and make fun of him. Is... This is like a big problem with a lot of people's interpretation of comedy. Generally, the idiot, like, and, you know, be Chief or Basil Fawlty, like that type, they're not like, or Eric Cartman, they're not yeah. like the guy you're meant to be. Like, they're, well, they're, they're same, the one you're laughing at. Same goes for yeah. uh, Rick Sanchez in Rick and Morty. A lot of the stuff that he says is very brutal and also wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of it is very, um, removes elements of, of the truth in order to, to make yeah. a conclusion and that you know a lot of people idolize him a lot of people are like you shouldn't be listening to him he's not a good person it's like the show's not telling you he's a good person the show is very desperately just trying to have him remain in character he would say these things because you know yes. a lot of people get confused as being like what's the message of the show is it this thing the character said and it's like well it may, it be, it's gonna be more complicated than that usually right mm -hmm. that's why it's good to have uh, they, characters uh... that challenge the shit are yeah. they uh, censoring some South Park episodes now that it's out on? Like, Are they? I'd be surprised yeah, if they weird. weren't. South Park is. Well, I mean, South Park has had many episodes that I'm pretty sure the Scientology episode does not get replayed. Um, uh, what was? Because I'm pretty sure. Um, I think Tom Cruise, Mission Impossible Three was coming out around the same time, and Tom Cruise, like Mission Impossible, was Paramount. South Park is uh, Paramount or Viacom, and I think uh, Tom Cruise was wasn't going to do the promotional tour for Mission Impossible 3 because of that episode, and so it doesn't rerun now. But it's so funny. But <laughs> I have it yeah. on, because uh, I have the box set for season 6 to 10, the best stretch of South Park, like, for sure. So I have it forever. <laughs> I, no, I remember reading about recently, I'm pretty sure uh, a few South up. Park episodes have been pulled. I think it's Hulu doing it. It's not, it's obviously not Matt or Trey. It's not Comedy Central. I no. think it's Hulu. Because they oh, have the streaming okay. rights to it. Yeah, there are five episodes that aren't on HBO Max that are being pulled down. Okay, um, yeah, I know HBO has been pulling stuff as well. Oh, uh, they're the religious ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I know what that's about. <laughs> is it just the religious ones, or is it, like, race-related? Um, specifically, uh, any episode, there are five episodes in which Muhammad appears, and they're not in it. Those ones oh. have been pulled. So that would have been like the 200th episode. I think they did a whole thing. That that means there's no Family Guy. The Family Guy episode wouldn't be in there either. Well, dude, the one where they were making fun of it. I mean, a lot of people doom about this, right? Like, oh, everything's gonna go. But it's like, well, but if we're knocking out some of these little things we've been seeing, it's like, surely it is only a matter of time before each of the because we all watched these shows when they first came out. They they're edgy. <laughs> like a lot of them, are yeah. very edgy. And so it's yeah. just like, are we just yeah? Is that what we're doing now? I guess so. Yeah, it worries me. I really hate the direction we're going in right now. It sucks. It's uh, if it was like this pure puritanical view on what uh art or like comedy is meant to be, you know, there's certain things that you're not oh. allowed to do because what about the potential consequences of other people deciding to behave a certain way because they were influenced by a piece of media? But that's like a really tenuous and stupid reason to do anything. Right. You bring up a uh, family guy. Mike Henry stopped doing the voice of Cleveland now, right? Uh, Cleveland Brown, I heard yeah. about that. Yep. Yeah. And no more, I guess, uh, Hank Azaria is up who. That was a long time coming. But, but see, like, I, yeah. I remember he didn't give it up straight away. It was once he'd been barked at enough that he was like, I guess I'm hurting people. Okay, fine. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's all right. going to go, I think. It's, it's just people, because the people who like this stuff don't angrily shout regularly at the people that they're doing a great job. We, we just, we go, yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. I like it. But the people who are angry that they're doing a bad job, as much as I don't think there's that many of them relative to everyone, nor do I think there's that many that agree relative to everyone, uh, but they're just going to keep shouting. People. They're going to keep sending they're, messages. And it's just going to be like, yeah, okay, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop. They're the vocal ones, yes. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, I think there's an argument to be made on the live action side of things. For, like if you're telling a story in a certain area of the world where it makes sense to cast an Asian person or whatever, I mean, there's plenty of Asian talent. There's plenty of black talent. Like, if the role calls for like a black person or an Asian person or whatever, just mm -hmm. sure cast yeah. a person of the appropriate race because there's plenty of talent. 
It would be it's... weird to see like Mads Mikkelsen playing Shaka Zulu in the Olympic. <laughs> right, yeah. It would be rather unusual, I will admit. I, I, feel, I feel like that would be a point of contention. Handsome. Yeah. But I think once we start getting in, into the gradient of this, where we're going into the territory of like co comedy cartoons, like, com like comedy voiceovers for a cartoon, it's just like, like is well, this really I mean, worthwhile? Does like, that, um, like Kratos's voice has to be replaced. He's playing a Greek, and he's always been played. Oh, by you Black know Man. they aren't gonna do it. No, they won't. Yeah. But and, and um, another yeah. form of hypocrisy being, um, you know, Apu is a stereotype. That's why he's bad. And it's like, so what about Willie? It's like, yeah, but he's, he's Scottish. Who cares? It's like, um, what oh. about what yeah. about? <laughs> Well, I'm surprised Bumblebee Man hasn't been destroyed in the process, too. Bumblebee Man is well, just... <laughs> like... I guess he's, he's small enough, right? But it, it's funny, right? Because Homer Simpson is just American dad. Well, not American well. dad. TV show. <laughs> like, he is just the standard well, it's, and lazy that's what I mean. American It's, it's plenty offensive dad, if you yeah. want to go that way. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm a, an American father. I'm not fat, stupid, and selfish. And it's like, yeah, well, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. I guess I guess everyone's willing to accept that that's a caricature. While the uh, every member of this is the thing about Simpsons that blows my mind. Every member of Springfield is supposed to be an extreme version of that particular stereotype or archetype. Like the yeah, the fat policeman who just eats donuts and he's terrible at his job. And you're like, yeah, yeah, okay. The the evil white old man who's got the most money owns mansions and basically everyone is damaged in some way, shape, or form by his operations and he doesn't give a shit. He tries to block out the sun. <laughs> 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 this is what I mean. Like, there's one for everybody. That's why Simpsons was emphasis on the was so awesome. It was making fun of yeah. everybody. Same as uh, South Park as well, but Simpsons was a lot more child friendly. Let's just say. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> is also, episode... uh, as it's worth mentioning, sorry, uh, Alpu is actually like the best person altruistically in Springfield, other than like Lisa. Yeah. Right. But yet we have to lose him because he's too offensive. It's like that's absurd, but okay. Yeah. Well, that they're censoring the episode about censorship, kind of. Oh yeah. Oh, the family, yeah. Well, the the all of the Family Guy episodes that they're censoring, the main point was censorship. They were trying to make a point about censorship. It's, it was never about it's so, um, what they're making it about. It's why we have to appreciate the shit out of some of these these uh, I call, you know oh. old cartoons. It's like you have to really appreciate yeah. some of the ideas there because I still remember that episode vividly. It's Marge makes a huge fuss about Itchy and Scratchy, it gets sanitized to an insane degree, and nobody even likes it anymore. And she's happy, everything's great. Then, um, Michelangelo's <laughs> David comes into town, right? Or is it, it's a statue that has, uh, you can, you can see the bad part. And she's okay with it, because right. that's a piece of art. But other people are like, what do you mean? What about the children? What are you talking about? Like, Marge, this is horrible, we need to go protest. And she's like, what? No. And it's like, ah. Mm -hmm. Look, know, it's right, very what... obvious what point they're making. <laughs> Well, I mean, yes. that's what the whole South Park movie was about. The kids watched Terrence and Philip because, of course, they were going to. Like, of course they would. And I think that's what a lot of people forget is, like, kids, of course they're going to consume the content Especially that they're not if, supposed to. if you make it forbidden. Especially if you... Yeah, you tell How, how much forbidden can't. content did you guys consume? Because I... Uh, <laughs> yeah. In my household, right, there was a whole fine, shelf man. of movies I wasn't allowed to watch, and I was like, well, next time you guys head out, <laughs> I'm just gonna... Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's effectively what it is, you know, like people, the fact that everybody is aware that Call of Duty is consumed by teenagers and children, it's like, well, it's not supposed to be, but we all know that they will anyway, because of course they're going to. It feels like a lot of people have forgotten what it was like actually being a kid, seeing oh, dude. all of this really cool, edgy content. This is the thing, with how everything's going, we're a part of a generation that never came before and will never come again. The idea that we were, we were let out onto this, because it all started with... Play Pong, you know, in your safe little room. No one can bother you. Good. But then I eventually, once it clicked on online, parents, I don't think, really yeah. reacted to that. They didn't understand what that meant. Your kid is now walking into a world full of unparented kids. And we yeah. got, we just got a blast of reality. It was just, like, all yeah. over the place, whatever. While also shooting people, exploding people, or, you know, moving blocks, whatever it was. At least there wasn't a vagina or a booby in there. But, like, that's already going away uh, with, with yeah. what we've been talking about. And well, I think, um... I think uh, one of the things I've thought about a lot, like, the whole point of Red Dead Redemption 2 is, like, you know, these people who have to get used to the new times and they don't understand it. And obviously when you look at it, you're like, dude, civilization's cool. But, like, 
if you look at the internet as like the old west which is what it feels like it feels like i'm um arthur morgan here like i just don't understand this you know <laughs> civilization <laughs> coming to my internet you know yeah. i just want my freedom like that's all i want i just want the internet to be what it was like this untempered wild land where there was a lot it of, was great it was it was wonderful I, the um, internet I used it. to be insanely good it was just the best thing ever there was so little filtering so little censorship it was just all over the place and nowadays it's like dive in every other article it's like hey remember that favorite thing of yours guess what you're like oh <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> it should have never have been made and you're a bad person for enjoying it retroactively yeah Gone with the wind. Gone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're bringing that one back with with a disclaimer. We'll see that. The yeah. Of it. I, I heard about that, and I still think it's absurd, the idea that, like, so whatever is in there, right, that was offensive, I wonder how many movies that applies to. And then should all movies actually... Yes. And then I was just like, what you're doing is just... You, you're going through the cycle of why we even have age ratings. That's all you're doing. Like... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, ridiculous. Why would yeah. we need anything beyond age ratings? There are ideas out there that if we expose a person to them, they could be hurt? Like, uh, this isn't fun. <laughs> like, this, uh, this sounds like something else now. Right. And also, offense is subjective. You know, like, what, what if I just saw something and I was like, man, I'm offended by the Teletubbies. They're making what? fun of morbidly obese people <laughs> who eat TVs. You know, like, and then... <laughs> eat TVs, oh my goodness. You know, then it's like, oh, we're, we're, we're sorry. Or uh, what was, um, bananas in pajamas, you know? Like... <laughs> Sentient bananas make... is terrifying. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> or like, um, I, I guess it's just, um, I feel like even something as wholesome as Sesame Street, you could find some way to spin it oh, in a way that's negative. Dude, you're limitless with interpretation. We've seen that actually with modern YouTube, even in the past like year more so than ever. People will be looking back at old cartoons or old shows or old movies that are absolutely innocent and being like, you do get that this is about fascism. And they're like, I'm sorry? Yeah. And they're like, you don't understand, Spongebob is trying to teach, and you're like, shut the fuck up. Like, no, 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 Jerry, Jerry is running away from Tom. It's, it's, it's just, there's, it's cat No, mouse. it's about marginalization. No, it's, an, it's an analogy for capitalism. Analogy. Jerry, Jerry is the oppressive white man who Because <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, there's room for this weird middle ground where, um, I remember when, uh, I was younger, my dad bought he got a big box dvd set of like all the old looney tunes and on in like the preamble whatever it was before the show they just say some of these cartoons were made a long time ago and some of them have you know racial depictions of stereotypes and da 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 but we're but you know we're just letting you know that this is a you know it's what they did back then and we're preserving these originals here in their or you know original form because you know it's art and it's from a different time and it's all that sort of thing and if that's all they did, I would just, man, if that was, if only that could be the world where we lived in, where that's as far as they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. It's a shame as well, because if you fight too hard for this stuff, if you fight publicly and hardly to be able to have all these words be not considered, it's like, you can start getting some labels, and then you have people coming after you in different ways, depending on how popular you are, you gotta be real careful. Yeah, because the whole, the whole idea is effectively you're defending a principle more so than anything. The whole idea of like, I'm, oh, absolutely. Like, it's not any single yeah. use of the thing in any particular no. context. It's more just a wider scale. It's always about the that. The whole idea of you do it once, then it has to be all or nothing. You have to commit to all or nothing, because if you don't, it's just going to be some wishy-washy bullshit that's decided by whoever has the most power at the time. That's the power right of now, intersubjectivity, where you get enough people who have a similar take subjectively, and thus it has to be accounted for, as in... If we just if we paid a million people to say that they're offended by the word chungus, I think it would actually become a swear word. If they just kept saying it over and over again, that it's horribly offensive. It relates to yeah. fat people, and it's disgusting and defamatory. And you, I mean, they're trying it with Karen, right? <laughs> they're trying to make it. So it's, <laughs> we'll have to see how that goes. What was the uh, what was the one you said? Goblin. Oh right, yeah. Goblin. Um, I used goblin in a tweet the other day, and I had someone. Leave a comment on there saying, like, can you be careful using words like that? They're often associated with, like, Jew hate. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it's, like, completely unrelated. I was just like, it's a goblin. Goblins are... You can't take me... Talk a dog. <laughs> Give me back my goblin word. Like, you can't take that. Yeah. That's... Oof. Them goblins will get you.
Oh yeah, remember the OK symbol? That got made oh, into yeah, a Nazi yeah. symbol for a while. Is that still a thing, or have they given up on that one? I think they no, gave I, up I, on it. <laughs> I think they gave up on it. It's just, it's so, it was so ridiculous. It it caught on just enough for all the normies to get wind of it, I Well, think. remember, we watched like, a video on EFAB that, about it. I mean. There was a guy explaining, yeah, like, did. you need to stop using it, because it is... It was like an IGN thing, wasn't it? it was <laughs> I think big, so. <laughs> it was a fairly RG. big studio guy, and he was like, guys, we have to stop using the LK symbol, because reasons. Oh, it's, it's kind. A few people in chat give me the goblin pass. Thank you, guys. <laughs> my G, what's up, my G-words? What's up, my gigas? <laughs> my goblins. My, my, g my goblins. Yeah, I'm really sick of those preachy, condescending articles about, like, we really need to stop doing X, or whatever it is. Yeah, I, I love how they always frame it that way. We. It's like, we really need to stop doing it. Like, well, and the one they say we really need to talk about and then thing, and it's like, what? Oh, uh, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm. It, it is a curiosity. It's just like, how long before they're like, you know what? Schindler's List is pretty offensive, actually. <laughs> just like, um, just like, there goes our chance of getting a musical. <laughs> if only. Um, where were we in 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 Origintisms? We we've got. I think you brought up the idea of the 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 sanitized versions of game chat. That's where we went off the rails. So we could get back on. Them. <laughs> That's EFAP. <laughs> yeah. Was it was it was it relevant to like you wanting to uh I don't know, provide the alternative and stuff, right? In the in the stories. Right, yeah. So mm. um Yeah, I I just I wanted to depict the uh the online gaming sphere for what it was. And I feel like big companies, developers, publishers were kind of shying away from what it really was. And I was just like no, like, let's actually look at what it is, you know? And uh, I, kn I know I had uh, uh, people affiliated with, like, Bungie or Microsoft who were fans of what I did, but they couldn't publicly kind of announce it. Like, uh, there's Halo Waypoint was a thing. I don't know if you heard of that, but it was yeah, kind yeah, of Yeah, I remember a, that. Yeah, like, it was, that. Yeah, it was like a content platform for Halo-related videos. Some Red versus Blue stuff went on there, I think. And uh, I knew somebody with Halo Waypoint who was a big fan of what I did, but they were like, we can't have your stuff on the platform, unfortunately. And I was like, N you know what? That's okay. I get it. Like, I understand. I realize I'm kind of going in a direction here where I'm painting the, th the culture for what it is, and it's not a flattering look, but mm -hmm. it is what it is. You know, that's the direction I wanted to go in, and I accept the consequences of that if nobody no big companies want to affiliate with me fine at least i'm i'm writing the content that i want to make you know and i have my audience and it's for them and they enjoy it and whoever wants to get on board is welcome to and yeah and so yeah i kept doing that and i made a a, a first season of the show rb and the chief and then a second one and um and a third one and a fourth one and between the third and the fourth one, there was a gap because I got burned out after season three. And um, I was kind of like, I, I don't want to do this anymore, at least not necessarily permanently. But I was just like, I got to just take a break and then see how I feel a little mm -hmm. bit later. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they it was obviously getting so many views at that point, the show that they wanted to keep that train going. Mm -hmm. So they decided they wanted to do it in house so they would they would take over the writing and they would like get the action figures and then they would film more episodes of the show without my involvement and so that was what RB and the chief in LA was yeah. i don't know if you guys heard of that <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's yeah. that's a whole fucking thing i mean <laughs> I mean, there's so many different questions to it i oh, I, I, I guess it's just like what 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 do you have to say about all that Oh Christ! Well, they they made the first couple episodes and they were horribly received, and <laughs> yeah, then they, they yeah. yeah, and then so they came wait, to me. Is, Sorry, so go what ahead. is this? This is Arby and the Chief in L.A. What's that? Yeah, so that that was the quote unquote fourth season that I wasn't involved in because oh. I was burned out after season three, and I was just like, I don't want to do this at least for a little while. But they, Machinima wanted to keep it going because it was such a view cow for them. 
Yeah. And uh, so they wanted to just do it themselves. They would they would have their own writer and their own puppeteer and cinematographer and all that. And I was. Just it's like, kind okay, of insane as as how that's a microcosm of how TV shows will often go in real life. Like, yes, a, yeah. a creative is behind it. They they push everything to be the way that it is. It becomes loved, well, and I that creative wants Star to. Wars, yeah. Yes. Ooh, ooh. And it's like... <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it's I'll be in the chief and ally is kind of like season four of Community almost. Like, yeah, you know, it lost, it yeah, lost the person who made it, and people could tell. I could tell, and I was like fourteen or fifteen at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true with a lot of things. As soon as the creative director goes, or like just key members of the, it's, it, it's the ones creates... that just had the most input, right? It's like when you lose them, you're not getting the input that was well, required to make the thing in the first place. I mean, look it's, at uh, companies like Bungie. Look at well, companies Bungie like you know. Look changed. at all the companies yeah. like a Bioware. Well, know? I think uh, I think Naughty Dog might be the interesting one right now because people are. I've seen people make the observation that a lot of, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Like the whole idea that the studio is very different. I mean, Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin haven't been there since Jack and Daxter, and they founded the company. Amy Hennig hasn't been there for a long time. Bruce Stratley left, so you have like a lot of big people cycle out. And slowly but surely, you eventually end up with a different team, and they're not necessarily going to make the decisions that kind of you describing like Simpsons want. now as well, right? Well, Simpsons, yeah, there's another they one. Just it's cycled never... all of the creatives out, and now we we don't even know who's right in these episodes, really. <laughs> well, yeah, yep. like it, it's it's rare that you ever notice the change, but the change eventually comes, and it's it's stark. Um. But it is, I guess it's an interesting thing that we often, like, I think a lot of people often don't think about the people who make the content that they like. I mean, I think it's really easy when you're thinking about actors and stuff, but a writer's room, I mean, The Simpsons writer's room was legendary, but barely anybody would know their names except for, like, Conan O'Brien. Um, mm -hmm. And the goes for a lot of video game developers. I mean, a lot of people probably don't know who Jason Jones is or, uh, uh, or Joseph Staten or any of those guys despite the fact that millions of people consumed what they made. It's kind of funny because you can uh, see it from both directions there. It's like when they buy it, they're like, well, all we really needed was your characters. We don't need the writing because that's what people want. And then... Yeah, we just need brand. You actually have consumers who are like, yeah, I don't really care who's writing it. I just want to see Han Solo shoot his gun. Well, it's good. I just want to see yeah. Luke Skywalker with his lightsaber. I don't really care what's happening. And it's like, those people will be pleased no matter what. But then you'll just have these hardcore fads sit there like, something's not right. <laughs> something's yeah. something's well, wrong. Yeah. Something's um, missing. Yeah. I, I feel like that's, uh, well, we, we probably can't talk about The Last of Us 2 because Mola hasn't played it yet. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have even brought it up. It's probably going to get talked about in chat now. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'll I'll look away because I'm 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 on the cusp of being able to play it, so I'm excited to react to everything. Brand new. Have you have you, uh, have you played it, John? Or uh, yeah. And I I realized this is going to be a very unpopular opinion, but I fucking loved it. <gasps> I really did. Wow, that is a unpopular. Oh, that sucks. We can't yeah. talk about that. <laughs> <'Cause> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. You know what? We'll we'll have you back once. Well, if you're willing, and w once we do a Last of Us two stream, because we're planning on doing a fab for it for sure. Yeah, I'm actually I'm really blown away by how uh, divided everyone is on it. I I guess surprised. in a way it's no uh, yeah I, I agree in a way it's not surprising, but like the hatred I'm seeing for it is so strong. It's just that there's an I, uh... I wasn't expecting it to that degree. You got right. there's other elements involved, right? Because it's not just the fact that people are unhappy with the story. It's also, correct me there if I'm wrong, but angle. yeah, yeah. But um, I also on the business practices that people were concerned with in relation to uh, Naughty Dog Naughty as well. Dog as... The studio and the crunch. Oh, well, that's why we got the, the leaks. Crunch. We got the, the leaks crunch. because a guy there got so fed up with how terrible the company was treating him. He was like, "Fuck it. Here's what's happened. Here's what happens in the game." I and think um, pressed from the beginning. I think the problem was that there were a lot of things that happened beforehand. That could lead somebody to believe that um that there were that there were going to be problems like the whole idea of seventeen out of twenty designers leaving in, in a short period of time. It's like, well, that's a lot of new guys you have to come in, and are they going to do as good? I mean, but then again, it's interesting, right? Because most of the criticism is directed at the story. Very few people are talking about the gameplay, which uh I think is just good. I'm not sure if I'd go much further, but I think the story, the problem was the decision they made. It was probably never going to like. A lot of people would were never gonna like that. I feel I feel like there were probably more 
well, it's kind of a weird criticism, right? You should have done it this way, but done the same thing. But there's like a lot of validity to the whole idea of maybe they should have inverted the story and done it in the opposite. But that, I don't know. Part, part of the problem is I know what they were trying to do, but I, I'm not convinced that they executed on it very well. But um, but we can't talk yeah, about don't, it. Yeah, don't mean to blue like ball it. chat, but uh, it'll come yeah. eventually. And like I said, we'll we'll have you on if you wanna if you wanna chat about it because we'll probably take several hours to talk about what's wrong with it once uh, <laughs> once <laughs> once we yeah. once we've all got uh the context we need as in playing it uh all. Yeah, because I'll watch Mahler play it um in his playthrough, so I'll be around for the ride, so I'll be able to know everything about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I I agree. It's definitely not a perfect game. But I just oh, uh, yeah. the the degree of shit that it's getting, I think, is well, just unwarranted. Well, I, I think uh, I think that any score for that game, I I was talking about it with a couple of people. Like, it's a four out of ten, and I was I was floored. Like, I, I don't see how anybody can say that. No, like, especially when the attention to detail and the animation and everything. At the same is, time, like, I imagine so you both agree it's not a ten out of ten. So. Oh yeah, I I don't think it is. Gotta find that know. number it sits on. Where well, might I, it be? I don't I don't think I don't think the first game is a ten out of ten either. Um, no, I, it's, yeah, neither it's do in I. My, it's in my yeah. big most over, um, overpraised, uh, overrated games of all time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, <laughs> uh, right. So Arby we were on Arby and the Chief in LA, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So they did the first few episodes, received horribly, and then uh, my producer contact at Machinima contacted me, and uh, he was actually do writing the scripts for it because uh they didn't really have like a dedicated screenwriter god it's, like, gotta, it's so, gotta be so weird to have to write for a bunch of characters when you're not even necessarily prepared for it you're just like i don't know that they say this stuff i guess yeah exactly it's just so so not the way to like do this and so i i definitely regret the decision of handing it over but you know what? i was i was burned out you know and it's like something had to give you know? Were you um were you working on like hard justice and one life remaining around that time? Uh was yeah, I would jump between projects and that yeah. was kind of a it helped me stay productive because I would work mm -hmm. on one show and kind of get tunnel vision and then yeah. and then I, I would jump that. to another show and kind of be able to look at it with fresh eyes mm -hmm. and then get a sudden surge of inspiration and I'd work on that for a bit and then I'd get bored of that and then I jump back yeah. to the other thing. And is, that really that... worked for me. Is that kind of the? Re I this is kind of like a tangent, but I figure that might be the reason why you also have been doing the bites miniseries alongside, like. Season yes, eight. it's a nice diversion from the plot, and yeah. uh, there's different objectives when I'm writing this full story episodes and then bite episodes. Bite oh, episodes, I'm just trying to make people laugh, and the plot yeah. doesn't really matter. The plot can be absolutely ridiculous as long as it's funny, mm -hmm. and then uh, with the story episodes, I'm much more fo focused on the plot making some kind of sense it's yeah. not entirely grounded in reality obviously but like i try and it, there's a, a lot more focus on plot and i don't let the plot come at the expense of a joke a lot of the times mm -hmm. so um uh, go ahead sorry i was gonna ask and i know you don't like one life remaining or hard justice but if you had to choose which one of those shows do you like more what do you reckon Oh, geez, probably hard <laughs> justice. I think I, yeah, they're both I, they're both kind of cringy. <laughs> looking back on them for me, I mean, because I feel they're like funny. a lot of the jokes didn't land. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, I'm not shitting but, on anybody who likes the show either. I'm really appreciative of anybody who likes my old content. Well, I guess um, I guess what I would say is like hard justice and one life remaining are really funny, but the plots are a little bit uh flimsy, ridiculous. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. I mean, like I are. <laughs> I remember, like, I think, um, I think what Hard Justice was like, uh, that was the cop show, wasn't it? The one with the, uh, like, Bernard and, and all that, and then it was, like, investigating, um, well, if you don't want to talk about it, it's fine, like, I No, if, like, go yeah. ahead, I'm totally fine with it. Yeah, Hard Justice, it was a big dick joke, that's the reason it was called that. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. I didn't even realize that. And the, the, the police group is called erect erect the eradication yeah. of repulsive um, evil and corruption <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly so it's just erect. stupid dick and... jokes and but sometimes the plot took itself too seriously in contrast with that mm -hmm. and it just didn't work like in, in retrospect it's just... about plotting though like 
having done those shows because they were they were serialized. So. Uh, can you repeat the first part of that? Sorry, I missed it. Do you think that that doing those shows, and I, I think this is an interesting thing when it comes to like any creative enterprise, like the fact that you have to make stuff that isn't as good to get good. Um, do you think that uh, Hard Justice and One Life Remaining taught you a lot about like plotting and structure, story structure and stuff like that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge believer in failure, you know, mm -hmm. and like you, you must love the Last Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I get I get shit because I had said that I watched Last Jedi in theater and I didn't mind it. I thought it was okay. Listen, it's and, oh, it's all right. Well, I don't know how you currently feel, but a couple of my friends came out. One of them said it was meh, and the other one said they I loved it. Confused. Both of those I dudes hate the film now, yeah. so it your mind Definitely changes. Came out confused. I came out confused. I, yeah. It's nowhere near perfect, but I will say that I still like it better than Rise of Skywalker. I that's that was fine. A piece of shit. I think that's a fair. <laughs> I think yeah. that's fine. <laughs> it's honestly hard to choose between which one of those two is worse. I'm on, I'm on the rare team of choose any of the sequels. They're all so terrible. Choose whatever what you want is your favorite. They're, they they should. Oof. Just theories that, yeah, um, they're all terrible. It's, it's it's like you're watching. If I mean, you could tell are written by different people like those films. <laughs> Yeah, You'd probably argue true. that TROS was written by someone different from TFA, and yet. Yeah. I think I had watched Last Jedi 2 with a, a fondness of Rian Johnson, because I, I, I liked right. his work. Well, he had he had directed a few episodes. I'm not... Of course, he didn't write the episode, oh, but he directed right. a few episodes of Breaking Bad, yep. and yeah. he wrote Looper. I think he wrote and directed I, Looper. I still I have respect okay. for his direction for Aussie Man. I have respect it's, for his directing. I yeah, mean, like, I'm fine with him. Directed. From my limited understanding of what I can draw of a director's talents from just watching the film, seems to me like mm -hmm. he's he's pretty strong. But he's holy shit, his writing! Hard. And this is coming from because I I remember when people were like, "Oh, you're gonna you know Last for Last for sorry Last Jedi is gonna be great because it's written by the guy who wrote Looper." I remember being like, "Wait, <laughs> wait, mm. but Looper's." Wow, well, I think uh, I think I still was in the I like Looper camp when it came into uh, TLJ, but then I feel like Looper has kind of. It's just kind of the issue with all time travel stories for the most yes. part. It's not just the... <laughs> because well, I mean, uh, the, the compare this, this is the thing, mini rant. Like, Ryan Johnson was like, hey, you're supposed to treat Looper, even if you think it doesn't make sense, the same way you treat Terminator. You give them the time travel right at the beginning and the rest of the story runs without it. And as YMS says, that doesn't make any fucking sense at all. Looper has the time travel tisms happening throughout it. This It's non-stop. It keeps referencing. The whole plot relies on it. The biggest payoff in the movie is to do with time travel. It, it cannot yeah. be separated the entire time. While Terminator, well, yeah. he's right. You only need the opening and then the rest of it runs without time travel. Mm-hmm. Because right. I remember, like, I think the thing in the looper was the whole, I can remember what you do after you do it, and then they communicate messages. Fuck it. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense, because if you scarred yourself with a message, you grew up with it. And also, the fundamental premise of the film doesn't work. You can't no. kill people in the future, but they killed his wife. And that's so. what made him angry, which is like, <laughs> yeah. wait. And this is the, this is Ryan Johnson's writing. He's, he's gunning for the emotional payoffs, which everybody sh probably should do as, as writers. That's the thing that everyone loves about him. But holy shit, you gotta earn your way there. You can't just, just skip over a bunch of stuff and just be like, I don't know, don't who cares? It's not about science. It's about about fun. Which uh, right, yeah. <laughs> we could we could pr we'll probably get into that as we progress, I imagine. Yeah. I think I'm usually more forgiving with filmmaking than a lot of people I know. Um, because mm -hmm. like I've I come from like I went to film school for four years. I know how hard it is making a movie. Um I, and I, I've, I had seen Rian Johnson in interviews, and he always struck me as a really nice guy. And so yeah, no, that, I think that kind of um, softened the blow for me, where I, you know, I've, I watched Last Jedi. I'm like, eh, he tried. It was all right. You know, I he mean, he tried I, for sure. Like, <laughs> yeah, he definitely tried. Like, you could tell that he was interested well, it was, in making that film. It was just yeah. a few days ago. I was on Twitter arguing that I don't think he did it at all for the money. Really, I think that he did it because he's a creative who had a passion. If you watch the behind the scenes stuff, he seems to be very invested in all of his ideas. I'm okay with that. I just yeah. think he didn't do a good his job. Ideas were just really shit, and they ruined that's, a lot of stuff. That's totally fair. I get that. Yeah. For sure. That movie definitely was not about making money. I I, I, I will <laughs> safely say with confidence yeah. that that's the case. I mean, Disney were happy that it just had lightsabers and the characters and space. That's what they were after, and they got it. So good for them. But the individuals they hire definitely have their own ideas, which, again, is a good thing. It's just that, 
don't know, when you join a franchise, this kind of comes back to us talking about uh, not only uh, RB and the Chief, but community as well, and, the, and, and Simpsons. It's like, when you take over for a thing, you need to learn that shit, because you've got to continue it. You don't just add on to it like Lego. That's not how it works. Right. So on the uh, I'll be in the truth in LA, right? Yeah, that's where we were. So, <laughs> so we, we just we just have all these tangents. We just go. That's how we are. Keep de getting derailed. There's no no worries. I don't mind. Um. So, uh, so my producer contact at Machinima had contacted me saying, "Look, these episodes aren't faring very well," <laughs> and uh, they wanted me to uh just help. They asked, like, can you help us out at all? Like, I realize you're burned out, but, like, can you at least just handle the writing part of it? And I agreed reluctantly, but that was a mistake because I had to keep going what they had established, which was flawed and stupid. And um, I should have just... I should have just argued that we should just, like, kill that season and I would just move on. To I mean, at that point, I still wasn't prepared to take the whole show back on because mm -hmm. I was just I was still burned out because it was just like a week or two after. But uh, I agreed to handle the writing of it, and I didn't do a good job with the writing. And uh, uh, you, you were kind there was... of set up not very well to you know like salvage it. I would say the the base was already flawed. You know what I mean? So it was yeah, probably that was a factor, time. and also yeah, because of that, my heart wasn't in it. But if my heart isn't in something, I should have known better. I should have just not done it, you know, because right. I, like I'm of the mindset now where if you're going to do something like do it 100 percent or just don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't giving it 100 percent there just because there was so, too many flawed elements. But I just I finished I powered through it. I finished the season off and I felt pretty ashamed of it and myself. And uh, so but at that point, I was feeling kind of invigorated enough to like right. take the show back on again there's like a drive to be like you know what it can be good though so uh, that sort of thing yes goes. yes begins. yeah so i thought like i can i can fix this this can still be a good show and you know if i'm doing everything again you know i'm not so burned out anymore and i can get a lot of creative satisfaction in the fact that i'm handling every aspect of it again and the fact is, I did want to do the show again at that point. I was ready to take it back. So I, I took back creative control, complete creative control of the show again. And um, I called it season four. So I basically pretended that Harvey and the Chief in LA didn't exist. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I just, I went ahead and did season four. And some of my best episodes are in that in I that think uh, season. season four was like pivotal because I think you can see the transition into what it eventually became. As a right in that season yeah well I, in the latter half of season four yes. there's a big yeah. uh there's a real i had a kind of a there's a big click in my brain all of a sudden when it came to like writing scripts mm -hmm. like there's one episode i did called night of the evading dead <laughs> yeah i remember that one evading a reference to a particular armor ability in the game anyway mm -hmm. um s s this script was structured where the character, a, uh, a character was in one state at, be at the beginning, but in a different state at the end of the movie. And it, it sounds so like obvious, but when, when you're in the, in the position of being the writer, uh, for some reason, I hadn't come to the conclusion that I could have character development in my scripts right. <laughs> until now, you know? Do, do you think that's tied to the fact could... that it was comedy more so than anything yeah. like the and comedy just naturally like well the character's got to stay the same because that's that's the joke it's these characters dealing with these situations that's a great point i think you're right about that yeah there's something about comedic writing where characters are kind of frozen well look at this like simpsons state. right every character learns something at some point but they're still exactly the same basically throughout the how long is it 35 years or whatever <laughs> they're all the same yeah right yeah so um, I've, I've figured out in that moment that, I don't know, like, uh, cause Chief's character really never changes. And if he did, then the, I think the show would be over. Mm -hmm. So it's he really can't, different. I, and I that's figured be... out that he couldn't change in, in a significant way, but there could be some slight kind of evolution in his character or Arbiter's character or whatever. A lesson could be learned 
Which is actually you know. something I find super interesting about Chief that um, I'm going to vaguely describe something, and I'm pretty sure Fring, you'll be able to pick up who I'm referencing yeah, here. Yeah. But uh, from a different show, I mean. So you have a character mm -hmm. that is specifically one way, but you kind of want to have moments where they're doing specific things, and you're like, but they can't fundamentally because of this, this, this. So how do I, how do I connect their fundamental motivation, which is mostly an evil one, to uh, allowing them to have good person payoffs? And like you, you have to. It, it can be extremely difficult, but you have to motivate Chief by essentially being the lesser of two evils, right? That's usually what it is. He usually commits to doing some kind of action that um, is fundamentally on its own, maybe in isolation, a bad act, but they're doing it in favor of something better or, or to a awful person to prevent them from doing something uh, worse. Which is how we can get him in, into situations where he's almost a hero, but uh, fundamentally still in character. Right. Yes. Um, I think, I think like, Chief, you can see that probably in, like, Season 6, the interesting idea of, like, he's like, well, I don't want Halo to go away, so, like, it's a very selfish reason to do a heroic thing, you know? I like playing Halo, I don't want it to go away, but yet yeah. Chief is such a selfish person that he wouldn't typically put himself in harm, well, harm's way, as far as, you know, online games are concerned, to do something good. Well, I think but it's... Yeah, whereas Arbiter has many reasons to make because he's a thoughtful person, so it's it's different. Like it's a he has a different reason to do good things. And it always came across to me as a stakes thing as well. When when Halo as a whole is at risk, uh, the little jabs and swear words and and awful uh, attitudes from Chief are almost endearing because it's right now that's just fun because because we're actually trying to do something really important. But when everything scales back down and he and Arbiter are just gonna have a game online and he's being a dick to someone, it's kind of like hey. Don't be so, like, assholey. come on. That sort of thing. It's really interesting how it can change speed, like, when we're in the thick of a big fight against a big enemy trying to save the world, and he's doing the exact same stuff he's always done, we're just like, ah, that old chief. Good stuff. <laughs> but, right. But then when yeah. everything else has calmed down, we're like, he's kind of an ass, I don't like him. <laughs> but, um, I think in terms of the idea of, like, making the show serialized, I'm sure, like, I listened to a director's commentary that you did where you mentioned it, and it just makes sense to me, the whole idea of, like, if Arbiter is a thoughtful, intelligent person who is stuck in the same place day in, day out, playing Halo, like, surely that's got to be, like, surely he's not content with that, right? Like, yes. surely this isn't, he's not happy with his life. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I realized that that kind of, that didn't make sense. Like, why would someone as smart as he is be satisfied with the state of his life? You know, just and, and how could he possibly spend that much time with someone who he could never be friends with? <laughs> it's like, how do you do that? Yeah, so like he started getting depressed, which was a reflection of my own depression that I dealt with in my own life, right? And a, a lot of uh, the writing that I did as the show went on was kind of therapeutic in a way, you know, because I was dealing with my own thoughts about life and feeling like shit and. And I would kind of explore those ideas through the toys, you know, and that 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 delighted some people. It pissed off a lot of people. I think yeah, it polarized naturally. a lot of people in that moment. Well, but I, I don't I don't think the show ever jumped the shark. I don't though, think so personally. Because it was always about like online relationships with people. Like encountering people online and like various personalities. And what I did with like season five and then onward is that I would take one character and just focus on them for, for like the whole season rather than just one episode. And I was like, I th this is an opportunity to kind of really explore a single character or a, a batch of characters. Um, but anyway, so the, so I did, I worked on season four and, and then I, I, all of a sudden became much more serious about screenwriting. And then I, I bought a bunch of books on it. And I really, um, I was like, I was just kind of fucking around before, <laughs> like, yeah, just like writing kind of stream of consciousness, <clears throat> almost like, this is funny. This is funny. Not really thinking about like book ending stories or foreshadowing or using plot devices in any uh, sophisticated kind of way. Um, but I, I wanted to, I wanted to do that. And uh, and I wrote. I wanted to get good good at it, so I bought all, a bunch of books, and uh, I bought like the the Sid Field books, you know, how you know how to be a screenwriter and yeah, all this yeah, stuff. And, 
Right. Yeah. I bought, he, I think he wrote three books. I bought all of those, read them all. And, uh, you feel I started... that they helped? Oh yeah, definitely. And I took structure a lot more seriously mm -hmm. and I had like whiteboards. I did the index card thing where I would, you know, I would always have three acts and then, ah, yeah, <laughs> so, would... you know, it's, it's all useful, like uh framing for, for how you're going to fit your ideas into something and make them full. Right. Um, what uh? What, what do you think would be like any particular things you really felt like? Oh, this is making it all work now. This particular thing. Um. When I st I think I was always kind of adhering to the three act structure, like subconsciously, but now at this point I was very aware of it, and it helped the outlining process a lot. Mm -hmm. And I st I still I still do the exact same thing. I don't do the whiteboards and index cards because it's just kind of a pain in the ass to be honest it's quicker to just do it in notepad <laughs> but uh, i'll write like act one act two act three and then i'll indent that and then i'll list in three word beats what are like the the broadest dramatic blocks within those acts right and it's usually can be it's like a switch or a, a delivery of a key piece of information or something you know it's like this scene this character does this or this character says this and it's like a power switch that leads into the next scene organically mm -hmm. do you and tend so, to have like, low points at the end of your second act yes <laughs> <laughs> it's, yes it's effective you know for the most part yeah oh, you don't even make a sense. low point or a crisis or whatever you want to call it it's just things reach a boiling point right mm -hmm. yeah and so i still i still go by that same pattern to when I'm writing episodes today, and I did back then, I started doing that, and it really helped me. Like I, th there's, I think people who don't know about screenwriting and story structure, they think that it's confining to have to adhere to a three act structure, but I find that it maximizes your ability to tell a, a dramatic, to like, to tell a, a dramatic story and uh, inflict an emotion on people. Like the, Would you the, say that limitations can uh, really, really inspire creativity? Yes. Yeah, My exactly. God. Hmm. Yeah. Well, have you ever found when working with that sort of thing, though, that you, you're like, damn, I kind of want, want a fourth act to erupt here. Can I make it work? Or has it always worked out uh, with three? No, it's always worked out with three for me. I remember somebody DM'd me. Somebody sent me a hostile Twitter DM. And they were like... Uh, you keep talking about how the third act is so fucking great. I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, he said, uh, you should definitely read this book. And it was a link to a book. It was called The Hulk's Guide to Screenwriting. And the whole thing was written in all caps, which I thought That's was incredibly obnoxious. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Because the joke is he's the Hulk and he's angry and he, therefore he writes in all caps. Get it? Anyway, so I was reading this book and the book was saying that you could have as many act breaks in a story as you want and the the idea of adhering to just three is limiting the potential of your story and i don't think i agree with that i don't what, agree with yeah yeah no. i'm not sure i feel like it's not that it can't work in theory i just feel like you're gonna have to really really be good at trying to make it all gel together I bet most people would try that and it would come out really, really strange. Right. So what the three-act structure represents to me is the pattern of birth, death, and rebirth that mm -hmm. is so intrinsic to existence. You, can, there's, you can't really get around it or refine it any more than what it is. And I think you, you can have as many act breaks in a story as you want, but they're all going to fall under a broad three-act paradigm. Well, you know. it's um. I think generally the way that acts are often defined is the door closes and the protagonist now must continue on this path. The way that they can't go back anymore, like they're forced onto the rail. So like, you know, first act, inciting event, main character is now locked into a situation that they have to resolve. And then the second act generally is the whole idea of the door has now closed and then forces them, like it forces them to come to some sort of revelation that will now allow them to win. It's so almost the whole idea of everything starts off simple and they're cool. First act, door closes, and now the character is forced to deal with a situation they're unfamiliar with. They approach it from their old 
point of view and then they lose and they change their point of view and then they win and that's like the simplest effective story i guess so but but there's nothing about that that limits the amount of times that you can force a character into a situation they have to get out of you know what i mean it's like it's just like a broad categorization precisely i think you hit the nail on the head it's a point of no return right mm -hmm. and the the three act thing is it's just it's like you you come across a cave you go in the cave and kill the monster and come out of the cave there's there's your three acts you know it's like mm -hmm. i don't that's that goes back to like the dawn of man you know it's like the mm -hmm. eternal story the and, and i'm assuming you can't this applies to seasons for you, right? Not necessarily individual episodes and the season as a whole. Both. Yeah. So when it, when I moved on to season five, that was when I switched to ser a serialized format. Mm -hmm. And not only did I structure the season in three acts, but I structured each episode in three acts as well. Um, mm -hmm. There just obviously wasn't as much of a focus on buttoning things up at the end of each episode. But I would definitely try to button things up at the end of the season. Addiction. And yeah. yeah. So I think the for season five, it was like the first three episodes were act one of the season as a whole. And then the middle six episodes, five or six episodes were act two. And then the last two or three episodes were act three. And so now and, I uh, wanna I was gonna bring up the obvious question of like with Serialization comes, stories that are longer comes, more focus on drama rather than comedy comes, the confusion or even concerns that like the format you're using does not lend itself rule wise very well to stories, as in you're limited by game mechanics. And uh, how how is that in terms of an approach? Because you you know you want to to have stakes, you need rules. But sometimes game rules don't match the kind of rules you're trying to create in your, you know, dramatization of the events happening. The the standard ones being um, like how everyone talks to each other as they as they meet up with each other in the game, uh, versus most yes. people wouldn't wouldn't be doing that in in the game really when playing. They'd be in parties or they wouldn't be talking at all that sort of thing. Yes, exactly. So yeah, there's some there's some license that I take personally in like making. You're you're right. People don't talk like that online. I mean, the the specific dialogue I don't think is unnatural, but just the way the the format in which people talk. Oh well, it's other, it? yeah. This it's goes the same like, for a lot of content in media, like an unspoken rules where we all have to go. Like, I guess that's that's how that works. Then that's how that you know it happens in sci-fi and fantasy all the time in terms of that's how that. But when they're chasing. Um, uh, I forget his name. Uh, villain from season five. Why am I? Ah, uh, Trent. Yeah. Well, the, the, Trent. The, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're chasing him, and he like gets into a um, it's a hornet, right? My Halo knowledge is <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and he does. He escapes yeah. into the distance, and it's like he's moving servers when he goes to the edge of a map. I guess like that's just how yes. that works. You're like, right, all right, exactly. that's how that works. <laughs> like, yeah. In my mind, it's he's navigating to a point in the map where no players will engage him and he has time to like go into his start menu and quit the game it's kind of stupid i know it is i mean that makes sense but i guess like the, it, you, know, you don't want to quit mid game in case they can frag you before you right can do it. i was avoiding being fragged stupid. right so, sorry say that again i was like i i fringy's just trying to drag you down i'll agree with you and say it's stupid <laughs> 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 yeah um Yes. So I I agree there's there's things about the plot that are kind of dumb, but um I th Oh, well, I, I was I saying that it was that's what you have no choice though. This isn't an accident of your writing. This is this is what your tools are. You actually can't do anything about this. Like you have to right. mold the world around your writing as best you can. Yes, exactly. And that's uh, what I liked about Arby and the Chief more than my older shows is that the game is treated as a game. Like the they you know the 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 toys in the room that's like real life and then they log onto the game, and the the way the game operates to a degree is incorporated into the story. Like with one life remaining in hard justice, that's treated as like the real world, and right, that's part of why it's so cringy to me. Stuff. Yeah, it's <laughs> why is everybody wearing armor? It's just dumb. Like it's so <laughs> dumb to look at, and. uh 
But I, I always liked how Arby and the Chief treats the game as a game, even though, like you were saying, I take some license in how in the format of how people talk and stuff. And um, but I think it worked still to a degree, yeah. and I like I it's all in service of certain themes, and you know, exploring the headspaces of certain characters, and you know, my own feelings, you know, emotions that I was going through growing up in my twenties. Yeah. Well, it was the character and, work that got me. It wasn't the adherence to Halo as a video game mechanically. It, like I was like, uh, I mean, I, I can take it or leave it. But uh, the right, yeah, whatever you know, how everyone was dealing with all the different situations it came up with. Like, I love the idea of a of a group of in game, almost like terrorists trying to take it all down in in response to tosses, which is absurd. But whatever, <laughs> like I, right. I, I can well, believe it. I'm, it's not even that detached from reality. There's a group called Lizard Squad. That uh, took down uh, Xbox yeah, the, Live well, and Sony's that. network. Mm. Yeah, so a group of people can come together and attack, you know, networks and yeah. bring them down, either for financial gain or just to disrupt, you know, the status quo or whatever. And you the know, same just, kind of just for fun. To, uh, it, like it also applies to the whole uh, wedding crash thing. I mean, there's precedent for it was that World of Warcraft. Um, you know, where they had the funeral yeah. in the game and then a bunch of, because of course somebody was going to do that, you know, like it's the internet, so there's always like precedent for people behaving in, in the ways that uh, they do on, on the show, like, because it happens in real life, like people do these things, people take down online networks, people, you know, like crash video game you know, funerals and weddings I'm really glad you brought that up because I forgot about that. That that is one of the main reasons I season five is the way it is is because of that wow funeral, and I th I thought that was so fascinating. That yeah, it is. yeah. like you, you, it's a video game, but people are gathering in this digital space as if it's a serious, mournful thing, even though it's a bunch of avatars fucking jumping around and. I think you have People characters discuss space. that, right? In the season, there are, I, I think yeah. there are conversations just marveling on this actually having happened is insane. <laughs> right, yeah. So people are having these very monumental kind of events that should happen in a real space. Or, you know, I've, I've heard of people getting married in Halo or whatever. It's like, it's actually happened. And I'm indifferent to it. Like, if people want to do that, that's fine. I just think it's yeah. kind of... There's something about it that's just oh, it, it's cringy silly. shit. But you know, whatever. Yeah. If that's what you, if if that's yeah. what pleases the misses, then I guess that's what you're doing. Yeah, and it is something that happens. So like, what I was doing, if people said it was my plot was stupid or or whatever, I could at least say, well, this did actually happen. It's not that divorced from what people actually do. Um, so the the wow thing really fascinated me, and then you know it got raided. That that was the other factor that motivated. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't just the funeral; it was the fact that it got invaded by a bunch of people and trolled. And it's like, what were you expecting? You know, mm -hmm. like this this was bound to happen. It's it's an online competitive play space, and you're just hoping that nobody comes in and ruins it. Well, yeah, because <laughs> all, all you're asking for the rules is social etiquette, but you're in an environment in which yeah. social etiquette is irrelevant because there are no consequences. We, we, we were talking about the yeah. forbidden thing, right? Like, you're getting told you have to behave and you have to respect it. It's like, no. <laughs> That's a warning. Mm -hmm. and no, it's, yeah. yeah. I don't like... I have to re respect real space. To hell with that. Right. What's well, the whole idea? Yeah, and then if you want to make video game police like tosses, it's never going to work because <laughs> you can't do anything yep. to them. Which is also a real fucking thing. If you look up bully yeah, hunters, oh, I don't oh know yeah, 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 that. Yeah. Oh yes, I have. Rags got a video oh, yeah. on bully hunters. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. I'm which not even sure they ever it's... thought it would work. It's such a bizarre <laughs> concept. It could never work. Video game police. Yes. It's it's dumb, right? But like the, this is I like making fun of this kind of stuff and kind of illustrating it in a, in my plots, right? And uh, but uh, before I get into much detail on season five, I just want to say I ended season four with an episode called "The Spider." Yes, uh, yeah. and I thought that's still one of the best episodes ever made. And because I really and like Craig. it was at that point where I realized. Oh, I've got a strong theme here. And then I, I all of a sudden I realized the importance of theme and how it holds everything together. 
-hmm. And then I, I think, I think I was aware of the the power of thematic subconsciously throughout like writing, but mm -hmm. now I became really hyper aware of it. And oh I was yeah, like, dude, it's I'm, it's I'm, great, but it's it's like a lot of people, I guess, foolishly learn just like just having one. That's what you got to do. It's like it was execution. It's always about execution, right? And so I I really I was really pleased with how that episode turned out. Where at the beginning of the episode, Arbiter's terrified of spiders, and at the end of it, he's best friends with a spider. <laughs> he becomes friends with it, mm -hmm. and uh, and then it it ends. They're playing Majora's Mask, and the last shot is is uh link opening a chest and getting 100 rupees and it cuts the credits right there i just thought that worked really well because it's like a parallel of like going into the dark tunnel that's scary and then you get the reward at the end of it you know in this <laughs> case it's the friendship with something that he would never thought in a million years he'd be friends with. It's just funny because I'm flashing forward to how <laughs> some of these stories go <laughs> and I'm like oh man yeah I mean yes but oh man yeah right and there's also uh there's a literal spider in the hallway in that that part of Majora's Mask I'm talking about I don't know if you guys played Majora's Mask but there's uh once you get the bomber's notebook and you go underground it's a tunnel with a spider at the end of it and at the beginning of the episode Arbiter doesn't want to go down the tunnel because there's a spider at the end. Mm -hmm. That was, I, I actually had a scare of spiders and a, a scare of the spiders in Zelda. Like, that was always well, a very, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's a reason to be afraid of spiders up in North America, but uh, down <laughs> here, there's plenty of reasons. To oh, be I, you guys are having a hell of a time spiders. with spiders down there. I heard about like well, the fires, and then the fires yeah. created a, a habitable environment for a shitload of spire, spiders. Spiders oh. all of a sudden, spiders, well, they have I mean, fire I mean, spiders. <laughs> the fire bread, like, the spiders. It's like World of Warcraft. Yeah. They're just like fuck yeah. it, spiders, but fire, fire spiders. spiders. Right. Well. <laughs> I mean that's that's the thing. Like the fires got rid of all the koalas, but then in their place are all the shit ones that you know the shitty animals that we don't like because you know we got our cuddly critters who are also venomous, like platypuses. Um, but then and then uh, the spiders that you have a lot of reason. Like I, I the list of spiders here in this country that are very dangerous <laughs> and not <laughs> only dangerous but just are common in households in dark corners. Um, fortunately, I'm, I don't live in Sydney, but Funner Web Spider is a nice, fun one that stands up on its back legs and like flares its uh, its um, uh, fangs in the air. So it's like posturing. This is how bold these spiders are. That <laughs> sounds like... fucking terrifying. Oh, they're, they're horrifying, and, and yeah. they're big how did enough. It, how did it happen? How did Australia end up with all these things? <laughs> well, I think. Uh, I think... I think Jay once described Australia as a beta test, like God's beta test when he was creating the world. <laughs> trying Listen, to figure out after, what he could do. Everything goes there after first. After Noah's Ark landed wherever the fuck, and Noah got all the weird animals and said, all right, y'all need to go just, y'all need On to this go island. somewhere else. <laughs> well, I think... Find uh, an I island think... or something, because you can't hang out here with the rest of us. Well, the cool I'm animals don't want you anywhere near them. <laughs> the natural explanation for a lot of this is that, um... When the when all of the continents starting splitting apart, the the ecosystems began to form independently. I mean, it was only really humans who decided to walk between these places, but the animals largely stuck to themselves. And so, uh, you know, that's the reason why Australia is the only place that has marsupials, and it's the reason why you know, like Europe is the place that had rabbits and um and and wolves and stuff like that. Um, but Australia is this weird one because it's really not connected to any of the other continents in any significant way. So it basically developed all on its own. Unless, of course, you buy into the conspiracy theory that Australia is actually in South America and it's a big lie made up. No, no, <laughs> no, no. Australia is not real. Yeah, I was going to say, we know it's not real. Uh, it's obvious. I've seen the alleged photos of Australia. Obviously fake. No one would ever make it that over the top. Like we're not we're not cool yeah. with lies on this podcast, but we entertain yours. We're just like yeah, yeah. they'd make it a little more believable if it was Seven actually foot real. Tall jumping rats that have pouches. I mean, what is this? Yeah, yeah. it's weird. Like, <laughs> um, so it's someone said it broke off from Pangaea first, and everything got hyper competitive there. 
<laughs> is that? <laughs> I was gonna say Australia like Australia is the Xbox Live of the. Yeah, Xbox. I love the idea that all of the animals had to just keep out evolving each other because they kept <laughs> <laughs> killing each other. Yeah. Part of the thing is, I always have difficulty. I just pull up a map of Pan Pangaea or Pangaea. I think it's what it's called, and. I like how they have a map that shows where all of the countries are, and and yeah, you can see like Africa. Yeah, it's cool. And, and Africa Australia isn't a country, is... but I get what you're saying. Oh yeah, no, I know that's stupid. Like, <laughs> I was. The, the I don't think Africa is stupid. Like, that's fucked up, dude. But yeah, okay. Yeah, I love. I personally love Africa. But yeah, Australia looks like it's right at the bottom, even lower than Antarctica, and then you know they all split off. It's um. It's yeah, I, I think that's how the ecosystems form because really there's an, there's no explanation. Like the animals here are, are weird. I like them a lot, but I mean koalas are weird, man. Like there's not really you know koalas, opossums, platypuses are very weird animals. Um, echidnas. There's nothing. Opossums really are like the it. only marsupials we've got over here. Are possums marsupials like your so. possums? Are they? Hold on, we we need to. This is something we need to know. Possums, <laughs> I, um, I, you guys I've heard if, that they are. I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you mind if I just take a few minutes to go to the bathroom? I'll be go right back. for I'm it. Sorry. No okay. Problem. All right. Thanks. Oh, we're, yeah, gonna, uh, we're gonna let John do it. Most of the time, we oh, prevent yeah. people from peeing on EFAP. Oh, that yeah, is a rule. Yeah, are marsupials. Um, they are indeed marsupials. Awesome. They're nifty looking. I've seen hey, a picture of a Virginia opossum. There are. I mean, do you have a thing like possums like to crawl around in people's roofs? That's kind of like. <laughs> well, that's thing. just a lot of. It's just a lot of animals do. It's just a place for them. You know. Oh, yeah, like raccoons, right? Bringing up spiders, by the way. If you had like a, a unethical experiment where a child is brought up without seeing a single animal in their entire life, all the way up till they're like age twenty, and then you present them a spider, a rather large one, I feel like they'd be afraid of it, right? Uh, I think that spiders have a lot of reasons to be afraid. They don't really have a, f and I think I think there's a reason why even bears, like bears, are not friendly animals depending on which species they are. But yet people get teddy bears. It's like why it's it's really easy to I guess because they're anthropomorphize. Very... Yeah, and, think, and they're friend. Really well, easy to anthropomorphize <laughs> mammals like mammals. Well, like the closer they are looking to us, the more we're like, yeah, they're probably friendly. Yeah, like it's the reason why a lizard is less scary than a snake because it's still got four limbs, you know. It's 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 still got a. Uh, whereas a snake, it might have a face, but you know, it slithers around. Like it's 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 the same reason that people are afraid of those scary ass looking fish at the bottom of the ocean. God, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're horrifying. They're like from your nightmare. They're like Cthulhu monsters. Yeah, um, about spiders. Though, I think you're right because first of all. Eight legs. You're like, why the fuck did you do that many legs? <laughs> like, what's going on there? The fact that it's such an absurd design, as in it's this blob in the middle, and then all the eight legs come around it, and you're just like, that's that's some alien shit right there. And then the fact that they're yeah. they're dark creatures and they move fast and they stick to corners. You're just like, mm. and they crawl up walls. You know, that's a <laughs> kind of and yeah, and they're fast funny. as well in their own sort of you know yeah. in relation to their size, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole idea of like, you know, ants are not very scary because they're small, but ants close up are terrifying. Oh yeah, I remember, yeah. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, man. They they, they have to run away well, from an ant yeah. at one point, right? And there's a reason why she lob, you know, it's just like a big version of a scary thing already, you know? Like, just, it, it's scary. Spiders are scary animals. <laughs> Mola doesn't um, like dark creatures. <laughs> 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 It was only a matter of time until the truth came out. Yep, I should have said I just hate black creatures. That would have gone over better. The funny thing is, <laughs> I, always, I, always, I always tell this story about, like, I just, I just like telling people that platypuses are incredibly dangerous because, you know, platypuses are really cool, nifty-looking animals. You're like, ah, oh, platypus is cute. And then you find out that platypuses have pincers that are so venomous that if you're stung, the pain is so intense that morphine will not relieve it for, like, four months. It's just like, oh, oh no. Is that the kind of thing then that no. you say you were stung in the arm, people would opt to have it chopped off, or? Well, your is that... arm is gonna balloon. Your arm is basically never gonna work again. That's how powerful the venom, or, uh, I'm not sure if it's venom or if it's like a toxin, but yeah, uh, if you see a platypus and it stings you, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. More so than if you got stung by a snake, or bitten by a snake, rather. Like, 
you, you'd actually be better off. Like, a brown snake will kill you. Like, a platypus isn't going to kill you, but it's going to cause a lot more irreparable damage to you. So, um... And there are anti-venoms for, for snake poison. There are no anti-venoms for platypus stings. <laughs> so, if you ever see one, don't touch it. If I ever see one, I promise you I will not touch it. <laughs> Just for you, Fringy. If I ever come across a, uh, ever come across a platypus, nope. Mm -hmm. Well, platypuses are actually really... Oh, my favorite part about platypuses is they are, they are the chattest animals in the animal kingdom. Um, like, platypuses um, are very territorial. They kill basically any man that comes into their domain, and so platypuses... Uh, women outnumber platypuses 10 to 1. So there are no incels in the platypus world. Me. <laughs> you know, all platypuses are the chads. And they're getting all the Stacys. And more than one. I like how Stacy is just the word to describe, like, <laughs> attractive woman. You're a Stacy. And then... <laughs> it's so funny that Karen is what it is. I don't know. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to change the name of our suit lady um, in Spider-Man. Because she's called well, she wasn't even she wasn't even in Far From Home, was she? So... She wasn't because I guess they could because it was Jennifer Connelly. That's probably then of course, like an expensive voice role to get. Uh, you also got didn't didn't he talk to did he talk to Friday at all? He talked to uh Edith. Edith, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Edith wasn't as human like as Karen. Anyway, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm back. I'm back now. Um, we're up to right. Five. So. Uh, yeah, we were talking about, I was just finishing talking about season four and how I started taking screenwriting and plot devices seriously. And, and thematic uh, unity. Yes. Yes, exactly. And um, so when I was doing a fifth season, um, I was really heavily inspired by uh, not just Breaking Bad, but The Sopranos and Dexter. And there was a bunch of like serialized shows I was super into. And I realized... I was so compelled by them because they were serialized. And mm -hmm. um, I was just like, wow, what happens next? I got to watch the next one. Because like, for the most part, before that, I was just watching shows where everything resets by the end of the episode. And it's, it's, that's okay. Well, I remember, but, um, do you remember the Family Guy episode where he loses his job, uh, uh, wherever it is, and then at the end they comment on it like, uh, isn't aren't things supposed to feel kind of normal at the end of an ep? Uh, I think they say at the end of a day to try and you know they're trying to be meta, and it's like but you didn't get I, your job back, and he's like yeah, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I oh. think I know I know the exact episode you're talking about. Yeah, that's funny. I like that because uh, at the same time, you conversely, Mr. Burns uh, loses all his money in an episode, uh, becomes like a humanitarian, and then goes back to being an evil billionaire in twenty minutes. Like, they right. put him on a huge arc, all that takes place in that amount of time, and it's just like, yep, gotta get back to the wall. <laughs> and the benefit of that is you can watch all of them out of order then. You can just be like, yeah, whatever, this, it all makes sense, all following, but if you do serialize and you're like, whoa, 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 don't spoil it for me, and I gotta start episode one. Yes, there's pros and cons, definitely, to both. Um, but I, I found myself much more compelled by the serialized format. I, whenever, whenever it would cut to credits, it's like, oh god, I gotta put on the next one. And I wanted to, I wanted to have that feeling for my show. I wanted to see if I could do it. You know, I just, I wanted to challenge myself with a new kind of format. And, and then I, I decided, okay, I got to build this season around one big event. And then, you know, of like I said before, I was inspired by the wow funeral thing. I'm like, what if, what if? And also the fact that uh, the wedding episode in season three was a fan favorite. And so I was yeah. like, okay, well, what if I do a wedding again, but just on a bigger scale and the whole season would revolve around it and build up to it. And it started with like a flash forward. So I was experimenting with nonlinear storytelling for the first time. <gasps> My God. Which, which I really liked as well. You, you're um, talking about sort of like, forward yeah, flash forward. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but not necessarily just like flashing forward in the cold open. Like I, I, I was also just like, the idea of just jumping around in the story, like at any point, but um, there's like uh, there being a purpose to it. Have you, you seen Prestige? I mean? Uh, yes. That is yeah. I, love, I like so, that movie. 
on the first watch through, many people can be utterly confused because they're like, you jump from three different timelines and different pieces, and you get flashbacks and forwards and characters remembering or you know recanting or even predicting whatever. You just there's a lot to absorb and keep track of. Yes, it, yeah, it, it was a bit of a confusing watch the first time I saw it. Yeah, but I remember I liked it a lot, and I, I didn't I didn't do a lot of that in my show. Like the the jumping around that I would do was just basically at the beginning of some episodes i would do a flash forward as like a cold open and then i would jump back to the present for the beginning of act one that's when i, I kind of changed my formula up a bit as well so like i would have a teaser and then act one act two act three for each episode mm -hmm. and um so i did season five and i had uh yeah the villain was trent who isn't a very good villain, I don't think, in retrospect. He's not very well fleshed He's a bit out. of um, an everyman bad guy. He seems like yeah. a very normal bad person. Yes. So I didn't put that much thought into the antagonist side of it. It's so um, funny how that happens with a lot of um, stories as they progress. The it only, You could argue it starts out rocky, and then the protagonists are sorted, the structure is sorted, and it's like, oh shit, what about villains? Because if you look at the MCU, <laughs> villains were weak for a very long time, and they still haven't necessarily yeah, fixed lame. it yet. Because yes, most agree. people would agree that you got Vulture, Thanos, Zemo. Zemo. <laughs> like, yeah. um, um, Loki, but Loki, Loki doesn't have yeah. a villain anymore, you know? He's almost transitioned out of that role and like basically everyone's favorites are all from like you know the the, onwards, the late yeah. teens onwards in terms of the amount of films that have come out it's insane it's just uh yeah because they, what they yep. used to do and this is a trope that people pick on but it's, it's kind of just true if you watch it they take the hero and they make a version of them that's just evil that's usually what they end up fighting it's like iron man fights the bigger iron man thor fights <laughs> his evil uh norse oh, brother yeah. Hulk fights bigger Hulk, yeah, and it's uh, even in Iron Man too. He's like he's fighting because he's in an Iron Man suit with whips, whiplash, and he's just like, eh, I don't, know, I don't care. <laughs> this is like just beat him. You have right. to go back to when like the earlier superhero movies. Like the only good villain I can really think of is Doc Ock from Spider Man Two. Uh, Magneto yes. is another good one. Yeah, yeah Magneto. Yeah. They had Magneto lots to work with with Magneto really well. from the comics because it's just. Such a thorough character, I'd say, in terms of motivations, is very, very clear. You yeah. could very much build him up. Um, you know, Greek Goblin was uh, campy as fuck in Spider-Man One, but I still think he was yeah. strong compared to yeah, a lot of I, early yeah. MCU villains. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, Green Goblin's better than. Yeah, um, he's something of a villain than, himself. What was, uh, <laughs> Red Skull. Uh, Oof. Yeah. Okay. You got me there. It's like that's not Captain America, but evil. It's like what well, kind of is because he's he's. He's got all the super soldier He's benefits, right, doesn't he? America. Yeah, actually, He's sorry, right. I'm wrong. He is Captain America, but evil. He has all. He had the serum, and it went wrong. It gave him all of the abilities, but it made him look ugly. That was the point. <laughs> it's like, oh no. Oh right. So yeah, it applies to all of them. Um, and then of course, Avengers is an, is again we're 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 relying on because Loki was the only one out of the early ones that people were like, He's kind of cool. Like Lo Loki's a character. You know. Right. <laughs> And then, um, and then in phase three, it was, um, uh, what was his name? Killian? Yeah. Oh, uh, God. Oof. <laughs> One of the and worst, Killian. Thor, you did, you did, and then we got you didn't Which talk to he me. Again? He's the, he, exactly. Uh, He's the one who, um, uh, <laughs> wanted to talk to Iron Man. And he was like, Tony, uh, meet me on the roof. And he, well, he says, like, I'll meet you on the roof. And then he doesn't show up, and he's hated him oh, ever since. Oh, Guy Pearce. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he missed an appointment, and he hates him. And it makes it even worse when it's like, why have you captured Gwyneth Paltrow and Pepper Potts? Why? And, he's, and she's like, oh, I'm your trophy, aren't I? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god. And this is so far Man. into the MCU, it's like, guys! And you, you'd think to yourself, maybe it's like, oh, maybe they were focused on other stuff. It's like, no, they had a really good villain in the palm of their hand in that film, and they ruined it. <laughs> And it's, yeah. pe people, have, people are often like, oh, you're obsessed with the comics if you wanted the other bad, uh, sorry, Mandarin. And I'm like, I didn't even read the comics. I like, like I, I like Ben Kingsley. I like the concept of a character that's mm -hmm. using magic that wants to fight Tony Stark, who probably doesn't believe in magic, let alone uses it whatsoever. It's like, this is great. Yeah. I have issues with Iron Man 3. <laughs> Just... <laughs> yeah. And then who we have after that? We had, um, the gob... Oh wait, no, it was the elf. That's right. The, the oh, elf. what's his name? Malekith. Malekith, Malekith yeah. I think. Yeah. Malekith. Great name. 
Um, but, uh, to know what happened but, with. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, that's how you do. Have... You, you name your villain. It's got to be Mal something. Mal. Yeah. Maliciousness, <laughs> man. Malevolent, man. Malus is the last. And then, uh, and then it was Robert Redford's guy and Winter Soldier. He was all right. He was all right. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then we had um, uh, Ronan, who was yeah, <laughs> just evil bad. That was that was the biggest criticism of Guardians of the Galaxy One. Is like your bad guy is just bad guy. And you're like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, he had scary man. makeup. That was his character. And that's yeah. I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's like a lot of the time when you when someone's trying to fix up everything, they'll be like, ah, the villain can just you know be the obstacle, and it's like, nah, the villain needs to be a character. Make him a character. Make them yeah. someone. They're the protagonist of their story. I don't think it's any surprise that the strongest films in the MCU have the strongest villains: Vulture, Thanos, Zemo. They're all really good foils. Remember right. Ultron. Yeah, well, I was, we were about to get to Ultron. Evil Iron Man, sort of. Except he forgets that he's uploaded himself into the internet, so he's able to be defeated. I wish he was evil was Iron Man. Like, they could have worked with that. Make him just, you know, have the same values, but, uh, I guess corrupt them into evil-tisms. I think that's what they wanted to do, but it just didn't really play out. No, it did not. No. And then he decided, I'm gonna drop a meteor <laughs> on Earth. And I'm not going to hedge my bets. I'm not going to put even one robot, like, in, I don't know, Russia somewhere so that I can upload myself to the internet again at any point. God, that was that such is a insanely stupid. stupid. He's so I don't dumb. know about you, but if I had robot horcruxes around, I would, they'd just be all over the place. I would ne you'd never find yeah. them. All. Not only would I send like one to, like, every single country, everywhere, I would also put several in caves, distant caves, <laughs> like, just, yeah. like, stay there. <laughs> Wait until and, I call like, you. You know, Ultron seems to forget that he is all of the robots, so he has one badass Ultron, and then he never creates a bunch of other pretty good Ultrons, too. Why did he mm -hmm. just He also destroyed he, one of himself. He destroyed one of Just to be He's like, like oh, lol, you... Black Widow, you spooked. It's like, what are you, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's a valuable... Why does he create so many crappy ult? Like he would be better off just making six or seven really good Ultrons. Like, because I mean, you kill Black Widow pretty easily if you just had one really good. Ult Why didn't he kill Black Widow? Oh yeah, he wanted her to see his work. <laughs> He's lonely, so he didn't kill his main enemy just to take her back so that she could see his work. What a stupid character. <laughs> It's a shame that movie didn't work because, like, to be honest, I I kind of liked how Ultron, like, because he was built by Stark, he became this amalgamation of all the worst parts of his personality. See, that is what and I yeah. want, and I just don't think they managed to get there. Like, no, it wasn't executed that well. You have like the scene where he lands and he's like, "Ah, oh, kid, you're gonna give your father a, 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 you're gonna make me cry or something like that." And it's like. Oh right, that's what they're going for. That he's almost like a father to Ultron, and the Ultron has, and it's like, what? Ah, oh, so much potential. Why? Why couldn't? Why? Right. Well, yeah, like evil, evil robot that Tony Stark makes to save the world, who has a warped perception of how to save the world. Is that's a cool idea, but and I mean, it's almost unfair. I kind of feel bad for Joss Whedon. He's has two movies that people shit on him for that he, a lot okay, of it he had wait. no control over. So, someone's calling this out in chat. Did you guys forget that Vision used the Mind Stone to lock him into his body? Yeah, that's stupid. We're, you're misrepresenting that's the film. Yeah, so we think that's extremely stupid. Extremely. How do you even do this? How do you lock someone out of the internet? That's not possible. If you had transferred <laughs> yeah. Ultron... Like if, you, if you transfer Ultron to a USB, right? And then, USB, that's it. And, and then uh, Vision does his thing. Has Vision prevented the USB's copy of Vision uh, Ultron to get back onto the internet? Are you kidding me? And no. Also, like, Stupid. How, how is... That doesn't... How could you possibly like... pull Ultron out of the internet? That doesn't make any sense. And also, does that mean Ultron's that Ultron... has been cancelled because like, of his old... Ultron... <laughs> he, has, he has, like, a Wi-Fi router in each of the robots or something? Like, like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, though, transfer him to a hard drive, disconnect it from the internet, and then ah, Vision does also, his thing, it wouldn't have affected that hard drive, now would it? Also, whoever said that, they had to destroy all the robots because none of them could leave. Yeah. Because if they left, they could get back onto the internet. Your argument is wrong, you should feel bad. 
Yeah. <laughs> but like, like I said, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still hold on to this point here. Ultron uploads himself to the internet. He then infects himself into every piece of technology that was ever connected to the internet. Now, with how much every human is pulling out and putting in USBs, Ultron is still out there. He is still. He's waiting. Ultron. He's waiting for that guy to put that USB in to watch Pirates of the Caribbean three again, and it's going to jump right onto the internet and spread everywhere all over again. <laughs> it's basically yeah. It's never going away. Ultron is like yeah. He's 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 here forever. They should. And see, they they said I don't know how this stone works. That's just how it works. Like bullshit. You can't just say that's how it fucking works. The internet. <laughs> I like. It. The Mind Stone is compatible with like USB C, I guess. Like the Mind it was, Stone. It was. It was over the that second they said he got into the internet. It was over. I w You can't. You just can't. You, you, ha you have to like one robot get away and then I... have it be that he needs to. They should the have robot. said something along the lines of only the positronic brain within that unit is sophisticated enough to hold his consciousness or something like that, <laughs> right? So you couldn't just be yeah. like, oh yeah, he's got a YouTube account now. It's just one. Well, <laughs> It's such a stupid movie. Like, God damn. Yeah, but I want to I want to clarify. That's not like our only issue with that film. Is this? No, that, that's I, okay. And I'm someone. I'm a big fan of Joss Whedon's work, and I really like the Avengers and I like the MCU. But God damn, that movie has so many writing problems. Holy shit! And um, uh, we, it's just a matter. The film are, is a stepping stone, and that's why it got destroyed. It was supposed to set up a whole I bunch mean. of other movies. Civil War right. is a much easier film to view as like Avengers. God two. yes. Yeah. That's the real That's Avengers a... too. <laughs> I, I like to think so. It's, that probably should have been the end of our uh, phase two. If it was like a really good second act low point, you know, like <laughs> to have, to have that be the, the end of phase two. That was uh, that was Captain America, right? Like uh, yes, that was yeah. one of the Captain America movies, right? Mm -hmm. The best one and the best movie in the MCU, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we will kill people who say otherwise. John, and do you have a favorite uh, favorite Marvel movie? Or are you not really into them? Or? No, I I love them, man. I mean, the, yeah, yeah. The, that's a bunch of shallow villains, but like, I mean, I've always been a big comic book fan. I grew up watching uh, Spider Man, the animated series, and X Men and shit. Literally, and... no, that's X Men. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, so. So I get a childish joy from watching those movies, as flawed as they are. Um, I really enjoyed Infinity War. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Good. Infinity War was really that was quite enjoyable. Good. That quite that movie good. felt so big in scope. I was just like, wow, this is this what, felt uh, like an event, you know. What do you think of Endgame? Uh, not as good as Infinity War, but yeah. I <laughs> thought it was fun. It's a fun. Kind of <laughs> that's that's a kind yeah, thing to say. Time <laughs> heist fun. romp. Yeah, it is <laughs> no. enjoyable. I uh, I think um, it seems like the unpopular opinion is Infinity War is better, but I firmly believe Infinity War is better than. I don't even Infinity really War. think it's a competition. I feel like it's I, just. I don't think it's a competition. Infinity War. The it's main problems with Infinity War are the t are the stones. The yeah. stone problem is the same in Endgame, but the time travel on top. Well, is, uh, not yeah. much makes any sense in Endgame at all. There's there's countless right. things. That, we did a whole podcast on it. There's lots of things yeah, that don't yeah. make sense. Filter, and, um, sprinkle that in with uh, just a, a much, much weaker villain. Yeah, Thanos um, was pretty awesome in uh, yeah, Infinity Thanos, War and in Endgame. In Endgame, he's a lot more like Ronan. It's a, yeah. it's a bizarre decision that they made to to instead as instead of carrying on with Thanos that we had to get a totally new Thanos. Yeah. Who Bad yeah, new evil one to destroy uh, the world. It's just, and I, I think Infinity War has this breakneck pace. Like it really feels like everything is racing towards a uh, an ending. It, yeah, it, they it, are. It's very. It's for all the stuff that's going on and all the characters that they're juggling. It doesn't efficient. feel like it's clunky and overly full and overfilled. No, it's um. It really, it really, every time that there's a massive, like, crescendo in, uh, in what's happening, it, it slows down for a little bit to, uh, to focus on the characters, and then there's a nice big action, like, another leap again. And, I mean, it, I guess the, the funny thing is, right, like, the real big battle is the Wakanda battle, but I'm much more invested in the, uh, in the, the, the Titan battle one, on yeah. his home planet. Yeah, that one's the, yeah. where the real battle's happening. 
So Counter One's mm -hmm. weird, uh, and I think I, wow. I mentioned this on EFAB before, but I ended up watching Infinity War with uh, my sister and her boyfriend, uh, one of the near Christmases, I can't remember. And she's like, the most normie of normie ever, people watching movies, loves them all and stuff. The second they were like, open the barrier at the front, she went, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, I don't know. she was like, yeah, what even, who cares if they come in from behind, just, just, what, just deal with them. Spread out and get them. Yeah. Like, why hoard I, I like, them on yourselves? That decision does frustrate me, also, in retrospect. Why, why do you charge the big dogs and fight them melee when that's their only method of attack and you can use Shoot ranged them, attacks? Shoot them, please. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, f I feel like these people don't realize that, you know, in World War I, charging the enemy line when there were a bunch of machine guns was a highly effective, a highly inefficient strategy. Like, it, you couldn't yeah, they overwhelm learned real quick. them. I learned very quickly that it didn't work, like, and I the, lo the ultimate dogs. logic of yeah. being like, we'll convince these mindless dogs to all come through that one opening instead of going around, it's like, you don't even know that that's gonna happen. They could still go around. Right. And wouldn't it make more sense to open it and close it? Like, it doesn't make sense Absolutely. to open it, but if you are gonna open it, open it and then close it and then open it again. Don't let them all in at once. Yeah. Why would you let them all in? <laughs> like... <laughs> And then you got like, you got Black Panther like open the barrier, and then even the woman's like, "Oh, dude,", dude. <laughs> she's like, like "What?" Like a really <laughs> stupid idea. Like, yeah, open and the barrier. It, it, it would have made for a really fucking awkward and clunky action scene, but it's like open the barrier at A and then B and then C and close them all behind each other as well, it's just so they walk through and then get cut off, or just confuse the shit out of the enemies. Opening the barriers at different places and closing them immediately after, just fuck with them. I guess um. <laughs> The, the funny thing is, um, everybody wants their charge, because Lord of the Rings had their charge and it was awesome, but they forget that this is a science fiction universe where you have ranged weapons and air support. Oh my so god, and charges how, are a really bad idea. how much in Batwoman do the people with guns run towards their targets? <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time in John Wick. <laughs> so yeah. Oh yeah, John Wick as well, yeah. That, that's yeah the second and third is i have a gun i better try to stab them with the with my gun <laughs> with my gun <laughs> where were we what was happening <laughs> uh, possums <laughs> yeah we were all possums at some point <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're gradually we're... making it through the seasons that is the plan now that is officially <laughs> yes. the structure is, is that okay what we're doing? Yeah, oh, absolutely, just... yeah. We're, we're, oh, yeah, we're, we're doing just three whatever. acts. Go we're halfway through act two, maybe. We're gonna hit a low point soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we were talking about villains, that's how we got onto this. Right, right. But, so uh, you, you were more interested in trying Trent. to, um, I guess, move on from Trent to uh, build your villains a bit differently? Uh, yeah, although it, it took me a while to learn that lesson. Like, even with season six, I still hadn't learned at that point how to m flesh out a villain. Well, I'll be so honest with you, like, because like a caricature. These are all so um, like impressions I got when I was watching it. I think, what's your favorite season, Fringy? Would you say? Um, the the interesting thing is, uh, I think I really enjoy season six. Um, even though I think season six has a few plot holes when it comes to like the whole frag ban. There are a couple instances where like the frag ban doesn't work necessarily in the way that. It, but despite that, I really like. I like what season six is about, and I like where the characters go in that season. Um, though admittedly, I also pretty fond of season seven, but it's it's you know it's the dark season. Well, yeah, it get, yeah. that was going to be my take basically. It's like I always remembered loving season six, and uh, seven seven was question box, and I was like, huh. And I rewatched them, and I was like, oh no, I love both season six and seven. Seven was question box, so I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> season seven, man. It's uh, it's as dramatic as uh, some other TV shows I've seen have a dark season. The the, the uh, like we're gonna we're gonna get some real shit happening. But um, yeah, season six. I just remembered being a lot more um engaged because of the fact that our villains had, they weren't just um main leader and then subordinate people. The fact that they had names. The fact that they had dialogue that made them. Uh, individual from each other. I was already like, ooh, this is more, because it's not just RB chief and then some guy, which again, right. it can work. It's just that now we've got big arbiter guy who's kind of mysterious, curt with people, and also the leader, not entirely sure of his motivations yet. A femme fatale, obviously. That's a bit yes. of an archetype. Then, um, yep. guy who almost is on par with chief uh, <laughs> for like attitude yep. with the 
gaming, and then um, average dude bro. I was just like, this is interesting. I had to stab these full people. Thing with the average dude <laughs> bro being like the most print, the dude who's just this complete asshole to women. It's like yeah. ends up being the one who's actually the principled one. Who's like he doesn't? No, yeah, he doesn't. Actually, I I actually just didn't like tosses. Like, no, I, I don't want to take down the network. I like video games. Which you know? felt yeah. very much like that would be a thing in real life. Someone could potentially join up to for one reason, and then they're like, "Whoa, this is getting a bit out of hand." Actually, right? So, yeah, defector. And and plus, I think Adam. Everybody likes Adam. Well, I, I said like they like the character. They, of Adam. They, yeah, they appreciate like the Adam. story. He, yeah, he plays a role in the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, uh, what I personally liked about season six is that they're all dispatched in an ironic way by yeah. the end. Right. And I, I, I had, I had planned that out really far in advance. So, um, um, the order was that, um, Adam got taken out basically because of his own, his attitude, selfish. his lifestyle that killed him basically. Yes. Yeah. In a way they all kind of led to their own demise. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, I think it was Duncan was the Duncan got taken out by Kylie. He got taken out by the girl that he was constantly being like, "Oh, girls can't play video games. They're shit." The, the misogynist who's outsmarted by a woman. Yeah. The, and the, then, the yeah. child who's uh, arrested or disciplined by his mom and arrested. And then uh, our, like Chief outsmarting. <laughs> yeah. Out yeah. Smarting yes. her right. With hologram. That was Holograms awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know what's good? Yeah. So th this is actually the reverse of what I was talking about earlier, right? So mechanically, the game can hamper you, and you also have distractions, like, for example, how frag banning may or may not work. But um, when you get a payoff that's entirely within the game's mechanics, it, like, it blows up in, in the viewer's experience, I imagine. They're just like, oh shit, it was a fucking hologram. Right. Yes. It's, yeah, I enjoy, cool. like, taking certain mechanics, like, People are familiar with how the game works, obviously, a lot of fans of the show. And when I incorporate exactly how something works in the game into the show and it's used in the plot in some way, I think that's people really appreciate that. And I certainly do. Like, well, certainly, I, yeah, I, I mean, that you got to have a load of Halo fans in your audience. So they're all going to be looking out for references. And, and instead of created fantasy mechanics for your story, like mechanics that are not only for the story, but actually mechanics, it's like, oh, they'll, they'll easily get more endeared to it because. I mean, it's very relatable. You know, it's yeah. one of those things where I'm I'm not familiar with the show really, but even when you talk about um, uh, were, were, was it us? We were talking about esports earlier, yeah. And I was saying that a lot of the reason people like esports is because it's, it's a very relatable thing. That's something they feel they can go and do. So in a show like this, I can imagine people like, oh yeah, he did a thing that I could do. <laughs> so that's uh, that can it gives people oh yeah to it. And not only like is it a mechanical payoff, it's just having Chief outsmart someone who's quite intelligent mechanically. It's just like, oh. And outsmart <laughs> them basically yeah. by li like leaning into the fact that he's an idiot. It's yeah. believable that he would walk in, like just walk straight out to the open. Just like, oh, hey, Arbiter, what's up? <laughs> Don't mind me, <laughs> just standing here in the open. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> around Season five and six is when I started making my own music for the show, too. And, I didn't uh, like your tunes, by the way. Oh, thank I you. Think they are pretty sweet. I like, I think did you I almost got... say shit. He said shit. No, I was about to say I was about to say schmick, but then I <laughs> schmick. My mind. Your tunes are pretty oh. schmick, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Honestly, when I started out, I think a lot of them are like in season five that I used aren't that good. Like uh, I I got better at it as the years went by, and I mm -hmm. it's something I really enjoyed. Like I, I love kind of dicking around in FL Studio. That's what I use, and uh, using just synth synthesizers. And I got some kick packs and s snares, mm -hmm. and I, f I'll do that for hours. I fucking well, love that. It's not it doesn't even feel like work to me. It's whatever just, it's worth. The I'll be in the chief theme is in my head, and it probably will be till I'm dead. But -da 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 -da. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I started using my own music because uh. It's a good thing too with all the fucking copyright oh yeah claims and flags and tracks that I bought years ago are getting like flagged now by fucking vaguely named media conglomerates you know it's just like you, you 
you received a copyright claim by such and such organization. I'm like, what the fuck is that? That's just some kind of vague conglomerate. Yeah, I've it's... had some pretty interesting run-ins with these weird companies that do that. It's like its own industry of this stuff, and it's terrible at shit. Well, yeah, what's it. going on with Metal seems to be that his job wick video was taken down by someone who's not connected to job wick by the looks of things already like it is some kind of weird um this is this is just a theory right i don't know if this is actually a thing but if you have a bot that searches for um clips from movies from channels that aren't big enough to be able to defend themselves like literally like zero to a hundred and then you file a false copyright uh, strike against them and then you email them saying it's fine if you pay me the fee for using the copyright, you're, you're, you know, I'll let the strike go. And then, because he was charged, I think, 200 or $300? It's like, what? Uh, and it's like, yeah. yeah, I didn't trust that shit at all. And it's like, I think people are manipulating the system. And when you've got channels that are so, um, I was about to say young, small, uh, or young, I guess that applies, The there's not a lot of things they can do to help, because they can't even contact the uh, creator support thing. And they're not exactly that helpful most of the time. Right. Oh yeah, it's a nightmare dealing with that stuff. That's why, I mean, you hear it all the time. No YouTuber says, YouTube's great. YouTube's no, what we no. got. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, eh. The system is so broken. Yeah. Terrible. And I got tired with copyright claims. So I was just like, fuck you. I'll make my own music then. <laughs> I'll just get good mm -hmm. at that too. You know. What do you use I'm... to make music? Like what program? Uh, FL Studio with a bunch of uh, FL plugins. Studio? Fruity Loops. Studio. Yeah. Fruity um, Loops. I'm... Yeah. Oh, so that sounds like something right off my alley. It's kind of yeah. weird. I wouldn't be that was able my to uh, that was my stage name music. back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like the most noob friendly sequencer that you can get. You know, good because I yeah. yeah thought about it. You know, it's like I uh yeah I thought about it too for the same reason. Basically, I don't want to pay for licenses and I don't want to get into trouble if I wanted to use like a like music. Because even if you pay for a license, it can still get picked up by a copyright system. If it's yours, there's no argument right yeah so um so i started making my own music it was a bit rough at the start but there's some catchy stuff i made i think for season five that i kind of like mm -hmm. uh, and season six i got a little bit better although in the episode one there's this really obnoxious sounding track that i fucking hate one thing and, i noticed uh, on rewatching sometimes feels a little loud that's all balance wise I, I I don't know if if because I end up moving the volume myself. Like, all right, go. go oh, mu music is swelling. Like, I'm gonna knock it down a little bit. Oh, are you just talking about the music or like the whole mixing in general? Um, I guess it would be a a mixing critique, I suppose, right? Because uh, what I'm talking about is music does usually swell. That makes sense, but um, not to the point where I've got it at a volume where I can hear the characters perfectly well, and then whenever the music swells, I'm like, holy shit, I need to go back down a bit. Uh, yeah, that. that but that's that tough. was a big music. learning process for me. Sound yeah. balancing, you know, we've covered like a thousand videos on EFAP. Sound balancing is something that everybody has trouble with, uh, you know, definitively. It's pretty hard to balance something perfectly. Yes. It's, uh, yeah, that took a lot of screwing up on my part. Eventually, I, I have a system that I think kind of works. Like I have, I, I have my dialogue peak at around negative three decibels. Music is like negative six if there's nobody talking but if right. if there is dialogue then it's negative 12 negative 15 maybe 18 um yeah so I, like i have a whole system now that took a lot of tweaking to figure that out you know and for for a long time i kind of neglected the whole audio side of things until i went to film school and i kind of realized like oh this is 50% of the experience. I should probably be paying more attention to this. It's, it's weird. You know Sound I mean? design is like that weird underappreciated thing where you notice when it's bad, but you never notice when it's good. Yeah. yeah. A lot right. of a lot of great really editing works that way. Well. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, you think about video games like Bell like Battlefield tends to get a lot of praise for its sound design, but I don't see a lot of other games getting praise for their sound design, even though it's really tough and difficult and it takes a lot of work to do that. Yeah, um, I agree. And it's still today, I watch shit on YouTube, and I fucking hate people not balancing your audio properly. <laughs> you're telling me, man. You're telling it me. Is, oh. Yeah, 
Yeah. And the, like, the, the funny thing is, this you know applies how to commercials are fucking super loud. Yeah, and then the actual content is like way quieter. Have you, you... got to constantly keep adjusting the volume. That really annoys me. Have you used the premiere fi function? They have a little two minute intro that's absurdly loud. It's like ten it's billion loud. times louder than anything on YouTube. I don't know why. I don't know why they did it that way. Oh, oh, on YouTube, the oh yeah, the video premiere thing. Yeah, because yeah. like the yeah, two minute counter, like, oh, everybody oh, has to oh, either. It's really loud. Like, cause I didn't want to. One time, I didn't want to mute it, and I was like, I'll just lower it, and I was like, I think I've actually like I need the volume slider to be bigger because I can't I get it. I need to be able to zoom into the volume. Yeah, slider. like I, I don't want it to be nil, but I also don't want it to blow off my ears. And I was like, why do I not have the option? Yeah. That's yeah. It's 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 dumb. I hate having to constantly fucking adjust my volume setting on my device or whatever. Well, it's funny, I don't know if you guys feel this way or chat, but um, a lot of big production stuff, when you watch shit on a TV, they often, uh, uh, big, big explosive action and music sections are often something you might have to turn the volume down just a little bit, but when it goes back to dialogue, you're like, oh, gotta crank it back up. Like, because sometimes the, the bouncing is fucked. Like, I don't experience this much with, um, I guess, uh, I was about to say mainstream movies, but it's like, well, no, it, it, I guess, like, I, I can't remember the last time I had to do that for, like, an MCU movie, or even well, Star Wars, they, but... Uh, they generally have, like, an industry standard yeah. at that point, because they're professional audio engineers, they know what they're doing. Like, oh, it drives me nuts, I was watching, um... Oh, is it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter, I think it could have been Life, the, the Alien movie, uh... I remember that was one of the. This was still a while ago, but just uh, I had my hand on the controller because every time an action scene started up, I was like, right back down. <laughs> I can still. I like how I stand, man. You know, professional audio, <laughs> professional audio <laughs> editing in these movies, and then you're like, oh, this recent movie that just came out. You know, I had to keep readjusting my audio because it was getting loud and quiet. Yeah, and I I hate when uh, the uh, the music in a movie is mixed too low. I remember I watched uh, the movie Bumblebee. And I'm like, God, the music is so fucking quiet, and it's actually not bad. So like, it's it's such a shame. Like, so much, obviously a lot of effort went into the orchestral score for that. And I think it's, that's it's the so case quiet. With a lot of movies lately. Um, that it's it's hard to. It's kind of weird. It feels like um, with a lot of movies, people don't talk about the score, and it's because the score is often really quiet, and you don't get to take it in. And I, I don't think it's a surprise that like the John Wick. Every time there's a club scene shootout, everybody remembers the song because you can actually yeah. hear it. It's at the forefront, right. and it usually and matches kind of the, the action like, too, which is always going to be a plus. Yeah. I think I think that's probably the reason why video game soundtracks tend to catch on is because they're always at the forefront. Whereas with film scores, depending on the movie, you know, there's a reason why people remember the charge in uh in Lord of the Rings. It's because the music's playing loudly. There's a reason why people remember the Star Wars theme. It's because it plays really loudly. Yes, and have the music at the forefront for um for people to hear it you know i think that's important to making it uh stand out and be memorable totally yeah i mean crank it up it's like what are you doing yeah yeah exactly it's, it's so it's it's makes such a difference music like that's always one of the first things i notice in movies and i mm -hmm. i see it talked about the least i think yeah music like is scores in movies Oh yeah. wait, no. But what's what's the thing that people say, Mola? The music is insistent. It insists upon itself. <laughs> so yeah, we covered uh, the 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 latest vision that I think is Ralph the Movie Maker. He said the Joker's yeah, vi Joker's, Joker's violins are telling him how to feel. He doesn't like it. Well, <laughs> when we're watching Batwoman, all the time we see how the music is really trying to feel something that just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like with the scene well, think, and what's actually happening. Thing. If it's if it's inconsistent with the scene, it becomes really a problem. But I mean, I think it was, yeah, I think Ralph the movie maker said in 1917 the music was insistent. It was telling you how to feel. It's like that was Dude. Uh, that was YMS. I think that was YMS. Yeah. Oh well, I just yeah. yeah, I disagreed on that one because like I think, I, and I think the example is the the trench scene, right, when the music swells up. But I really like the song, and I really like it in that scene. And plus, so there are other times where the music was like kind of incredible, like uh, the scene where they're um in the in the destroyed town at night and the mute and the flares were all shooting up that was like that was that was that was amazing like i was actually mm -hmm. floored by that scene when i watched it i like my good music you know what can i say maybe it's just i think I watched, video uh, games just, i rewatched you know, 1917 with my dad uh yesterday yeah <laughs> so 
<laughs> this is a movie. Uh -huh. he's, he's a guy who like loves all films and he loved 1917 by the way and I'm I'm the kind of person who's like I'm not even gonna point things out that I think are wrong or right <laughs> uh, uh, the one thing I did point out was I was I was like you know what they're doing with the camera he was like no and I was like okay <laughs> <laughs> right I was like you know so it hasn't cut yet and he was like ooh but um Oh my god, he was like me in the movie. It was crazy. He was uh he, he was like, "Wait, why did the thing explode in the um in the trench?" And I was like, "Oh, um there was it was a tripwire." And he was like, "How did that go off? They saw it, did they?" And I was like, "Yeah, it was it was the rat. It fell off the thing and the rat, yeah. it dragged the thing." He was like, "Oh, isn't that inconvenient?" And I was like, <laughs> you brush it off on him. Yeah, and I was just like, okay. But then um, he was like, oh, they're having a dog fight. Oh, they happen to land exactly where our heroes are. And I was like, I mean, <laughs> and then uh, funnily enough, he, he was just like, why aren't they killing him? They should kill him. He, they have to kill him. And I was like, well, I. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. you know, you know how it is. He's like, I was like, it's a young dude. He's he's looking out for his fellow man. That he was, he gets stabbed. He was like, I knew it. They should have killed. him <laughs> I, was, I was having so much fun with it because um, the you know when he's getting chased and he um, he he runs and he like kicks open a, a wooden thing and 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 gets in there and, and then he ends up being in. yeah. yeah. Uh, my dad was like, "Oh, he better keep running." And I was like, "What do you mean?" And he was like, "Well, the guy's right behind him." I was like, "No, he he like slipped over or whatever." And he was like, "Well, you didn't see him go into the thing." And I was like, "I I guess not." The and he was like, <laughs> "Yeah." He was just like, "Well, where else would he have gone? That was like the obvious place." And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Mauler, you're ruining film criticism. <laughs> no, Mauler's, Mauler's dadler is ruining film and art. Uh, and yeah, it was funny when she's like, he needs milk or whatever. My dad was like, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was good shit. Uh, but, he, but the thing is, he loved the movie. He thought it was fantastic. And I was like, yeah, cool. That is an accurate uh, perspective to have on 19. That's the correct opinion. <laughs> Though I guess saying it's better than Saving Private Ryan, that's the, that's the. Oh, that's actually one thing he did thing. say. He was like, it was really good. Not as good as Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to top it's Saving very Private hard, Ryan yes. as far as war films go. Um, talking about this raised a couple of points that are really important that I learned in my journey of like you know writing and making movies and stuff and studying movies is um setting setting things up as early as possible whenever you have mm -hmm. an opportunity um like when you were bringing up the rat setting off the tripwire uh it is uh convenient that the rat is there to set off the trap but i think right at the beginning that of that scene the rat is set up yeah like they come in think, and then they're like oh jesus rats, look at the size yeah. of that rat and then it kind of leaves the frame and you don't see it for a little bit and then they kind of navigate the room and then at the very end, the rat comes back and then sets off the trap. And of course, there is and some logic to them. They would disturb it, right? Them being there would make the rat want to move. Right, exactly. So there's little things, little setups and payoffs like that I really dig in mm -hmm. movies. And also... It doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah. And there's a point about music uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, th I th what I, what, one of the biggest things I learned is that story dictates everything. Like every aspect of production. Um, well, of course, it's the foundation, right? Right, exactly. The, the, the theme and the story just kind of holds everything together and it dictates how everything should be done in every specific department, including music, right? So there's certain movies where a b big bombastic score is called for, maybe something like Star Wars, right? Um, but uh, there's certain movies, it was one of the Planet of the Apes movies where it has a great score but the music is telling me who to root for at certain parts of the movie and in a movie like that it loses some of its integrity because i think what's great about planet of the apes is the moral ambiguity sure mm -hmm. and it's like it's not necessarily that the mon monkey's good humans bad but the, the, that's what the that's what the music is telling you a lot of the time, and I right I think that would that, be the instance of insistent music where it's almost telling you what you're meant to think. Yeah, trying to trick you. Well, we've yes. got a great example of this, do we not, Mister Rags? Uh, well, and Fringy, uh, have you seen Mandalorian, uh, John? Um, yes, I did. So, right, yeah, they only did one season so far, right? Yeah. yeah so when um, I saw that. 
when the uh, the Republic come in on the distress signal that has been moved and planted onto a random space station, and they obliterate the thing. They just come in and shoot it. And the music is very happy about this. It's like, woohoo, we did it, guys, yeah! And it's just like, what the fuck? Right. <laughs> you guys, yeah. this, is, this is beyond fucked up. And it's just like, no, no, it's okay, they're the good guys. They shot the bad guys. And you're like, right. Um, yes. Well, it, uh, that's actually interesting because now I'm thinking about like um, how music can drastically change. Oh the, yeah. Uh, the the I, I think a great example is now I I always sing the praises of Call of Duty World at War because I think it's really good. Um, and you compare it to like Call of Duty World War Two, like World at War, the menu music is this really ominous kind of creepy. Um, like um, it's it's this really, yeah, it's really off putting. Um, and it sets the tone, like, fantastically for a war story that's like, yeah, war's not that glamorous when you're, like, participating in it. It's pretty shit, actually. Um, <laughs> and then you compare it to, you know, well, uh, like, I like the soundtrack in Call of Duty World War II, but it totally changes the tone. It's all this, like, standard heroic, you know, burr, 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 like, trumpet yeah. stuff. And because of the music, and in part because of, like, the actual game itself, they have these totally disparate tones. And like one is really unique and interesting, um, and one is very generic, and it's almost like the it's. I'm not sure if the music is the microcosm of what it's trying to be, or if the music almost informs the way that you feel about it. I'm not sure if it's like chicken or egg when it comes to our uh, music in that way. Right, really complicated to balance though, because if. Uh... It, it, going back to Ralph with the violins, if he was like, I already understand the tone of this scene, I don't need the music to tell me that this is the tone of the scene. Well, we've, because we can't necessarily say that's absolutely a wrong take if we're going to simultaneously argue that music can actually tell you the wrong tone of, of, a, mm -hmm. of a thing, and that's a problem. And it's like, so music has to reinforce a tone? It can't make a point? And it's like, hmm. Like, well, can, I, can I, the tone be off in order to try and provide you an alternate perspective? I As guess, in, um, the, just, to, just to finish, so the, with The Mandalorian, yeah, no, could it be that uh, the, the show is trying to make a point that the Republic see themselves as the good guys, and the music is reflecting that for that scene? And if they went on to I condemn them, or to provide an alternate perspective, we could actually possibly make that argument, but they never do, because I actually think it's an accident. I think the people who made the show were like, I, but this I is I a good thing to do, it. isn't it? And it's like, no! <laughs> yeah. And I... <laughs> I, it is, um, the idea of, like, how the music kind of informs what's happened. Uh, now I'm thinking about Halo, like, the the whole idea of a lot of the music in Halo is, like, this sort of mystical, almost, like, magical element to everything that's, you know, like, anything that has to do with, like, the forerunners and the things that they made always has this mystical kind of awe. And it's it's interesting to think, like, do we feel that way about the forerunners because of the music or was it the music informed by what they were trying to do you know which one created the tone that influenced the other is um it's hard to know i think i think it's really hard to identify but it is kind of clear when music has been used effectively or ineffectively like right. um like when a scene shouldn't have music that's really obvious you know Saving Private Ryan would have been made much worse if they had music during the Omaha Beach sequence. It was, it was great to have it be totally diegetic. Well, do you remember? Yes. Um, uh, this is a specific reference. Uh, Fring in uh, when the two like lamest fighter characters in, in Buffy accidentally meet up in battle and they play the standard yeah. track for battling, like dramatic and serious. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's fucking hilarious because they can't. They just slap each other basically in slow motion. But the show treats it as though it's serious, and that, you know, you, you understand immediately that's funny. And that's what I mean about, like, how you really gotta be specific about how you're, you're criticizing something being misplaced or not. Because, uh, mm -hmm. I guess that, that would be the example where it's intentional, while with Mandalorian it was a fucking accident. Yeah. Yeah, I think in those situations, an outsider's perspective can really help. Like, if you're, if you spent years working on a movie, you kind of get tunnel vision. And then you get a score made for it, and you're in the odd, like the sound testing room, and you're just like, "Yeah, that sounds great." You're not really looking at it from the perspective of an audience member, where you're going like, "You know, this. I feel like this would be seen. This scene would be more powerful without music. Sometimes less right. is more." It's almost Absolutely. like you you viewed the music in isolation, and so you hear the song, and the song is good, but. It's almost like you're not hearing it in relation to how it plays in the scene and whether or not it's even 
useful to have well, it. It's funny all. because this reflects YouTube videos, actually. Say, for example, you're making a video about um, how important it is that Luke uh, did what he did for Vader, and you're speaking very softly and carefully about how meaningful this is and how it sets up. And then in the background, you've got the cantina music playing because you're like, oh, it's Star Wars music. You're like, yeah. dude, it's it's just doesn't match. Doesn't match at yes. all. Totally. <laughs> Can you imagine having, like, <laughs> while Darth Vader is fighting Luke on the Death Star? <laughs> 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 Again, it sounds like we're describing a sketch. Like, that would be a sketch in a Star Wars thing. It would be funny. Uh, you know, the Emperor turns the radio off. He's like, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, oh, Christ. <clears throat> really funny, actually. Yeah, so uh, music crucial, but uh, sometimes sometimes you don't need it. And uh, oh, of course, it's a stronger... of course, definitely, yeah. Sometimes silence can be uh, deafening, as they say. Yes, no matter how high quality or sophisticated or great sounding the score is, sometimes less is more. Sometimes it just doesn't work for the movie or the scene or whatever. And that's why you know the story dictates everything. And um, so yeah, I. Uh, can, uh, can we move on? Does anybody want to say anything more about music? Or oh, no, that's no, we... good. Okay, move on. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so um, where were we with my thing? We were talking about season, season six. six. Yeah, yeah, I started making mm -hmm. music for it, right? And um, so I moved on to season six, and I I thought, well, throughout making season five, people were getting really impatient with me because. I had set up this wedding crash in a flash forward, right? And uh, and then all the episodes that followed were kind of a lead up to that same moment in time. And then I had a, so many comments were just like, get on with it. Move on to the thing. This is all filler bullshit. And uh, I was like, you know, just wait for it. Just wait for it. It'll be worth it. And uh, I, th I think the finale for season five I think is is a is a fan favorite now. People really appreciate how it paid mm -hmm. off for the most part, and I'm I'm really happy with the way it turned out. And I th I think there's there's a good message in there about being the good that you want to see in the world. Yeah, there's a line of dialogue that kind of reflects that. And uh, I don't know if I planned that out really from the beginning, but it just kind of came out organically in the process of writing that finale and i just i thought it it worked and uh this raises an interesting point about um because when i started doing the latter half like the five season five six seven and i'm planning out things way ahead of time um and i'm i'm already at the very beginning i'm thinking like okay how does this villain ultimately what's his downfall what is it that leads to his downfall and then that raises a really interesting argument between um, archetype versus propaganda. And right. um, it's like if you've already made up your mind about something, uh, like, are you approaching that organically or are you just forcing your perspective on how life is? You know what I mean? Like there's an argument to be made for, like maybe i shouldn't be planning things so far in advance maybe i should just start with a bunch of characters and uh, and uh, an opening scene and then just work my way completely organically to the finish line and right, however that's it like manifests the whole versus versus plotting idea the idea of should you plan out your story's plot points in advance with a clear end in mind or do you want to like or do you, or would you rather approach it from the perspective of I start and then I just go and wherever the characters lead me is the ending that I man these birds are fucking wild <laughs> or, yeah. yeah or uh or yeah, do you just wildlife. let let the characters uh lead you there I personally think plotting is better but yes like that's what I think right I I try really hard not to be propagandistic in my writing although I do I when I'm starting a season. I think in like, what are the tentpole moments of this season, right? Like mm -hmm. I, th I think about the four key beats, like where the act breaks are in the whole season, right? So like, this is where the season starts. This is like the break in act two, the break in act three, and then the end. Those are like the four 
tentpole moments, right? And I'm thinking, yeah. what are those before I even start writing any episodes? And because I need, I feel like I need a track to follow. Like, I it's absolutely just, it's... think you, you need a, uh, an end. At, at the very least, I think you need to know where it ends before you can write. How, like, hmm. I don't see how, I don't what see how somebody. Mind? Oh, well, when it comes to knowing how G it ends. Jiminy yeah. Christmas, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Like um, I, I guess um, I guess part of the thing is, and and this is kind of like my my perspective on uh, on when I hear people talk about the whole the the craft of writing. I think I think a lot of people underappreciate that writing is very much like any other creative enterprise, like art or um or video game development. Well, I mean, it predates a lot of these things, and the whole idea that it's not like you just you, you don't just shit something out onto a page and then it's somehow like some inspired fantastic thing like there is a logic to stories and so in order to get the payoffs that you want you need to think about what you want to achieve and the best way to achieve it and you're not going to do that i don't think if you're just you might be able to there are like, people there are people stephen who can king do it a, more than likely well stephen king is a is a he doesn't plot he doesn't do outlines. well he's also known for I, terrible endings so well i guess <laughs> right i guess um i guess it's just the whole thing of um I don't see that you can, I don't see that a, a plot outline can ever really be detrimental to the story that you're trying to tell because all you're trying to do is know where you need to go. And if you know where you need to go, you kind of know what you need to do to set it up in the same way that like, if you want to drive to a certain location, knowing where you're going is going to be really helpful in finding the best ways to get there. You're going to find the fastest route unless you're like, let's just go south and see if we stumble across the place that we kind of think we might want to go, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I always, I started thinking about the end right from the beginning with yeah. like my, my long form seasons because it just felt too risky to just like start just from the beginning and then just go organically and whatever happens, happens because I think the likelihood that it's all going to fall apart by the end is very high. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think you can write yourself into a corner big time. Like, you, you, yes. you, and you don't want to be having that happen when you're part way through, like the production of something. Like, oh shit, oh yeah. shit, you know. Like, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a terrifying place to be, and I I really didn't want to be in that spot. So, mm -hmm. um, I I always thought very carefully about the trajectory of the whole season. Not not uh, didn't have all the details fleshed out, obviously, but. Um, so I would get those tentpole moments throughout a season, right? And then I would fill in like just quick summaries of what each scene is, right? So this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene leads into that one. And then we get to the first tentpole and then keep going. And then you just fill in all the blanks. And then you look at what you're left with and you just kind of comb through it backwards and forwards and make sure it's all, it seems like it's written organically, even though. Mm -hmm you kind of thought about it from the very beginning about the whole trajectory of the thing. And you try and get rid of any parts that seem forced where you're trying to force an outcome. Yeah. It's like, okay, this part needs work. So you'll take that scene out or maybe you'll flesh it out with maybe two or three additional scenes to make it more organic to it's just you just make it comb and comb through it back and forth make it as smooth as possible and then Rain once i have basically. yeah and once i have that rough outline of the whole season then i'll at that point that's when i started writing individual episodes mm -hmm. and uh that was a very that was very comforting for me to have that track and i didn't necessarily have to like adhere to that like it could change on the way but i needed to yeah. have i needed to go in with a with a game plan I think a lot of people probably want it mentioned that like when you have very strong and more than even like four characters that are very driven you could necessarily not actually have an idea of where the story is going you just drop things on them and as long as you stay true to them you're probably going to be able to generate something that's pretty engaging obviously the uh one of the premises being bottle episodes just being like what is your idea it's like i don't know they're trapped in a room what happens then like, well, it probably will <laughs> yeah. be interesting. For example, the four of us being trapped in a room, there's probably going to be some interesting things talked about at some point. <laughs> Maybe you could right, probably yeah. put that in an episode. But <laughs> if you, so for like, for example, um, 
the Joker from the Dark Knight trapped in a room with Jack Sparrow and uh, David Attenborough. He'd be like, what the fuck are they going to talk about? <laughs> like, and, and you know, I, I'd be surprised if anyone was like, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out and see what happens. And then you have the same scenario, but they're all on a desert island. The same scenario, or, or, you know, you just keep, you, you throw something at them and um, you just see how they deal with the situation. Or you could be like, actually, I, I really want to, I'm doing all of this in the first place because I want to have this pay off at the end. For example, you know, character kills other character, a person they would never kill. You're like, how do I get there? You're like, all right, I gotta put all of these stakes uh, along the line, and I've gotta get to these these pieces. But how I go, you know, get from A to B to C to D to E, those are the um, dynamic and, and varied scenes that uh, my characters I will be building as as we go. But hopefully, sticking to those stakes. And by the time you get to that payoff, you might have changed it. It might be that someone else does the kill, or or the person who did the kill wasn't who we thought it was the whole time, and you find it's more engaging or something. Because um, I think the th this is this is the complex thing with like writing advice is that every single piece of advice comes with caveats. Like, oh yeah, structure mm -hmm. it all, but also leave room for non-structured stuff. <laughs> You're like, wait, yeah, yeah. And I think I think the idea of like planning for an end sometimes depends on what your objective is. If 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 the goal of what you're trying to do is have this really poignant point to make, I'm not sure that it's very achievable to do that if you don't know where you're going. Like if you have a point to make, you're almost going to construct the story in facilitating that point, at least if you want to make it good. And so you need to probably know how it ends and then work backwards. But I I guess that's the hard part is because it's really easy to see something that's been made and then deconstruct how it didn't work but it's hard to know the right way to make something even if you know what a good thing is it's kind of hard to know which way to go about it right yeah so um i uh i wrote season six and what what i i would have that broad plan right and then i would write individual episodes and in the process of writing dialogue, I would often find that, oh, wait, this character is taking me in a different direction than I initially thought in the outlining process. So yeah. I, would, I would have to like go back and adjust the outline and then go back to the dialogue and write it. And that, that would happen so often, right? But that's, that's the process, you know? I think, I think yeah. that's the right way to do it. I think cuz when you just try and do it completely organically there's no like the the chances that you're going to hit the mark at the end and button up everything in a satisfying way are just nil I think it's pretty tough pretty yeah. tough yeah yeah so but you, you at do, least like, work you, with a general outline like come on guys <laughs> get yeah, something have, <laughs> do do an outline but by no means do you have to adhere to it you just like you just have the plan there if your characters take you in a different direction when you're writing dialogue great just adjust your plan and then go back to the dialogue the weird and just thing, keep going back and forth like that the weird thing i've noticed is because i'm trying to write a book and like a part way through it it's like oh shit there's a lot of problems already and it's kind of this situation where it's like maybe it's a good idea to just write the bad story and then just basically be a script doctor to the story once it's done. So have like a first draft and persist with the problems that you know are there and then just adjust as you're working on it and then have this flawed thing and then just start identifying the scenes that you can change, almost like a film critique, but of, you know, the thing that you've already made to, that you then do in your revisions. That's, right. That's yeah. kind of like, I don't even know if that would work though because I haven't even finished the fucking thing. So like, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> It, it's hard, man. I mean, I've, yeah, I have a bunch hard, of friends yeah. who are like dabbling in writing and whenever they do, they say they're trying to write something. I'm like, good for you. That's it's such a fucking hard undertaking hard. to do. It it's well. really hard. Yeah. And the people, a lot of people don't understand just how hard it is to write something good. And I've, think, I've, yeah. I, I wrote a feature script uh, about a year ago and I was so excited to write it and I excitedly shared it with some of my friends to get some feedback and i learned that it was a piece of shit and was i that, uh, <laughs> was that the was that the uh the poly frost was that the, the penguin yes idea? exactly yeah. i wanted to tell this kind of grim violent hyper violent action story and I, I was just i was so stoked to write it and i thought it was like i was so proud having finished it like it's just regardless of the quality of it it's just like i finished this thing and uh, mm -hmm. 
and then I got a bunch of feedback saying like, man, this really needs work. And I felt like such shit, but they were right. And uh, that was a valuable learning experience. And, and I had been writing RB and the Chief for a long, a long time at that point. And so you would think that I'd know what I was doing, <laughs> but uh, yeah. even if no matter how much writing experience you have, you are still very, very capable of writing a piece of shit. And so you always have to be vigilant about like you always have to attack your own work. You can never let yeah. ego carry you away. You well, know? Um, one of my favorite quotes on creating stuff was actually, it's in uh, the Halo 2 behind the scenes like documentary where they're talking about how they were making the game. One of the things I like about the documentary is they're just honest about the fact that they kind of screwed up. Like, yes. and that they, they didn't, they didn't, it's like they didn't, th their ambition was way beyond the capability of the hardware. And I think uh, Jason Jones said, um, you're always going to be your own worst critic, especially if you're doing something creative. If you think that what you're making is the greatest thing ever all the time, it won't be the greatest thing ever. And I think yes. that that's like such an accurate statement on what it means to make something good is to, you, you, for, for almost the majority of the time you're working on it, you're not going to be convinced that it's actually great. And because of that, it's it, it gives you like a motivation to work really hard to make it work as opposed to somebody who thinks that every idea they have is awesome and that they're King Dick and they can, you know, do no yes. wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's no, I think that's totally right. And, um, I, there's a bunch of people in my life who have told me repeatedly, you're too hard on yourself, you know? And I think I am, but I think that's, that's I think it's part of it. To be hard it's, on it's, yourself. it's, it's yeah. essential. Cause if you're not, then you're going to write shit. Is I there think. any good writer who isn't hard on themselves? You know, yeah. like, I feel like there's no such thing. Everybody's hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to stay that way. I think if you're good, if this is what you're going to do, if you're going to write, you know, mm -hmm. well, it's almost and... like you're criticizing yourself, isn't it? Because like, it's almost like writing is just bearing out your soul onto paper. Like, this is what I think guys feel free to feel free to let me know <laughs> if it's good or not. <laughs> like, Yeah. It's it's very vulnerable <clears throat> thing, you know. To I think like so. if, being just a YouTube content creator in general as well. You're kind of just you're putting yourself out there for the web to criticize. Yeah, and uh, yeah. it's not. Yeah, a lot of people. There's there's a lot of people who are envious of my position. They're just like, oh man, I wish I had a channel. I wish I had your subscriber account or your subscriber count. And uh, it's like there's there's cons that come along with it. You know, it's, it's a, it's a vulnerable place to be something. It's mm -hmm. not all, it's not all it's cracked I up think, to be. Uh, I think you can see that in like what it means to write. Cause effectively it's like, what are you doing? You're taking the ideas in your head, which don't exist in the real world. And are the, the amalgamation of your thoughts and feelings about the world and the human experience. Um, and you're funneling these into characters who are effectively parts of you to some extent to tell a story that you think is important and potentially push a message that you think is correct that might be wrong and do all of this whilst also trying to actually have it make sense and and be effective by like the rules of of writing and yeah that's like that's that's really uh intimidating i think personally. totally yeah but and yeah it's 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 very vulnerable but the opposite the alternative is worse you can't write stuff trying to please everyone yeah you can't lie you know, yeah. like, you can't really lie, I guess, about what you want this to do. That's the thing. There's so many pressures. Like, do something yeah. that will make the people happy. It's like, wait, no, I don't want to do that. Because that might be something, like, schlocky or, or, or slop, basically, right? Like, pleasing everybody. Like, no, it should be something that's true to me. It's like, wait, but what if what if it's like, yeah, but it's true to me, but it's also really flawed. Should I keep it the way it is because it is true to me? Or, or, or should it be a corrected, true-to-me story? Should I get this guy's opinion? It's like, wait, but what if he changes it to what is true to him? Oh no! What do I? Oh, <laughs> I yeah. stressing out what here. What do I yes. do? <laughs> yeah, totally. So I had I had written uh, I had season six outlined of my show, and then um, I knew by the time, like I knew, like the big the first big tent pole in the season was there's like a big attack on the network, and then the the toys become aware of this hacker clan. And then the second, uh, or like the, the crisis moment of the whole season, the end of our second act, the low point is that uh, um, Claire gets caught 
in the crossfire. And then all of a sudden they have a personal investment. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then from, from the beginning, I knew that the last few episodes of the season, the third act, it was going to be like a sort of a classic revenge movie takedown where they hunt them down one at a time. So like this episode is Adam's takedown. The next episode is Claire's takedown. And then you subverted that wonderfully. (laughs) Thank you. Um, yes, I it was really funny, liked I forgot that it. part of season six. Um, I was, if, if, I'm not sure if Ringy's still here, but uh, I was talking to him about how I was rewatching it, and I told him, I forgot how they defeat um, the last dude. I've completely forgotten. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm referring to season seven, actually, rather than six right now. Uh, oh, okay. But um, you, I, I, I can't, For some reason, I feel like I shouldn't spoil it in case you got a story for how you led up to making the decision, but... <laughs> what I'm referring to is defeating the bad guy, and it's not the kind of defeat they wanted, whatsoever. Yes, and uh, right. I, I found it really strong. That's all. Right. Yeah, it's either kind of purposefully underwhelming, or like a- ironic in some way, where the antagonist led to their own downfall. And I did that same thing for season seven as well. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, so season six, some. Def, you you mentioned there was big plot holes, gaping plot holes in season six, and you're right. Oh. It was definitely a flawed execution. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I big... did, you were talking about the plot uh, plot holes in season six, right? I the the only the major one I remember was um they went into the hacker network to get the uh to get the frag band stuff, and um then there was a power outage, and it kicked them out of the game, and it's like oh you're 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 banned now, right? <laughs> like you, yes. you you got booted out of the game, so you're banned. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, but I, I can't remember. I, I do remember that there were just a couple times where um, it was mainly to do with the the way that frag ban works. I think was the uh, was um the only really problem. Like in terms of the actual, I I never felt that there was like an inconsistency in terms of like the ways that the characters were behaving or anything. That it was just like the kind of the issues that just came with trying to make Halo work for the story that you were trying to tell. And obviously that's, there's going to always be some conflicts there, you know? You're right. That's fair. Yeah. Um, I that, still that really very, like it. That was a very tough line <laughs> yeah. to walk for me. I mean, I, I should have planned it a little bit better. But um, but yeah, that was a learning experience. And um, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to mention some people thought Fragband was stupid. But that's another thing that's actually a real... I hey, like Frag Van. You know? I think it's a super effective tool for having the uh, the actual conflict in the game matter. I felt right. like, I, I felt like I could believe it being a real thing. I, I felt like I, I was like, it. I'm sure someone can hack it so that if certain circumstances take place on your console in relation to the the account that's done it to you, that it can make the console do something to itself. Yeah, mm-hmm. that it, it was a real thing. With um, I think one of the Counter Strikes, Counter Strike Go, there is exploitable code that is executed when a character model turns from active into a ragdoll when they're killed. So it's the generation right. of a ragdoll, the code that gets executed. There is an exploit that there's a tool made to take advantage of, and it banned people. It banned their accounts. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it turned out to actually ended up being a real thing. And, well, uh, I, think, I think whether or not it's a real thing, the whole idea is by having... Not only having it that your console is banned from access, but the idea that they then get your personal information, it means that like getting killed in the game actually matters. There's yes. like legitimate consequences. So because if there were no consequences, you see people shooting each other, like you gotta respawn anyway, so who cares? Like it's still <laughs> matter, you know? Right. Yeah. Um so so I moved on to season seven and I knew I I kinda I still wanted to do like there's a bunch of bad guys and Arbiter and Chief meet them and then decide to take them out. But I wanted to do something a bit different. I wanted to like dive deeper into the character, into the antagonists. That, that was really mm-hmm. what yeah. distinguished season seven for me. I wanted to create, because in season six, I like the, the villains in season six, but they're very, they're very shallow in terms of motivation. They're just out for they money. Are, in, in a way, they are a little bit more removed from reality than the season seven villain is. Season seven villain feels like a full on person that's we're getting to know quite well. Um, right. Yeah. While the that season very... six ones, again, as we went over, they're like more archetypal. It's like I know this this kind of person. I understand. I follow. Like 
I guess in the same way that Darth Vader kind of was that in A New Hope, and then when he watched the next two movies, he's like, holy shit, this guy's like, there's stuff going on. <laughs> he's not just, right. not just an evil machine man. Right. It was, it was that point that it really came clear to me that the best villains are, like, they're relatable, they have a point. Um, they're real people, you know, and not just evil for evil's sake, and it made for a much more compelling story. And so I was like, what if I write an antagonistic character who's right on the line of like, <clears throat> there's a good friend in him there somewhere for the toys to befriend. Yeah. And they don't, they don't have any other friends, but they see a friend in this guy, but he's also got one foot in the shadow. Yeah, you just got, you, you know, generate the scenarios so that they're mainly only getting wind of the good parts of what's left of him as a person. And so they right. can connect and develop, and that's really important, because yeah. you can tell from the get-go this guy's gonna be trouble with certain elements of his character, If the, and, and, and obviously Arbiter's turning a blind eye to a lot of it for a while. Because he just yes. needs a friend, he feels lonely, because of everything that happens leading up to it. And I'm, I'm assuming, right. again, this is all as a result of the fact that you, you would have planned out Season 7, you would have been like, let's not do Season 6 again, because why? Why do you want to do it again? That's another thing with right. drama that comedy doesn't suffer, usually. Comedy, you mm -hmm. can do it again. A lot of the time, comedy is actually funnier when it's referenced and repeated. Uh, but drama has to move on, otherwise you'll start doing the whole stale thing. People are like, really? This again? Like, oh, it's going right. to end the same way? But again, it's funny how writing works. It's like, but then you can rely on the fact that they've seen it before and do something different to surprise them, which is precisely... <laughs> precise, <laughs> this is the first villain, I'd say, that's defeated in Arby of the Chief in a way that makes the audience uh, stunned, I would imagine. Ah, uh, right. yes. I got I got some flack for that too. Like, uh, really, there are there is some repetition in season seven with like repeated plot beats. Like people are saying like frag ban again. Jesus Christ! But it's really? totally recontextualized though. It's a yes. totally different and reason I, for it to be. In the I thought story. That he bought uh, he bought and modified them or whatever, right? Like he, he they'd stolen them. Uh, and his friend them. his friend remade them. Upgraded. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it, it essentially okay performs the same function. But you know, it it plays. It's it's a, it do, it has a function and it served what I was trying to do with season seven, which is to a degree it was I was kind of doing season six again, but I was just exploring the antagonists more and trying to make them more believable characters, and so I was just trying to do the same but much better, I thought, yeah. and um and what really sold me on season seven, like going ahead with it is the emotional dilemma of Arbiter having to sacrifice the one friend he could have made uh, in service of doing the right thing. You know, which, like, because yeah. they're, they're doing these despicable things, trolling people. And for a while, the toys do the same thing. They follow along with them, and they get some gratification out of it. So they kind of embrace their dark side because they have nothing else in their lives. You know, like, they're, they're, sh they're, sh they're in this room they're kind of tired of each other's company <laughs> and like yeah, they that's... live in this constant state of discontent and it kind of made sense to me for them to kind of embrace their evil side but and i guess they... uh this will be this will be interesting to talk about actually because it's it's one of the things like i think Mola rags and i've talked a lot about how so if the idea is for the sequels luke is a detached miserable hermit can we do that and it's like Yes, but you have to work really hard. Let's, let's to make get full him use that of those thirty years, shall we? <laughs> we yeah, have to... it's, right. it's the whole idea of um, you have characters, you can create any character you want, but once you create a character, you have certain constraints on what you can make them do. And so, the interesting thing, I guess, would be like with Arbiter. It's okay, so he's he's a pretty moral, upstanding guy. He's very guided by principle and morality. But I want him to do some bad things for a little while. What what sequence of events has to happen that would force him to do that? You know, the whole idea yes. of how can we organically push this character to the point that he will make the decision that that I need him to for this story to work. Yeah. And I feel like that's an often neglected thing in modern movies anyway. It feels that way. Just like, no, I want him to do this now, you know? I, I, yeah. I honestly feel like it's the it's the perversion of subversion, as in Let's take this character who's known for this and make them do this. That'll be so shocking and amazing, and it shows that everyone's capable of everything. It's like, yeah, but you have to, you have to explain it. You can't just have them do it. That's like, that's like the baseline idea that we can shoot out while like 
you know, eating some food and watching TV. Like, oh, what if they did that? What if Luke killed what his if nephew? They did this really cool thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's 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 the power of fiction to me, you know, like even though it's a it's a fictional tale, what you can use fiction to make the ultimate case for why something is true, like yeah. a certain archetypal truth, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, it, whereas it, in real life or like a documentary format, you can see those same archetypal truths unfold, but it takes way longer and sometimes across multiple generations. and. You know, there's a lot of pointless conversations that happen in nonfiction. Like, you know what I'm? I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but just like the whole for, idea that uh, stories are really effective at conveying a message more so than just discussion. just the message on its I own. Guess. Yeah, yeah. In fiction, you can be far, far, far more concise. You know, mm -hmm. in illustrating why something is true. Well, I think it's a whole it's show don't tell really in effect the the idea that if you demonstrate the point that you're making it's uh it's going to be way easier for somebody to understand why that that message makes sense as opposed to a very methodical also almost uh, clinical relaying of information making them right. care about the situation and the characters and then the message comes through as if as, almost as if it's like a friend of theirs that's uh mm -hmm. committing to this thing and they're like oh i get like, it now okay. i get why they're doing that <laughs> right as opposed to, you know what you should do? This. And it's like, well, I disagree. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, season seven is a really personal season for me. And I'm actually, I was really delighted to hear how you guys liked it. So I like it a lot. Yeah, I like yeah, it a lot. I feel like that polarized a lot of people again, because here's this like show that started off as this stupid raunchy comedy where nobody learns anything. And, uh, I decided to use it as a, you know, a vehicle for exploring my own feelings growing up in my twenties and the nihilism I was going through and you know, my questions about life. I kind of put them all in these characters. And, um, I was, I was very honest about certain feelings in that season and uh it was just a vulnerable thing to write but it was also very cathartic for me like i got a lot of frustration and rage out writing those episodes for that season and um it's it's that's what i like so much about writing is that you can channel so much negativity into something yeah. positive <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah yeah and i encourage everyone to to do it you know if if they haven't tried it I'm just like, have you ever tried creative writing? And they say, no, I'm just like, you should just try something. You might be good at it. You never know. Because I think everybody's a storyteller, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to be writing something like you can tell stories through music or whatever. It's all like underpinned by narrative. I feel like and that's it's kind what, of in yeah. our um, human etymology at this point. Telling stories is like something we would have done as soon as communication was possible. Not only to teach lessons, but to entertain, to distract, to l literally tell someone about someone's history. Just be like, this is a thing that happened. And every time yeah. you get them in, you know, right. around the campfire, everybody's listening. It's just like, yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. All of us have not only told them in our bloodlines, but listened to them intently. Right. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a reason why entertainment is subsumed with story that story is like the key you know tv film uh at tv film video games uh books comic books all of the like the, it's everything stories and like documentaries you know why, why is it the david attenborough documentaries are so compelling it's because he like weaves a story into yeah, what's happening generate narratives very much by the dramatic music in these very you know sterile and objective documentaries you're like nah they, they try to have some fun with it they're yeah. like yeah look look at the friendly penguin as he moves across the oh no oh no look what's coming yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. well it's it's funny like david attenborough's what he does is almost like a microcosm of what stories is he has the status quo and then there's something that gets thrown in like a, it's usually a predator <laughs> you know or like um or something like that or prey that they find so, you know, from the perspective of the lions who tell the story about how the lions are starting to get hungry, they need to, you know, get some prey. And then there's the the zebra or the the the, uh, the buffalo running around and then the story there, or if it's like a penguin, 
getting separated from its mom and then it well from its dad actually because that's you know like the cub getting separated from the parent yeah. and then they go on their little journey to find them and it's just like that's a way people are really receptive to stories um mm-hmm. i think that's like a universal truth of human beings is we really are receptive to stories i don't know that there's anybody in the world who doesn't enjoy good stories I think Absolutely. there was, uh, do you ever watch Walk in, the Walking With series? We mentioned it a few weeks ago, but uh, Walking With Dinosaurs, Monsters, Beasts is ah, the whole lot. I feel lot. like I've seen I remember that. Yep. I think yeah. it was Walking With Beasts, but there was this storyline of like um, a giraffe cow sort of creature. I can't remember what it was called, but it like, it has a kid and it's growing up with them and they go on a little adventure. But once they reach a certain age, the mum basically kicks it off and go away. You have to survive on your own now. And, like, it, uh, I think it gets into, like, a fight with some other creature, survives, and then it eventually bumps back into the mum, who's got a new uh, baby, and she doesn't even recognize it, to the point where she considers it a threat and is going to kill it if it gets anywhere closer to it. And I remember as a kid being so sad about that, and it's all made up, essentially. <laughs> it's all fucking yeah. I was just like, that's so, that's the life cycle, that's horrible. And it's like, it's not even, didn't happen. <laughs> it's like, but it probably <laughs> did, though. It's, it's so sad. Yeah, it's, it's that's that's uh that's 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 why I think um what David Attenborough did, I I really like him and I like a lot of these uh these um documentary narrators who come up with these really awesome stories. Yeah, yeah. Man, uh, just uh, we we like that shit, don't we? All of us do. <laughs> it's like, get us get us feeling stuff. Do. I mean, it's the whole reason we exist is to experience. That's the whole point. I remember when I was really young, before way before I started like writing, um, I would I would listen to music a lot, and I would kind of paint narratives in my head to yeah. like go along with the music. Yeah, and uh, it wasn't, and it, I had I would have these like feelings wash over me, but it wasn't just because of a certain image on its own in my head. It was because I was juxtaposing it with something else that I had thought of just before that, you know? So like mm-hmm. very early on as a kid, I kind of latched onto the idea that it's, it's narrative. It's, it's the meaningful sequence of events where this happens, but then this happens. Mm-hmm. And it's like, there's a dramatic juxtaposition there where there's like a, a meaningful growth moving over, moving from one stage to the next. So yeah, uh, uh, Trey Parker, Matt Stone method of writing. It's never, and it's, but or therefore, this yes. happens, but this happens, therefore this happens is way more effective than I went to the place and I got an ice cream and it was really swell and I yeah. went home, you know. Oh my god, the people yeah. in, the people in chat have the names of the things I was referring to. How do you even know this? The the the, <laughs> the, the, the creature that was the mum was an Indricotherium. I, that's probably pronounced horribly wrong, and the uh, the the monster that it fought was a hyena don, which sounds made up, doesn't it? Hyena Don. Oh, hyena Don. <laughs> I believe just... it. Yeah, I've heard of that before. <laughs> but I, I fucking love those series, man. I could watch them just like just just give me it, give me all these horrible monsters and wonderful kind herbivores battling their way through a world that doesn't care about them. You know, uh, the movie I think of that is the antithesis of that storytelling approach is uh, Batman versus Superman, where like, <laughs> you have yeah. all these scenes that could be put in an entirely different order and like it wouldn't matter because like nothing ever affects the next thing it's just the sequence of events that exactly have to do with one another proper writing is like this scene organically leads into this one and then this one and then this one whereas that movie is just like let's just shove a bunch of scenes in that don't tie in they're not related to each other at all and yeah fuck that movie is a piece of shit i hated it <laughs> <laughs> I, not wrong the only also, part I liked was when Superman gets a sink smashed on his head. I was like, that was pretty cool. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. That movie. Yeah, I, yeah we, we're going to have to talk about DCU eventually. EFAP will have an arc for it, but because uh, everyone says you should watch the, the extended version, the non extended one is a joke, but I don't know. I don't know how much they can fix it. Certainly didn't help for <laughs> Ghostbusters. Not that I'm saying it, it would be the same situation, but uh, also, I do believe Hyena Dawn is a real thing. I was just saying it sounds fake, yeah. doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does um, sound like someone who's just like, hmm, fuck it. Pocket <laughs> I, I Dawn, it's I the know. pocket square of dinosaurs. Um... <laughs> Why did you say that name? <laughs> I love how. Yeah. I, I just love how, like, 
people will try to explain. I don't know about you guys, but who refers to their mom using their first name? Why wouldn't he just shout, well, yeah, you gotta save my mom, <laughs> you know? By the which, which, by the way, is so much better. Have Superman yeah. telling you to save his mother. It's like, oh. Cool. I, I like the idea that, um, that it's like, oh, they both have the same name, Martha. It's like, dude, like, <laughs> that's a nifty coincidence, but I don't care, but dude. Like <laughs> but, but the part that should get to Batman is that he has that level of humanity. He's like, please save my yeah. mum. It's like, oh, shit. Yeah. That's, that's, that makes you... <laughs> that this... should be enough. Exactly, but yeah. instead he's like, wait, Martha's my mum's name. <laughs> Martha, <why> just... <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then she runs up to him and explains. Yeah. Fucking, just, oh my god. I like the idea that Lois Lane is sprinting up to this bedecked Batman <laughs> in this master metal suit. Just like, no, 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 don't spike, don't spike him, please. It's his mama. <laughs> you got... That's I I I, do, I don't get it. Like, was did Zack Snyder just like, oh, they got the same name? That's let's let's do something with that. <laughs> like, as if that's the most pertinent Listen, thing to pull out. All of, of it. that, all of that will get fixed in the Snyder cut. Well, oh, yeah, I'm uh, sure. I I uh, the part of the problem is it's going to be unfair because this Snyder cut's going to be long compared to the actual film. It could be anybody awesome. look it it should be better than justice league if it, it is, be isn't better. better than justice yeah. league that would be insane like it's not mm -hmm. remotely the same action i really don't want people to be like okay so zack snyder is clearly better than everybody who worked on the original one because he managed to pull off this movie uh, and it was totally equal circumstances it's just like no the 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 the, the snyder cut has had every single advantage you could ever want for making something well, this he's kind got of extra money he's got like uh, at least six months at least six months to make it i'm work. pretty sure he's been tooling he's with it this whole time is he not it's like his yeah, thing I'm, and whereas i'm pretty sure uh i'm pretty sure that um joss whedon came in like what six months ahead of time he had to reshoot and he didn't get it uh he didn't get um a delay yeah, and, and who, who knows exactly what he even got to do, right? As opposed to just, yeah. they brought in a name to try and headline it. Exactly, to just fix and it up. if it's people it, are wondering, like, why would they choose him? It's like, because he's the fuck guy who did the last two Avengers films. Like, of course. It, it only makes sense. <laughs> yeah. um, and there's one guy. Yeah. But, and this isn't to say that, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say, like, if it's good, I'm going to be angry at it. It's like, no, no, I, I, I hope it's good. For all the people out there who adore Snyder's work. I really do hope it's good, but I, I I don't know, man. Don't get your hopes too high. He's a bit of a he's 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 got he's got patterns in how he constructs stuff. <laughs> That's all. That's all I'll say, okay? Actually, I, uh, I have a soft spot for Justice League because it's so fucking bad that I think maybe <laughs> I, I was find crying, it hilariously laughing. funny. <laughs> yeah. I was doubled over fucking crying in hysterics. And it, I rank it as one of my favorites so bad it's good movies where I'm just like I have a I had a great time watching that movie just because it's such slog it's, it's and so I actually bad. I hopes the Snyder Cut is worse somehow than Justice League just because <laughs> oh I would love that fuck if that if actually, it was that bad funny. and it's that funny yeah I just if it I was like, another if it was like bad, Batwoman levels like I'd be on board but again you've got hordes of people who are desperately looking for this movie to like justify Zack Snyder almost or at least uh, Justice League they they want to see Henry and, and, and Ben and, and Gal, these names sound weird in my head when you just say the first ones all work together to battle is it Darkseid is going to be in uh, uh, well I, guess, I think they're yeah. going to add Darkseid in which is um. I always found it weird that it was Steppenwolf like what a fucking odd choice Steppenwolf really not Brainiac or Darkseid or a big boy Steppenwolf okay so we're building choice. up to the big boys. Well, I mean, part of the and part of the problem is like the DCEU at this point is so like shaky. I'm I'm pretty sure the new Batman film is in a separate continuity. It's like, oh, so what what is this universe then? It's oh, it's like a multiverse, I guess, now. But it's it's weird. It's because from what I understand, the whole point of the Batman was it was gonna re like write out the DCEU as it already exists, but now I guess they want to commit to the DC. Like, we're in this weird point where people think the DCEU is actually well-constructed. <laughs> and it's, it's not. It really isn't. It's just, no. it's a complete mess. I mean, like, the, the MCU has enough issues to be called, like, broken as, as, a, as an mm -hmm. entire world, but DCU doesn't even come close. 
Well, the big no, problem with the all. DCEU is that even from like a broad meta story structure, I think the easiest way to compare it is the order for if the if the MCU was like the DCEU, the order of films would be Iron Man, Captain America: Civil War, um, and then there'd be a uh, oh, there'd be like a um, Thor. What's, what's, <laughs> a, what's a what's a no a bad guy group, just a, a bad guy group from the uh. I don't the know, MCU like Sinister um, Six. Sin- yeah, Sinister Six. Then right. the Sinister Six movie, and then um, I guess Captain Marvel, and then Avengers. Like, what kind? Of, like, what yeah, kind it's of order bizarre. is that? Not to mention, we're getting what? Suicide Squad again soon. <laughs> That's like, Suicide okay. Squad. That's right, and it's a direct sequel, kind of. Who's who's directing that one? James, James Gunn. James so Gunn, there's yeah. a little bit of hope. Oh, for right. That. Okay. There's a little bit of hope for that one. The, the, I, think. I would I would argue it's a lot of hope. Honestly, he's he's easily like top 10 at this point of people who are behind a project where I'd be like, ooh, we can expect writing to be good, hopefully. Yeah. Well, characters at least. At For least sure, the yeah. characters will be interesting. Um, and I think what, it, so I think what they're making for DC now is like, they got Wonder Woman and then they got that, uh, Suicide Squad, the Batman, um, I think they're making Shazam two, and then like Aquaman two. So it's not it's not a great lineup. Like I mean, I'm only really yeah. interested. <laughs> Suicide Squad and Batman. That's really all I'm there for. Yeah. But um, I think it's uh Matt Reeves who did the recent Planet of the Apes films, which I like personally. Though I'm pretty sure that they have a lot of problems, but I do like I, those. Yeah, films. I really like them as well. Yeah, I think they're good. I like Caesar a lot. Um, Andy Serkis is pretty excellent yeah he's great he's terrific i feel sorry for him with snoke he he apparently was quite uh into snoke and he was like it was gonna be cool it's just yeah, nah. oh, <laughs> i forgot he did that i think yeah, um good. he's similar to to mark hamill in that he was sold on something different i can't remember if i read this somewhere but it was just like the the trilogy pitch was just changing constantly throughout all of these movies being made like, what exactly this is all for. And just, you know, you read the script for TLJ and you're like, oh, I guess I die. Okay. Huh. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be disappointing. Um, and I remember, I can't remember, I think it was uh, the guy who played Admiral Akbar. This one makes me really sad. His last day on set, um, playing Admiral Akbar, whom he'd played since the beginning, he didn't get any fanfare or anything. He just got to say, it's a rap while in the costume. And then he cried when he'd left. Because nobody gave a shit. It's or at least that's how we felt. It's like, oh man, oh, wow. these depressing stories on set of uh of this movie. And as and as yeah, we know no that uh, uh, Oscar Isaac will not return unless he needs money. <laughs> and, unless he needs money to buy a house. <laughs> and uh, John Boyega <laughs> laughs regularly on Twitter about how he got money from Star Wars and that he's not responsible for the writing. <laughs> 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 it's insane. And that imagine what we'd be getting if they if there wasn't huge pressure to not criticize the mouse. Like, holy shit. Yeah. Well, we I got feel... that all female uh, pirates movie reboot thingy coming uh, up. Oh, uh, with uh, Margot uh, Robbie. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> Well, I mean, I like her. Dude, the first like, one will have a cameo shit. from Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow, and it'll make everyone go nuts because he'll be in the trailer, and then in the second film, they'll completely assassinate him. <laughs> Is that he what you think they're, they're going to do? Yeah. Well, if they want to remain within uh, standard. <laughs> every every reboot of anything. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of like the modus operandi for Terminator, isn't it? Like, we just meet like... him in the next one, and he's like this very well-dressed guy, and he's just like... Drinking isn't good for you, okay? Like, it it, it it hurts those around you more than it hurts yourself. And you're like, wow. No, but remember, Mauler, Jack Sparrow is a uh, an inferior version from a deleted timeline. Oh, God. What's <laughs> <laughs> oh. such a terrible line to put in your movie. Like, you're a it's relic just these, from... <laughs> these pompous-ass new remakes that think they're so awesome because they have a hundred bazillion dollars while they're... The the original ones are so old and gay now. Yeah, it's like, it. hey, <laughs> those peasants had to earn their way to the top. I can grab yeah, you I with my CGI like arm. Yeah. <laughs> and we were talking yesterday about um, Han Solo and how he uh, how he sold Luke's uh, medallion for drinking money for booze money. And how he got Leia a kitchen installed on the Millennium Falcon for her birthday. For wedding, we wedding. 
Oh, for a wedding? Oh, The wedding hell. gift Han provided Leia was a kitchen in, <laughs> in the Millennium. <laughs> this sounds like a joke. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, no, it's canon. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's canon is my favorite. <laughs> like, when it's off and off, this is what yeah. it is now forever. They really hate these old characters. They need them, but they hate them. Mm -hmm. Well, you need you need their corpses to pile them up so that your your new characters can be propelled forward. You know, <laughs> that's how it feels. It feels like there's just this how mountain of characters we love who've been destroyed it's... in order to prop up these new characters. We are well past a pattern at this point. We didn't even we had the pattern with just Star Wars, but we've gotten like countless well, franchises we've that are doing Terminator. this. Twice over, um, I mean, what would be another clear one of this happening? Toy Story? Uh, oh, Toy Story 4, yeah. Terminator? Or, Wait, you mentioned Terminator, did you? Or Predator, yeah, I guess? I did. Uh, Predator, well, yeah, but Predator, like, that movie's just dog shit overall. Hang like, on, I'm well, sure well they, it. so they don't, they didn't, the only character they could oh, destroy oh. would have been, uh, Dutch, but they couldn't get him. Oh, I mean, Arnie didn't want to be in it. Thank fuck. So, instead, <laughs> all they could ruin was the Predator lore, which they did. They made them autism hunters. It's like, yeah, what? Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> that's right, the original Predator, he came to you, I've talked about this before, I think it's in my video, but like, I remember being super young and watching Predator and being blown away by the motivation of the movie monster being sport. I was like, that is so fucking yeah. cool. And it collects the skulls of the people it beats. It's like, that is so awesome. That it's like, nah, I was collecting the spines so it could draw out the, the fluid to study and, <laughs> and get what? I don't yeah. know. Like, it's just like, come on. You ruined everything. <laughs> like, why would you do this? <laughs> He's hunting autism powers. Because <laughs> autism is the next stage of human evolution. Fucking movie, man. Universe. They had to ruin the <laughs> aliens, too. It's not a, not not even the human, the protagonist the... human hero characters. Was they had to no, ruin the killed, villain, too. You killed too. the namesake of the whole series. You ruined the <laughs> namesake. Oh. That's how bad they are. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> yeah. carry on, I guess. Where were we? We're at, we're at season seven, I guess. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. so, uh, I was really proud of how season seven turned out. Um, there, there is a, there was a controversy around it though. Cause, um, um, I can't really go into it without spoiling it for people who haven't seen season seven. But there's a big catastrophic, catastrophic end mm -hmm. to season seven, and I intentionally built up to that moment from the very beginning. Oh, you can tell. It's actually, it's actually foreshadowed, like it's bookended. One of the first images is cool. In the season, alludes to it. Yeah, it is cool. And um, a lot of people thought, uh, maybe not a lot, but a certain portion of people thought that my message was glamorizing suicide. And um, uh, I didn't. Uh, that really wasn't my intention. Uh, I, what, I feel like it's an immature take, as far as I'm concerned. It's just like, oh, that well, that glabber. I don't know. I don't think it's entirely invalid either. Um, it's an inaccurate thing message to take away from it. I think, given all the context of the season, but uh, I can see how people would come to that conclusion. And um, what I saw it as the, the toys have a very unique situation, and by the end of that season, they saw no way out. Yeah, them. I mean, that's kind of where I was going to go with it. It's like, the, yeah. there, there's no, no one's experiencing, technically speaking, if we're going to go very literal, what they are. Uh, right. And that I imagine it seemed like the logical end point if we're going to be building these creatures up with actual, like, characters, uh, lived experiences, memories, emotions, and the fact that they're falling apart. Exactly. Which they're is terrifying, apart. by the way. Right, yeah. That, and that was a major theme of that throughout that whole season was, like, decay. They're, they're coming apart at the seams because there's, there's wear and tear. They're, they're finite. They have finite bodies. And um, um, by the end, uh, 
yeah, they they throughout in the course of the season they they feel like the character the antagonist Eugene to them is like their one last attempt at making a real friend online and they didn't even they couldn't even do that. And so by the end they really have nothing, nothing on the horizon. And the the relationship between the toys themselves is just soured by circumstance. And um uh yeah, it's just it's a very it's a very uh, bleak ending, and it's sort of reflective of just how I was feeling at the time. At the time, you know, I was just very nihilistic at the time, mm-hmm. and um, but I didn't feel it like it was dishonest in the ending. You know, I don't think like, so. like you were like you were saying, it felt like a logical conclusion to me, as grim as it is. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, they don't, but I, they don't like if you're losing your body parts in real life, you're actually on a ticking timer, this, the fear with being a toy is what if you separate all the parts you can't move but you're still alive? Right. Yeah. This is, this so is what the, I mean about being in a unique situation with, with what these creatures are. Yeah. So the, the light at the end of the tunnel for me in that situation was that they were taking control of their own lives, mm-hmm. you know, at the very end. And um, so, but then I... I I left I left the show for a while, and that was at the same time I stopped working for Machinima, and the way they fired me was just simply not responding to my emails anymore. It was very unprofessional. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gee. and so yeah, so leaving Machinima and leaving the show kind of just happened at the same time, and um, it just the show wasn't getting the views that it used to, and. That's partly my fault. It's partly their fault for making LA such dog shit. Are being the chief in LA, <laughs> and um, I was just yeah, I was feeling really bitter. And then as time went on, I was looking back on the series, and I'm thinking like, is this really how I want to end this show? Like it started off as so like just like funny and upbeat, and then it ends in the most <laughs> the most bleakest way possible, <laughs> and. Uh, that that was uh one of the reasons i decided to go ahead with an eighth season i almost i felt an obligation to kind of like not not a dishonest not like i'm not trying to revise my feelings on season seven i think season seven it has its purpose i don't regret making that season i think it's an important one it's a personal one for me i'm very proud of it but um i didn't want the takeaway to be like Oh, I guess that's it then. Just, just end the pain of life on your own terms, and then, and that's it. Um, I did. That felt like a. I didn't want to end the show that way. Yeah, I understand what you mean. But, uh... but I said I told myself I wasn't going to go ahead with season eight until I had a story that was worth pursuing. And then I had this idea of bringing Adam back because his fate was undetermined. Like, uh, like you kind of you yeah. see him arrested. And then you don't really hear from him again. And I liked that character so much. And I decided to bring him back. And I also, I didn't want to bring the toys back straight away because of the big thing that I had built up to in season seven. And so that's kind of partly why the 2001 arc is there is because I wanted this big kind of dreamlike buffer in between that climax of season seven and then season eight, where they come back, they're back together. Because it just felt too abrupt. Just all of a sudden, they're back again. It's like, oh, I guess the emotional significance of the season seven is just thrown out the window. I didn't want to do that. Like how you're highlighting the nightmare of being a writer. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. <laughs> all yeah. the choices you make means all of the other choices were not made. Like every other possibility is now not possible if you choose one, one road. Yeah. And as I also just, I wanted to do a 2001 parody because I love that movie so much. And I saw this like comedic parallel between Hal and Chief or Pal, as he's called in the 2001 <laughs> arc, the perfect algorithmic computer. <laughs> and uh, who's obviously so imperfect. And um, uh, so I did that. And I'm currently in the process of doing season eight. And I don't want to go too much 
I'd rather not go too much into detail. I'd rather just, if people want to watch it, they can check it out. It's on my channel. Yeah, because we're getting closer and closer to catching up to, like, uh, we're, not uh, even, we're nowhere near old internet days anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm independent now. I'm not working for Mishinama anymore, obviously. I'm, I'm just working for myself. I got my channel. I got an editing job on the side as well. Ooh. And, um, yeah, just that's that's pretty much my the story of our being the chief, the evolution of it. Yeah, and uh, I imagine you've gained and lost all kinds of different kinds of viewers uh, throughout. Probably ones that stick through the whole thing, ones that joined on when it was more drama than comedy, and then vice versa, maybe the dropping out. Um, oh yeah, there are there are a couple of major polarizing points, but uh, I always did what I wanted to do, you know. Mm -hmm. I never tried yeah. to like pander to like the fans and like I just did what I thought was compelling, what I thought was funny, what I thought was entertaining, and I just did it as best as I could. And you know, there's problems along the way, but like I really learned from all of those problems. This is why I was saying earlier about like you can't, you can't have any regrets really in life because you learn from everything you know everything shapes you for those uh, it's like who are listening what would you recommend if uh, they were looking to maybe get into the show like maybe an episode or a season or uh start uh, i don't know just start start from the beginning and uh just know that once you hit season five things are going to change quite a bit and uh if you don't like it, that's fair. It's not for everybody, the direction I took it in. But it just, <laughs> I, wanted the, I wanted the show to evolve. I didn't want to keep doing the same. As someone like, said in chat, except for LA, fuck LA. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's te terrible. I regret that decision. But I learned from it. And I learned just the whole experience with Machinima was, is a whole story on its own, you know. And once mm -hmm. that deteriorated, I kind of... That was a really eye-opening experience for me because I learned what Hollywood culture is really like, you know, and what, like, just the well, nature um, of business and corporate corporations. They pissed off the whole internet in more ways than one when they, they essentially, without warning, dumped their entire Completed log everything. of so many, so much content. It's insane, like, that they would have done that. And... You know, you have the kind of fans among all of these different IPs that were on uh, Machinima that would have downloaded all of them if you just given them like an hour, <laughs> like just told them yeah. hey, how to go down. Well, that's kind of the the, the sad part is you managed to get a, a lot of your backlog back, but um, I know like Battlefield Friends, I'm pretty sure like season three onwards is gone, like it's not anywhere, and I really like that show. You can't find it, and there's a lot of other shows that are. Uh, never got their backlog back and it's just like why would you delete so much years and years uh, and years of people's work it's fucking terrible what wanted. how they handled that yeah just the catastrophe yeah. so poorly it's managed that's what that's what they're remembered for really yeah all right. of that Deleting stuff that they did is just it doesn't matter anymore you remember where they what tried to remember they tried to revamp their image a little bit towards the end there when <laughs> warner brothers <laughs> yeah, came in they did yeah. yeah, and it was just so terrible. And, uh, yeah, it's just really cringy how they tried to kind of reinvigorate their image. And all, obviously that ended in catastrophic failure because they're, they are no longer an entity of right. any kind. Like, there's yeah. no record. There's no website. There's, there's just nothing. It's just gone. And so that's, I was, it was kind of an immense relief for me at that moment and really freeing all of a sudden because I didn't upload any of my old content to my channel for a long time because I'm just like, is this legal? Like, does Machinima still own the content? And like, I'm, I can't, I can't re-upload to my channel, I guess, because I was under contract with them and ugh, I had people giving me flack for like, it's like, well, you, you signed a contract with them and they can do whatever they want. And that, includes getting rid of all their <laughs> stuff and i'm just like i didn't i didn't late i didn't put that much fucking love and labor into the show just so five years down the line the whole fucking thing could be erased that's stupid as fuck 
Like you, yeah. What you, kind of stupid thing? It, you had a contract that said that they could yeet your entire catalog of work. <laughs> so yeah. too bad. Well, it didn't say that in the contract, obviously. No, I know, but that's like right, it's yeah. like it's just like why would I agree to so this something? Why would I pour an a decade of my life into the show, and it's I'm expected to be okay with the, the whole show being erased off of the internet entirely? And I'm I'm not even allowed to put put it on my own channel. And I tried so for so long for months. I was emailing Machinima saying, "Can someone please fucking tell me if it's okay for me to re-upload to my own channel?" Because I'm really confused here. It's like I get that you I had a contract with you and you owned the content, but you're not hosting the content on your channel anymore. And I, I don't even care about monetization. I just want the fucking show seen. Yeah. I just want it to be able to be enjoyed. That's it. Even if it's still on your channel, I don't give a fuck. Just put it up there just so people can like watch. And you, you notice I'm getting angry now just talking about this. Shit. <laughs> yeah. like, man, it's so, it infuriates me. What I can't what imagine I why you'd be angry that five people. years of your life is being deleted. <laughs> uh, it's, it's fine. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty emblematic, isn't it, of the disconnect between like corporate and creative, right? Corporate is like, what's the big deal? You know, who cares? Like, this is the contract. Oh, yeah. What's the big deal? Whereas the creator is like, well, Dude, like this is like my life's work. Yeah, so, and that's Fucking what it hell, is. Man. And th if they wanted to keep it on their channel and monetize it, so they get the revenue, I was prepared for that too. That I that would have been okay with that, really, because at least people would have been able to see the show. At least it's up. Yeah, and so when Machinima just went off the map entirely as a as a an entity, like it just doesn't exist anymore. I'm just like, fuck it. I'll just. I guess I can re-upload my stuff now because it doesn't matter. There is technically no owner anymore. So No, it doesn't exist. It and I made the fucking show either. anyway. So yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I handled you know. every aspect of it. So Except uh, LA. Fuck LA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't re-upload that one. I, <laughs> but uh, I noticed. <laughs> yes. Uh, I remember uh, checking through it and I was like, yep, that's not there. Good stuff. I don't know if this is true for all of Machinima's old content, but I know Rooster Teeth grabbed a lot of it and like rehosted uh, it. I think they did, but I think uh, yeah. I think Rooster Teeth is a subsidiary because I'm on their Wikipedia now, and uh, it was bought out by like Warner Brothers, um, and and then it was going to be reorganized into Auto Media Holdings, which is a subdivision of like Warner. I, I always get confused, right? Because it's like Auto Media Holdings is an American digital media company owned by Warner Media, a division of AT&T's Warner Media. It's like, how high up does this go? Um, and yeah, that that company owns like Crunchyroll, Full Screen, and Rooster Teeth. So there must have been some sort of like cross deal, I would imagine, because they're part of the same company. Right. Yeah. Um, I th I certainly think Warner Brothers, Warner Media, whatever, didn't really know what they were buying. It feels and... like that happened with um what was uh what was that uh Disney bought it it was um that multi channel network um what was ah uh, I can't remember what it was called Disney bought a multi channel network for like half a billion dollars and it just was not a worthwhile investment at all because multi channel networks are kind of like yeah you know right yeah I I don't know the name of that one. Damn it. It was... Ah, uh, <laughs> this is going to kill me. I'll find it eventually. We'll just <laughs> I'll get it. But, uh, yeah, I have a... You know, working with Machinima wasn't all bad. For me, anyway. I know it was bad for a lot of people. A bunch yeah. of people were, were screwed over. And just, because I joined with them so early, I, had a, I was on a better contract than what a lot of like the, the newer directors were on because yeah. um, they had learned how to like write their contracts to maximize their profits you know while just giving their creators the bare minimum the people who are actually doing the fucking work you it know? was maker studio by the way that yeah maker studio everybody's saying it in chat that got bought right. out for like half a billion dollars right um but work working with machinima they they kind of left me alone for the most part. Like they let me do the show the way I wanted. And I'm grateful for that. Um, there was some censorship that moved in around season seven. I started having to bleep out words mm. that pissed me yeah, off. I remember that. You had to bleep yeah. out. Yeah. Cunt. <laughs> yeah. 
because like I had never censored myself before that. And all of a sudden it's like inappropriate to like use the words I'm using. I'm just like, well, now it's not okay. And then I'm, I'm having email arguments with their fucking, what do they call it? Like, uh, PR standards guys and or... practices. Right. Yeah. Just the person, the people in charge of cleaning up their image. And I'm I'm arguing over like you know I should be able to say this word because don't you see it's in this context where it's not offensive and here the 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 actual joke is this and the target isn't that it's I'm here's why it works they don't care they don't care about any of that it's just like as soon as one of the bad words on their red flag list you know as soon as they hear it mentioned it's like nope that's not okay you got to bleep it I'm just like this that's is just gonna sucks. piss people off like come on so I I eventually like. I wrote dialogue that would ab abuse that like deliberately. Like I would have chief say th things that had cunt in the same sentence, like seven or eight times, just so, <laughs> just so it would bleep <laughs> over and over and over again. And it's just my way of kind of giving a middle finger to the whole censorship thing. And yeah, it, r it really, really sucks when you've got this idea of what you want and someone else tells you, nah, you can't do that. Yeah. And I never had to do that before. And I was on season seven now, you know, and it's just like now I got I got people I got to run my content through people to tell me like, this is OK. This isn't OK. Like, I was just very uncomfortable with that. I didn't it's like that lame. at all. Yeah. And it wasn't like I wasn't being careful with the language I use, you know, like I use pretty foul language, but I every time I'm actually carefully considering the context of it. I'm like, do people know? why i'm using this word like do they know why it's funny like like that, if, i was, if only I was always very aware of that if only you'd made all of it at the same time as that first episode and it all would have been okay <laughs> yeah exactly yeah they were i mean machinima was quite happy to to yeah to to have all that language when it was profitable profitable to them when nobody cared but then you know they they just they flutter in the in the in the political wind you know where it's just like mm or like the however you would phrase it where they're just they wanted to clean up their image there's a, a right. phase l late into machinima where they were just like we can't have all this like edgy you know uh, unfiltered language and like they were getting some flack for like women being over sexualized like there's a there's a series called uh yeah gamers uh, hate that yeah i know exactly Ooh, that what was it called sanity not included they had like a intro segment like animated segments where chicks had like massive tits and oh you know, no yeah that. boo that yeah no <laughs> yeah so i mean and i just maybe there's an argument there that maybe that's you know over sexualizing women i don't know i just i didn't didn't seem like a big deal to me i thought it was it came from a, a good place Oh, that's, you know, you know, I mean, that stuff's ongoing, just, right? It'll be around f just how much and just how little are allowed or what should be, all that stuff. Right, yeah. So Machinima was just getting, they wanted to go, like, they were getting more and more success and they were reaching closer and closer to, like, the big, big league corporate level. Mm -hmm. And when you get to that level, all of a sudden you've got to, like, clean up your act, I guess. And they yeah. were just trying to... Yeah, they wanted to give the give themselves a bit more of a polished, sophisticated look, I guess. I, mean, I think it's a combo of broad appeal plus the fact that so many eyes are on you, you got to be a little bit more careful because I think we all kind of see that like it's less about the act being wrong, it's more about who saw it and who complained. And by wrong, yeah, I just mean against right. the rules. Yeah. It's yeah, like so... a pragmatic approach. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so things towards the end th during season seven, my relationship with Machinima started deteriorating. I could tell like things weren't going to a good place because they would respond to me less and less frequently via email. And, and the contract uh, you had with them, was it ongoing or was it renewed every uh, year or every season? Um, I, I don't think it was strictly every year, but every now and then. If they had like a, a new contract, they would give it to me. Um, yeah, with just some revised terms. I was on like a, a th I used to be get paid by the views, but then it was like a salary. 
uh, as time went on. Right. Did you know? Did and you then, like have the position of just being like, man, I should uh, strike out instead of you know, like on my own instead of signing with these people? Like, I'm assuming that I, creeped in. Yeah, I really wish I hadn't neglected my own channel, you know, in service of, because like I I was uploading shit to my channel like Master Chief sucks at Halo one and two, and then um, once I signed up with Machinima, it's like okay, you make videos for our channel now. And so I wasn't really uploading anything to my channel at all. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wish I'd kind of kept up activity on my channel in some form. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's where I am now. I'm trying to rebuild it. And I've decided like independent from here on out, you know, I think yeah. uh, a lot of people are starting to realize that like going your own way, is super valuable nowadays. Yeah. And not to mention possible now, it like is possible. it's just yeah. like the means of, of creating your own stuff are just they're there at a consumer level now like you get a webcam you get a microphone you can get your own green screen you can get a dslr and i guess and you uh, can you can it, make it, your own shit now like, like you don't need a studio hook yeah up. exactly yeah and you can learn a lot of these skills but i guess the interesting thing is because when i was younger back in the early 2010s or late 2000s i was like oh yeah this machinima thing i think machinima was like really accessible as a as a means of telling stories but because i never had an xbox i couldn't really do it because like halo is the only game that it really works with but it's interesting that despite the fact that machinima is a super accessible way of actually creating cinematic content it's kind of died almost as a mainstream like thing because obviously there's your show and there's like red versus blue is still going on. But other than that, there's not really a lot of machinima anymore. Um, which is weird considering that it's super accessible. Well, I, th I think it depends how you define machinima. And I, I have a right. big problem with the word and uh, how a lot yeah. of people use it. Because um, machinima is so loaded. Like it can either mean the name of the company, which doesn't exist anymore. Or a specific subset of fan content right right or to me it's much more broad than that because it's a contraction of machine cinema and so to me machine cinema applies to any kind of triple a video game cutscene you know what i mean like you're making cinema with a computer right yeah the the strict definition is the use of real time computer graphics to create a cinematic production so video games yeah. Right, exactly. So like, you know, the Uncharted games, for example, like those, those, all, all those cutscenes, that's to me, that's machinima. But the way pe people most often use machinima is that it's specifically fan curated. Content. Right, the idea of you're using a game engine in a way that it wasn't strictly intended to be used to create a story. Right, you're um, creating cinematic content in a non-official capacity where you're not affiliated with the developer of the engine right. or whatever, which I think is just a is such a weird way of defining the term. Yeah, it just didn't. It just never really sat well with me. I'm just like, well, if this this is machinima, what do you call like big budget in-game cinematics? It's basically the same thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's I guess obviously the tool true. set is more sophisticated on the developer end well yeah just... i guess that's the interesting thing like you got source filmmaker i mean what is that that's that's like machinima but it's it's basically you're just using the same tools that the developers use to create the cutscenes for uh for team fortress 2 and stuff yeah so but... yeah i got i got people tweeting at me sending me emails saying like like how do you feel about being one of the few people who are still contributing to this lost art form i'm like what do you mean lost art form it's still being done. Like, how's it a lost it art form? I don't understand. Done. I guess it, but yeah, like I was saying, it just depends on how you define I the guess, term. Uh, it'd just be like Halo 3, well, the ha Halo 3, like Halo Machinima in general is not very common when back in like the late 2000s, there was a shit ton of like Halo 3 Machinima shows. There was, uh, what was it, matchmaking and like pre-game lobby and stuff like that? There was all yep. these ones and it's not really... But I, I feel like that might be more associated with the fact that Halo isn't that relevant anymore. Um, no. or, well, I say not that relevant, like it's still a big deal, but it feels like... Uh, well, it doesn't even Definitely just feel like... It, it's it used it's, to be. Yeah, it used Three to be like... Out of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it used to be like the defining uh, 
game of uh, the Xbox, and I guess it still is, but like Xbox as a whole is a lot less relevant now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, uh, that ties what we were talking about near the beginning with like the key creative staff being cycled out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have these people moving over to 343 who it's just not the same core it's not the same team. development or narrative team. Yeah. And, and uh, I think it's uh, often forgotten because people see the logo like, oh, it's it's that developer. And then you forget that um, it's very rare that you have a Kojima type who sticks with the same franchise for like 30 years and has a core team that sticks around for that long too. So things are generally consistent. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. If, I, I hope uh, 343 pulls out something good. I'd like some Infinity. good Halo games, personally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd like Absolutely. some good Halo games. Yeah, everyone, everyone but... want to do a vote on that? Do we want good stuff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, like, I, guess, I miss um... the Halo kind of gameplay, and not a lot of stuff sort of gives you that. No, Halo was a unique... I feel like Halo filled this... this middle ground between uh i guess what a lot of console shooters are now and what the old school type of shooter used to be like quake yeah sort of thing you know it's this kind of middle ground where it's um it's a, a mix between the two that was really unique yeah um, i don't even know what modern sorts of games i play that really compare i mean apex no. is too fast and so is doom and Call of Duty so is it's too, hard is, to uh you know time to kill is too yeah. low it doesn't have the same sandbox elements that halo had Mm -hmm. um and so it's really it's really in a market of its own but it feels like they keep trying to lean into being more like call of duty and stuff um and i right. guess we'll have to see with halo infinite but the fact that we're what like five months away from the launch of uh the new xbox and we haven't seen any gameplay is a little disconcerting i'm not gonna I, lie yeah right. i'm concerned i'm wondering where is all this stuff where's all the info why do you not want to show us what you have right yeah yeah yeah, it's, it's true. Halo used to be on the top of the pile, uh, mm -hmm. but I never expected them to stay there. I mean, because, you know, they that happens all the time. The top dog kind of drifts out. Something else comes in. But Halo, Halo was at the top for a while, and then Call of Duty came in once Modern Warfare came out. And mm -hmm. uh, Call I of Duty then became... Could have yeah. been the new top shooter. Five Battlefield could have been, but five has yeah, five has demolished any chance of Battlefield being the top dog. And now that Modern Warfare is super popular again, like yeah, it seems like Call of Duty is going to be on top for a while. I guess it's interesting. Nintendo feels like they're the only company that really remains generally just beloved consistently. Listen, no one can take them from yeah. the Nintendo throne. They've carved out their no, own throne. They've carved out <laughs> a throne of their own. And I mean, it's, you know, you look at Zelda, every time a new Zelda comes out, it's, I mean, Breath of the Wild has probably like peaked its popularity as much as maybe like Ocarina of Time, but it feels like, you know, Zelda is sort of at the top of the pile again. And Mario mm -hmm. keeps being at the top. And I don't know, Nintendo, I like my Nintendo games. I know Chief doesn't like them, but I like yeah. them. Um, yeah, it's still some of my fondest gaming memories are of Halo multiplayer, like uh, Halo Combat Evolved LAN parties, where you get four Xboxes in one house, you'd have like a 16 player party, you'd be playing mm -hmm. like Blood Gulch and Sidewinder, I fucking love that shit, that was so good. And then Halo like 2 on Xbox time. Live was so good. So it's probably worth really asking, what's, that. what is your favorite Halo game? Uh... I think combat evolved still. Yeah. And mainly Halo for the story, right? Second. Is that That too. Yeah, just the way it the way it plays. There's something really floaty about it mm -hmm. and smooth. Yeah. That would I, you say I, that the um would you say that the jumping is floaty? Yes, jumping yeah, is I floaty. Would, yeah, I I kind of agree. Yeah. I I yeah. thought you would. Halo 2 felt different. It felt a little more stiff gameplay wise. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it exactly. It, it felt different, different to play, though. Yeah. Um, but I still liked it. I thought the music was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Halo it's... 3 seems to be a real highlight for people, but... Uh, oh, I yeah, that's okay. definitely my assumption of fan choice overall would be Halo 3. Yeah, right, yeah. Absolutely. Love me Halo. Love Halo 3. It's my favorite. I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was packed with features, and the, the campaign was fun. There's something like little 
there's something a little plasticky about the way it looked. I don't know. Uh, I, I, can, I, I, I can see that. I think um, Halo 3 was the point where Halo wasn't like the top dog graphics-wise on console, I think. Yeah. Um, even though I think Halo 3 still looks pretty good. But you compare it to like Uncharted 1, which came out the same year. You know, Uncharted 1 looks a lot better graphically. Um, and then Halo Reach kind of came back to sort of being top in terms of our graphics, I think. Can I just right, cut in? Yeah. I just wanna, so this gets referenced in uh, my my video that's coming out. But you know when when uh, the episode of Simpsons for you where uh, Mark Hamill is talking about Sprint and then Homer has yeah. to tell everyone off oh, for yeah. it. And what what do you remember what the guy in the crowd says? Ah, uh, no, it's the, I can't the, the little nerdy kid when Mark is talking and they're all complaining. Do you remember what the kid says? Um, was it say something like say the he says such and such. Ah, talk about Star Wars? Yeah, yeah, now, <laughs> that's right. Guy in chat called Ofa <laughs> Dave just said, "Talk about Star Wars." <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, yeah. my good man. It's it's Halo tisms today. Halo, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you, what about Reach? What do you think of Reach? Uh uh, yeah, I really like that. I, um, not as much as Halo 1, 2, or even 3. But uh, uh, I really enjoyed the campaign. It's a sad... It's like a Rogue One, sort of. of yeah, uh, it has like a, Halo uh, stories. A, a looming sense of dread throughout the whole thing. Yes, exactly. And so it's, it's grim, but I, I like that about it. And the art style of it, I like how it feels gritty. Like it does it's, feel real it's, raw. Yeah, it's like the grimness of the plot is kind of reflected in the art style of it, and I really like that about Reach. I, and, uh, I, I really like Reach. Reach was good. Uh, I don't think it was better than 3. I think gameplay-wise, no, no, it was no, very, very questionable decisions like the introduction of Bloom. Um, right. The powers not being balanced well, uh, stuff like that. It was still good. I still really like it, and I certainly appreciate it. Still a good game. But it was mm. armor lock was an interesting decision of theirs. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that and sprint and all that stuff was very. Mm, mm -hmm. Why? My favorite oh, part um, of Reach is the last mission, where it's like the last mission in, is incredible. In, inf infinite enemies fighting to the death. That yeah. that was really powerful. I thought that was really well done. Well, I think that's a good example of um integrating gameplay and service of your story, and it feels like a lot yes. of games. Now it feels like there's much more of a problem that we're having where it's a lot harder for so seemingly I think slow walking is emblematic of the problem where it's like, all right, you gotta walk slow now so that we can do our story thing. <laughs> yeah, as opposed yeah. to like giving you full control and having it be and I think I had a conversation with this about the guys yesterday, thinking about a lot of games from like early 3D era when we started to actually have cutscenes and stuff. A lot of games like Ratchet and Clank the cutscenes would never have the character do something that you wouldn't do. It would only ever be like, all right, we set the scene and then you interact with it. Whereas now like ludo narrative dissonance is so pronounced because things happen in the cutscenes that you wouldn't do or that wouldn't happen in gameplay. And so it's, um, it kind of forces this wedge where you have to just kind of pretend that the cutscenes are happening in like a different plane of reality to the video game. Yeah. Um, and I feel like Halo never really had that problem, especially like in Reach because everything that happens feels like something that you can do. And then when they need you to do it in service of the plot that they're making, you know, then you have that full player control to, uh, you know, do your last stand and it's super effective. Yeah. There's, there's a, a real opportunity with video games to craft experiences that uh, yeah. movies can't give you. And it's, it happens so few and far between, but when it, when it does it, it's fucking awesome. Did you guys play Spec Ops: The Line? Yes. I did. Yeah, Love I never that actually did get. To, I never actually did play that. What the game does in the last mission is so fucking amazing. I can't get over how good it is. It's, it's a really good game. I really yeah. like what they do. The fact that even the loading screens start to get more ominous as you progress, right. they start like criticizing you personally, like you, the player. It's really yeah. cool. It's uh, Spec Ops Align overall. I mean, it's not that mind blowing of a game, really. I mean, it's it's kind of clunky at parts, to be honest. But yeah. just narratively, and 
at the end and what what the narrative does uh in combination with gameplay i think is just spectacular i haven't seen anything any other video game pull that off it constantly even after all this time is sort of it like the primo example that comes up when people talk yeah. about impactful storytelling and it's uh it's a very meta game um because a lot of like what it's criticizing is you specifically the player not like the characters are definitely getting criticized but the whole the whole kind of point of the game is like what are you doing here like what what is it that you are doing with this game you the player why are you doing this like why are you playing this game is it fun like are you having fun as the right. game slowly pushes you towards doing these really bad things it's like hey this is fun right i mean it's a video game who cares it's fun right Right. Um, and I think one of the things I really liked as I was playing the game was when the characters are doing call outs, uh, like when you're when you're marking people for your squad to attack at the beginning of the game, it's all like, you know, you know, tango on the rooftop and like oh hostile over there. And as it progresses, he starts getting a lot more like deranged. He's like, kill that fucker. I want him dead. Stuff like that. And it slowly right. but slowly like transitions over the game. It's really cool. It's really it's, cool. I like that well, game. It's well done. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And it feels um, like, um, yeah. I was just going to ask. Well, my, my thing will move move on in a different, well, slightly yeah. different direction. So go ahead. No, that's that's cool. That's uh, we, yeah. Um, I was going to say, you you mentioned that you you kind of like that stuff the most. Have you got like uh, maybe a small selection of what you consider to be like your favorite games of all time? Uh, my first experience was uh, Sonic Two on Genesis. It's a good that, game. Yeah, got me into video games, and then I played Sonic Two on Game Gear. I I, tr I traded my Genesis with a kid at school for a Game Gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is really dumb because I was just like gaming on the go. I can play Gen I can play Game Gear whenever I want, whereas Genesis, I'm limited to my house. But uh, of course, terrible trade off. <laughs> I mean, not only is that game fucking hard, to Sonic Two for Game Gear, it's uh, it's um, that system chews through AA batteries like a motherfucker. Yeah. Oh my god, and, it was uh... foreshadowing for Machinima. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but eventually, I got a Genesis again, and um, and uh, I played Sonic Two, and then Sonic Three, Sonic and Knuckles. Sonic was a big entry point for me into video games. And then I, I branched off from there and uh, I got, in, instead of getting PlayStation, I got, I went the Nintendo route. I got N64. So I grew up with like Ocarina of Time, Majora's mm -hmm. Mask, Donkey Kong. Did you go um, to GameCube after that? Yes. Yeah. I got it on launch. I was that's, really excited. That's totally about it. my era, baby. <laughs> I yeah, love yeah, GameCube. Yeah, PS2 yeah, yeah, GameCube <laughs> was my jam. Yeah, um, and GoldenEye and Perfect Dark. That was so, yeah. that was fucking blew me away. Fucking even Mario Party on N64. I was blown away by how much fun that was. I remember playing it at one kid's birthday party once, and I was like, I need that. I need it again. I need to put the think, uh, the game with the yeah. balls where you try to knock each other off and stuff. I was like, this is more fun than anything ever. <laughs> like, I, <need> this. <laughs> I, I feel like there are a lot of those like seminal. I think Grand Theft Auto Three was like a big eye opening experience for me. Oh in yeah. In terms of like what video games. I mean, I was really young at the time because like I got introduced on like Crash Bandicoot, and then obviously going over and then <laughs> seeing Grand Theft Auto Three, I was so impressed by the, yeah. this big open sandbox that you could explore. Yeah, took the games really well. Um, I didn't for a lot of growing up. I wasn't allowed to have video games. Uh, I played mm -hmm. them at friends' houses whenever I could, and I, I found I was good at them. And I, I love the competitive aspect and how, and I just got really absorbed by them. And, and stomping noobs. I guess uh, I the interesting really thing loved is them. like I feel like now it's almost like if you wanted to, if you were a kid now and you wanted to start playing video games, you're not well poised to get a really good um i guess a broad spectrum of games because when you've got stuff like fortnite that's free and persistently updated it doesn't give you an incentive yeah. to move on to something else whereas like when you're a kid and you beat crash bandicoot for the 10th time you know it's like all right i could probably stand to play something else now yeah um 
And and uh, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because games are designed now to be services rather than products. To be persistent rather mm -hmm. than it's one and done. Here it is. And even you know in the two thousands when DLC was dabbling with it was like all right we'll do a couple of map packs and then move on. But um pretty much ever since the twenty tens, it's like yeah we want you to keep playing forever. And I'm not sure that there are many games that I want to play forever. Um. I like novelty, and I feel like uh, it feels like people are missing out now because it's like play League of Legends or like CS:GO every day for like ten years, and then you just miss out on so many games. I'm, I'm also miss out on so much. There's there's just so much stuff out there now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like games that end. You know, I yeah. like games. That end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some games that build up to an ending where it's just like, okay, it's over now, but goddamn, that was fucking great. And then oh I yeah, can... some of my favorite games are you know those you know you play them once and they're kind of that's it, but they're yeah. amazing and you love them and you never yeah. forget them. Yeah, and it's like you know uh, the Zeldas or not just Zelda but uh, N sixty four Zelda being one of them N six or Super Mario as well. But uh, you finish the game and it the game just kind of freezes on a frame at the very end where you yeah. have, you're forced to turn the console off. Like, there's no, like, going back to the main menu or anything like that. It's, like, the game it's wants nice you to finality. power it off. Yeah, I miss, I miss that shit. I think <laughs> I missed, um... Here's a... This is a weird one. The the end credits to Super Mario 64 kind of make me emotional. Yeah. Um, especially right at the end when Mario's like, you know, thank you so much for playing my game. It's like, yeah. oh, man. <laughs> like, thanks, Mario. I had so much fun. What a thank ledge, you. Mario. I'd buy you I a drink. You yeah. so many times. Yeah. And um, totally. I feel like I feel like that's what Nintendo still offers, though. It feels like that's Nintendo was almost like, "Hey, remember video games like a long time ago? We still like those types of games." <laughs> but with, uh, Just be fun. But with the added, well, I mean, that's Nintendo's. You know, if it's if it's not fun, why bother? It's like hey, that's a nice little quote there, Reggie. I'm inclined yeah. to agree. Um, and I think, I, uh, oh yeah, I was just playing Super Mario 64 last week. And right. it's it's amazing how well that fucking game holds up. It's you a know? great. That's a that's a great game. Like, and that is it, a really excellent game. What does it say about modern gaming? Where I'm going back to fucking Super Mario 64 to like. To I think uh, I actually think um, and this is something I hear a lot when you when people talk about game development. It's the whole idea of if it, if it's fun to just move a character around in a room, that's a really good starting point. Is it yes. just fun to be in this space? And I think the opening of Super Mario 64, I mean, obviously in retrospect, it's easy to look at it like that. At the time, it was like, holy shit, a 3D environment. I can move around yeah, in multiple that, directions. That shit was mind-blowing. Walking into the castle, and then when I found out, because again, this is over a friend's house, that there were these portals into in different worlds, I was like, you fucking yeah. kidding me? This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's... It's the whole idea that that opening level is literally just, here's Mario, run around, jump see, and, around, see what you can do. As much as this sounds kind of lame, it's like, we were, we were pretty lucky in that all of these things were new when they came out, all of these different mechanics. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, you can go through so many different uh, games that were essentially like groundbreakers for this, but like even as much as uh, Doom and and uh, Portal and all these games that introduced this whole new mechanic that's focused on it and... But like nowadays, you're spoilt for mechanics now. They're all over the place, everything. And you're just like, yeah, this is just the norm. This is just mechanics now. The and ability like, yeah, okay. to move around in a 3D space without loading screens. Like, I think, and it's funny, I feel like even the PS3, Xbox 360 generation was the last generation that I was like blown away. Shit like in Grand Theft Auto 4, walking into a building without a loading screen was like insane. Yeah. That blew me away. Just the fact that I could go into these buildings without loading screens. Um. Mm -hmm. It's just so nuts. Yeah, well, I think and, that it makes yeah. us all a bit cynical as well with newer stuff that's like, hey, look at us, we're doing this thing. And you're like, I know how you're doing that. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You think you could trick me. I know, I know your tricks now. Um, I, I mean, I still really like video games, obviously. Oh, totally, like, yeah. And we're all going to happily play new ones as they come out. For example, um, The Last of Us 2, all happy to play it. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, <laughs> But it's, I, I always wonder if it's, like, nostalgia, but then I think, like, no, no, this was, like, a really good era for video games, you know, the 90s and the 2000s. There's a lot of good video games in that period of time. Yeah. I think Nintendo excels in game design, like, with yes. their yeah. their, fa their phases of development. Like like you said, they'll 
they'll start with Mario just in a blank, empty room and just like, okay, does this character feel fun to play? Is the running mm -hmm. speed just right? Does the animation look just right? As a, like the, as Eddie's just reminded us all, do the fish move away from you? Mario 64, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like they're in the water, yeah. Yeah. And then they come in and like it's like once they lock the character movement down and make sure it's fun to move around as that person, then it, they do the world design. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think a bunch of developers, like indie developers, will kind of do it all at once, and then it just ends up being kind of messy. You well, know? it's almost like uh, there's a certain purity to what Mario is as a video game, and I think I think that purity extends to a lot of Nintendo. I even think of new stuff like Splatoon. You can tell that that was just a really cool idea that they had. Where they were like, what if we like had a game where you shoot ink at people and you can use that ink to move around the level and the goal is to cover the level in this ink that lets you move around. It's like, that's a really cool idea. And right. you can see that it started with like a unique gameplay idea. And I guess you can see that to a lot of things like Mario. What if you're a guy who can jump around levels and explore them? And then uh, Metroid. What if you're a bounty hunter in a space that you need to explore and get power-ups to open new spaces um, as opposed to, I guess, as much as I like them, other games where it's just like, do, oh, uh, it's a third-person shooter, you know? You, you run, you shoot. That's, I'll do that's Pikmin. What, you do. what if you have control over tiny creatures that rely on you for everything and you can choose to sacrifice them or force them to eat the remaining wildlife to create more of their kind? It's a wonderful little... <laughs> it's, yeah. beautiful, it's beautiful. And uh, yeah. Super Smash Brothers, you know, what hit the other player off the screen to win. The more oh, you was, hit them, the more they fly. That was genius. I love yeah. that. It shit. is genius. It's yeah. like the most unique fighting game. That, that Well, I'm sure that I'll get flayed alive for that, but I think it's really <laughs> unique. <laughs> There's really nothing like Smash Brothers. Love it, yeah. yeah. Great stuff. Well, there was PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. You guys remember that? Yeah. No, I yeah. don't. They they really oh, had to scrounge the bottom yeah. of the barrel for characters to have in that, didn't well, they? Well, part of the problem was their their introduction was like, okay, so who are our characters? We got Kratos, okay, cool. Uh Nathan Drake, yeah, cool. Um we got uh uh Fat Princess. It's like, wait, who wait, who? Uh we got um Sweet Tooth from Twisted Metal. It's like <laughs> what wh what? <laughs> like and we've got Big Daddy from Bioshock. I was like, that's third party. What, like, what are you doing? Um, it's such a, it's a crazy characters. character to have in there, though, still. Big Daddy. You're just like, huh. Yeah, Big Daddy. It's not like uh, Bowser. Oh, and, uh, it's not like Bowser and Donkey Kong or anything where it's like a character. It's more of just, remember these enemies? You're like, I mean, yeah. Oh, and uh, they had General Raddick or Colonel Raddick from Killzone 2. I was oh, wait, like, did, ah, okay. You know the Big Daddy? Did they have... The Big Daddy you play as from Bioshock 2, or was it just a random Big Daddy? Oh, it was a Big Daddy of some sort. I don't know if it was the Big Daddy or so anything. I was going to say, the problem I with mean, the one from Bioshock 2 is it's not as iconic a look. The Big Daddy that everyone knows, the look of it, is the first one you encounter in Bioshock and 1. And also, it's mm -hmm. not a PlayStation. It was originally on Xbox 360. <laughs> it didn't even come out on PS3 too. Oh, And well, then they had really shut up. weird... Like... There were so many, because they didn't have Crash and Spyro, which was the big, like, all right, guys, what's going on here? Um, and then I think they had uh, they had Dante from Devil May Cry, but they had him from the shit reboot instead of, like, the actual one that was on PS2 back in the day. The DMC? That one? Yeah, th they had the DMC Devil May Cry Dante as opposed to Devil May Cry oh, Dante, yeah. the one who everybody likes. Yeah, um, I've heard... I like that oh, game. I thought frankly. It was, so did yeah. I. I thought it was hilarious, to be honest. Like, <laughs> I, I, well, I haven't, I haven't heard it was a bad game. I've heard no, a lot of confusion from people wondering why they did the weird changes. The story and stuff. sucks, but the gameplay is pretty fun. I they had a Bill O'Reilly, so like the world is is uh, taken over by demons, and they have a Bill O'Reilly demon who is on like a news. <laughs> he does the news, <laughs> and then you fight him in like an alternate dimension. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Dude, the plot's so over the top, and the that yeah. character is such a ridiculous edge lord. It's he's so such funny. An yeah, like, every cutscene he's in is just hilarious. And then, um, and then I love how like right at the end, Verge is like, "Hey, I'm a bad guy now." And then you have the <laughs> <game>. <laughs> it's, it's just so stupid. <laughs> oh. Remember that part where he goes into the nightclub and he's asked to write his signature down? He yeah, just and then he punches, punches him on it. <laughs> he writes, punches him, he yeah. Writes, <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs>
<laughs> then there's oh, this like fuck. scene in the game. So like, you're remember you're you're meant to be the good guy. So um, the bad demon, his his wife is or his girlfriend's pregnant, and Virgil shoots her in the chest, and then shoots <laughs> her in the head. And it's like, wow, Virgil, yeah. wow. And then um, later on, Dante's mocking the dude, like, oh, hey, we killed your kid. It's like, wow, you're the good guys. <laughs> like, you're the good guys. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> God, that was such a... Uh, and, and funnily enough, Rags, they made Hellblade after that game. So it was a really, really? interesting Oh, that around. was Ninja yeah. Theory, right? That was Ninja Damn. Theory, yeah. So, uh... It's kind of interesting how they turned that one around, didn't they? Have you uh, have you uh, played that, John? Or uh, which one? It's a new sacrifice, Hellblade? right? Yeah. No, I don't think I have. Have you played Soma? Uh, yeah, I haven't finished it. Damn. But uh, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Oh wait, I is like it like Soma. recent? I haven't finished it. Either. Yeah, fucking everyone should fucking finish it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I played it a few months ago, and then I stopped. I got kind of confused. And I kind of stopped playing. I did the kind of same thing with uh, Penumbra as well. That's the same developer, isn't it? Yeah, Frictional. It happens. It's okay. Frictional I games. I don't yeah. hate you. It's fine. <laughs> no, I was really enjoy. I just I got caught up doing something else. But uh, I really enjoy the atmosphere in those games. And just because a game doesn't have combat, like I have nothing against that. Like I love just exploring a rich environment. It is. It is three dollars on Steam right now. Everyone in chat, go buy it. Soma, three dollars. Go, go, go. Wow, that's really good. Get I get get a though. get a day off. Turn all the lights off. Play through the whole thing, and then wonder about everything. <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, but that's yeah, do you have like? So were you going with the sort of Mario sixty four there with like favorite game or out of curiosity? Favorite game of all time. Uh... I think Majora's Mask is up there as one of them. Um, I remember what one of the biggest things that got me on the next generation was Vice City. Mm -hmm. like I was yeah. aware of GTA 3. I saw my friends playing it, and I was like, holy shit, this looks awesome. But uh, And then I saw Vice City, and I was just like, this game looks so ridiculously fucking fun. I have to get a PS2 now. I didn't have one yet. Yeah, and, I had some uh, friends growing up who had Vice City on their Xbox, and it was one of those games that we always would take turns playing and doing crazy stuff, and it yeah. was wild, especially when you were younger and you didn't have as much of a, I guess, frame of reference for crazy stuff. Right. It was nuts. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I'd have to th I think about that more. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's not an easy one to answer. Hard. It goes the same for all mediums, really. So it's like, I don't want to choose between my kids. Yeah, because I've really, I've played a lot of games. Like, I, I'm, you know how people call themselves gamers, but all they've played is like fucking Call of Duty Black Ops, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, Uncharted, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, there's a lot of games I'd have to consider. Um, I think it gets harder as time goes on when it's just adding more and more and you know it's been years since the first experience. Time for the harder yeah. question that I, I should have asked you to begin with, but I forgot. You don't get to mm -hmm. ask qualifying questions, simply one or the other. Which is better? Christmas or Halloween? Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. I think Christmas. Yeah, boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mullen's the only one who that's, disagrees. That's not to say that Halloween, Halloween is bad. I'm he, I'm very much a fan of both. One. Everyone loves Christmas the most, and yeah, that's propaganda that's from the Christmoids. I wish I could still go out trick or treating, but I'm too old now. <laughs> yeah, just like a fully grown adult, just like walking up to somebody's house. Give me hey man, if they <laughs> if they manage to make and sell to the general public Iron Man suits, I'll be going out for Halloween. Be, yeah, I mean, I'd I'd like that uh Spider well Spider Man suit. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> ridiculous. <at that. laughs> I mean, <laughs> see, with my thing, I was like, because with the suit, I can fly and do stuff, and you're like, with the Spider-Man, it's like, no, it's just Spider-Man's powers, I guess you want, right? The suit itself. Well, I mean, I don't know, you can you can web people up and loot their house, you know? They yeah. open the door and just stick into the wall. Wow, Fringy. The stereotype comes out. Jeez. Damn. Hey, what do you, hey, that's, that's offensive. Wow. <laughs> you can't say that to me. Spider people. <laughs> Wait, what were, what, what were you referring to? I don't know. Oh. I think green people, like green hooded people. 
that tends to be the uh goblin yeah. people if you will <laughs> <laughs> goblins those pesky oh, goblins you, no, streaming that's, people up. you're not allowed no you, it's not you're not There's allowed too many landmines to avoid i don't know who i'm offending anymore I feel like it's, that's what it is like, you know, living in a modern political climate. You just teleported into the middle of a minefield, no equipment, <laughs> no nothing, and you're yeah. just madly jumping around. And then you jump and you hear a click and you just like, you know, it's like that Jimmy Fallon bit where he thought he was going to get cancelled because he referred to that person as a drag queen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. What was he like? I'm not a drag queen. And you see his face just sink. <laughs> he's, he's so scared um yeah and it's like the person you've just pissed off with that one landmine throws you a spoon it's like don't do it again but you're like this doesn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> just I, I pulled up the clip now just to look at his face yeah you can see it oh it's great <laughs> oh what a great world we live in where everybody's afraid of saying one thing yeah, pisses somebody off. Yeah, um, it really makes me sad. I don't like it. Everybody's mm -hmm. worried about saying the wrong thing. Nobody's allowed to be wrong anymore. <laughs> oh God, no! Wrongness is not allowed. Yeah. So oh, actually, what, what were you going to say, oh, Spencer? What? Well, it depends. What was your? What are you going to ask? Well, I'm trying to think of like a, f a few more sort of wrapping up questions, if you will, to, to bring around a, a circle. I was. So uh, on, I was going to ask. Uh, what's uh? So other than Arby and the Chief, you like you got anything you, you're working on? Yeah, I got my podcast that I do. Oh yeah, yeah. And, no, uh, and I'm what else also I'm <laughs> even like real uh, work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Podcast. <laughs> right, right. I'm doing a. I want to do a video game review show. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm developing. I just finished making an intro for that. It's got <gasps> this cool like VHS aesthetic and. Oh sweet. Yeah, yeah, I'm really proud of how it turned out, and um, yeah, so I want to do like a long form review thing that's intercut with some funny sketches and stuff, right? And it just feels like, like I really like watching that kind of content, and I personally, I know a lot about games. Obviously, I've played a shitload of games across multiple generations. I know how they're made. You know, I've attempted game development in the past didn't really go anywhere but uh it's something i know a lot about and i feel like i could uh offer a valuable perspective on that so i'm just like why don't i make my own review show so that's something i'm yeah, working on sounds nifty what's your uh what what's when do you reckon that's uh gonna be coming out uh, uh, have, that's fine <laughs> well no i was intending to do it this month but i was having a whole bunch of isp issues which i recently got fixed right. and uh but since I got it fixed, it's been like a week now, and I've been meaning to do like that and podcasting, but I just, I haven't for a while. I've, I've just gone quiet because uh, I've been really fucking like miserable the, the past week or so with everything going on in the world. Yeah, and yeah. yeah I'm going to do that. Yeah, and I'm just like I'm afraid of going on my podcast and saying the wrong thing. <laughs> I do and... trust me. I get nervous constantly. Like, what's the stupid thing I'm going to say today? <laughs> yeah, and so I just I don't. I feel I'm just like a ball of anxiety. I mean, I'm I'm happy that we're doing this today because I feel like this is this is making me feel a bit better. Like being on here talking to you guys, and enough so that I can probably stream on my own channel again uh, <laughs> in a day or two. Um, but Good yeah, to know just, there are like-minded just... people, right? We're all normal, <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly, because it feels—it's uh, very—I uh, don't know. I've been feeling lately that like I'm on a fucking alien planet or something, you know, just like with this <laughs> shit being shared on my Facebook feed and. Oh uh, yeah, stay away from that. Yeah, yeah. The po all the political stuff people are posting. I'm just like, holy shit! I sometimes wonder if I'm insane. <laughs> like, yeah. I just occasionally <laughs> wonder, just looking at what's happening in the world. I'm like, am I like, have I got it wrong? <laughs> like, am I just completely nuts? Yeah. I mean, really. I mean, it's just now more than ever. I, mean, I felt like that before, but never to this degree. Where I'm just mm -hmm. like, holy fuck! I feel like I don't relate to anybody anymore. Like this, mm -hmm. it's kind of maddening. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm feeling better today, and it's partly thanks to you guys. So, thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Oh, on. thank you for saying that. that's very kind. I'm glad we've uh, 
been able to provide something like that. I've, it's been a very chill conversation. Lots of nice little things yeah. I'm talking about. Totally. This has been great. Now, I have uh, actually. I'm, I'm wondering. So, Arby and the Chief will end eventually. Uh, what's uh, what do you reckon? Do you think you'd be wanting to make a new show after that, like a new fiction show or movie or? Um, I think so. I have actually an outline written for another Hard Justice season, believe it or not. Oh, right. Okay. But I'm not. I'm not confirming that yet. It's just an idea I'm kicking around that I think yeah. would be cool. And uh, <laughs> once season eight of Arby and the Chief is done, I don't think I'm done with the show because I'm still doing the bites episodes right. on the side, and I really enjoy doing those. And I feel like there's a never-ending stream of things to make fun of in regard to the gaming industry. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I enjoy making those and I don't see me stopping making bites anytime soon. So season eight will end, but I'll still keep doing those because they're, I actually, I genuinely enjoy making them and I like right. making people laugh. And one of the few highlights of my life is just going on my podcast and premiering a new episode that I made. And then, and then I get to enjoy it with everybody else and I get to see their reaction to it. And <laughs> you make you know, me think about that laughing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I was thinking just that same thing. We we do yeah. <laughs> such a stupid we're the, thing. We're the internet's number one uh, bat Batman woman fan, fan club. community. <laughs> we we watch they are, those episodes are catered for us. It feels like they they anti content designed for us. Like anti content. <laughs> they knew what they were doing when they made it. They had all of us in Everything. mind. Yeah. I gotta check oh. out this Batwoman. It sounds like a lol it's cow. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah. It is hilarious. Well, you can watch Batman. all of our uh, reactions to Batwoman I, season yeah. one in full. If I was, I don't know yeah. what what episode you reckon you should start with. Like, what what's oh, the what's dude. the funniest reaction episode, we've had? Episode Honestly, two, start at the um, beginning. Well, well, yeah. That was episode two with the uh, the the Kai, <laughs> the, the petrol <laughs> tank. <laughs> I think I, is that, that episode really two? Fun. If it is, yeah, do that I one. Think it is. Yeah. Okay, well, that is, yeah, fuck it. Start with one. <laughs> yeah, start <laughs> with one. Go through them. There's no it's point so skipping right. one episode right. in order to <laughs> start with Yeah. Yeah. It 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 looks bad. Like I I I just I didn't start it because I'm just like this feels. It is funny. I feel like dude. I'm not gonna get it is, compelled. It's so funny. To, to give you an example, right? There's this bad guy who steals stuff, and she's escaping by climbing like a skyscraper. And Batwoman is on the ground floor. She fires her grappling hook at this person and pulls her off the tower. And she free falls into a shallow pool and survives. She's just like, gets back up like, Damn you, you foiled my plan. It's like the funniest thing. <laughs> How are you not dead? Like, <laughs> Uh, I think that might actually be filmed in Vancouver, is it? Do you know? Uh, yeah, it is. A lot of those shows are filmed in Vancouver. It, like yeah. the CW shows. Yeah, I'm aware of a lot of mediocre shows that are filmed here <laughs> in my how, city. How disappointing is that for you? Just like knowing that all of these shows are getting filmed. Oh yeah, I have friends who are on the crews of those shows. They're like grips or they work in right. set deck or whatever. And uh, I know some actors who are in these local productions some of them are good some of them are are not so good <laughs> uh but i think it's just a lot of it's just such lazy filmmaking where everything is in sloppy handheld medium shots and well like, yeah they, they are making those shows quick i don't yeah. believe that they have long production per episode yeah and it's just i'm it's so it makes me really sad because there's like a lot of mediocre television productions made here and a lot of like Hallmark movies, movies of the week type things. Uh, right. And people work their asses off. My mom loves on these movies. <laughs> yeah. My aunt like there's, there's very a big safe. audience for them. Yeah. All those are safe. I know there's going to be a happy ending and things will be okay. I don't have to worry about when I watch it. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that, like, I don't doubt that the people who are actually working on set are trying really hard. Really, a lot of the fault comes down to the writers. Like, it's this, there you go, we're yes. thematically strong now, because we, we mentioned this previously, it's all oh. about that writing at the bottom, at the foundational level. Writing is like the paramount exactly. of storytelling. If the script sucks, it can't be good. Like, it just can't be good at all. I would say that, yeah. um, yeah, you are, you are right, the next port of call, as far as I'm concerned anyway, once you get nail writing, it's like, does that, can everything else fail and still be good? It's like, acting is probably next on the, on the acting rung. Acting is the next one. On you the fuck list. up acting well, completely. For, for, yeah. 
Um, of course, yeah, there's... Uh, I of course mean as well that you, it, they frame it so that the characters are seeable. Like it, it, I'm assuming that's the case. Like the worst kind of um, cinematography is usually passable, right? Like it's not. How, when was the last time you watched something and you went, "Wow, they they didn't frame that correctly," like to the point of absurdity? Like, where's the oh, actor? It's very rare anyone the fucks actor? that up these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's so many things that need to be working simultaneously on like all levels like writing directing acting and hopefully it all comes together into i just a, feel like to a quality product but usually it doesn't writing is the one though that like it has to be good in order for any of the others to even be like functional like the, it's almost like they're multipliers and uh, if you multiply them by zero you're not getting anything really it's just like yes. yeah i mean it looks pretty i guess that you're totally on the money there. Yeah, if the writing's fucked, the whole thing's fucked, so that has to be on point. For example, Game of Thrones Season 8 looks gorgeous. It's really well acted. <laughs> and soundtrack's fantastic. And you're like, so what's the only part that failed? It's like, the only... Well... <laughs> just, it's the only this one element that we talk about every once in a while called writing, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I've, I've kind of ruined my reputation by saying that I kind of liked it don't say it season eight. <laughs> so everybody throws that back at me where it's just like well you you said you like game of thrones season eight you said you like the last jedi so i gotta take everything you say with a grain of salt now maybe maybe you're yeah, not the great I mean, writer you th we thought you were obviously um, so we we can't go in depth about what your thoughts are on the last of us 2 the last jedi the sequel trilogy or uh season eight game of thrones but i assume you'd be willing to concede errors as opposed to being like no Oh, absolutely. It's there's there are parts of uh season 8 that are very flawed. Like it's it's I think the themes are correct. Like the idea that power corrodes and uh like that's that seems like a that's the right theme to like have at like the end of the show. I don't I don't I would go into more detail here, but I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. <laughs> you, the it's audience you're talking or... to despise uh, season 8. Chat is filled yeah. with people who despise Season 8. But the way I look at it is like a cake baked in a pan that's way too small. Like I feel like it could have been a good if it, if it had like two or three more. seasons. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because where they take all these characters, they skipped way too much. Jamie Lannister not caring about the innocent, it's like, oh, you gotta, you gotta work way harder to convince me of that. This whole time we were all under the assumption that he's, he's very much uh, invested in the innocent. Daenerys going nuts and killing uh, several thousand families, including innocent women and children, like, nah, she wouldn't do that. It's not gonna happen. You're gonna have to do way better right. than that. Um, and yeah. obviously this applies to basically all of the characters in that season. They, they just... Arya Stark gives up on her revenge plot after the entire show because what? Sandor Clegane said, hey, it, it doesn't do good stuff for you. Which doesn't even make sense because she's been really happy up to that point with how much revenge she's committed, which is a lot. Yeah. There's too too um, much stuff happens way too quickly. They they uh they drop the ball. Yeah. It, no, it's true. Um I think there's there's definitely a lot of blame to be set at the foot of those two showrunners for saying that they only needed one more season when they clearly needed at least two at the very minimum to like button it up nicely like sure. one is just not enough um that said like there's there's so much production value in it like there's things that, there's beats in the season that i that i love like there's a there's a particular beat with uh um what's his name uh sandor clegane that is so fucking cool like that almost like makes the season for me just that that beat alone i don't want to say what it is you probably know i don't know if you've seen it but you probably know what well I'm like i said you, uh people who are watching this right now probably know all of the spoilers because uh i made many videos <laughs> on, i say many many for me i made three i think Okay, so it's okay if if I go into a yeah, you should detail. be fine. I think most people here have either know what it is or don't care about Game of Thrones whatsoever. For Game of Thrones? Oh, people don't give a shit about Game of Thrones anymore. <laughs> no, it's it's true, and it, and that's it it kind of it makes me it. I feel for the cast and crew. You know, it's like because <sighs> the the show was good for so long, and then it's like they they missed they screwed up with season eight. Granted, but now it's like nobody ever talks about the but show at all. That's the problem. Anymore. The fuck up 
permeates through all of the older seasons now. You can't watch the older ones. You can't watch Daenerys' storyline without being like, I know where this goes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> People yeah. don't really want to re-watch the show. That's what they did with the final season, which, by the way, is practically unprecedented. I don't even know that I've come across a TV show. Because I feel the same way. I'm, I want to re-watch it at some point. But, like, good lord. I don't know how they managed to achieve that. Because usually you, you have, like, Lost, um, Dexter... Trying to, what are like the famous examples of TV shows that ended in ways that people were very unsatisfied with? Sopranos is like a 50-50. Uh, mm. uh, um, do, do you think about... Sopranos ended badly? I haven't seen it. <laughs> oh, Sorry, he's, okay. he's saying that that's what he's I heard, fucking I love that show. Yeah. Um, well, the point I'm making, I guess, is that uh, these shows still it had a controversial ending, but yeah. people can still look back on it. Well, people but still rewatch well, it. I they mean... still recommend it. Recommending Game of Thrones now is like. You're taking a position when you do that. It's like, wait, what are you trying to right. say? It's like, well, I don't know. You'll get well, some fun out of it. The interesting thing is that The Last of Us might become that in the eyes of a lot of people. Well, like, it's uh, not worth the first one now with the second one existing. Well, I, I think, well, I guess the problem is a lot of people will probably say you could probably just play the first one and then just stop there, as opposed to Game of Thrones where you need to push through. You right. Know, like the last a lot of people say stop at the end of season four. It's like, stop when the Lannister family <laughs> has just experienced a major blow, when the Stark family yeah. is still scattered throughout Westeros and the White Walkers are still on their way. I'm just supposed to yeah. leave the show? It's like, trust me. I like that, just... Nothing important happens in that, <laughs> in that period, you know. I think that it, it's doubly interesting when you consider that this is a show that had, you know, that it ran for what eight Top years. Of the world. It was influential yeah. as Top, hell. It was everywhere. Top of the world. It was a, a cultural juggernaut. Uh, a huge icon of shows. Everyone talked about it. People who didn't watch it heard about it all the time. It made, you know, spoilers as a thing, like a super, yeah, you know, like everyone became aware of it. Everyone knew about this show, and now it's like it never existed. Yeah. Like, that's Weird. insane. Yeah. I, I agree. That's what happens when you fuck your show up. They also, they pushed it to a limit where normal people were annoyed by it. I've told this story before, but my dentist hated the season. They felt the need to tell me. Well, I feel <laughs> like that's what it's been for the last, um... <laughs> The last couple of years is, you know, Last Jedi, Game of Thrones have been these weird moments where regular consumers of content who don't necessarily think a lot about the construction of a story or writing or anything are noticing that something isn't working, that something's wrong, whether or not they can articulate it in the most concise and detailed manner, you know, it, whether or not, like, they can identify that there's a problem with the craft. Yeah. I just I'm I'm not willing to throw out the baby with the bathwater with Game of Thrones cuz like there's just the the battle of the bastards for instance is one of the greatest moments of television I've ever seen. All right, calm down. Mm. It's so I th I th I thought it was really cool. I thought it was epic. It is it really shot. cool. I'll give you that. <laughs> cool. A lot of it don't make sense though. I don't know much about it. The hyperspace really kamikaze is really cool. But the, you know now, but they screwed up season eight, so it's just like that show is complete AIDS and cancer. And well, I mean, otherwise you you'll know, get you'll get AIDS. Hot take, but uh, I thought pretty much everything past season four, episode nine, is mostly garbage in Game of Thrones. Um, oh, yeah. I I just hung around forever because I was incredibly attached to these characters, which a lot of them had survived up until that last season in terms of writing. Um. But uh, yeah, like like as I I take the I happily take the good with the bad. It's just that season eight's writing was absolutely abhorrent. Um, also, yeah, I agree with someone in chat. Hard Home I thought was better than the Battle of the Bastards, and that's season five. I saw them both, and I liked Hard Home better. It made a lot more sense. What what one was that again? What happened? It's when the zombies attack the wildlings. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that was great. The place, right? yeah. That that sh I remember people saying when it came out that um this show has officially supplanted Walking Dead because they've done zombies better than Walking Dead ever did, and I was just like, I agree. <laughs> like, this is cool. <laughs> wow. I gotta watch that again. I, I don't really remember it though. It's well. uh they achieve being pretty scary. There's quite an ominous element with the like the the horsemen are watching them as the zombies just pour over the the wildlings, and it, it's. A, I shouldn't talk about it. I'm going to get passionate about how much I fucking loved that show once upon a time and how much potential it had. <laughs> so disappointing. Right. The zombies yeah. destroying the wildlings was like major foreshadowing in my head. I was like, this is what's going to happen, but to Westeros. And of course, they don't care about the. Who cares about the wildlings? They're random people who live beyond the 
the wall. So, but but as soon as you know they get down south as, uh, and, uh, and all this squabbling over who gets to be king, that's going to become pretty fucking irrelevant pretty quickly. But I was wrong. They knock out the zombies in a night, and then it all becomes about <laughs> squabbling over the fucking chair. And I was like, oh, you guys, that right. was. Uh, Talk about yeah. thematic, um, thematic destruction, as far as I was concerned, on that level. Like, we could talk about how power corrupts, but holy shit, the point of the show being that, like, we need to work together overall, that's more important than deciding who's in charge. Uh huh. Like, I, I really liked that idea. I thought it was very fundamental and something that a lot of us can really, like, draw from in terms of how it can be applied in real life in, in smaller circumstances. Not, not, not necessarily referring to, like, a presidency or a king, but just how we solve problems. Petty squabbles. Yeah, you know. and and it was, just, it was just like, nah, we we stab the dude with a knife and he dies. <laughs> like, oh. I've uh, now interesting yeah. thing. I've seen a lot of people say that it's um it's uh oh my god, how am I like forget ah uh, Martin George R. R. Martin's fault yeah. that uh that he didn't finish the story, so this is the direction that the series went because they had no source material to pull from. What do you right. think of that? Uh, is it his yeah, fault? that's like. I don't know. Ideally, they should have waited, because I feel wow. like yeah. they, had, they, had, they had more important things to do. Apparently, yeah. Because <laughs> I I always thought it was weird how like those sh two showrunners they were gonna like helm Star Wars going forward, mm. and it's just like they were they were bringing someone else's writing to the screen. Like I th I think in the early seasons they did a good job of that, but there's no evidence that they are good writers themselves and that they're there's disciplined pieces. enough to write. For example, yeah. the uh, the scenes between Tywin and Arya are all them. And this is the thing: I can believe that if someone was forced to make someone else's characters and writing come to life for many years, that they should have some understanding of these characters and thus should be able to almost make some scenes that are like, yeah, that was actually good shit, or you know, whatever else. But um, I think that. I always thought it was more tied to the fact that they lost their passion for the show, the fact that they wanted to move on, the fact that HBO offered them everything they could want, and they were the ones who were like, no, not only do we want to cut down the seasons, we want to cut down the episodes. We want to get rid of this show. We're done. It's just like, damn. Yes. That pisses been, me off. I agree. That's that's a perfectly valid be better criticism. better to pass it on to someone yeah. else, you know? Absolutely. Like, you Please, give it to yeah. people who fucking care about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Pass it to, along to someone else. Because I, I don't really have a problem with them wanting to move on to something. Because they, they've done, like, at this point, seven seasons of the show. And it's just like, oh Christ, I can see how they're burnt out. You know what I mean? Someone just, just mentioned like, in oh, chat. Enough um, already. They didn't even know how to pronounce Missandei's name. They said Missandei in an interview. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> it's like, how the hell have you gone this long pronouncing your name Missandei? How the fuck did that happen? And, and the fact that they don't, um, oh, there were so many clips, they're so cringy. Like, uh, they, they forget which characters are POV characters. Uh, they were asked, like, which one was their favorite, or vice versa, or, like, like, the opposite, and, and they got it wrong. Um, then, of course, I'm assuming you heard about the infamous, uh, she forgot about the Iron Fleet thing. Right, yeah, I did. <laughs> that's some, that like, you? that's some peering in through the fiction right into the writer's notebook and just being disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> she forgot about it. Like fuck you, man. This is the thing about. I like, like the idea. Stalin forgot about the Central Army Group. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. It's no. That doesn't happen. Like that's not. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm not happy about <laughs> Game of Thrones season eight. Okay, but I'm, no. it's fine to enjoy all kinds of portions of it. I just. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm forgiving of things like particularly movies to a fault where I, like I'm not I'm kind of I'm slow in the head in a lot of ways where I'll watch a piece of content and enjoy it on a surface level and leave smiling going, you know, what? I, I kind of enjoyed that. If you have and then like I'll talk to other people and they'll be like, what the fuck? You actually like that? What about this plot beat that makes no fucking sense? And what about this, <laughs> which is totally against her character? And I'm just like, oh, yeah, I guess that's a good point. Yeah, I do that. That happens to me a lot. And I'm sure there's a bunch of people in the chat now who think I'm a total fucking raving retard. No, I, I think that's uh, whatever. Think that's I'm just being honest like that, about how I felt about these things. And of course, we, we your, your criticism is totally valid. So. Um, well, I was going to say, if you there's have a free two and a half hours ever, uh, I have a video specifically about episode five, which is the episode I think killed the entire show. I go through all of the shit that I think is wrong with it. But I, oh, wait. Hold on. Which, are you, which season are you talking about? Season eight. Se season eight. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. It's the one with 
yeah, it, I mean, the, the, the end portion of my analysis is all about Daenerys, and that's the biggest fuck-up, but unfortunately, that wasn't the only fuck-up of that episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh, well. Game of yeah, Thrones. it's it's a shame how it was handled at the end there. Um, it, really annoying to hear that it wasn't even HBO. You know, it was it, HBO it, was willing to give them bizarre, anything they it? wanted. You'd never expect yeah, that to be the case. Often yeah, especially considering anything. how much money it was bringing in and how much of a you know cultural icon it well, was. It's a rare case of so most TV shows go on longer than they should because the producers want more, more money, more, 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 just give me more. This was a case where the producers were like, please just do more because not only do they want money, but like the story needs it desperately. It's like this, this, this husk that's got no water and it's crawling across the floor. Like, please just give me a little bit more. The the writers are like, eh, you only need six episodes. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I have a similar feeling uh, with Dexter. Well, I used to fucking love that show, and I thought season four was the peak of that show. I think, uh, isn't then, that how most people feel? I think so, right? I think so, yeah. Well, John, John Lithgow's season four, right? Yes, yeah, it is. I thought that was a great season from start to finish. And then it crashed with season five. And then season six, they tried to kind of make it better, but... There were some good parts, some bad parts. And then season seven, the last one, I think, or maybe it was season eight. But uh, it was just a fucking train wreck at the end. And I was just like, God damn it. That's such a good show, like, uh, early on. And now it's tainted with this shit, just like season, like Game of Thrones is. And it's too bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is a shame. Um, but, you know, that's that's the risk, you know, let's like what those showrunners should have. They, I think they had an obligation to see the show through to its end. And, you know, I think they 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 cut it short, shorter than it should have been knowingly. Like, it's insane that to think about that they could get like if. If they. Like in terms of future jobs that they would you would look at season eight and what it did to the fandom and community and what it did to you know, the reception of it. And mm -hmm. you know that they could still get a job all over the place doing like writing stuff. Despite all of that, you know, it is kind of insane how I mean, you look, we would talk about Batwoman, but you know, like how are you, <laughs> how do you have such consistently insanely bad writers? You yeah. Know? I'm actually excited to watch Batwoman now. Just the funny I'm, thing I, is, I feel like Batwoman is more culturally relevant now than Game of Thrones. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. I, I, I love, like, so bad it's good movies and TV shows. Oh, yeah. Like, I enjoy cringe and schlock. I've seen so much dog shit, and I love it. Like, I've, I've, there's great movies that I haven't seen, but I've seen almost every Steven Seagal movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Man, <laughs> I just get such a kick out of them. They're so funny. They are. Those tend to be really funny. Those sort of like eighties, nineties, crappy movies. If yeah. if you were gonna recommend that we watch a Steven Seagal movie to like riff on it for EFAP, would you have a recommendation of one to take a look at? Maybe. Oh shit! There's uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's there's one with like an oil plant or something and. I'm going to look up a list of Steven Seagal movies and see if I can find the name of it. I'm sure Chad will get there. <laughs> Real I don't know. This might be too much for Chad, even. Like, this is going to be an obscure <laughs> one, probably. Um, on Deadly Ground. That was one of them. On Deadly Ground. On Deadly Ground, 1994. So and, fucking and this, funny. And to you, this is the peak, so bad it's good stuff from Steven Seagal, is it? Uh, yeah. And it's hard to say. Um, hang on, I'm just kind of scrubbing through all the Asian Connection. Is I watched that recently. That's pretty funny. Um, yeah, I say if you want the biggest laughs out of how terrible it is, On Deadly Grounds certainly one of them. Marked for Death is another good one. Um, yeah, if you like so bad, they're good movies. And like they all, his character background is the same in like every movie where he's just like this <laughs> ex special forces guy who's put violence behind him, but he's called back into action. And it's like, 
it says here on your file you were special ops it's like yeah I'm, <laughs> i put that behind me it's like we need you back in the game it's like that's every fucking steven seagal movie Liam yeah. Neeson movie, yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Liam Neeson oh, yeah, is so never right. brought into it by a person it's that he's in the place where the thing happens that's usually what happens <laughs> or his daughter gets taken either way yeah um so i was gonna ask do you have a preference when it comes to comedy and drama or do you find just you would want to pick between them you want them both um both Oh my. What you cut out there, what? Hello? 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 Uh oh. His they internet got has died. Oh my goodness. The gracious. Disnoids, they got to him. <laughs> what are we gonna do now? Well, Fringy's mute, so it's just you and I, right? So, I wanna talk about, um. <sighs> hmm. Game of Batwoman. The new show about a medieval Batwoman. Who. Advised to become king of Batlania, Bat Batwomania. Batlania, a matriarchy? A batriarchy? <laughs> I mean, if he's actually just randomly died, uh, <laughs> I guess, like, um, we, well, we can, uh, you know what, so... He lasted longer than most guests do, but he, he went all the way to the yeah. end. He went until the internet was cancelled. His internet killed him. He didn't pay his internet bill because he was here talking with us for so long. He forgot to pay his internet bill, so they cut it off right in the middle of the podcast. So you're saying really it's chat's fault? Yes. Yes. I'm. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well. I mean, Fringy is being really quiet over there. Yeah. So look at it. Look at look at that guilty face. Yeah, he knows. He's looking at us with that face like, Look don't that. tell he them knows. the truth. Don't tell them I did he it. He knows what he did. Um, so far, it's been a nifty talk. He's a good guest. I like a guest who won't shut the fuck up. Bringy. Oh, I, did I just miss his... <laughs> I just got back. No, he, well, he was in the, he was in the no, middle of telling us about something and then it just dies. <laughs> he said he liked, oh. he really liked, um, what he said, he said he liked the gas mask guy and the dog. But that third one, that green guy, he just went on and on and yeah, on, just, and he couldn't take it anymore. No chemistry, so, constant no chemistry. berating. Like oil and water. You don't have to be so work. mean. What do you mean? How is the oh, truth no, mean? We're not, being, we're not being mean, we're lying. <laughs> <laughs> That's a form of That's... mean. Oh. Hello. So as long as he doesn't come back, we should be all right to... Oh, damn it. Oh, Hello? oh, shit, here he is. Oh, my goodness gracious. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. It's okay. okay. <laughs> so um, anyway, you were saying comedy and drama. Yes, comedy and drama. So um, I uh, I like the whole spectrum of human emotion. I don't discriminate. You know, I don't think laughter is any less important than, you know, feeling an intense emotion of any other kind, you know? Mm -hmm. So like that kind of ties into like, you know how uh comedies aren't as eligible for prestigious awards yeah as like uh drama and stuff when i think comedies are just so important you know and um well, a good example is like hot fuzz you know hot fuzz is like an incredible it's never yeah. been nominated for anything it's a fantastic fucking movie it's like the script and just the pacing of it it's just perfect yeah i, I would argue every element of filmmaking in that pops there's something to say about why it's good Yes. Um, I, this is something I actually meant to talk about earlier on in regard to like just starting our being the chief. Um, it was what, what taught me what satire was. And it's a show called Knowing Me, Knowing You with Alan Partridge. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure about that. I fucking love that show, and I used to watch it as when I was really young. Is one of my earliest recollections of watching comedy, and I was kind of blown away by it because uh, it's like a talk show format, but every episode ends in a complete disaster. And it took my it took me a while to wrap my head around the fact that it was meant to be that way. I was just like, this talk show 
isn't going well at all. Why would they put <laughs> this on tape? Like, why is this like, why would they put this out there if it didn't work? And I'm really young talking about this, right? Obviously. So I'm, this is me just coming to terms with like, oh, they did it on purpose. And then I started realizing like, oh, I, I kind of, I get how satire works now. And then I realized like how you could, you could weaponize it and you could use it to make, actually make a point while being hilarious at the same time. Yeah. So I learned how it was a very powerful persuasive tool where, uh, and it in involves critic, a lot of critical thinking because you're embodying your opposition. And you are taking their logic to the, the breaking point where you point out the ultimate fallacy in their position. And I res I've had a huge amount of respect for that. And that was one of the things that informed my creation of Arby and the Chief was because it was a satirical portrayal of online gaming, right? Where Chief was just this cartoonish version of, of hate and intolerance and um, impatience. And all the th all just all the negative aspects of playing online that b bugged me, but also made me laugh as well. And uh, comedy, yeah. So comedy's always been a really a important part of my life, and um, it it's taught me how to like laugh at a lot of things in life day to day. Like I I, I laugh a lot. I'm a very uh, and I like to make other people laugh. And um, it's just I, I couldn't imagine living life any other way, you know. It's uh, yeah. Comedy is hugely important. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. Uh, I guess this, you know, because it's, it's it's hard to figure out what exactly like how I can ask the question to get more of what I was sort of looking for. Which I guess I guess it's more to do with the writing then, because um, if if we've already agreed that like Arby and the Chief has had a distinct comedy to drama. The sort of necessary changeover. The comedy has remained, but um, the overall points of the season seem to be much more focused on like a dramatic point rather than uh, just having fun. You know, that's all it is. It's like actually now you you want to make more points about it and stuff. And it's just like, do you find that um, I guess distilled down to its like greatest form that comedy or drama has more of an effect on you, or do you find that they're just both super important? Um. I think they're both important, and yeah, you're you're right. I I took your question and I kind of went down an alternate route there because I remembered so <laughs> something from before. So sorry about that. But yeah, you um, it's uh, it's a constant tightrope that I'm walking. Definitely with with uh, the story seasons, it's tricky because I'm taking these characters that everybody identifies as comedic, and then I'm trying to tell a story that's like well, like rick and morty is trying it right now like with its each of his seasons it's you, you can tell i'm not sure if you watch it but it's just like you can tell there's a tightrope as well it's uh there are some episodes that are like quite impactful in terms of what they're saying about uh the events right now or a message but then there are some that are like oh was i not supposed to take any of that seriously oh okay that sort of thing right yeah um is there's there's some some i try not to let the comedy come at the expense of the plot and um, like with the story seasons, especially later with the later seasons and now, uh, the plot is to me is a little more important than the comedy. But it's also important not to extinguish all the laughs either because mm -hmm. they are, I think they're inherently funny characters and I don't want to lose that, especially Chief. But there, there, are, there are some instances in the plot where there, there will be a particular plot beat that's a satirical joke. Like in season eight, for example, um, the toys get into trouble with the tossers and they're put into internet jail, <laughs> which is like a, <laughs> it's like a prison cell on a map in Halo, Halo Reach. And it makes no fucking sense, but that's kind of the joke. Yeah, the, the concept like alone the, is what's making people laugh. That's the hope. Right. Because what I'm saying there is that if you experience toxicity online, you can always turn your console off at any time. Right. And that's what the toys do, of course, to escape internet jail. And then there's a whole, the tosses are just like, how did they escape? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, we, oh, we had them secured in internet that. jail. What the hell happened? And it's like, so the, the, like the, there's certain plot beats that are essentially entirely comedy beats. You know what I mean? Like, uh, 
So, but that doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes I'll see an opportunity there where I can use satire as like a, a way of getting from one point to another in the plot. And I feel like it kind of works. Maybe it, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I thought the beat about it, you know, having internet jail and the fact that the toys can just quit. Like if the, if the plot was taken seriously, you would think like, okay, the tossers must know that the toys can leave internet jail at any time. This is totally stupid. But like, part of the joke and part of the plot is how deluded the tossers agents are yeah so um, I mean, this is why it so helps it's... to have audio commentary so people don't get upset that you didn't notice stuff like this you're like no no it's on purpose right yeah so it's it's a tight rope i it's all carefully considered though if if and if a joke is if it's funny enough or I mean, that's not enough it's not enough for it to just be really funny to sacrifice the integrity of the plot in most cases. But yeah. if like, it's a satirical, if I'm making a satirical statement with it, I feel like that's enough sometimes at the internet jail being probably the best example I can think of. I think of it's that. a careful tight rope, I think, because, um, well, this, this Barry, Mola, do you want to talk about Barry or? Uh, that, I mean, if you want to, I yeah. mean, that, that, that oh, is be, that the wow, show it's, with uh, Bill Hader? Well, yeah, because that's a show where like um, it's a comedy and a drama, and I think the conclusion we were coming to was that the the comedy was like legitimately undermining the drama at some points. Um, and it's kind of like the whole idea of there's a real balancing act, um, of of like. You know, because because a lot of the time, uh, comedy is that doesn't make sense. That's really funny. I mean, Simpsons does it constantly, but Simpsons obviously gets away with a lot more because it's a cartoon and also it's a focus on comedy. But if you like want drama, drama also kind of almost needs to be contingent on things making sense. And a lot of yes. what comedy is is it is nonsense. Well, it's yeah, um, it, it's insane how how many different degrees of all of this there are, how many different types of this there are because um. There are some shows that you automatically describe as comedy or drama just by com uh, having both in them or, or combos. But then, like, so this, like, what's the most serious drama you can think of? It's like one of them is like, oh, I guess like Breaking Bad, sort of. And you're like, yeah, but they have yeah. lots of dark humor, like the the disposal of the body in the bath, and it slabs through the ceiling, and blood and guts splatter everywhere, <laughs> and Walt is just like, really, <laughs> you just you just fuck this up this much, and it's like funny and it shouldn't be f well it's that kind of humor right like a uh, black hat or a lot of this where it would just be especially in uh goes forth where it's, it's like randomly harshly yeah. commenting Who's on how a couple of flares? you'll be lit up like a christmas tree yeah, yeah um <laughs> but but even even black Adder, there was like there's some stuff they were like actually uh because of the way the season ends they're like we're gonna take a serious note on this we're not actually gonna make it a joke the people who went over the top and died in World War One. That was actually something that was really harsh and horrible. Right. That's Did an interesting point. Yeah, uh, Breaking Bad is a good example, and also uh, The Sopranos is a great example of how comedy can come organically from a really grounded plot. You know, just, yeah. just because a show is funny, that doesn't mean you're sacrificing the integrity of the plot. Like, yeah. to me, The Sopranos, it's not classified as a comedy, but it's one of the funniest fucking shows I've ever seen. And it's funny because the characters are funny and the truth of their day-to-day -day lives and situations is funny. The way they deal with it is funny. And so just because you have comedy in a show doesn't mean you're undermining the plot necessarily. But the, the comedy needs to come organically from the situation. Like break, the Breaking Bad thing with like the, the, the bathtub, the acid melting through the floor. Like that's a great... It's like a comedy beat, but it I makes mean, for all we know, sense. when they wrote it, it was to supply them, you know, a problem to overcome that totally makes sense within Jesse's character. That makes sense. And then maybe when they were constructing, you were like, actually, this would be, this could work as like if we film it right and if we deliver it, you know, like tonally in a way that's um, ambiguous enough. Because despite it being flesh and bone and blood flying through the ceiling, it's like if we do it right, this could be taken quite funny because it kind of is. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's... Um, Tough to that's nail that sort of thing. Yeah, that's the kind of comedy I would hope to, like, to have in my show, but it's, it's such a fucking hard line to walk, and it's, I still struggle with it, like, even today remember, writing um, scripts.
I think it's like episode two or something, but uh, Blackadder's on the phone with um, oh, the 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 guy is the guy in charge. I really can't remember the name. Um, I can't remember either. Yeah. But uh, he's talking to him about how he doesn't want to go over the over the top, and the guy has a Stephen little like Stephen Fry, right? No, no, it's um, he's only in the is the it one. Ep- no, it's it's a it's uh, no, the guy no. it's the guy above those two. He's on the phone with him. Um, what was Hague, oh, Hague. I think? Hague. Hague. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's talking to Hay, right. and he's got this this set of like the trenches on the no man's land, and he just has a bunch of little like uh, toy soldiers representing his side, and he's like put them there. And as he's talking to Blackadder, he just starts brushing them off into a dustpan and puts them in the bed like he already knows that's <laughs> going to happen to them. And it's just, yeah. you know, the thing with those shows having the audience laugh in the background as they do. Right. A lot of people wouldn't even have known that was a joke at the time in, in, unless the audience had reacted to it. Because you just, he's talking, like something else is happening in this scene. He's, he's, he brushes something off a table, you don't even know what it is. But the joke is that that's how much he doesn't give a fuck about all the soldiers. And that's, that's horrible right. to think about. But also kind of yeah. funny. It's just like, wow, yes. that is a balancing yeah. act right there. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah, that's another good point about the the role that comedy plays in life, and you can yeah. find laughs even in the most dark times. And that's it's kind of a defense mechanism. Sometimes you have to laugh in the oh, most for sure, yeah. bleakest moments, you know, because otherwise you'll go insane if you don't learn how to laugh. And um, yeah, I, I'm a big lover of um, black comedy. You know, it's just like... Uh, like Medea? Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that a Tyler Perry thing? Yeah. Or Oh, no, I know what you mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean uh, just um, comedy in just comedy of color. bleakness and darkness. All right. Yeah. And um, it's... That I think that's where comedy is at its most useful, you know. Yeah, is is getting people out of fits of depression or or whatever. Like sometimes you got to laugh at the most darkest moments. And I I love stand watching stand up comedy that's like brutal. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's oh, yeah. just comedy. yeah. I fucking George I can't Colin. get enough of that stuff. Yeah. It's kind of ruined st- the rest of stand-up comedy for me because usually I watch stand-up and I'm just like, this is too tame. I need something more hardcore than this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, almost it's sometimes like too that. wholesome as well. Like, the joke right, is yeah. like, yeah, that's kind of nice. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I also do notice that about the bus. Yeah. Have you ever noticed? Uh, I like how that's just you know that's, that's basically just um Seinfeld's brand of comedy. Though even he's considered controversial now. How nuts is that? Oh yeah. Um, do you guys know a comedian called Frankie Boyle? Yes. I fucking love that guy. I think he's so funny. And in his third stand-up special, he has a he has a bit called Michael Jackson's Children's Hospital. Oh. And <laughs> it is one of the funniest fucking the first time I heard it, I was crying laughing. But it's so it's horrific. The paint the the painting that he picked that he picked the picture that he paints for the audience is just horrific right. but it, and it was taking something because i'm a big michael jackson fan whether he did what he did or he didn't i don't know i don't really want to get into that but it's it's kind of besides the point anyway like where Fra- frankie assumes that he did what he did at least for the sake of the joke uh it's about uh, michael jackson's on his deathbed and he was recorded he was recorded saying he's going to build a children's hospital the biggest children's hospital in the world. And he's kind of, his voice is very weak and it sounds really strange. His voice is strange because he was just on his his last breath, right? So it was was very sad. But then Frankie says, I don't think that was even his voice. I think that was the the voice of the pedophile demon who controlled his soul. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And then he, he goes into this like, a few minutes long rant where he personifies the pedophile demon in Michael Jackson, where he's like, I'm going to build a children's hospital. (laughs) And it was, (laughs) he's like, I won't get into it, but like, it's just, it's just this horrific picture that he paints. And, uh, it was taking this idea, this positive image of Michael Jackson that I had and just 
doing a complete 180 of it and just twisting it into the most horrific thing possible. And there's something about that that I found I found so ridiculously funny. And it was, it was kind of an eye opening moment for me where it's just like I, you can they made something so twisted, really, really funny. Like, how did he do that? That just fascinated me. And uh, there's been a, a few moments in comedy for me like that where I'm just like, oh, you can find you can get big laughs out of like the bleakest shit sometimes, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, I think uh, I've heard it being described like that tragedy is first person comedy, third person. I think that's, a, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. If it's not happening to you. It's like, Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but if it's happening to you, then it's like, Oh, this sucks. Right. Yeah. And when I realized when I was laughing at such dark humor, I then kind of realized like, okay, there's certain things that when you're laughing at something, there's a certain thing. There's a, there's a target of a joke and a subject and the subject matter of a joke. Right. Mm -hmm. And just because like, it's like, if you tell a joke about the Holocaust or something, just because the Holocaust is the subject matter, doesn't mean that you're targeting the victims of the Holocaust. Right. No, but yeah, but you you can tell a joke where something horrific is the subject matter. Like nine eleven is another example, right? Pe people have told jokes that involve horrific things like that, and they've been funny. But it's specifically because they aren't the target of the joke. The target is something else. Usually, it's just some individual who's made the wrong choices or something, or I don't know. Yeah. But the subject matter and the target are not the same thing, and uh, yeah. That, that was a learning experience for me, too. Um, I suppose uh, there was no video coverage this EFAP, but there was one, uh, one clip that is worth the four of us seeing. Uh, the four of us have probably already seen it, because it was spreading around Twitter in relation mm -hmm. to um, video game journalism, <laughs> as you call it. Reviews. Oh, yeah. uh, and I just think it could be fun to watch before we... Uh, well, consider moving to any other kind of uh, section of this wonderful podcast. Um, I'm just going to send you... I don't know if you know how uh, Watch Together does or does not work. You just hit the old link, and you'll jump into a little room with all of us, and you can control your own volume, but the pause button is shared by all of us. Uh, oh. This will only be like... Oh, I've seen other streamers use this. I never... This is my first time actually seeing this. How this works. This is cool. Yeah, okay. Shit. Um, is every is everybody in? Uh, yeah, I, th I think so. We're loading missing one right now. Yeah, it's loading up. There we go. All right, so been uncharacteristically slow. You all may have heard about this and or seen it, but um, IGN, no wait, Gamespot, <laughs> sorry, reviewed SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just gonna watch the opening like 30 seconds, so it's just funny. Okay. I'm Michael Hyam reading for reviewer Funke Joseph. Nearing the end of SpongeBob's journey under the sea, you're tasked with guiding a ball through a giant this Rube Goldberg machine. Like you. What? Sounds like I who? Just, can no, it just can the people like... watching see the video feed? Yes. It's just, it just sounds oh, okay. Like gone a little bit. Don't so worry, they were long for the ride with us. Interesting. Right. Concept. Sure doesn't. Matter. Machine, man's lair. Once you activate the machine, you have to match the ball's painstakingly slow speed while using SpongeBob's arsenal of bubble abilities to make sure it doesn't fall over. It's a simple task and concept, but trying to execute it is some of the most unfun and Sisyphean gameplay in recent memory. People in one set, I love <laughs> referencing Sisyphus in your SpongeBob review. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking brilliant. That's not even the reason I put this clip on, but that's fantastic. Who? People aren't gonna, no one's gonna know. It's this. It's it's just I know this word. Yeah. I need you to know that I know this word. Yeah. Is there a particular controversy surrounding this video or the? Journalist? Yes, we're we're about to see it. The frame you'll see if you ha if you don't recognize the frame, then uh, this will be due to you. But he's about to criticize a puzzle. Let's uh, let's watch. Task and concept, okay. but trying to execute it is some of the most unfun and Sisyphean gameplay in recent Sounds memory. Sounds just like you. In one section of the puzzle, all you need to do is stand on a button, and that button opens a gate for you to bowl a bubble into, so you can progress. The only problem is that during Spongebob's wind-up animation for bowling, he walks forward. 
That means you fall off of the button, which closes the gate you and prevents you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's Swear like, God. just tab back fifth. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Oh, God. This is like the cuphead thing. Yeah. This <laughs> oh, it's so Stand fucking funny. Back. Just tab fifth back. I, I can't believe that this... this is, first, I had to check. So, this has 465 upvotes. It has 12,378 oh. downvotes on a fucking SpongeBob SquarePants video game <laughs> review. There's something. <laughs> the puzzles in this SpongeBob game are too hard. For like, my this, game this scenario to me is just, just amusing as hell. Like, they tried to review a kid's game, but they fucked it up so much that it pissed off the entire internet. Like, <laughs> jeez. Um,. Yeah, that's that's basically it. I just think that's so funny. Oh my God. <laughs> he keeps stepping. It's like just... this is the kind of shit they would do in Portal. Your standard puzzle that's like, hey, you need to do this to do this, but it does that. So what are you gonna do? And he's like, that's a flaw. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> How do these are? If you're a professional video game journalist, and like, and you can. How do you get this job? Like, what's the what's the hiring process? What yeah. what questions do they ask you at your interview for reviewing video games? Mm -hmm. Hey, so have you played SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom? And if so, <laughs> how how practiced are you in taking a couple of steps back so that you can just get the like just take a few steps back? I don't <laughs> understand why this is. Oh, okay. It's fascinating. This is a it fascinating is. review. Let's just. Uh, well, it feels like, yeah, exactly. I'm just gonna roll it back and let it, let it play again. It's, just, <laughs> it's funny shit. Animation for bowling. He walks forward. That means you fall off of the gate and prevents you from bowling the bubble where you intended, when you intended. These kinds of gameplay barricades are common. Barricades. They're barricades. <laughs> they called. They called challenges. I just, like, barricades. Wow. That is fucking incredible. There's <laughs> a button that just lets me beat the game. I, I tried to throw it into the thing, but there's this fan that prevents me every other second from getting it in. What is this about? <laughs> I don't understand. You broke it's true. it. That too many of these people suck at video games. It's fucking unreal. I don't know how they get these jobs. No, it is insane. Yeah. Baffling. Um, but yeah, the, the, I, I did watch this whole review, there's not, the, the, he says, like, the game isn't hard enough, and a lot of people are ripping on him for, like, you know, saying, like, why does the, the game meant for children have to be, like, fucking Dark Souls or some shit, but, it, <laughs> it's Dark all... Dark Souls of Spongebob game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like this, a comment says, games are supposed to punish the player for being bad, yet this game feels like it's constantly <laughs> punishing for no reason. <laughs> 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 That's fantastic. Why is this game punishing me? It's only yeah. supposed to punish bad players. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of it's kind of incredible, isn't it? It's like art. Oh. So yeah, that I don't know. I just I, I figured that would be a, a, we. I wanted to play that clip. It's just, uh, we did. Success. Wow, That's um, funny. Holy that shit. That really brightened my day. My <laughs> something about my self esteem is just oh From man. From what I, I understand, so uh, myself. This rehydrated battle for Bikini Bottom has been very controversial because all of the reviews that are coming out, like apparently IGN had a really bad review for it as well. Um, <laughs> and everybody's just talking about how it's actually a really good game. So it's kind of interesting that. Did yeah, one of the developers like, say that they like Trump or something? Well, like the funny that thing is, I looked it up on Metacritic. The critic score is 67, the user score is 9.1. Really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Uh, Apparently, Battle for Bikini Bottom be a really good game. Oh my god. Well, the problem is a lot of people played it in their in their good old childhood, so kids, you got to be yeah. real careful because uh, the especially. I mean, if you're dealing with that, like you you watch this review and it's like shitting on the game. The first thing it says is the puzzles doesn't even work properly. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of puts you off right from the start, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, that's um that that's kind of it. So the the plan, I guess, now is uh, to answer the super chats, uh, which oh is the standard time where Rags and I offer the guests if they wish to to stay or go. It's completely up to you. Were they not allowed to go before? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> You're in internet jail. Yeah. <laughs> right. I see. I see. Either of you are welcome to answer at any point. I'm happy to stick around. Oh. For a little while anyway, yeah. Oh, you're talking about me and, and the other guys. I'm I'm totally down to stay. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, for, <laughs> for some reason I, I thought you were talking about the viewers. Uh, I was, I know, <laughs> yeah. I, I realized, oh, he means me and the other guys. Like, yeah, I'm totally down to stay. All right, Absolutely. so yeah, just I'm gonna read out the super chats <coughs> in chronological order. Some of them, I think, will be addressing what we've been talking about. Some uh, to you directly, and some just gonna be memes. So you may not understand a lot of them, but that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. So first one just says the best or crossovers. I I think they meant the best of all crossovers. I'm gonna get. I don't know. But yes. Um, hello, all my Ewok words. Hello there. There was one in between Hi. those that got deleted. It just says message deleted, so... Sorry about that. Assuming they didn't do it themselves. This one says, John, lol, 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 lol. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to that. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and guess. That's something you hear a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, I remember when John CJG was Digital Fear. Wow, I'm old. Yep. We all do. It's okay. We're all old. That's still my. It's still the easiest way to look me up on uh, YouTube. Either you type in John Graham or Digital Fear, and my channel comes up. So, hmm. yep, never, never going away. Stuck with it for the rest of my natural. <laughs> well, should have put more the, thought into it when I wanted to play Return to Castle Wolf. Well, I guess the but... the main problem is if you ever create an internet handle, you just, you can't have it be easily substitutable for <laughs> gay or queer. Like, that's, that's <laughs> yes, that was a very big mistake on my part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Look, it's digital queer. <laughs> in fairness, you got yeah. wrecked. Okay. <laughs> uh, fags. <laughs> Um, gonna take my horse to the old town glue factory, Elmer's gang. Um, you gonna, you gonna turn the horse well, into glue? I sponsored a racehorse once and Why? named her uh, Purina. All right. All right. Well, I mean, I'm sure some people will appreciate that. However, we can move right along. Then, no need to dwell on that. Um. <laughs> Fringy, please say the N word. You know which I one. I already did. I already <laughs> did. Just so you, you got it. That's fine. Uh, hello there, Magsler. Mary for the win. Mary for the win. Are we referencing Batwoman? Sure. Oh, May right, maybe. I mean, Mary's alright. Yeah, she's she's not as insufferable as the rest sometimes. Well, whatever that means. Yeah. But a lot of times she is. Um. Uh, Thoughts on Indiana Jones trilogy? We don't talk about the fourth one. Uh, oh, it's great. Yeah, big yeah. fan of all three. Favorite is probably the third. All three, yeah. Yeah, I love them. I need to rewatch them sometime. It's been ages since I've seen them. EFAP movies, Indiana Jones. <gasps> Hooray. <laughs> I think the third one is my favorite, but uh, that's not... I don't I've, think that's the popular... I've decision. never not loved the uh, dynamic between... Harrison Ford and Sean Connery. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah. I love that beat at the end where he's like, he's in the chasm, he's reaching for the grail. It's like, I, I almost got it. And uh, mm -hmm. Sean Connery's like, Junior. Junior. Or no, and he says, in, in Indiana. Let you go. Yeah. Like, let, let you go. go. Yeah. Let you go. <laughs> yeah, it's good shit. It's fucking great. Yeah. That's my diary in Berlin. Junior. Junior. <laughs> Junior. Junior. Um, this is a unicorn uh, emoji. Wonderful. What's up, my good B word? So many, so many letter words at this point. It's hard to keep track. Okay. Well. Um. Hello, massives. Hi, rags. Hello. Hello. Good to see you, EFAP. 
Uh, good to see you. I guess that's supposed to be good to see you on EFAP, John. Uh, love your content ever since middle school. Hey. <gasps> awesome. Um, the Last of Us 2 story is bad tism. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, like, yeah, like, again, the reason why we're not talking about it yet is because I'm assuming the the things that may or may not happen in it are going to be things that people in EFAP chat are probably going to want me to react to, like, for the first time in the game. That's why I'm trying to avoid all yeah. spoilers. And once you get that, you'll also get us talking about it, possibly for more than one EFAP, because there's already several videos we've been sent, because people are like, please watch these, please! I'm just like, alright, alright, just chill out. <laughs> like, we gotta play it first. So, we'll yeah. get there. Um, hello all my nor words. Fringy's life matters, green man good. Heart. Hello. <laughs> I'm just looking at Fringy's icon, that's his, that's his whole feel right now. Wait, what's that? I didn't. I didn't. Know that. <laughs> that makes uh, it even we were, better. We were just talking about alpacas. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, damn it! I never get to catch these live, and now I have to go to sleep. Keep it up, long man. Absolutely, yes. Um. Oh yeah, a lot of people want me to play Pikmin. Right. I guess I. Yeah. I didn't finish it. That's true. Okay. Well, I'll. I'll try and get that going while I'm carrying on. Um. Hello, all my N words. Hi, rags. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, rags, and oh, whoa, rag. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, crew. Awesome guest, but I have a barbecue. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh. like the way that that's worded. Hey, right, cool. I got things to do. <laughs> I got a barbecue. Fuck off. <laughs> You're like, oh, all right, jeez. Uh, where are we? Uh, Rags, you should look into Canadian May firearm ban and how bad it is. Look into the Gabriel Wartman too. That was the cause. Hmm. Do you want hmm. me to paste that to you, or...? Yeah, go ahead and do that. Because I don't know what those words mean. Some, some space-age stuff. Peanut. Um... I've made an EFAP network in Titanfall 2 on PC, if anyone's interested. Just look up EFAP in the network search. Oh, there That's you go. Nifty. I might do that. Um, the true Toa Nova returns. Yes. Nova. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> what was the deal with someone taking over Robbie and the Chief and making it horribly unfunny? Was a big fan up until that point. Movie included. Oh. Oh, that's uh, Arby and the Chief in LA. He's talking about. Yeah. Right, I assume. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, horribly oops. unfunny. Yeah, I actually. I actually forgot about the movies, because there's the movie and then there's Endgame, Endgame and there's six. Yeah. yeah, it was split into six parts in YouTube. You used a lot of Call of Duty music in that. In that yes. One. Yeah. Lots of COD Four tracks. Yeah. I fucking I love the music in that game. I think it's I yeah. It so cool. I think it's pretty good too. What was it? Um, the what was the name of the guy? Scott was it? The the Coke. The two. It's just constantly. Oh working. yeah. So yeah, the toys get a roommate called Scott. <laughs> and uh he's like this cocaine addict uh who just smokes a shitload of cigarettes and jacks off and <laughs> and uh i can't i can't forget what function he played in the story to be honest he was the villain i think yeah <laughs> and, um, and then there was ancient smirnoff who was this russian dude who just yeah know, he was played by a good friend of mine who just had this like trench coat and this like kind of russian <laughs> armband and he had this just funny Russian character that I wanted to incorporate in the show just because I thought the character was funny. It didn't serve us any kind of theme. Like, those those aren't meant to be taken nearly as seriously as, like, season five, six, or seven. They were just, you know, me having fun, you know, yeah. doing shit that I, uh, that I thought was funny. And uh, those were fun to make. It was a bit of a grueling process because um, Arby and the Chief, the movie, that was made specifically for a screening event in Vancouver that happened. It was called RVB Can West, Red versus right. Blue, and um, as in Western Canada. And it was a uh, it was an event in Vancouver for Red versus Blue fans to like meet up and watch uh, promotional stuff from Rooster Teeth, like promoting their new season or whatever else they were working on, and then uh, other people who lived local in Vancouver to show off their machinima projects 
and then I was one of them. And I remember that was really stressful for me because that was the first time I, I had premiered something in person. Right. And I made this half hour movie that uh, I don't know if people like it. I mean, I think I think it's kind of it has its moments. But, I like uh, that movie. I like the, um, oh, the opening thank you. introduction sequence with the uh, play pretend like um, video game thing. Right. Yeah. I had, a, I had a good time making it, although it was like to meet the deadline, it was a really rushed production and just throwing right. it all together in editing towards the end was really rough. We were on no sleep. And um, I remember being so stressed out during the screening just because it was like an audience of like 100 people or something, or maybe not almost 100. And uh, I was just really nervous. I was outside chain smoking cigarettes because I didn't. <laughs> I was just worried about everybody who was gonna hate it. And like, but uh, I, as usual, I just it just kind of the negativity kind of blew up out of proportion in my head, and it wasn't. It went down really well, and people were really, people really enjoyed it. They got a bunch of laughs out of it, and people were com complimenting me after the show. And it was a really, it was a nice, it was a nice time. <clears throat> yeah, that's good shit, man. Like this is a. Yeah. Performance anxiety, but for a thing that's already created, <laughs> like, please don't. Right, yeah, and it's just watching a, sh a move, a thing that you made in f with a theater full of people. Mm. I'm just anytime a joke doesn't land, I'm just like sinking in my chair, going, "Oh Christ!" <laughs> like, just cringing so hard, my spine's about to fucking break. See, and that's the great thing with YouTube is that you don't need to know if they did laugh at that particular joke or not. You just imagine they did. Right, yeah. it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except with them pesky live audiences. Hate those. <laughs> the worst. Yeah. yeah, except ours, they're great. They're great. <laughs> In which case, too. Um... So this just this just says Outer Wilds. I think we're starting to get a regular who keeps saying that... I guess they want us to get Outer Wilds. So. Is is that a that game? Is that is a game. Yes. A lot. Yeah, Outer Wilds is a game people keep recommending. Hmm. Which I mean, maybe that means I need to give it a look and give it a shot. Hmm. Just been on my normal rotation binge, I guess. Uh, right. Yay, birthday, Efap. At twenty-five years of age, I'm an old man. Yeah, pretty much. Twenty-five is uh, that's that's late in the game. It's all over at that point. No more fun. And no one here is disagreeing, so that must mean it's true. <laughs> um, bastard, start streaming right as I have to go to a birthday party. Ah, it's okay. I'll see it at some point. Also, if I recorded an EFAP parody cover song for the 100th FAP, would you show it? Um, assuming it doesn't break TOS or copyright. Should be right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not against that. Make it really funny. You know, we just warned about how live chat are just the worst. I worry about that shit on my stream all the time. People want me to watch stuff live, and I'm mm -hmm. just like, okay, what's in this <laughs> language? It's gonna get me fucking banned. Is there giant dicks in it? Like, what am I in for? Can uh, only hope. So, so people want my live reactions, but like, I I really want to screen this shit before I air anything <laughs> live, right? Yeah. So. Oh, it's funny, we, we, we don't screen most of the shit we show and then we end up getting hit with copyright claims and stuff, with, which doesn't even make sense. Like, some of the videos we cover get away with it, but then we don't. It's like, but we're breaking it up even more than it was. I don't understand how that works, but alright. Right. Transformative free tisms is it? Yeah, it's all very complicated. Um, hey, the worst it's been is like a copyright thing, though, so... Yeah. You what, sorry? Uh, like when it comes to people wanting me to watch stuff mm -hmm. like the worst that's happened is just like copyright claims it's like people use like like me using call of duty music for like rb and the chief yeah end game yeah so it's been pretty good yeah you think it wouldn't be that bad right I mean, most of the time mm -hmm. we still i don't think efab's ever gotten a strike which is kind of amazing honestly Ooh, wow yeah you'd think we would have by now Streak lives. We'll have our first eventually, I'm sure of it. 
Uh, hey Moller, I wanted to apologize for spoiling a big plot point in The Last of Us 2 in last week's video. The question was meant for Weekend Warrior, who I assume played through the game already. Hopefully it doesn't ruin the experience too much when you play it. I'm not even 100% sure of what one it was. I am... I don't either. But definitely... But if, if you give a super chat, like, surely you know that Moller's <laughs> I'm gonna read it, yeah. Right? <laughs> like, I'm... So... I don't know. It was I, meant for Weekend Warrior to read it. It was meant for somebody else to read, not you. When you read it to him, don't read it, alright? <laughs> just... Just say it aloud, but don't pay attention. Uh, I still use the term, tell him you have super cancer every so often. Thanks for the laughs, bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... That was a highlight. Mega eight. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn is coming to PC, also high rags. Hello. Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, hey moles, I'm making a grand meme for EFAP 100. Where's the best place I can post it so you can find it? That would be... Uh, Discord is the best one in the EFAP meme section. Second best is probably the subreddit. Third best is Twitter. And if none of those work, I don't really have a meme depository that uh, people can use, I'm afraid. Um, but hopefully that's good enough. Well, this is 50 Pikmin? I don't believe it. Should have gotten more. Damn it. Um, Mola, favorite characters from The Wire? I have unfortunately not seen The Wire. We we are going to watch it though. That is the plan. Yeah, after uh, uh, Bojack, right? Bojack. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I'll have seen more cool shows for cool people by then. Okay, people. <laughs> um, I watched the first season of The Wire uh, and a bit of the second season, and it's it's really good, but it's moves so fucking slowly. It is a slow paced show because I got part way through season one, and uh, yeah, it's 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 got quite a slow pace. Yeah. Um. Fringy, say the line. I already did. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, loved watching Arby and the Chief back in middle school, loved watching Machinima videos back when they were still popular to do. Yeah, man. It's, uh, I feel like most people know about it if they've been on the internet since uh, that era, at the very least. Yeah. I highly recommend it as, like, a, a tool for familiarizing yourself with the process of filmmaking. There's a lot of skills that you develop doing Machinima that you can carry over into live action. Like, you learn how to be economic with, like, Okay, I'll start with my wide shot and then move in for coverage. You know, it just you 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 learn kind of a lot of shortcuts that you can you know, like, not in a way that you're compromising the quality of the product, but just like you save yourself a lot of time. Yeah. And uh, the 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 process of making machinima, there's a lot of overlap with live action production. I know that might be hard to imagine, but it's just you know when it comes to the block light rehearse shoot thing that applies that's exactly the same for machinima just like it is it's just like there's a few steps obviously you don't have to take in the case of machinima where you don't, you don't have to light the scene or rehearse it mm -hmm. but um it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap there and it's like i've i've learned like i i did a lot of machinima making before i went to film school and i realized like a lot of the skills that I developed, I could carry over into making sh short films. Where it's just like, no, we we gotta s start with our wide shot, and then we'll move in, and uh, and then you know, just like editing as well. All the things I learned about editing video and sound design, like I was able to carry that over to live action. So if you're interested in filmmaking, and you want to, you want like an easy, low budget way of teaching yourself how to do it, like just. Try making a machinima movie with a video game, whether it's Halo or something else. Is there um is the ability to do that with, with uh Master Chief Collection possible yet or no? I uh, tried to do it on Halo 2 anniversary on Xbox though, not on PC, I don't think. Yeah, I've I've just been focused on Reach so much. I haven't really took taken a dive into the, the options for that in Master Chief Collection, but I'm aware that I, Halo 5 has like a machinima mode specific, it's named that, and you can put like a green screen object, it, like it, there's a forge mode, and you can place like a green screen box. And so like, like they, they, they put some filmmaking assets in the game itself, 
that you can toy around with. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. But there's just something about the aesthetic of that game that I feel Reach yeah. works a lot better. Like, because uh, Halo 5 is like super 60 frames per second and there's no elite characters. And uh, I don't know. I just, I feel like Reach works a lot better for me. Halo 5 also probably doesn't have maps that work well for Machinima because they're all like arena maps and enclosed spaces. It's not really yeah. big environments and things like that. Yeah, Reach. Thinking that Halo maps prior to 4 and 5 especially were real places like real yeah you know you could, you could go there and there were things that happened and... yeah so... breach has a real filmic quality to it i think mm -hmm. i think more so than any other halo game like it's it's cinematic and i think that kind of is a is because of the story it's telling like the the, the grim plot of like of sacrifice that is like rogue one yeah i could, I could definitely yeah. say i could connect those yeah. A lot of people really love that aspect of Rogue One, just the fact that they all die. <laughs> it's just like, well... <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mola, my dad and I bought a 1927 Thompson SMG. We're picking it up next month, and I remember you mentioning a video about them that you liked. Where can I find it? And high rags. Hello, and you are very lucky, uh, very, very lucky to be able to purchase that sort of thing. Must be very, very expensive. Oh, is it like super rare? The paperwork. Well, oh, super sort of, illegal? Or? But no, yeah, not right. super legal. You have to do a lot of paperwork to a lot of paperwork to be able to get them. But the big prohi prohibiting uh, aspect is generally the cost. Uh, automatic or uh, select fire firearms that are transferable under the NFA. Very expensive. Um, very, very expensive. Some far more than others, uh, but Thompson's, they tend to be collector's items for a lot of people. Obvious historical reasons. They're very standout, uh, very iconic. Mm -hmm. So the demand is often very high for them, and they can be very expensive. Um, yeah, the, so the video would probably be from uh, Xbox Ahoy or Retro Ahoy, or Ahoy, I think is just what he goes by. Uh, he, he, if you just type Ahoy Thompson, you, you probably find it, but it's just a cool video to explain why it has the reputation it has, and then I think how it worked and why it was made. Uh, good stuff. Um, stop pronouncing it H like H, it's H, silly British. Also, hello Raggled. Hello. I pronounce what I want the way I want. <laughs> and you can't do nothing to boot it. Yeah, um, but what if the queen uh, I'll, I'll, told you? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it then. If she says, yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. She is the queen. Defying the queen, like, why would you do that? Why? It's it's. Like, first of all, rude. Yeah, Jesus Christ. I mean, no, no, the queen. Island, Jesus Christ is a different one. Jesus. Yeah, the queen's rude. <laughs> uh. Hi, Mauler and Rags. Hello. Can Hello? can one of you say just us, and the other one responds with yeah, like he's extremely pissed? What? Just us. Now you have to do the other one. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. I don't know what the fuck's happening in this super chat. Uh, it ends with XD, so uh, hopefully we nailed it. Hello, roller and guests. Hello. Hey. Also, hi, Mags. <laughs> Hello. Carrying over memes there. I know where that came from. Uh, chewy or crunchy chips? Crunchy. Ch yeah, I will, crunchy. Well, so a lot of people probably haven't had a lot of... Chewy chips are definitely not the more common one, but I've had some... When I was uh, hiking in New Mexico once, I had a lot of these, like, apple... Like slightly de mostly dehydrated apples, and they were kind of chewy, but they were really good. Uh, and those were great. I really like those. Those were yummy. But um, yeah, I'm a I'm a, ch I'm, a I'm a crunchy chip kind of guy. No, wait, is are is he referring to cookies? 
I think well, he's probably okay. referring to cookies because he said chips, and I know that over in backwards land, your chips are our cookies. You mean so frontwards that probably land? Makes more sense. Cookies? What are you talking about? No, no, crisps. What? No, no. Okay, oh, so crisps. Oh, yeah. crisps. Wait, wait, why did you say cookies chips, if you meant cookies. that? Crisps, no <laughs> chips. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cookies because... are still cookies. <laughs> cookies yeah. never no, changed, Rex. What? What, what do you call chips? You call chips something, right? They're crisps. We call chips chips. That what you? you call them crisps. We call them chips. No, I don't call them crisps. We call them chips. And I thought that chips was like British okay, or cookies so, or something. So you, you know like Pringles? They're chips, yeah. right? Yes. We call those Pringles chips. are chips, yes. But we but also my, call what you call French fries so chips white. as well. We oh my god, is this true? That means we, all three of us have a different categorization. Well, because we have fish and chips. That's still well, like chips. Yeah, I was gonna say for us, yeah. all crisps are crisps. Potato chips that are that are fried, no, we, preserved, we ready in packets. Chip, right? Yeah, yeah they're crisps for us. Chips are like this is yeah, fucking pointless yeah, talking yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so when they ask that, they really meant like. Well, chips, so the crisps, full thing like says chip. chewy or crunchy chips ahoy. I prefer chewy. Oh, Chips Ahoy is a kind of cookie, so... Yeah, uh, right. Chewy. I prefer Chewy. Chew yeah, if, yeah, if we're talking about right, cookies, yeah. Chewy for sure. Alright, well, I'm glad we got that, uh... Get, yeah, got that, all settled. That, yeah. that was very important to discuss. I'm glad we yep. got that out of the way. Yeah, good yeah, stuff, Get guys. all your Chewy cookies ready for EFAP 100. <laughs> Um, Longman, every video on Moolah past EFAP 84 has not been put in their proper playlist yet. Just a friendly reminder to do that sometime in the future. I will get on that. I do sometimes forget. Thank you. Um, please invite It's a Gundam on EFAP. I'm okay with that, sure. Yeah, sure. Could be fun. Hey, Moolah, it's been a while. I know it must be hard to constantly defend MCU Spidey on Twitter. Unfortunately, some Spider-Man fans are tism. Also, could we hear your updated MCU film ranking? Hmm. Oh, that take ages. It's kind of hard to, yeah, like, list it all. The, the updated version That'll is just... That'll be good for EFAP 100. Oh, yeah, we, we could, we could do the little and... game thing, I guess. Yeah. EFAP 100. Did there you, you guys like the Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man movie? We, we are yeah. big fans of the new Spider-Man right. films. Much Homecoming to this, is yeah, I like them. masterpiece yeah. tier. Yeah, Far right. From right. Home, really not great. as good, but still good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm cool with Far oh. From Home, but I really like Homecoming. Homecoming is Homecoming is. I mean, Vulture is, like, the best villain in the MCU as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, he's great. How do you think they compare to the Raimi Spider-Man movies? Uh, I think that he stacks up very well against Doc Ock. It's kind of hard to pick between those two, but I think, uh, I think Vulture is pretty fantastic. Right, he's, yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much that works about him. For one, he was created by the Avengers and the Avengers activities feed into what he does and inform why he does what he does. Um, and he has a lot in common with Peter in the sense that they are both just on the ground underdog types. It's yes. just that he, and they were both created by the Avengers. They were both created by the Avengers, exactly. And also, this is the fun little nifty thing that I think Mauler found out. Um, Vulture's theme is an inversion of the Avengers theme. It's like the same song but inverted, basically. And it's like that's so that's so cool, man. That's, that's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. They carried the same thing over to uh, Mysterio. How like his theme, if you change the key signature, it goes from heroic to sinister. This is some really clever stuff. Um, yeah. Because like with vultures, I think when it's heroic, it's like bam, bam, dan. Oh wait, no, I'm I'm mixing up. You with, mean Mysterio? The villainous right? one is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just, these are some really clever things, and like, it's funny, because a lot of people shit on music in the MCU, but these new Spider-Man films, they got some, like, musical, um, they got some recurring musical tracks, like, Spider-Man's got a new theme now that they use, yeah, it's, it's good shit, I like these movies a lot. Uh, I do too, and I really like Tom Holland as Peter Parker. I like him a lot too, yeah. Um, I find his performance in the movies is a little too giddy, and like, the dialogue is very fast and sometimes mm -hmm. the scenes can be a little too like on the playful banter side where it doesn't feel organic um but i do like the movies um but spider-man 2 in the raimi trilogy is still i think my favorite one uh, i think that's really a fair really choice good. yeah, yeah. it's a really good, good film 
Third one's a fucking disaster. <laughs> oh yeah, no, yes, totally. What a what a shitty film. <laughs> what was yeah. some... <laughs> Anyone who thinks otherwise like is just fighting? fucking wrong. Dude, um, I I I, we were, I was going to that movie with my friend to the theater, and uh, he said, uh, "I'll bet you five bucks this movie's a piece of shit." And I said, "You're you're on. This movie's gonna have venom in it. It can't be a piece of shit." And also, this Spider-Man Two is fucking awesome. So I think this will be good. And then I watched it, and my by the time it got to the Peter Parker dancing scene, my face was in my fucking hands. <laughs> going, oh no! What no, what are they doing? Oh, it's so bad that they parodied it in, into the Spider Verse. That's how bad the dancing scene was. Yeah. Jesus, well, that movie. Yeah. It's too, too many elements. I don't know why they didn't just settle on one villain. It was stupid. Well, the interesting story behind that one is that Abby Arad, one of the producers, said to Sam Raimi, you've got to do Venom. Um, and instead of, like, because uh, he wanted to do Sandman, um, and but he, he still wanted to do Sandman, so he just did all three. That was the right. wrong decision. And I think it's yes. an interesting discussion of... um. Even if a producer imposes these obligations on you, maybe, like, don't make that decision, you know? Yeah, well, it's, like, it's, just, it's what people say about, right. they're like, TLJ's only bad because of what TL TFA did to it as a setup. It's like, no, T TLJ fucked up all on its own. It didn't, you can't blame it all on TFA. Mm -hmm. And even if, even if you're a sequel to a really bad thing, it's like, even if, you can still try. I'm to give up. <laughs> like, oh, I don't think there's any yeah. reason to assume that just because a producer told you to do something that it, you couldn't find a way to make it work, you know? Right. Like, it'll be harder, and maybe it's preferable that we don't have producers saying, you must put Venom in the film. But the the idea that it was doomed from the start, I don't think is, uh, I don't think I agree with that. Um, I love how Sp uh, Raimi's Spider-Man 2 is so focused on Peter Parker. Like, it mm -hmm. feels like the movie's Dude, really about Dude, that film is really fucking good. Yeah. It's quite surprising. Uh, yeah, and I love that it spends so much time with Peter Parker at the beginning of the movie. And it's like, all these terrible things are happening to him. He can't pay his bills and whatever his yeah. love life's failing. And by the time he's in the bank and he's applying for the loan or whatever, and they don't get approved... It's just like, oh man, how could things get any worse? And then Doc, and then Ock, Doc Ock, Ock comes yeah. in. I'm like, that's fucking cool, man. And then there's this great fight scene. It's a great movie. It really is. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, because if the third one was fantastic and stuff, we probably would have gotten a fourth. And I can, you can only imagine at that point, like, what are you guys going to do with this? You're going to expand yeah. it really far? Maybe... Maybe Venom it got to splinter off into his MCU? own films. Well, that's what I mean. It's like, what if that was would have been the MCU, the beginning? What if fucking Peter, by the time he came like 50, 40, 50 years old, he's uh, he's bringing up a young, well, he's mentoring a younger Tony Stark or some shit like that. Imagine that as a imagine. Yeah, <laughs> be pretty nifty. Just seeing that vision, though, I'm pretty sure it would piss off some people still in some way. Like, Tony shouldn't be mentored by Spider-Man. It's fucking ridiculous. Well, yeah, you'd have people saying it's inaccurate to... The, well, because in the comics, neither of them mentor each other. So, <laughs> either way, it's not going to work. Um, so, yeah, we'll do we'll do an MCU ranking in uh, episode 100. I'll try and make a note of that, actually. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Uh, Jay is being silly on Twitter again. Uh, referring to his tisms from Friday, by the way. Jay is regularly <laughs> silly on Twitter. That's his whole thing. Yeah, he, uh, he'll he'll post self-aware cringe, right? That's, that's you know the deal. It was explained extensively. Um, long man, take a look at Blackfields, a fantasy horror short on GoFundMe being created by Mr. H Reviews. Also, have him on an interview him about the project. I have no idea who that is. Uh. Yeah, Nor do I know, I know what Blackfields is, but I hope it goes well. I guess well. that's the movie, right? That he's crowdfunding. Well, yeah, but I've never... Beyond that stupid chat, I've never heard of it. Right. So these fucking giant balloon animals killing my innocent creatures. I I, I refuse to accept this. Oh, he fell over. Is that's he killing your Pikmin? Yes. And they work. <laughs> they work very hard to not be killed. I've never played Pikmin, um, and I think I would like for them to make a Pikmin four just to make it really easy for me. Well, you mean to, you can just uh, emulate it? Uh, I well, yeah. I mean, that's that's true. So really, well, I've got no excuse to make at all. it easy for you. Don't play SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dude, if you want to go to hell, play Spongebob. <laughs> That's the... Uh, if you want to risk that shit, I don't think so. Bikini bottom. Yeah, and one of the puzzles you have to back up a little bit. You need to... Uh, it's, it's some pretty 40 chess maneuvers going some on. Some people have there. had to go to hospital yeah. as a result of <laughs> dealing with Brain that. hemorrhaging. I have no idea how to solve this this one. I'm getting fucking lost here. It's not good. Uh, rags and Mooper. Which are better, traps or tomboys? Um, how is a tomboy even like? How is this even a contest? Tomboy. Yeah. yeah. I, I well, like... well, a lot. Of, so to be fair, this is only going to be a fair question to someone who's bisexual. If it, it's pretty much a, it, if if you're straight, there is your answer. I mm -hmm. mean, you... yeah. Because part of the whole trap thing is not knowing it's a trap, and if the question involves it's you knowing it's a trap, it's kind of a. a... However, I like both the Vagugu and the Peen Peen, so I'm gonna go with Tomboys. <laughs> I'd go with Tomboy. Well, I mean, I'm straight, so of course I would. <laughs> wow, nerd. You just haven't found the right trap. <laughs> <laughs> There's a trap for everyone. You haven't seen the right boy pussy yet. <laughs> Tomboy, yeah, I think that's an easy one. Mm -hmm. this super chat probably thought they were asking a pretty fundamental question here, and they're like, "Damn it!" What is it? What is the thing? You've got Fimboy Hooters and Tomboy, like what? Tomboy IHOP or something? I don't even know. What it is. Tomboy Waffle. If it, dude, if there was a Tomboy Waffle House, fuck off! I'd be there every day. Jesus we don't Christ, have... can you imagine a Tomboy Waffle House? This is why I'm kind of envious of, like, America, the fact that you have fast food waffles and pancakes. We don't have any of that shit. I don't... Like, I, we... I can't even call Waffle House fast food, because... Oh, well, I, I mean, they... chain stuff, right? Yeah. Like, we don't have chains for these. We, we have McDonald's, KFC, and Hungry Jack's, which is our equivalent of Burger King, and, and not much else beyond that. We don't have Wendy's, we don't have Arby's, we don't have IHOP or Denny's. Wendy's is no, I've heard Wendy's IHOP and Wendy's Denny's Wendy's. is, is, is uh, shit. Or IHOP, I don't know which one. Went to one a of Denny's them is bad. Top hats it was, it was uh, and we, Denny's was we don't have, uh, I mean, I guess this will be for you, John, like Tim Hortons. There's plenty of that yep. shit in Canada, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's actually, Canada it's not a... Yeah. McDonald's John's coffee. John's up in North East Dakota. It's, it's not a Canadian-owned business, though. A lot of people think it is. Oh, but, uh, no, okay. the Umbrella Company is in the States. Oh, my ah. God, Umbrella. Zombies. Umbrella, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We gotta watch the, the, the Resident Evil movies for EFAP movies. Oh, Have God, that could be, yeah, all of them. I feel like EFAP, oh, yeah. like Red EFAP audience would want that. They just watched all of them. Yeah, but with us, <laughs> they'll see us go through actually all of the scenes. And like... Oh, my God, I can't imagine. Then we could wrap it up with Doom Annihilation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It'll be about time. Ugh. Cool. Remember the Resident Evil 5? It's fun, but it's not scary. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the meme. <laughs> yeah. That is the I'm take. I'm surprised that game hasn't been cancelled and pulled off shelves. I mean, that's the thing. It, it almost oh, was yeah. when it came out, so imagine. When it came out, if they did it yeah. now. Even though there's literally... it, Nobody cared when it was Spain. Like, nobody cared. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. So, Fuck the Spanish. Yeah. They deserve it. <laughs> These aren't the minorities you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Even though in Spain, Leon was the minority, so I, yeah, I don't get well, it. It's really weird. Um, and also, remember, Spain is Europe, so they're still the colonial power, so maybe oh, that's why it's right. okay. Yeah. Those yeah. villagers, pieces of shit. I can see <laughs> hatred in their yeah. eyes. Yeah. Uh, oh, hi, Rags. Oh, hi. Anyways, oh, hi. how is your sex it. life? Um, kind of in a weird slump kind of thing now because of the a lot of the corona stuff. Yeah, you can't really go anywhere. A lot of people, anywhere. yeah, a lot of people, it's mostly normal here, but a lot of people just don't want to, you know, go out and about. And there's this weird sort of split up seating at all the bars and restaurants and places. And I don't even, I don't even know what the fuck the zoos do. And that's kind of my place to take people. Take be just fucking telling everyone. Take people to the zoo. You find a bitch, you take that bitch to the zoo. Because <laughs> you want her to know that you like you nature, like animals. you're okay yeah. with animals, and it gives you a lot of time to spend with her and talk, 
and stuff to comment on. You can eat while you're there. All sorts of things to see. It's not over really quickly. You're there for a while. Take that bitch to the zoo. <laughs> I never even thought of that. That's a yeah. That's a... How are you? Rags has mentioned this several times. It's like he doesn't even watch EFAPs. Fucked up, dude. Uh, oh, all well, right. It's been a long time since <laughs> I thought uh, since I discussed taking bitches to the zoo. Yeah. So for which like ten years. For, which is not a euphemism for fucking me, by the way. Just so we're clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like get it, like transport her to a zoo and look at all the animals. <laughs> transport it. <laughs> Transport her. With he's some he's getting sort of with his official language vehicle. now because he knows that this will be clipped and used against yeah. him one day. Oh yeah, tip number two: be able to transport someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a creepy way, god damn it! If you if you offer to take her to the zoo and then have to follow that up with, "Hey, uh, could you take me to the zoo?" <laughs> Doesn't really. Uh, not great. Not a great hey, but, impression. You know, if if you are if you live in like uh, the Netherlands, then you can always offer bike ride, right? Bike ride to the zoo. They like their bikes in uh, Holland. Yeah, the, bikes they're, and they're hikes a bike are great. people. Bikes and hikes are great. You want to see her all sweaty? <laughs> there you go. Life advice. Fuck her in the woods. <laughs> uh. End the stream, ER released a video. Well, I know what I'm watching at the end of this stream. <gasps> I'm watching the back of my eyelids. Because I'm fucking tired. Oh. <laughs> um, ich lieb Kapitalismus. Sieg! Uh, what is your favorite Rennie Harlan movie? Uh, I don't know who that is. Rennie Me neither. Harlan. Let's see, do I recognize this face? Hmm. I think I... Hmm. Well, I will run through some movies that he's been in, and you can tell me if you like them or not. But up, up, ba up, Here, up. Let's I, start can, at wait, the back can I just, and work. I just want to highlight. You get 30 what? days in this game to collect 29 parts of your ship. Holy fuck. And uh, on the sunset of day 30, literally sec 10 seconds before the game is over... I just put in the 29th part, which... Wow, whoa, holy shit. Which means I get to oh, pass, I guess. <laughs> it's just like, thank <laughs> fuck. Yeah, hurry, gather your Pikmin. Oh, are I don't care serious? if some of them are dead. Oh my god. Wow. I don't actually know what happens in this game if you don't get the required parts in time. I don't know if it, like, gives you some kind of, like, okay, but, you know, you did okay. Or <laughs> something like that. Maybe it's a game over? I don't know. I don't think they. I, don't, I feel like they wouldn't do that. I feel like that's too harsh. <laughs> right. You, you spent you spent a month with this character just to watch him choke and die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's. Day when my life. He says uh, the ship doesn't need oh. every lost part in order to fly. For better or worse, I must go. So I guess he's just gonna try it no matter what you have at this point in the game. And I don't know okay. what it means for. Uh... So what if, like, the 30th part that you needed was something kind of inconsequential, like the gas cap or something like that, you know? It's like, oh, I can't leave the planet well, remember, without the gas cap. I picked up a part that said it was like a super laser that destroys things. I'm like, maybe I don't need I that. I can't leave the planet with my air conditioning unit fully. Well, I mean, you probably do need air conditioning in space. It's pretty cold up there. Yeah, you need hot air. That's why you need air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. So... I just ditched the Pikmin. Look say... at them. They're so depressed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like master, Man, that's <laughs> that into that your soul. Up. Like how are what? How are they gonna cope? How are they gonna deal with it? Are they, they just die now. They don't have a master like, to tell they, them who they to kill. Left behind, or are they going to continue to segregate by race? Yes. Following your example, the yes. white man's example, yes. the invader, the, <laughs> the yes. white man's <laughs> example of segregating. Like clearly, this is what we should do. That's... Wait, so were those Pikmin left behind? I the blues uh, well, and the reds fuck I like found purple? them there. Like, I just used oh. them for my benefit and ditched them. Wow. Oh, that's horrendous. Watch it explode because you didn't have all the parts. Well, I'm missing one. It couldn't have been that important, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it's Wouldn't fine. it be funny if it was the most important component of the... I'm going to feel guilty and go back and save them. That's what's going like, to happen. The, what's the 30th part? He's like, oh, spark plugs. You're like, fuck. <laughs> So like, what is the story of Pikmin, by the way? You're you're like a you like uh, crash land on a creepy alien Holomar. planet, and you got to get all the Pikmin right. to basically collect all your ship parts for you. Wow! Oh my god, just, dude! Just enslaving them, dude! Total Pikmin lost one thousand sixty. 
They all, oh, they wow. all died. 337 of them survived. So really, we're talking like Stalingrad casualty right here. Of of the total 1,400 ever sprouted, the vast majority died. <laughs> the vast majority didn't make it. Um, but yeah, I guess I win? I don't know what happens now. I, I don't know if this is game oh, over. Oh, is that the end of the game? I think so. <laughs> I don't know what's happening anymore. It's gonna play its little outro sequence, I guess. Um, bum, bum, bum. Wait, so did we find out what Rennie Holland movies are? Yes, I have a list here, and you we can go, we can start from the oldest, work our way up to Do present it. day. Alright. So, starting in 1986, Born American. In 1987, Prison. And then we have A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Mm. Oh, I never saw that one. I didn't see that All one. Right. Uh, we have The Adventures of Ford Farlane. Fairlane. Ford Fairlane. All right, maybe you've seen this one. Die Hard 2. Oh, no, well, that I was like him. Nobody's seen that. Die uh, Hard 2, Die Harder at the yeah. airport? It's, it's funny, the only thing I really remember about Die Hard 2 is it ends with them fighting on an airplane. Also, Robert Patrick is a bad guy in it who gets killed randomly. Because he's yeah, a he, yeah. he, uh... That's right. It's like, who are you? Uh, what do we look like? A sitting duck. Pew! And then shoot him in the face. And then, uh... Then there was a guy who tried to kill John McClane, but then John McClane turned on the, uh... The, like, ground elevator thing to move a gun towards him so that he could shoot the guy. Yeah. I remember that about it. And they crashed the British plane. That was the big like, oh shit, these guys are serious. Dude, I really like Die Hard too. It's not as good I as like Die, Die Hard, Hard One, too. but it's it's great. Yeah. yeah. Do you uh, like Die Hard? How much do you like Die Hard Three? Out of curiosity. It's got problems, but I really enjoy it. Yeah, I I, uh, I love the dynamic between uh, him and yeah, I love Sam the third Jackson. One. I like yeah. Die Hard 3 a great deal. I, If it were me ranking them, it would be 1, 3, 2, and then a pretty big... I I, I like 4, but, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a really it, fun movie. Mm -hmm, it is. Um, I think it does suffer by the fact that it's PG-13, because John McClane is such a foul-mouthed person. Yeah. That it's, uh, it's almost weird that he's not swearing as much, and it's kind of toned down. But and I still like it a lot. The opening scene, holy shit, you wouldn't get away with that today. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what's interesting about Die Hard 3 is that if you look at the Rotten Tomatoes ratings... Yeah, it's not good. You see. Yeah, it's some bullshit. That movie's great. Yeah. But again, um, it's kind of the problem, like, I, you know, even, even back in the 90s and stuff, critics were often, like, having these weird assessments. I mean, Blade Runner is a good example, isn't it? It's not like Blade uh, Runner got better with time. Like, Blade Runner got mixed reviews when it came out, and it was good then. Right. I'll uh, keep going through the list here. Uh, we've got Rambling Rose, Cliffhanger, Speechless. Uh, oh, I know I Cliffhanger. Know yeah. Cliffhanger's a Stallone uh, one. Right. Uh, yes, I, it is. I like Cliffhanger, yeah. We got Cutthroat Island. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Gina Davis was in that one, I believe. God, I saw that so long ago. Yeah. Um, Mistrial, or Mistrial, who knows? Could be either. Yeah. Uh, the Long Kiss Goodnight, Blast mm. from the Past, had Brendan Fraser in it. Uh, Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> oh, uh, dude, that movie—that's an EFAP movies movie right there. Deep, Deep Blue, Blue Sea. Man. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. the one where Samuel Jackson gets eaten by a he shark? He gets killed by After the shark. After a big speech <laughs> about how they need to work together, it's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've got, next up is uh, Driven. Uh, also, with the, that's uh, it's another Stallone film, I believe. Uh, oh. We got Mind Hunters. Exorcist The Beginning. Is, oh, is that... Uh, Exorcist... Oh. Right. Okay. That's the, mm -hmm. the 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 title. The beginning, I guess. Yeah, that's not the second one though, is it? That's a different. No, one. that would be Exorcist Two. Yeah. The the heretic. That was what that was. <laughs> um. Yeah. Weird one. Uh. Two thousand six. Uh. The Covenant. Uh. 
Then we've got Cleaner. Twelve Rounds. John Cena was in that one. Uh, the Resident. Five uh, Days of War. <laughs> okay. Uh, Devil's Pass. Uh, we're up to 2014 now. The Legend of Hercules. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I've heard of that one. Skip Trace. With uh, Jackie Chan and Johnny Knoxville. Oh. Huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that before. Uh, 2018. Legend of the Ancient Sword. Chinese movie. Ah. Uh, to its shit. Bodies at Rest. Uh, and then in 2020, The Misfits. So. Okay. Mm. So really, I haven't seen many of those films at all. It, he he did a short film in 1994 called The Foot Shooting Party. So, you know. dude, Smash Brothers Melee. Yeah, that Melee. intro is so fucking hot. This dude. game is this game is easily yeah. like in the contenders for best GameCube game of all time. It's so it's so I, uh, fucking good. It's in my top ten. It's definitely my top ten games ever. And uh, Sorry, which which GameCube game was that? Super Melee. Smash Brothers Melee. Uh, it's funny oh, how yeah, it's terrific. Yeah. I just beat. Pikmin, and I just got the Captain Olimar trophy for booting this up. How cool is that? <laughs> that is pretty cool. Oh, uh, dude, I, the fact that I've, like, memorized all the music, you know, the menu music. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> There's so much content in this game. It's fucking there crazy. Is. And it's insane. It was made in, like, two years. They made this in two years. Wow. Um, I'm pretty sure Sakurai, I, from what I understand, he nearly killed himself basically making this game. Yeah. He would sleep under his desk and then go straight back to work. Oh my god. Yeah, oh, alright, talking tough. about dedication. Yeah. Um, I'll never forgive Digital Fear for the ending of Deus Ex Machina. I hope that, and then it's <laughs> all bleeped out, <laughs> dies. Anyway, love you, John. Also to have your defab. What, Thank what, you. What you yeah, that was... I made that a very, very, very long time ago, and I learned a hard lesson from it. I wrote myself <laughs> into a corner. It, that's We talked about that, actually, yeah. about not planning ahead. You write yourself into a corner, mm -hmm. and then everything just falls apart. That's what happened to me with that. And Our, I learned from that, and I didn't... I refrained from doing that again, so... I think, um... Deus Ex Machina, I watched that later. Like, I didn't know what it was for a while, and I'd seen everything else, and then I watched it. And, it's cringe. Um, it, it's very serious. <laughs> it's yeah. what I noticed it's about cringe. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but, you you know. will die from cringe if you watch it. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Like I said, I had no regrets because I learned from it, you know? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I was ripping off a bunch of movies, too. You know, and I think a well, lot of I think that's how we all start. I think everybody Ex like yeah, one exactly. of the comics I made when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> I made, I was like, man, right to the Clank School, I can do that. And so I made a comic <laughs> called Celo and Lobsy, in which that yeah, Celo is a seal and Lobsy is a lobster. What great names! And they just go on these very like adventures that are basically borderline plagiarism. <laughs> but I was like ten years old, so you know. <laughs> Um, yeah. Now that you've announced CeeLo and Love, so people are gonna make artwork for that, probably. Uh, well, please, I mean, I mean the, the great part is because I was shit at drawing, and I'm still even not that great. Lob Lobsy was just an oval with very thin arms and legs, and so whenever I was drawing the comics, I'd draw him the most because it was the easiest to do. That's how lazy I was. I'm like, yeah, the little oval guy, that's easy. And just make it. I like how you announced EFAP artists, so there's probably going to be a shit ton of like art now of this half-baked garbage idea that I oh, came dude. up with when I was like eight I'm, years I'm old happily looking forward to like paint drawings, I don't care. I just want to see this, this <laughs> CeeLo and Lobsy. <laughs> well, I, I remember, uh, god damn, like, there were some stupid comics and all it ever was was, oh, I saw something really cool, I can make that, and th then I made it. And because I had no self-awareness, I was really proud of that stuff. Um, no, he has now to destroy the, the, the bling in Mount Shroom. <clears throat> well, <laughs> I mean, there was probably, like, I, I remember, oh, there was something I made, it was, it was like, gangsters, and it was just basically, there was a guy called, uh, Alan, I think, or was it Al? Yeah, and his, his shtick was, um, because I was so stupid, 
he was a Hindu, so when he died, he would come back to life because I wanted him to be like Kenny from South Park, <laughs> not understanding that Hinduism has nothing to do with dying and coming back to life as the same person that you were. It's so stupid. No, you could. It just you have astoundingly good luck. Yeah. Or bad luck, I guess, in his case. I think Fringy just wanted to kill a brown person over yeah. and over again. Kind of fucked up, I dude. assume that it, I, I assume that a Hindu is brown. By the way, it's just well. Why would you assume that? It's a religion. That, yeah, you huh, racialist. See, I turned it around on you, Brad. Well, I just, I just, just, I, just I just recognized my my horrible. I I know I'm betting I'm gambling odds here, you know, but. Mm -hmm. So anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. What's the next chat? Yeah, will. Boston. Will the Fringoid be brought to pay for the deaths of so many Pikmin? Dude, uh, what? I didn't do it! I don't it's know, man. Fault. Kinda does seem like you were the one who did it. There are no green Pikmin, I wonder why that is. Wouldn't that... Okay. <laughs> You're like, trying to figure out how that means it's your fault. <laughs> like, wait. Uh, Pikmin are like plant creatures and they're not green? Yeah. Well, they have green leaves on their little heads. It's, it's totally oh, adorable, okay? okay? Yeah. Kind of like a black that was uh, Miyamoto, really wasn't it? He came up with uh, Pikmin. Like, that was his little project, wasn't it? Maybe. I don't His personal friend. His gay lover? I, I was just, I didn't know if you knew I wasn't his personal friend, that's all. Okay. Can Permission. you have a friend who's not personal? I thought, like, being someone's friend sort of entailed the concept. That yeah, you're, you're, you're a non personal friend of mine. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people friend. use friend very liberally, so I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, uh, I mean, what's, uh, what was, I feel like The Sims had it right, you know, there's acquaintances and then your friend and then your good friend and then, what was it, romantic interest or something? And then, and then girlfriend and then all that shit. The Sims 3 was pretty good game, I think. Nice little tangent there. This <laughs> is like, yeah, Sims. When are they gonna make a new one of that, hmm? Well, they made Sims 4, and I remember when that was coming out, I was so disappointed with what they were doing. I think um, the main thing was uh, Sims 3 introduced the whole uh, open world element, and then they took it out because... I don't know why they took it out, but they did. A lot less features, a lot less content, and I never bought it, and I don't think I... Well, no, I think I got it for free, actually. Um, and I wasn't having that much fun, so... Yeah, it's kind of a shame. I played the DS one with the aliens. I played no, uh, Sims two, I think. I played Sims on PlayStation Two, I think. I and, did too. Uh, yeah. Ran out of money. Had to send the kids off to military for some <laughs> revenue. And then the, couldn't pay the maid anymore, so she stole the lamp and a bunch of other shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck this game!" Oh, yeah, like, <laughs> this game is too would... real. <laughs> I would take these lamps. This come. game is too real for me. <laughs> Fucking Jigglypuff is gonna cost me the whole game, by the way. Why? Isn't kill me. Jigglypuff the most annoying Pokemon? Uh, is it just me? Or Do you remember the never... in Melee? She has that move where if she falls asleep inside your face, she'll fucking blow you out of the map. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And it was really, it was a really good way to beat um, uh, Giga Bowser in in one of the challenges because he's got a really big face, so it's really easy to get inside it and use that move. Wasn't uh isn't one of like the top, you know, competitive strategies to use Jigglypuff while somebody's in midair to make them go to sleep and fall off the level before they can wake <laughs> up. I, th I think that was something. In the same way you have um Kirby can almost kamikaze you someone. Up and then just yeah, yeah, and then uh spit you out and jump ahead just to beat you just in time. These, who, these who's are, your these main character players. on on Melee by the way? Who'd you mean? Roy. Roy was mine. Roy Gay. was my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Roy was uh Roy was pretty good. I think I uh I mained Samus, maybe? I yeah, think. Samus is my main. Who is that? I'm Wait, rags. I'm you disappointed really you didn't play, play as a woman. It's fucked up. Roy can be whoever I want Roy to identify as. I as the player, that, uh, I have the ability to make the character identify as a woman. One of the interesting so, things I remember in Melee is that all the Fire Emblem characters spoke in Japanese regardless of whether you were playing the Japanese version. And I yeah. always found that confusing. Like, what are they speaking in? I didn't, like, understand what, what, it, what it was when I first well, played it. 
At least it's more understandable than fucking Falcon Falco, sorry. Misyan Kaput. Or is that was that fucking yeah. Fox? Both of them? They both speak in weird oh, like oh, Fox says Mission complete! Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <that's> how he... <laughs> Because uh, I didn't play, like, I didn't play Star Fox. So it's like, who's this weird guy saying mi "missing kaput" or something? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck's happening? And I happening? think, um, I think it's the same for Falco. He's like, but he's way more Japanese. He's like, "Mission complete." Yeah. <laughs> like, <that's just laughs> you don't sound like... like what I think a bird would sound. Well, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, and what what was uh? Because I'm pretty sure Star Fox had some. You know, I, I I feel like the fact that I literally know the way that he enunciates his grunts. <laughs> told me I played that game too much. Hiya! Like that's exactly what it's. <laughs> yep, that's like. it. Well, Falco was my second. That's uh, who I played as. Yeah. Whatever I was allowed to play as Sabbath, with whatever rules yeah. friends come up with. Falco was a uh, Falco was a good one. Yeah, I like Falco. Yeah. But after I, I played a lot of uh, played a lot of Roy, and then when the next game came out, Ike was my boy. I didn't like well, Roy uh... anywhere near as much as I liked uh, Melee. I don't know. Uh, I liked Brawl a lot. I think I was really hyped for it because I played Melee, so I was so keen to play That was Brawl, cool. I think, I don't know, Melee's fucking next next level, man. I don't know. <laughs> Melee, yeah, in, in retrospect, I can uh, definitely see that it's um, the better game. Um, I said uh, that I had liked Brawl to a friend. He called me a fag. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> And I think his reasoning was like, how could you possibly like a game that has something like tripping in it? Which uh, I agree that tripping thing. Yeah, oh, is so I remember stupid. tripping fucking annoyed the shit out of me. Yeah. That was a really weird one. Why would no you want to put thinking. that in the game? <laughs> why would why yeah. would you make it purposely harder to uh, do normal things? Yeah. So I I, I never just randomly trip. <laughs> it fucking yeah, killed I me. Mean, okay. The tripping alone makes it, like, not nearly as good as Melee, I think, gameplay-wise. But, uh, what I really- what's really stood out to me was the music. Like, the, yeah, they had, uh, music is incredible. They had oh, Nobuo yeah, they had Uematsu, the yeah. Final Fantasy guy, did the main theme. I thought the main theme for Brawl is fucking amazing. The, it's, uh, it's pretty yeah. incredible. Um, like, and, and all the remixes as well, like, the boss music that they had as the remix, Final Destination. Um... Like, I'm not sure- it's interesting, all of the games have really good things, and I'm- I'm not sure if, uh... I'm not sure if I could pick which one is my favorite. Mm -hmm. Um... Melee's is really good, Brawls is awesome. I really like 4's, and I seem to be in the controversial camp there. I think 4 has an awesome, uh, theme song. Right. And, it just um, came yeah. out? No, uh, Ultimate has its own one, and it's, um... And Ultimate's is kind of incredible as well. Yeah, I've, like, I've uh, heard it. it's really, really good. It's, um, it's really... I think when it first got announced, I wasn't that impressed, but the actual, like, music in the game is way more dynamic than, uh, in that trailer. It's... The, Nintendo, they just got their tunes, you know? Very yeah. true. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm gonna be beaten up by a girl in front of the internet. <laughs> no. <laughs> but wait, I am a girl. Oh, a big girl, so too. Fucking giant ass mushroom, come here. Well, Samus is uh, six foot two, I think. So. Uh, I'm a lot bigger than that right now. <laughs> Samus is a tomboy. And but Peach is a trap. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, I guess that the opposite of what a normal trap is the opposite. <laughs> um, possum reviews on EFAP when? I don't. Oh, I don't know what that's um, to. I think I've seen possum reviews on Twitter. I don't know if I've ever seen any of the the videos. Assuming they have, I'm assuming they review I don't think stuff. I have. I see, yeah, the name. You know. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Also, they need to be a possum. Uh, loved your work, John. All the machinimas were great. Hey, how about that? Oh, is talking to me there? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the other John. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, man. That's. Uh... I'm always watching out for the guests here. I just want to keep a smooth show. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah, that's raggled. Gotta keep everybody on track. I don't want any yeah. long tangents Dude. about marsupials. You know the screw attack ball, Fringy? I find mm -hmm. throwing that as Samus at someone to force them to throw it is like BM for Samus. Like, yeah, enjoy <laughs> my move for a second against your will. <laughs> it's like... Yeah. <laughs> you just Watch give them a little, little taste of it? Wow, that's... But you Good job, taste of it. I saw that. Yeah, that was interesting. I was knocked into it. What do you want me to do? 
you specifically <laughs> homed in for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like you in on it. That's yeah. just a racist like thing to say, just because I'm a woman. Now that you, now that Samus knew that somebody else could do what she did, albeit temporarily, she just wanted to end it. <laughs> it's like, no, I can't have this. <laughs> fucking uh, Yoshi's insane on this in this fucking map because he like the the AI struggles. It like wants to run around really fast, but also not fall off the whole fucking thing, and then use its jump yeah. thing, which sends Yoshi. it above the screen. Poor Yoshi. Melee is an, an, an almost impressively graphically detailed game considering it's from 2001. Dude, I remember like, unlocking I all of the maps and just being continuously surprised. I was just like, this is in the game now too? Yeah. Mm. Huge step up. It was just, what a, what oh, a from the first symbol. game. Staggering. Well, the first one was really an experiment and then it was like, oh, wow, this is a really good idea. And then they just ended up making like the greatest game on GameCube probably, yeah, I think I'd be in that camp. Yeah, I, I think it's easy a contender. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I recently discovered EFAP, now on episode 12. There's a long but interesting journey ahead. And now I'm curious, did any of you saw H Bomber Guy's videos about Sherlock or Pathologic? Yes. I haven't. No. Both, I'd recommend. His Pathologic one is really interesting for a game that you're not going to play. Nobody even says in his video you shouldn't really play it. <laughs> it's a game with like okay. really awesome and interesting ideas, but it's just so fucking clunky and harsh. Like to complete it, you have to know stuff that's really fucking ridiculous. Uh, but he does the little guide for you and tells you about all the stuff in the game, and then he says, "Go play the sequel. That's actually playable." And the Sherlock one is really good at explaining exactly what is wrong with BBC's Sherlock. So check it mm -hmm. out. Um, anyway guys, wish you good stream. Also, hi Mola, Rags, Fringy, and John CJG. Hello. 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 No hello from Fringy. I said hi. You nope. just didn't hear me, obviously. <laughs> didn't hear you? How could I hear nothing? Well, I don't know what to tell you. You need to get your ears checked. You need to get a I better like how microphone. I like what Hey, dude, my microphone is like actually good. I don't know why there's ever any problems with it. I spent good money on this. <laughs> Seems like an interesting statement. It's actually good. Why are there problems? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, is people it a like get USB a of... or XLR. No, it is uh, actually XLR. Yeah, I I'm just not in a good recording environment. I'm pretty sure. It's right. well, Australia, in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Hey, same well, way. Yeah, I mean that might be it too. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned it the other day. Emus tend to sabotage my internet connection. So mm -hmm. you're joking, yeah, right? I just want to make sure because it's Australia. Yeah. <laughs> what? There's actually emu just digging into the ground, messing with cables. Hey, look, I'm yeah. against that weird AI in this game because they seem to randomize it where they're just extremely passive. Right. Oh, yeah. Pikachu's just doing nothing now. Look at him standing there with a smug little oh, shit. Oh, get cage. fucked. Baited with a Pokeball. Fuck you. Um. New ANC since uh, someone at my first game dev job showed it to me 11 years ago. Glad to see you're a really nice person. <laughs> Glad to see you're a really nice person and thanks for the loss. <laughs> How could somebody who makes Arby and the Chief possibly be a nice person? It's true. It's it's so Clearly crude. Clearly this was made by some missing. Yeah. Absolute filth. Um... Only in a more realistic online games, X Squad, Hold Fast, Armor, Hell Let Loose, do people coordinate on that level? Like I said, I think there's coordination oh, yeah. in almost all games, but only at particular, like, tiers of play. It's pretty unlikely for most games. But, like, even when we would, like, me and my friends were trying to get really good in Gears of War 2, even, like, we would coordinate quite a bit. But uh, there'd still be loads of trash talk. <laughs> but you're not going, oh shit, Havoc, oh no! No, well this is the thing. <laughs> it's not just that there's coordination, it's the way that they're coordinating. Like, Yeah, they're coordinating like they're real For people, example, they're all friendly to each other. It's, I like how they're like, oh sorry, my bad. Nobody ever does that. Like, yeah. If somebody says my bad, they're like, yeah, yeah it is your bad, you fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah, like, what the fuck are you doing over there? Or, there's a guy right there, fuck you, there's a guy, fucking wake up, there's a guy, you know, not I mean, like, there is a tango. It, yeah. It's like, they should have had it like Wiggins of Redemption playing Rainbow Six Siege. <laughs> God, I'm like doing everything. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> that would have been awesome. That scene where he gets, he gets killed by Havoc, he's like, Man, I can't take this shit no more, man. <laughs> I need that in the trailer for Division 2. 
<laughs> I can't take the shit out of my life! <laughs> These creatures are culturally appropriating my gun. They eat me and spit out and yeah. then they have it. That's ridiculous. Also, I fucking hell, I'm gonna not be able to pass this. <laughs> Thank you for the Goldeen game. That's just what I needed. Stupid Could you imagine fish. if it was in Rainbow Six Siege? Havoc, look here! Look, listen! <laughs> <laughs> Havoc, you fucking dirty son of a bitch. Yeah. Oof, that was satisfying. Okay. <laughs> uh, this just says, hi, I'm a guy. Hello. Oh, and hey. congratulations. <laughs> Excellent news. Congratulations on attaining well all that privilege. Yeah. <laughs> It'll serve you well. Uh, White Light's reviews are too short, IMO. Yeah, seven hours, uh, like, he, come on. Didn't he make, yeah, he made like a seven hour Death Stranding review. Yeah, um, that's shit, come on. Like, 15 I hours also, or uh, bust, I'd say. I really liked his Watch Dogs review. I was really impressed by that one. Um, god damn, like, there was so much about Watch Dogs I didn't know, and I played that game way longer than most other people did. Well, wow, Man, go. watching you play this game is such insane nostalgia for these maps and this I know, and this so good. Fighting all the, the mini Kirby's and mm. going through all the little... Man, wow. I remember, I was really hyped for Subspace Emissary, but I remember a lot more about, uh classic adventure mode and stuff. Oh, and, um, this, this game was formative years like crazy. I played so yeah. much of this fucking game. I, um, it was, it was kind of weird as well because I remember like everybody had a PS2, but not everybody had a GameCube or an Xbox. Uh, I didn't have an Xbox, but I had a GameCube and, um, oh, I don't think Xbox. I know many people who also had a GameCube. I'm pretty sure I was one of the only people. Um, and man, did you miss out if you didn't have a GameCube? You missed out on so Dude, much. yeah, it's such a good fucking console. It yeah. is a great console, yeah. That was the first console I had out of that generation for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really enjoyed it, yeah. I, I got Luigi's Mansion on launch, and I, I, I still fucking love that game. Yeah, that was excellent. Yeah. Fuck you, Ness. His jump ability is garbage. When are they ever gonna make a new- I feel like Nintendo was in a really good position to make, like, a new Earthbound. It feels mm -hmm. like they should. Well, they haven't made, like, there's not a Pokemon Snap 2. Mm-hmm. Dude, well, I guess just it's announced just, Dude, look at the way one. I beat him, what the fuck? They did? Yeah, for Nintendo Switch, it's called New oh. Pokemon Snap. They just had oh, a- wow. They had a reveal <laughs> for it. He just took right. it. Took it like a oh, man. Oh, well, well. Like go. a N Nintendo I, uh, Direct, I guess that's what they're called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. I guess um the funny thing, and I didn't know this, apparently South Park was inspired by Earthbound. Trey Parker and Matt Stone mm. like played that game and were like, oh, I like the idea of having kids go on adventures, basically, and that's like what how South Park kind of came to be. Their adventures are a little so, more controversial, I guess you'd say. Well, I guess it's just interesting that this long-lost game that didn't sell that well when it came out and hasn't had a new game in like 25 years was uh, hugely inspirational to like one of the longest running uh, TV shows like currently on air. Yeah, I listen to a lot of interviews with those guys and they're big gamers, both of them. I think uh, yeah, Matt yeah. Stone is more of like a shooter kind of guy. Right. And he just wants to kill everything on the screen. But <laughs> uh, um, Trey Parker comes from like playing Ultima and D&D &D and stuff. RPGs, and yeah. RPGs on like 16-bit. Consoles Which uh, makes there. sense because he was all, he's he's written I think the vast majority of South Park episodes. Um, what you saying? People who like shooters are stupid? Oh yes. no no no! It's uh it's the whole idea that like from what I understand, the dynamic is I mean both of them are hugely important to the creative process. But from what I gather, the process is tr like uh, Trey is the big ideas guy. He's the story guy. And Matt's like the grounded guy who sort of keeps everything on and kind of like helps the pair of them navigate the environment that they're in and like making a TV show and stuff like that. That's what I understand about their dynamic. Yeah, I think uh, he's a math major, uh, Matt Stone. And uh, I didn't know that. Huh. He, yeah, or if he doesn't major, he's certainly he studied math in school and he's good mm -hmm. at it. But uh, he uh, I think he really he's good at the satire angle. Right. Know? 
of like coming up like he'll pitch an idea that's in the news or something and he'll come up with a funny a sharp mm -hmm. satirical angle on it and then trey will take that and sort we'll of develop meld it into, it into a story. story yeah yeah it's uh it's interesting to like read or f find out about the method of like duos writing duos i've always been kind of envious of them i feel like i'm like the tray and i need like a mat to, yeah, to like yeah. keep me Same from here, going man. out of control for sure yeah there's definitely a benefit to writing in in pairs you can bounce ideas so. off of people yeah yeah and especially if you like got a really uh, there's a youtube channel flash skits and they're kind of like a writing duo as well and i think they work pretty well evidently they work well together because i like their stuff so you see a lot right. of those duos and, and i mean uh there was like laurie and fry or was it the other way around you know hugh laurie stephen fry mm -hmm. no i'm not sure like a bit of fry and laurie a bit of fry and laurie yeah. that's right that's yeah. right a bit of fly, yeah. fry and laurie yes um it's another that... commie duo i grew up watching yeah i just i like <laughs> in black black out it goes forth there's just so many great lines from him like <laughs> um oh you know, uh, something like along the lines of the, what the fact that when we go over the trench, we all die in like the first ten seconds. It's like, yeah, well, General Hank thinks this might be depressing. The Manitan. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, we're talking about first-person shooters. Neat stuff like this reminds me of a movie called Hardcore Henry. You guys should check it out, Dumbos. I have seen Hardcore Henry. I it's saw really that. fun. There yeah. you go. It's Rags fun. and it I though, fun. nope, still haven't. What does that say about us and, I, uh, and society I remember, at large? I think I saw a review. It was from like TYT's film like section or whatever. Oh boy! And they they were they were talking about because it's basically like a video game but a movie, and not like a video game movie but a, a film which is like emulating what video games provide. And they were like, "Oh, it's too fast. You know, it's hard for me to pay attention." It's like you guys just go play more video games because I was I was enjoying it plenty. I just had like the most mm -hmm. embarrassing killing of myself ever. Luckily, nobody saw it. I'm about to see it. Yeah, that was pathetic, Mola. Yeah, that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Jesus Christ. laughs> the way I just I mean, slip like, into the bad. water, like, well, time to yeah. accept my death. <laughs> Whoa! <Well, yeah, laughs> like, you can't jump again. It's just over for you. Why the fuck didn't I get the mushroom, huh? I'm player one. I deserve all the cool shit. Oh god, I died again. What, okay. <laughs> what are you? Oh, wow. What are you playing, Mahler? Uh, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate on the GameCube. Uh, no, not Ultimate. That's... Oh, okay. Why, Calm why down, Fringy. It's okay. I was making a meme. You meant is because because it's like the Ultimate Smash Bros. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I'm I sorry, I upset that's you. That's that's <laughs> definitely what he meant when he said those <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I heard uh, Melee has this new netcode that people are talking about. And uh, the the community for that game is more, is very large and active. Oh, and people are still to this fucking day passionate as hell about this game. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's understandable. Yeah. It's it's such a sharp game. Well, from what I understand, it's kind of like the new ones come out, but Melee is the one that ultimately continues to retain a community. There isn't like a brawl community as much or a Smash Four community, but Melee, yeah. I think, uh, no, they're Project not as refined M? and precise as Melee is. No. Yeah, isn't that Melee's it Melee's just fucked, like... yeah. Yeah, I, I... I... It's got... It's so solid mechanically, mm -hmm. you know? They did a good job. <laughs> so... Uh, money for the epic Batwoman crossover event of the year on Heal vs. Babyface channel. Uh, yeah, that was good shit. Glad you uh, have fun with it. Hi, raw ra rogs. Hi, rags. You good doggo? Hello. <laughs> uh, I'll be in the chief was the best thing Machinima had going. Glad to see John is now doing his own thing on YouTube. Yee. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. I have a. Uh, I don't have the numbers I used to, but you know what? I'm quite happy with that, and uh, I'm very lucky to have the audience that I do. I have a very dedicated. Yeah, I'd have um, to imagine they're pretty passionate, passionate audience. Yeah. Yeah. They dig my shit, and you know, as long as I I do right by them, I entertain them. I'm I'm quite happy. I don't need I don't need millions of views. <laughs> mm -hmm. Frankly, I think I'd be on if I if I did have that much more popularity. Like I don't know, it's just, like having that many more eyeballs on me might change the writing. I don't know. Like affect uh, you? No, I would still do 
what I whatever I want to do. Like I, I wouldn't sacrifice any creative control or anything, but it's just uh, I feel like I'd be under far more scrutiny. Like in this right. polit this cli this climate we're in right now, it's just like <laughs> yeah. you know certain jokes where it's just like. I feel like I'd be getting a lot of hate mail and complaints and stuff, and I'm really sensitive to all that stuff. Like, one bad comment on YouTube and Twitter, that can ruin my whole fucking day, and I, I wish I wasn't that sensitive, And but I'm kind of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, the, the right thing said by the right person at the right time can piss off anybody. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but no, I have, I have a great audience. I'm very lucky. Oh, by the way, when's our, when's our episode 15 coming out? Out of curiosity. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to get it done by the end of this month. Yeah, oh, it's, it's really oh, close. Oh, wow, so it's really, really close. close, yeah. Yeah. Almost And done. actually, I don't think I asked this yet. How many episodes, because I remember, like, initially, there was meant to be, like, 30-something episodes this season, but has that changed, or, uh... Yes, it was supposed to be 33. Now it's going to be 17. But like, oh, wow. Yeah, okay. but that's that's not because I'm chopping out any of the story. No, it's, it's just because really the episodes, long episodes are longer. Episodes, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, the episodes were supposed to be way shorter, but then I decided, you know what, I don't want to tell the story like this. This is too fragmented. Like, I want to tell big... Like, mm -hmm. I I just... I, I feel like it's... It becomes a stronger piece of work to have a certain set of sequences in one video rather than break it up. I'm you inclined know. to agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that means it's really near near the end then, almost. Yep. You only got three more episodes to go. Wow. Yeah, and they're all outlined. Season 16, the script for it is almost done. And season, yeah. uh, episode 17, uh, a bunch of scenes are fleshed out. Dialogue is written. But the whole thing from start to finish is already outlined. I know, what's, right. I know what the end is. And it's just it's just getting there and, you know, getting all the specifics down on paper and all the dialogue finalized so but yeah it's been a long 50, journey hasn't it <laughs> yes it has it's been it's taken me an Four embarrassingly long, long time yeah. frankly yeah but uh, it's it's something i'm i feel really strongly about and once it's mm -hmm. done i think people will be really happy with it yeah well and, i mean uh, it's a lot of content i think it's worthwhile to remember i mean doing like a feature length film in six months that's yeah. is pretty pretty impressive it's yeah, it's it's a lot I'm, I'm quite happy doing it though uh, it's a story mm -hmm. i feel really strongly about so hopefully yeah. people will see what what i was trying to do <clears throat> yeah. and the the bites i think tied people over you know because that's just classic rb and the chief to them i think you mm -hmm. know? yeah and th those are pretty long too the, the last one i did was like 20 minutes um and... that last episode though episode 14 that was quite a cliffhanger <laughs> that one oh uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah. Hey, that was a movie that starred Stallone. Ronald Bimstone, whoever it was that we were looking at. That wasn't at. starring, yeah, that was the, we... the director, wasn't it? Directed by Ronald Bong Bimstone, Dinkle. yeah. Ron Bimstone, Ronald Bimstone. You sound tired, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. Yes. I'm great, all's well. I haven't been drinking. <laughs> Why would I even bring that up? It's so silly of me <laughs> to do that. <laughs> For no reason. Uh, John, please scream like your dad is angrily turning off the Nintendo because he's an a-hole. Do it for smoke. Oh, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, Dude, I remember that. <laughs> I fucking, I shrieked at the top of my lungs for that one. And no, I'm not going to do that here. That's too, <laughs> that's that too hard like, on my throat. Oh, I and remember that. That was... <laughs> I can't even. It wouldn't do it justice. I'm no. Oh, dude, no. that was um, that was the Grand Theft Auto Four, right? Like I'm playing yeah. Grand Theft Auto Four online, and then uh, because what made oh. yes, that's exactly yeah, that's right. Yeah. And what what made that scream is because it get becomes so shrill, it's almost <laughs> like a little girl's scream. <laughs> you know, what was and, his name? Uh, smoke. What what was his uh smoke smoke weed, weed for was... life for twenty four right. twenty. Yeah. <laughs> It's a very pretty standard <laughs> video game no. alias. Well, back then, yeah, like 2008, 2009, yeah. Yeah. Um, thoughts on The Last Jet? I mean, The Last of Us 2? Well, we yeah, we kind of managed to cover that in the vaguest possible way we can right now, but... Yeah. yeah. The Last of Us 2 will be coming to an EFAP near you at some point. The Last of Us Thrones 2, Season 8. I already revealed myself as a retard for saying I'm, like <laughs> I'm sure they forgot. I've, I've, in the interest of not embarrassing myself any further and 
holding on to what integrity I have left. Maybe we won't get into that. <laughs> uh, EL just put out a new video and EFAP is live. It's a good weekend. If EFAP ever gets censored by YouTube, would you guys continue the show elsewhere? Depends on the censorship. We the... Yeah, we'd go to the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, if, if... I don't know. Let's just get weird hypotheticals going. We're not allowed to swear anymore. I'd be like, jeez. Well, darn. Mm. Good well, lord. Well, gosh darn, golly gee. Good golly gee whiz willikers. Yeah, Holy I don't know. If they just started, like, removing random older episodes, I don't I don't know what it would exactly take for us to want to move the show to a different place. Like, you know, fuck Twitch. I guess it would have to be DLive? Is that, Born like... Pornhub. Pornhub streams, that's the one. Um, not sure what it would take, but yes, we would probably... We would move the show before killing it, I think it was the point of that. Is there any platform that does live streaming like YouTube does? Yeah, loads well, of you do. got Twitch, but um, like not. I don't mean Twitch, but something oh. like because I'm thinking of like BitChute and Library or whatever these alternative kind of video platforms that. that people are moving to. But D I don't know if they have funny. live stream functions, do they? Yeah, I think DLive is currently the backup if you can't get onto YouTube and Twitch. Okay, that's where all of the rejects go now. Well, that it's oh, like yeah. the gab of uh of of live streaming. It seems to be what it is basically. Like if you got banned off of Twitch for its type and takes, then uh <laughs> that's where you go. Um, the Swedish the Swedish chef offends me, so I guess the Muppets a toast. Oh, definitely, yeah. Only yeah. matter of time. Everything that was ever offensive, it's gonna have to go. Yeah. Oh no. God oh, forbid somebody's offended. I was gonna say, it sucks, man. Oh, not Venusaur. You know what, that makes me think of better times. Fucking Igoraptor's animations about Pokemon. Oh, uh, <laughs> Venusaur! Bang! Uh, Ow! God, my fucking knee! Because <laughs> he came out recently apologizing for all of his naughty jokes. Yeah, uh, that was uh, a little <laughs> bit lame. <laughs> yep. I'm sorry, I upset people. It was a different time. It's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> You're offending me now. now. <laughs> yeah, now that I'm famous, now that everyone knows me, now that I got a following and I'm set for life, nobody else can do what I did to get here. <laughs> it's absolutely rude. Okay, Rax, accept it, you rude man. I just got lucky that I could do it, but you can't do it. You're not allowed to do it. Only I was allowed to do it. It, it feels like I want to go to the alternate universe where he never pursued the shit out of Game Grumps and instead made more sequelitis videos and animations. I just want to I don't see what happened to that one. Sequelitis was great. Yeah, I loved that. It was just cool. The the nobody else really was doing like a I'm gonna do an in-depth game breakdown also with fun animations. It's just like that's uh, yeah, I like it. Mm hmm Rip. <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> Rip in peace. Um, Wilford status check. Also, hi, Rex. Hello. Alive, I believe. Alive. As is Mr. Brimley. Uh, most disturbing film you've seen? Mine is Threads. I've not seen that. Um, I have. S I either saw all of, or enough of, um, a Serbian film. Nobody should see that film ever. A Serbian film? Mm -hmm. I saw that, yeah. It's disturbing. Oh, it's, it's it's very it's a very very gnarly movie. And it's 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 gnarly because it's about specifically about pushing the limitations of art. Yeah. And it, it kinda poses an interesting question. But it's so it's it's, just, it's not for everybody. It's a pretty fucking bleak watch. By the end, you'll just be looking through your fingers going, holy shit, are they really doing that? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Being beaten up by tiny monkeys. It's horrifying. Uh, if they want to stick to their principles, why stop at the voice actors? White writers shouldn't be allowed to create non-white characters at all. Well, that's interesting. I've heard where, people where, where you draw that, that line. Argument. I don't see. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you'd figure that's where the, the extension of the isms, right? That's where it would take them. Mm -hmm. But then, what does that mean? That means that people have been doing it right, not writing stories about 
people who aren't white, right? Oh, yeah, all well, you have to do yeah, is no, cite, no. cite like a beloved story about uh, any minority or whatever, and then if it's written by a white person, it's like, wait, what happens now? Do we now hate this story? Mm -hmm. You get a, lot, get a lot of weird retroactive activity with all this stuff. Right. Um, but they won't, because that means less representation. The cognitive dissonance is strong with the people who act like they're progressive. Fucking, it's hard to just keep track of the rules, that's what I've always said. I just don't understand what's happening next. Feels like they change every other day. Mm -hmm. And I killed them both. Uh, what's up, Machungus? Uh, just having a, having a podcast, as you do. Having a bit of a stream of diesel. Mm. What's up, Magobos? Look at that. Two two friendly greetings in a row through Super Chats. What a wonderful, kind audience. Goblins, someone get the Slayer. Also, hi, Rags. Hello. Um, I'm a Jew and I identify as a loot goblin. Huh. A loot goblin? You don't you don't know what a loot goblin is? I should I? Wait. Um, well, a loot goblin's the name. Of a player who just gets and gets all the loot <laughs> please, in a game. Please, put all this. Look at, all. look at the stream. Just look at look at the stream. Look at what just happened. <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> the AI couldn't quite. Handle it. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, man, that, that saves a bit of a struggle. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, thank you. Good old DK. Also, do you guys remember like the almost cheat for the Zelda one, which is you peer into the uh, the rooms, and if you don't spot the Triforce, it's just like, well, moving on to the next one. I don't remember that. <laughs> well, I I never figured out how it worked. Like this whole level, it confused me. It's just you just got to find the Triforce. So the other ones are just gonna have uh, links and. Oh fire. yeah, no, I I know that now, but uh, when I was a kid, I didn't know what I should be doing. Are you talking about the NES one where you go into a room, the camera? shifts over to the new room and you just kind of go in and out oh well this is in, in the it, melee or? in the melee uh level in adventure mode yeah like oh you, go in the room and you can check to see if the triforce is there because if it is then that's you know that's the level the room you need to lock yourself <laughs> to get it. see if i had to fight three oh, links to get right. there i would have lost right mm -hmm. i cheated <laughs> um i'm off Arthur and the internet is the old west. I felt that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> uh, more and more civilization. Nintendo Capri Sun fringy and tonal for episode 100. Nintendo Capri Sun? Uh, sirs, I've seen someone called that in chat a couple of times, I think. I'm not sure who it is exactly. Um... Have you heard about D&D getting rid of races, race buffs, because they think black people are orcs? No joke. Wait, oh what? God. <laughs> well, what? If, when I start DMing games of Pathfinder, second edition, mm. um, yeah, there's definitely going to be racial bonuses. Because, wow. Uh, there's, listen, there's no way that a, a, a little halfling is going to have the same bonus as a big old orc. There's, I guess it's uh, an interesting one, right? Because Fucking... race is almost not... She it's just killed like, himself. Oh. Uh, it's uh race is almost not like accurate in fantasy because they're it's it's more like different species really, right? Like well, yeah, it is. and a human are not the same species. I heard of a similar thing happening with Magic the Gathering. Because you yeah. have uh, you have like white and black cards, right? And black <laughs> is associated with like evil and swamp and whatever, and <laughs> white is like holy like uh, <laughs> healing Justice magic and order and yeah and yeah. goodness they don't have yeah. anything to do with race at all so, yeah they're worry. putting race on it exactly it's yeah. the whole point that people don't like nighttime like well, was gonna, yeah <laughs> we, 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 we evolved to fucking be able to see based on the and and so lightness is like ooh safety and understanding and control and dark mm -hmm. is oh this is scary and unknown there could be a big spider <laughs> now i'm yes. spooked well, it's not a mite for Fringy. It's there's definitely a big spider here. It's gonna yeah. hit the face. So I have Never. to use. I have to. I have to seek. I have to seek safe. Seek safety in the nearest kangaroo pouch. <laughs> I have to dive yeah. on in there. 
You're like, I'll pay you back later, Mr. Kangaroo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that is fucked up. Jump in that pouchy. <laughs> um. Slip on in. Get nice and snug. <laughs> take, a, take a bit of a nap. Not off. Rest up. Come out. Smell like a kangaroo. That's, that's one of the sayings they have down there. What? Get in smell a pouch. Like, you smell like a small. kangaroo pouch. Is this true for I you? Mean, you've, been, right. you've been sleeping in a kangaroo. Bring it, can you you'd confirm? Say, you'd say, yeah. <laughs> Bring it's it, this... confirm, please. What? That you sleep in kangaroo pouches and say, yeah, I came out and I smell like a kangaroo. Yes. Like, I was going to say, you said the Sorry. yeah all wrong there. Rags was very clear. Sleep in, a, sleep in a pouch to get away from the spiders? Fuck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's yeah. Australian I mean, he's not saying no, so I guess it's true. Evacuate to Mustafa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, spiders can no longer tell the future because it makes other arachnids like Scorpios jealous. Oh my goodness. Oh. New law. Also, hello, Doctor No. CJG. Also, hi, Muesli, and hi, Wags. Oh, I, I, I get it. Oh, hi. Hello. Uh, hey. This just says get the roof. I don't know who's who have thrown off the roof today, but yeah, oh my roof. goodness, they could be referring to roof amphetamol zine, which is what Bill Cosby used to rape all those women. Ah, uh, roof. Oh, so that's what a roofie is. Okay, right. He would put them into their. Uh, I thought he used these qualudes or whatever, right? Pudding. Isn't it like he appealing his case now? I heard about that, right? Like. Mm. Well, well, I don't you know, know what, what, either, what, do you, yeah, what sure. do you have to lose anyway? You know? Well, I mean, what? I guess, right, yeah. I mean, no Kirby. A... Fuck you. No Kirby. <laughs> what, you just wanted Kirby to let himself die? Yes! Like... Kill yourself, you piece of shit. Die, you little pink ball. Damn. I remember when I was a kid, I was like, Kirby's a girl, he's pink. <laughs> that was as far as my logic went. Wow, sexist. Also, I knew I, I could get him to kill himself. I, I knew no it. Girl. Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> John, yeah, it's I like clear. The Last of Us 2. The chat. So you have chosen death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Top tier Forever references. My reputation, mm. yeah. Hey, guys. Mola, do you plan to move to the USA? No. Though... Freedom Land does seem pretty cool sometimes. I'll admit it. I don't plan to move freedom there. Freedom Land, Freedom Land. I would totally I like visit people from Freedom point. Land, though, yeah. I don't mind the idea. It's kind of weird, because I think Australia is pretty great, but I also don't mind the idea of leaving and going elsewhere. Wow. Mainly, as long as the place mostly speaks English, just kind of like my caveat. Um... Had someone asked me to stop explaining Ridley Scott's flaws, he didn't want me to ruin Blade Runner. Legit wanted to live in ignorance and keep the magic alive. I stopped, um, lol, but the... damn. What? Okay, right. What is this ignorance that he has related to what? Blade Runner being good? What are these profound arguments that you have for why it's bad? I mean, also, I'm not, not here anymore. I'm not against uh, someone being like, I don't want you to tell me about mm. the things that don't make sense because I really like that movie or whatever. It's like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. If they, however, like, critique films professionally and are like, nope, this film is actually really strong and has no flaws, then I'd be like, all right, well, I'm going to have to reveal something to you, I guess, <laughs> if that's okay. Mm. Like, if you just heard, you know, average Joe in a conversation, they're like, please don't talk about all the things that don't make sense in fucking, I don't know, Batman and Robin. It's just such a fun film. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, my God, that movie. <laughs> The, the fucking ice skating. Holy shit. Oh my god, yeah. It's, uh, something else. Um, uh, I heard the, the Blade Runner has a, a version with, like, the voiceover. I heard that was pretty rough. Yeah, I'm not like a fan. A, yeah, um, and the original Blade Runner, it's, uh, it's a very slow moving movie for me. But, uh, I did like it. Mm hmm Good. Good world building. Some I'm, of the best I've seen. I'm against a bot that's like terrified of me, and he has a mushroom on, and he's just like super big, and he's just like, nope, I'm not gonna play with you. I don't know. I, I'm I'm feeling. Is it because I'm a woman? Is that it? 
I don't know. Sure, why not? It's all fucking subjective. <gasps> well, they keep telling me. How, do, how would you feel subjective. if a giant woman was beating you with an umbrella? I get so or fucking hard. parasol, I guess. A pair of what? A parasol. Oh, yeah, that's what they call them in Animal Crossing. Mm, you... You... Uh, no one around me cares enough about good story writing. Thanks for existing. Also, hi, Wolf. Oh, wait. <laughs> I mean, you can care about good writing and not want to know why something sucks. I don't know. Leave the poor people alone. Uh, hey, Rags. Hi. I got around to watching your older, more political videos. I really enjoyed your more in-depth videos, and it's nice to know more people like uh, think like I do. Anyway, can't wait for the new TFA, Moola. Though it's on the way. Oh, glad you liked my thoughts on the Holocaust. Some consider them very controversial. <laughs> but I feel that it needs to be said. Um. John, you briefly worked with Rooster Teeth. What's the story there and your thoughts on their downward spiral? Oh. Um, well, I, I talked about a bit about this in the beginning, but um, I went to uh, Texas, their studio there. I don't know if they're still there, but I went down to their Texas studio there. Texas is still there, there. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. Good. Um, so I Vegas went down to their... Is. Yeah. I went down to their studio, and um, I met them, the, the team, and the bullpen, as they call it, which is like their team of like editors. And like, um, they help with some of the story stuff, I guess, and sort of like recording gameplay and stuff. And, um, I think that that was before Monty Oum had died. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, but, no, I know um, who he is. Yeah, he, uh, is this amazing, like, he, he made these amazing, uh, like fighting animations. It's like Met Samus versus Master Chief or something. Oh, wow. And I remember those. They used to play in the GameStop years and years and years ago when I went there. Right, yeah. So Rooster Teeth hired that guy to do their fight scenes because he was a great, like, animation fight choreographer. Like, mm -hmm. he would, he would like, mocap himself and apply that to, like, character models. And um, so that's that's why in Rooster Teeth you'll see, like, there's a, this all of a sudden this focus on elaborate chore choreographed fight scenes. Yeah, yeah, it was because of his involvement, and uh, I, I wasn't, I went over there, and he was working there at the time, but he wasn't there, he wasn't there on site, um, but I got to see his workspace, and that was really interesting, hmm. and um, so, yeah, I went over there, and it was a little bit awkward, because I wasn't really sure what was expected of me, I'm just like, do they want me to, to write something, or like, are we just going to get together and collaborate on something? And so I tried my best to look busy. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, I was just like, I, I think we we split the, the airfare. And so I was just like, I'm here partly on their dime, so I want to look like I'm getting shit done. And yeah. So I was just I was just writing down. I had a notebook with me, and I was jotting down ideas. Just like, this, this could be funny if we did this. And, and uh, I pitched it to him. I had this idea of, like... Uh, um, I had this idea about playing ROMs and just like how like the um, not not owning the games that you buy anymore like because all games are like digital now and they're being made into like ser services and subscription models and it's, it's something to do with that I can't remember what it, the, bro the essential joke of it exactly was but um, I think it turned out kind of funny and then um, theirs, theirs was better though, the, the Gary Busey one. Even though I didn't get the joke at the beginning, I was like, <laughs> "How is this funny?" But then, mm -hmm. in practice, and then seeing the the final cut, I was like, "Okay, this is funny. I like this." And um, it was fun working with them. Like they're great improv guys. I kept ruining takes because Joel was so funny, in particular. <laughs> they they all were, but like, I was face to face with Joel a lot for a lot of the shots, and he would just be like. For every take, he would throw in something new, and it would catch me <laughs> off guard. And I would smile and just, I'd be like, "Fuck, sorry, we got to go back, reset." <laughs> that we did that so often, I felt really bad, but we got through it, and um, and we we did my sketch as well, and that was fun. And then um, I remember I was kind of off, I was a little off put by 
I, f I felt like I had a lot of funny reactions. Like I did, I was, I did a lot with my face, mm -hmm. but uh, in the editing, the editing was favoring them a lot and it wasn't really cutting to me very much. And I felt, uh, but it felt egotistical to step in and be like, Hey, you should cut to my face more. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm a big believer in like, like the funny line that is said is only half the joke. Like the other half is cutting to the reaction yeah. to like the other person hearing what is being said and just not even saying anything, just the look on their face going like, what? Are you serious? Um, but wasn't a big deal. And uh, it turned out funny. And uh, I had a good time. And they took me, they were really nice. They took me out to like uh, a couple of restaurants. They took me to the Alamo Draft House, which is All like right. a, a theater there where you can order burgers and beer, like from your chair in the theater. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'd never, I'd never experienced anything like that before. It was really cool. And um, had a great time. And regarding their downfall, I mean, it makes me sad to hear that. I'm not really aware what exactly caused it. Um, but I understand there's a perception that they are, and maybe well, it's true, the that they are on a downward out. spiral. Are yeah, you but... familiar with some of the news that's been happening? Because um, Bernie has left, and Joel left on, and Joel left on terms that don't seem to be good. Really? Um, but I think Bernie left on good terms. But yeah, the two of them are gone. So that's like two out of like five or six of the founders are gone. Um, oh wow! I didn't know Bernie yeah. had left. Wow, he's he that was very of, he held it all together in a in a big way. I think. Well, he was. I think he was the uh, the main creative. Like I think I'm pretty sure he was like the creative officer, and I think he ran Red versus Blue like as the director for the first decade. So, right, a lot of it went through him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I remember I mentioned I. There's a weird thing going on, like when around the time machinima was collapsing right mm -hmm. and uh warner media had come in and bought machinima they also bought rooster teeth i think the the umbrella <laughs> company that bought them both was called full screen full um, screen think, yes yeah yes and they had bought both and then uh i think so RB and the Chief went off, and then a bunch of my fans were pissed off. And I think one of them had gone to the Rooster Teeth crew and said, Hey, is there something you can do? And then I think Matt Hullum had responded saying, Have John get in touch with me. And oh, so okay. I, I, I had spoken to Matt before. We When I was over in Texas, we got along great. He's a super cool guy. And I had emailed him saying okay here's my situation like I, I did all this work on rb and the chief and they they took everything offline i've been trying to get through to the machinima staff to like ask permission to put my videos on my own channel because i wanted to do this the in the right way yeah you know i didn't want to just you know in case they still had some legal claim over my videos i didn't want to just be like well fuck you i'm gonna upload it anyway like i wanted to do it in a respectable way and um they just, they weren't getting back to me. And I was getting so fucking frustrated. I'm like, I don't know what to do here. And uh, and then I, I emailed Matt and he's like, wow, that's that's really unfortunate. I'll, I'll look into this and I'll get back to you. But uh, but uh, he I didn't ever hear back from him again. Well, so I, think... uh, I know that he's the CEO of that company. So yeah, he might be, uh, he might be quite busy, I would imagine. Right, yeah, I guess. Um, and maybe there's some weird thing where he's he's obligated to keep his partners at Warner Media happy and right. uh, I I don't know I, I don't know I don't want to say anything more I don't know what happened but uh, I just remember I didn't hear back from them um, but eventually I got through to Machinima on my own because I had threatened legal action that's what it took. Mm, and right. I, I, I was actually talking to a lawyer at that point, a, 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 somebody who specializes in intellectual property law, right? Spe specifically in regard to like video game content. And so I was talking to this guy, and he w was offering me a free like consultation. It's like I'll have a look at your case, and then we can decide what we want to do from there based on what I observe. Like if we've got if we've got something we can pursue here. And uh, 
so I, I sent another email to to machinima saying all right i don't know what else to do here so i'm talking to a lawyer and i'm going to take legal action against you if you don't come back to me then all of a sudden i got a response huh. saying oh sorry about that there's some miscommunication i was like ah, oh, yeah fuck miscommunication. You. yeah 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 and so i finally got through to somebody over the phone at machinima who was i guess he was the last veteran left at the company who was like there since the beginning it, and it like everyone everybody else had been cycled out at this point but this there's this one guy who had ascended to the legal department and was just now talking to me over the phone i'm like i tried reaching out to you guys over email for months what the fuck happened like why, why did it take why did it take this long what are you saying and they what it, it was i got what i wanted but that that kind of pissed me off because mm -hmm. it was so easy i was just like they they were like yeah upload it to your channel it's no problem <laughs> i'm like well if it's if it's not a big deal why couldn't you just have fucking told me this months ago like wh why why is this like pulling teeth i don't understand so yeah so i've i've vented a little frustration at them over the phone i was like this process has been fucking infuriating but i'm glad you're finally playing ball with me here because i don't think i'm being unreasonable it's nothing to do with monetization like but, i said but, yeah, it was just about really i wanted the show scene to own your own work that you did <laughs> yeah That's a no very unreasonable position no kidding i mean i understand that i signed a contract but it's like you removed everything off your channel including this show that i worked really hard on like without that i've got nothing to show for the past 10 years of my life like come on this this is a decade of my life that you're just fucking scrubbing as if it didn't exist and uh but eventually they, they were just like yeah Go ahead and upload it to your channel. The thing is, though, that you're going to have to remaster a bunch of the audio because... Because of copyright, right? Yeah, yeah. But, uh... And so get that, rid of that, that machinima was... logo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that, that was a funny part, actually. I was just like, um... Can I, uh, get rid of the... What what's what am, what can I do about the logo? Can I just blur it out? And they were like, "Well, you can keep it if you want." And I'm like, <laughs> "If you don't care, that logo is fucking going." <laughs> yeah. Why the you fuck would I keep it want. around? Yeah. What do I want? A permanent reminder of how you guys fucking boned me? Get get out of here. <laughs> so I was I was quite happy to fucking blur it out. But uh, yeah, I, I I uploaded most of my show to my channel except for seasons one and two for a while because of the the copyright music thing and i thought if if they get like a copyright strike then i think they were worried that they somehow would get in trouble but i didn't understand how that worked because it's my content it's going on my channel like i guess because their their logo was still on it but i, I told them i'd blur it out so I don't really get what they were worried about. But once they went under and they stopped existing as a corporate ent entity, I stopped giving a fuck entirely. And I was just like, whatever. It's all going on my channel now because you don't exist anymore. So, <laughs> And that's that. Everything's on my channel now, and I'm, I'm very happy with the way things turned out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that's behind me. Uh, and also... yeah, Ro Rooster Teeth, I haven't really heard from them uh, since, but I got... No I got nothing against them it makes me sad to hear that they're kind of going downhill but I, I wish them the best i think they're all really nice guys i don't have a bad word to say about any of them um also did anyone in efap watch red versus blue was a fan fell behind and heard it sucks now along with every other show at rooster teeth <laughs> <laughs> I just I like some of it years and years ago and i, like I uh them, so i like... really liked um the first like six or seven or so seasons um i like all the blood gulch chronicles and i really like season six which was the first one that they started serializing like real you know from the beginning it was clear that was a plan i like that season a lot um yeah i have watched basically all of it though except for like anything past season 13 so really i haven't watched in five years <laughs> but yeah oh yeah I like i'll always show. hold them in high regard because they they inspired me to do what i do yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm yeah. surprised I forgot to mention, actually, the, the the impact that Red versus Blue had on me. Like, the, the, the comedy and the story, I don't think was really my cup of tea. There were, there were parts of it that I thought were funny. Um, but uh, it just wasn't really the show for me. 
I don't think. But uh, I, it kind it blew me away that I was just like, oh, you can make movies with video games, hmm. and people were really digging it, and they had a big audience. And I'm just like, fuck, I can do that. I could, I would love to do that. Just write something and then do it in Halo. Like that's that's great. And so yeah, they they inspired me in a big way, and I'll always be grateful to them for that for for that inspiration. Yeah, I think they were hugely important for uh, scripted online content in general, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They had some other shows too, but I never I never watched any of them. I remember they, were, they had to have, like, Sims 2 one. Strangerhood, I think. I oh, yeah. That. Yeah. Um, some of the animated stuff they did recently I liked. I liked that Camp Camp show, but I haven't heard anything about that for a couple of years either, so... Right. I like their live-action <laughs> sketches. Those are what I contributed oh, to yeah. when I went over there. The Rooster Teeth shorts, where it's just, like, the crew doing live-action <laughs> skits. Those are really I, funny. I like those. I remember this one that was, uh, I think it was a Father's Day one they did where they were playing, um, they were playing catch. And um, as they were passing, I think Matt, like, it was, the guy they were playing with was progressively throwing more dangerous objects at him. So, like, it starts with him throwing the baseball at him and not paying attention to the fact that he's talking. And then, like, a basketball. And then I think there was the knife. Like, and then he <laughs> this knife. Like, oh, that was the knife. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's cool yeah they had some good ones yeah um but apparently it's all shit now <laughs> it's so, like, who's, all right then. who's still there then just jeff and gus I mean... uh so i think gus is still there i think jeff is still there matt would still be there um and i guess uh that'd be it then as well um yeah, that'd have to be, except for the guy who plays Tucker, but I'm not sure if he's like a full-time, you know, Rooster Teeth guy. I'm not sure if that's like... So yeah, that that would be the, the, the crew as it stands, I think. Alright. Oh god, I remember uh, I was kind of nervous being there because in one of my episodes of Arby and the Chief, I said Griff Ball was fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and I think it was Jeff's girlfriend that had come up with that. And yeah, I was oh. like, I was worried. I was just like, oh, they're gonna be like. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I saw what you said about my game that. type in that episode. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh shit! But no, I didn't. I didn't hear about it. So, that was a relief. <laughs> um, I made an eight in the eight inch haft for my shovel years ago. I guess it's supposed to be shaft. Uh, it's been the best upgrade I've ever made for my tools. Why aren't eight-inch shovels available commercially? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know what? Ah, oh, god, I gotta love them. It's a fucking injustice. That's what that is. I don't know. I ask myself that often, though. Yeah, yeah. Why are eight-inch shovels available? Listen, if you want something that's eight inches, you let me know. Shovels. You got any shovels or anything? Or you're referring to something more sinister, I believe. Oh, we'll be going deeper. Oh yeah. Uh, Five dollars for Fringy if he says Joe Monroe likes to grow snow down below, although he does owe Mo Cho, who lives on the plateau or plateau, <laughs> lots of <laughs> dough. What a pro, bro. <laughs> no. So Fringy. <laughs> Uh, what? What? Do, do you... Just post it in chat and tell him to read it. Alright. Uh, Super Chat is requesting that you read this. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, Joe Monroe likes to grow snow below, uh, <laughs> down below, although he does own Mocho, who lives on the plateau. Lots of dough. What a pro, bro. No. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh... I'm currently four minutes into making a 10-minute Transformers 2 parody review. It's my first video ever. Could I get criticism when it's done, possibly? Uh, we, uh, pretty much our thing on that from the beginning has been, like, wouldn't do, you know, like, critical reviews of, of anyone's work by request via buddy. It's, it seems like a really bad way to go. Um, 
you know, there, there's other reasons too. Like it'd be, it could be really uncomfortable or not not something that we're up on in terms of information required to be effective at it. But we wouldn't want to set a precedent where we're like, yes, pay us and we will review your works. Like, no, no, no. no. Um, but good luck. A Norwegian farmer had his machine fail over and trap him on an electric fence where he got shocked by electric pulses for like an hour. His legs are paralyzed now, but he's driving a tractor again. That, wow. Wow. What an unfortunate guy. Glad it has the happy ending. I guess, yeah. <laughs> he still drives tractors. Still <laughs> drives a tractor. <laughs> I feel like that's why we were told about it. It's just like, by the way, he, he made it. <laughs> he's still yeah. driving that tractor. <laughs> Um, Mola, Game of Thrones episode, uh, season 8, episode 6, when? Uh, we, still no date to be promised on that one. TFA part 3 is the closest one that actually has a date now, and it'll be probably in the next two weeks. But it could very well be one week. Just, just stay quiet about it. Don't tell anyone, okay? Nice. Uh, in North America, we have one marsupial, and we like to trade it for the Aussie possum. That'd be the old possum then, yeah. Neat. Oh, possum. Yum. Much like Australia, Wyoming is also not real. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Wyoming is made up. Everyone knows that. Everyone uh. says Wyoming. No one asks how Oming. Fucking <laughs> 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 this DK is too small, I'm just gonna slap the ground till he dies. <laughs> Or I'll do this. Oh, yeah, that's a dead DK. Um, fun fact, marsupials evolved in South America when it was connected to Antarctica and Australia. They, they were all, they were on all three and only survived in Australia after they broke apart and Antarctica froze. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is correct. Wait, so they just died in the other two places then? So what happened was, from what I understand, in Antarctica it's just, they froze. Out wow, they should have evolved and, um, jackets. And from what I understand, in uh, South America, they were eventually hunted by um, the animals which were in North America and stuff. Aww. Yeah. Um, I'm an hour behind, but the OK hand sign is still a thing. Some race car driver got in trouble for it last week. Ugh. Jeez. You mean a racist car driver. <laughs> Reminder that Mola's mask is filled with pee. <laughs> Alright. Uh, also, hi, Rags. Hello. Teddy bears are from Teddy Roosevelt. All of them? Yeah, well, everyone. What an <laughs> impressive collection. <laughs> uh, hi, Rags. What did you think of the Veil vale Riders? The Veil Riders? Yeah, what do you think of the Veil Riders? Whoever they um, are. I think it's pretty obvious. Oh, I haven't I haven't listened to them. I I, I just haven't listened to them yet. I'm just by Guard Beardia Beardio. Wait, I is that a is that a song by them? No, but I don't know it's a song by them. But he's the one who posted it on his I see. Uh Humans are in- Oh, wait! This is the- the Mordhau thing. I have- I have- I know some of it, but I haven't watched it yet. Um, if you're dying, by the way, you are welcome to go to sleep. No, I'm not dying. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I am, but... I'm, a little I'm bit. still good. Slow and steady wins the race. That's not true. It's slow and That's steady wins the race if the fast one said. falls asleep. Actually, races are won by the person who is swift and quick, and who can reach the finish line first. Without falling asleep, that's the important part. You can Stupid fall asleep. Rabbit. If it's a straight line, and you're going in a straight line, and you fall asleep, and the weight of your body presses down on the gas pedal, then it's very possible that you could win the race. I was referring to an animal, not a car. I mean, an animal could... I mean... Sleepwalking? Swap. If anything, if you were on a horse, it'd be, like, easier, because the horse could, like, steer and everything. Okay, in medieval times, could you get arrested for for riding your horse while drunk? Probably. 
or because it's a horse, it wouldn't let you like drive it into a wall. It would just stop on its own because it's like it's like no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fucking drive into that wall. He's a fucking retard. No, <laughs> you, <were> drinking. <laughs> you know, you humans. I get it. You smothered us and stuff, but really, I don't know. Um, humans are instinctually kind of afraid of snakes. Are we? Apparently. Instinctively afraid of snakes? Did they do something to us in some? Oh wait, the spooky snake in Eve's garden, the Garden of Eve and Eden. That's the one. Oh uh, right, yeah. His servant. So I, I googled it. Fuck, I messed up. I said our humans bigger than snakes. Fuck. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I. I well, it depends. That. Are we talking Harry are Potter snakes or? Afraid of snakes. <laughs> I don't know why I asked Google that question. Um, <laughs> Google's like, I mean, some humans uh, are, I Google's guess. I don't like, know. I mean, yeah, generally. Um, herpetophobia is the fear of reptiles. Fear of herpes. <laughs> Most so, people are afraid of herpes. It looks like that there is a a a a forty year research program demonstrated strong fear conditioning to snakes in humans and fast non-conscious processing of snake images these are mediated by a fear network in the human brain involving the amyg amygdala amygdala yeah so it looks like it says um uh, bah, 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 bah. It says research has found humans do not innately afraid of snakes. Do not innately afraid of snakes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well then, that question answered. Which is scarier, spiders or centipedes? Oh, spiders. Yeah. Oh, actually. Oh, that's a good it one. For me, it depends on the spider. Centipedes will fuck you the fuck up. Centipedes yeah. are not to be trifled with. They're terrifying oh, okay. in the right environment, I guess. But uh, you know, if you're like the worst it, of centipedes versus nothing. the friendliest of spiders, like, hmm. right, dude, centipede. Yeah, I think I'm more afraid of centipedes. But I don't know. I, there's some well, spooky spiders out there. Yeah, there are some super duper spooky spiders though, and they're in the web, so they can be like up in the air and stuff. So which means they're closer to your face potentially, and that's my no-no zone for spiders. Mm -hmm. It's my face. I have lots of no-no zones for spiders myself. I remember this part. I remember the coin battle part. Oh, the coin battle was so fun. <laughs> that was a mode you could do. <laughs> yeah, I remember coin battle, whatever it was called. Late stage <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> this is what the name is. Game Don't you get is. it? They're, they're hitting each other and money <laughs> comes out. Don't you get it? Beat the, sh be the shit out of each other for money. I'm it's... watching you play this Mahler, and I'm just curious, is this a modded version of Melee? No. Oh, do you mean because it looks melee? cleaner? It's it's an emulator, so it look, the resolution's stronger. Right, Dolphin, right? That's what you're playing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I just I heard stronger. you saying it was... Oh, fucking hell, it was really? you were playing, but it looks like Melee. Of all the things that could have fell out of that fucking... Ugh. Bombs. Oh my goodness. Oh, bombs. no. Bombs for everyone. Dude, I'm yeah, just whapping him, and, well. and it's like his wallet has a hole in it or something. Are you the small child or <laughs> the big man in tights? I am, I am the tiny child. The little Mugging tiny simulator. Child. Where'd your parasol go? Don't need what? it. What's down here? But you had more money. You have to get to oh, 200 to in get the timeline. Uh... You need to beat up that larger <laughs> man. See, that's the thing about capitalism. It's not just about making money. you got to make it in a certain amount of time. Yeah, before you die. <laughs> or during. Haha. Uh -huh. Ideally, yeah. During death. As long as you make it during death, <laughs> you're okay. I'm not entirely sure what it means, just run with it. Yeah, you're choking, but also doing your taxes and getting a fucking <laughs> mad-ass refund. Yeah. While you're, you're strangling yourself while masturbating, like David Carradine. You stealing <laughs> RLM's jokes. It's not their joke. It's yeah, it's totally Ryan. their joke. You know what I mean. You're totally stealing their joke. I'll, I'll Listen, not accept it. That's what I thought. No, I think it's. I think that this is everyone's joke. If you die of autoerotic asphyxiation, that's everyone's joke, and no one can take that away. From <laughs> if you die, that's everyone's joke. <laughs> that's everyone's joke.
You should, that's what you should have thought before you, you fucking. Well, as you were pulling on that uh, that belt around the door, you're just like, oh, this will be everyone's joke. Like, why don't you just take like a sock or something and wrap it around your neck? So if a you, sock, you just... yeah. I feel like that's just more difficult. Why? Are you looking for like less chance of failure? I guess. You gotta experiment with all kinds of things before you can just conclude something like that, Ragu. Maybe you should just get a spotter. I know it might be a little embarrassing to ask someone, especially. Well, you can if ask you're a family unfair. member, I guess. Right? Yeah, I guess your family member. Family should understand you. Yeah, I'm sure several of them your would do it. Family should be like, point. yeah, man, I'll, I'll spot for you, my dude. Just fucking. Let Stay it rip. safe, man. Stay safe. I'm glad we had that conversation. Xenomorphs were actually inspired by deep sea specimens. Makes sense. Deep sea stuff is spooky. I'm not hearing any disagreements on it either. So you know it's true. When uh, they discovered the platypus, they sent it back to Britain, and the scientists there literally didn't believe it was a real animal. <laughs> I mean, I could believe that. Uh,. What was the point of Batwoman Season 1 if Kate left before anything was resolved? Seriously, the series didn't set up anything interesting. Well, what we found hey, out was that it's... there were going to be 22 episodes, and uh, there are only 20 because of COVID. I don't know how they're going to wrap up Kate's involvement in Gotham's uh, Gotham as a storyline. Like, I don't... It, it'll the, be the terrible. The big thing was obviously Jacob finding out who Batwoman was. I, I guess we're not doing that. I don't know. I guess, yeah. Well, they like, set up the great payoff of Jacob learning that his daughter was Batwoman. Oh, right. She's not going to be in the fucking show anymore, so never mind. So much for that. Why Why did she leave this show? Do you guys know? Um, she didn't. Long working hours. Yeah, she injury. didn't like the long hours. Oh, yeah. She says the injury's not a part of it. I seriously fucking doubt the fact that she had two... Uh, what was it? Um, the part of spine? Discs, yeah, you know? discs of yeah. his spine got fucking jutted out to the point where she almost lost the ability to walk. Like, I was just like, eh. I feel like that's probably to do with it, the fact that you consider the show so fucking reckless that something like that could happen. Oh, yeah. The, the hours are fucking ridiculous. I mean, it, no it, working in television fucking sucks. So hard. What I kind of hours are you talking I mean, at least a, a movie suck. Working on a movie's hard, but at least a movie ends. You know what I mean? Like, the TV <laughs> show just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Well, I mean, you, it sounds like you've worked on sets, so uh, how how long can you expect to be on a set? On a oh, like uh, some 15 hours easy. Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was guarding an emergency exit for that entire time. Oh, man. I was in a, I was in a dirty stairwell. <laughs> I was on a, I working on a show called Rush. It was basically a, a spin-off, a rip-off of House. And, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, it's just like a you know a reckless doctor who his 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 methods are unorthodox but he saves lives <laughs> he the gets same. results <laughs> yeah exactly and um my job was to guard a stairwell emergency exit make sure nobody went in or out and there's like power cables running uh it's called seaway running outside down this set of stairs and my job was to just guard it and make make sure nobody came in because uh um, they were shooting down the, the hallway that was adjacent to where I was uh, uh, st standing. And I actually, I got in trouble at one point during the day. Because I, I, out of sheer boredom, I was just pacing around and I walked out into the hallway. And then I was like, I was in the frame. I don't think that they were rolling, but they were just about to roll. And then a producer saw me in the background. And he's just like... You, you can't be here. You can't be there. Get back. And I was like, wow. Hey, sorry, Jesus Christ. This sounds like a horrendous working environment. Yeah. Uh, it sucked, man. I couldn't even, t there was nobody even to even talk to. And it was just literally me sitting on my own for hours and hours and hours. Like I had a lunch break and everything, but then it's back to the spider ridden stairwell. <laughs> I just like the idea that some producer yeah. is just like, you can't be here. Get out. <laughs> Move out yeah. of the frame. <laughs> Like, who are you? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. We have so many people who are on film sets who are desperate to justify their position and look good in front of their superiors. <laughs> a lot of ass-kissery and 
Right. You know, so they see anything slightly out of out of line, it's like, oh, I got to make make a big performance out of, make this a to big make show sure. out of it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So people know I care about this production. That I, raise, <laughs> that I care yeah. about. This <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's it's fucking uh, it's soul sucking, you know. And people stay in it for the paychecks, but like they oh, they kind man. of. They're like the pay's too good. I don't want to do anything else. But then you know they do one day and then the next and then the next shift and then the next show and then the next show, and then before they know it, it's like they realize they've been doing this for years yeah. and and you've the stress like missed the window. Of, yeah, and the stress of the job has probably shaved ten years off the end of their life. <laughs> and, uh, it does sound like uh, production, like film sets, TV show sets are just like a just like a special kind of hell. Uh, what what's right. uh it's like a um it, oh, damn I, it's it's you know it's like a pressure boiler where you got right. all these deadlines and you got to wrap up but you're here all day and you have to reshoot over and over and if you don't even like what you're making that's got to be even worse especially like if you're an actor or something yeah if you do if you work in film or television you basically have no life because like like if you, especially if you're working like as a grip and you're fucking like, because like, I I did that for a while. That's my job was to run sandbags back and forth from the truck to like the shooting set and sandbags. weigh down. Yeah, they use that to weigh down C stands, which is what holds up lights and stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, or sometimes flags for shaping the light. And um, oh. and it would be my job to help the the light riggers set up the lights as well. Like I would be working with uh, electric, the ele the ele electrics department, and um, the zappy boys. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I almost killed myself actually. I, I, oh, I, like I, literally, like as in you almost <laughs> died no, on set. Yeah, because I I plugged a massive electrical electrical <laughs> cable in the wrong way. Like oh. I had it turned around, so like the ground and the power was like switched around, and I I plugged it in. And it felt like I got punched in the chest. I don't know how I'm still alive. Damn. <laughs> this, yeah. Maybe you died it's... there and this is hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. That was the one day I worked electrics and I learned a very valuable lesson that day. Never work don't electrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't get killed. Um, but yeah, uh, grips, I was I was lugging, um, you know, st uh, stands, C stands and uh, sandbags and equipment equipment back and forth from the truck to the shooting set and f to the next set and um by the end of the day i was just like you get home and you just want to fall into bed that's all you want to do there's like no time for even socializing with friends or you don't even have the energy to just like talk to whoever you're living with or you know right. just like i'm going to bed and then you wake up and then you're probably not going to get a full eight hours You'll, you're probably not even going to get six because the turnaround is so bad, you know? The, use, like, the interesting thing there, I guess, though, is, like, a lot of the people who are on those sets probably want to make their own shit, and yeah. it's almost like you you no longer have an opportunity to do that because of the amount of time that you have to spend working in, you know, on other people's stuff. Yeah, it's sad. It's like, I, I've talked to a lot of people on sets. They're like, I want to direct one day. I really yeah. like writing. Or whatever you hear all these creative ambitions from these people and it's like this is my way in you know like i don't into the I, film I guess world. that's what i mean like it's like i feel like it's almost like you need to just make your own stuff because if you make your own stuff and then it's really cool you know then then you don't even need you don't need to like prove anything to anyone you know yes. like you've already made the good stuff yeah if if you want to get into film in like a writing or directing capacity don't go in from the bottom up. Don't be a no. grip and expect to, you know, work your way up to that point. You have to write, you know. So that's and that's what I did. I was writing scripts and I did my. I've do, been doing my YouTube thing, and I'm I'm quite happy doing my YouTube thing. Like I don't, I don't need to be working for a, on a big studio film to feel fulfilled in my life. You know what I mean? I feel really lucky in that regard, because you know I have it. I feel like I have it really good. Um, I, you know, I, I write my own content. I edit it exactly how I want. Nobody's telling me what to do. Yeah. Um, I put out content for an audience that wants to see it. People full screen my stuff in their uh, in their own TV at home, 
and they treat it like a cinematic experience and it's like uh I, I i've i've heard people tell me before it's like are you happy what where you are doing what you're doing for youtube as if it's this kind of fucking stupid thing right. <laughs> you know it's it's like oh you're on you're a youtuber really and uh i'm i'm proud of it man and i'm actually i'm happy you know i do i do what i do i enjoy it people dig well, it well a lot of people i think see youtube as a stepping stone they're like i'll do that and i'll get i'll you do know. youtube in order to do this other thing and as opposed to seeing youtube as an end in and of itself yeah it's uh yeah it's like you know as, again with our generation it's like we basically built the idea of being like wait a minute you could have a job just doing that and you're like yeah you can well, yeah, it's, it's one of the interesting things is that the, the internet has made it to where things have been very uh, democratized. That's kind of one of the things I'm thinking about because I'm working on a book and then for a long time it's like, oh, well, you get it published. And more and more I'm like, but why though? Couldn't I just do that myself and make more money? <laughs> and like, yeah. you know, what 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 does a publisher offer? It's like, well, they can do their, their book covers. Like, well, I can do that. Well, they do the marketing. It's like, first of all, they don't market your book from what I understand. And even then, like, there's still a lot that comes down to you. And if you're going to do it anyway, then why don't you do it yourself? If, if, if like, half of books sold uh, sold on Amazon and you can direct publish to Amazon, wouldn't it make a lot of sense to just do it yourself? Like, that, I don't know. The internet has made it to where you can do a lot of things yourself. And I think, um, I think it's almost like an antiquated view of, well, I mean, there's YouTube and there's internet stuff. But then there's, like, the cinema there's the, you know, television, as if, like, there's necessarily a pedigree to it. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I, I wouldn't be happy if, you know, working under the studio system where, uh, you know, a, a potentially good script in the beginning gets script doctored in, into oblivion, you know, mm -hmm. and all these executive decisions go into the mix and it's just a piece of shit. And then you know, it's your job to bring this piece of shit to life. And it sounds like the process of actually making a film is really painful yeah just, um it's, it's kind of it's, it's weird sometimes i watch shows and think about how mu it must have been like on set and i'm like oh damn that probably wasn't a fun experience for you guys was it i wonder no. how many awkward uh, encounters these guys had or who they yelled at that day or something like that oh um, dude yeah i'm sure yeah, there's they're... a lot of yelling on set <laughs> oh every day there's something that's another thing I just couldn't deal with. I mean, I hated being yelled at on set. And a lot of the times it, you know, s sometimes it was my fault. Sometimes it wasn't. Uh, but like you have, uh, fuck, I remember this one day I was, uh, I was working as a grip and, um, the, uh, the, the, I can't remember. I think this director and the cinematographer are talking to each other and they, they say we need uh, we need wooden panels for the the floor here because it's carpet and we need like a hard floor I think because they needed to lay down dolly track mm -hmm. to like put the camera on and uh, the the director told his I can't remember who the name of the role it's basically the director's right hand and the director was just like get me this thing now I need this right oh. now. And then when the director says that, it's like you're you have to put that same pressure on your guys, where you're just like, come on, I need this right now. And then so, uh, so the key grip found out, got the call for it to get these uh, wooden boards uh, ready, but they weren't cut right. They needed to be cut first. And so this guy is like trembling, tr you know, because he's so worried trying to get this thing ready and he's got he's operating a saw blade he almost cuts off his fucking hand getting this thing Shit. ready right and then as soon as it gets as the square wood panel gets cut literally like right off the blade it gets handed to me so i can run off to the shooting set with it and then i got there and then it, they said uh Oh, false alarm. We don't need it anymore. We figured out a different way. Mm. So a dude nearly cut his and hand off over some bullshit. <laughs> precisely. Got almost lost his hand because of just ridiculous impatience for something that wasn't even needed. You know? And I'm just like... And I was <laughs> oh, fucking man. sweating bullets because I'm just like, I want to do a good job. I want to make sure I get this to them in time. And it's just like, there's all this needless fucking stress. 
and people shouting at each other. I I never yelled at anybody on a film set. Like uh, I was always very I was as kind as <laughs> I, like I, I could possibly be. I never people, yelled yeah. at anyone on a film set. No. Yeah. <laughs> not yell at her. I no, I, I I don't yell at anybody. Period. Very very uh, seldom Hitler? in my life. Oh. oh yeah. Would you yell at Hitler? I suppose yes. I would. Hitler? Yeah. Oh, he's still not gonna understand you. Yeah. You can yell at somebody um, without them knowing your language. Well, you can, but I feel like you know. Like, hey, Hitler. You know. By the way, you get a really bad rap, but you know I'm your biggest fan. Uh, you could say that to him. I could picture would. John saying that, yeah. But you would. I did get angry at the end of that day, though, because, like, uh, we were, were packing up the truck, and um, the key grip, he walks up to the truck, and he fucking f flings a sandbag right past my head. Like, it almost oh. hits me. Yeah. Jeez. And I look, I turn around and I look at him and I give him this, I didn't shout at him, but I gave him this fucking death stare. I'm just like, are you <laughs> fucking kidding me? I buy like, you, that could, you, you could have really hurt me there. And it's just like, my uh, my nerves were fucking shot after that work day. And it's just like, I don't need this right now. Like, mm -hmm. just be more careful, dude. And he, he tried, he warmed up to me a little bit after that because he saw how pissed off I was. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, it, and in the end, it was fine, but I was just like, this environment is so fucking stressful, and I feel sorry for anybody who works in this environment regularly, you mm -hmm. know? And I think a lot of people, they just become really calloused to it. It seems they're just, that they're way. just like, yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. I'm just like, how Everybody can you deal with this? Like, fucking, I'm... Whenever somebody yells at me for a film set because I screwed something up, or maybe it wasn't my fault, either way, it's just... I feel like absolute shit. I'm just, oh man. I well, it seems like, and... uh, it almost seems like they're, they're exploiting the fact that there is a totem pole, you know, a social totem pole in this environment. You know, the director and the assistant director and the producers, they're the top dogs. And if you screw up, you know, they can make things difficult for you. And so it makes this environment where everybody sounds like they're scared shitless. Right. Yeah. And everybody wants to get further up. Yes. Yeah. I've been pissed off on a film set, but like, um, I won't take it out on anybody. But and there's no, a, but there's a lot of that. People take out their rage on people who, you know, sometimes they screw I mean, up. There, there are it wasn't there are stories about this, right? Like films cover this, like <laughs> on sets right. where there's these right. uh, crazy shit happening. Uh, there's a great one uh, about filmmaking starring Steve Buscemi called "Living in Oblivion," I think. Mm -hmm. That's a oh. very funny movie about making a, what it's like making a movie. Where you have like, uh, the actors have this off-camera drama and they hate each other, but then they're supposed then to they, like have yeah. this chemistry in front of the camera and it doesn't work, and... That's hilarious. Was, Everything that can goes, can go wrong does go wrong. I do wonder if, uh, cause like a lot of old TV shows like Bewitched and stuff, they had a much shorter production turnaround, you know? And I wonder if they had to work like even longer hours or anything like that, or if they did a nine to five, you know? Right. But um, it seems like the nine to five is gone when it comes to things, cause things are shot on location, things are shot, you know, exterior, uh, not on sets all the time. For film, yeah, it's wishful thinking. And I, I kind of get it in a way like it's it sucks the hours are ridiculous but it's just like we can save so much money if we shorten the shooting days to like two instead of three or something yeah for like, or it's just it means we don't have to lock down this bridge for like an extra day or whatever if we can just mm -hmm. squeeze all of the shots into two days as opposed to three or whatever like yeah, like just squeezing every hour out of people it's brutal <laughs> but i do understand it on some level but I don't want to be a part of it. <laughs> uh, it's that world sucks. I don't want to be a designer bridge. Mm. That was that's the other thing too is the amount of effort that goes into productions in Vancouver, and so many of them suck because the scripts suck. Crisis on Infinite Earth. Well, cry yeah, I mean. <laughs> When we were watching that, we often made the observation that they were just fighting on some rooftop in Vancouver. It's impossible not to notice. Yeah. Super like they, they were in a gravel pit once for the finale, yeah. for the big battle. They went to the uh, yeah. dawn then, of fucking some, time, in dude. Some shots, in some shots, the gravel was CGI, 
Like it was what? a green screen yep. underneath them. Oh my god, are you fucking yeah. with me? Not right. Do you, do you, do you not remember? Do you not that? remember? Yeah. <laughs> that there was so much bullshit going on. <laughs> I don't remember this CGI gravel. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. I can't. It sounds like a joke. Like it's not real. I don't know. I don't know well, that it was show, real. Show like, had the CGI gravel what if? Because it, what if the whole world was playing a prank on us? They were like, "Did you actually think Infinitisms was a real project?" It's like, hmm. <laughs> hold on. Not. Here we go. Ah. Uh, oh. Yeah. Hold on. Let me. Let me see if I can find it. This gonna uh, make me say the N word. <laughs> no. no. Okay. Good. <laughs> God, it, the CGI is so bad, it looks like a PS2 video game. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Yeah, so, um... The problem is, this is clearly like... Yeah, this is definitely, uh, some CGI stuff going on. Let me... Let me pull it up. Uh... <laughs> like, look at this. Clearly, th th this is... There is something wrong with this shot, you know? They do not look like they're blending into that environment at all. Oh yeah, that looks oh, rough. Goodness. Well, it's worse yeah. in motion because it doesn't look right when the camera moves around it. Nothing yeah, well that's like how you can tell. Right. Even the actors don't look real. I know, Something right? about their expressions and their outfits is just... They're the fact just... that they're constantly just standing around, and, and this is what I mean, I think uh, production became very pronounced when we were watching this because I think I, we found out after the fact from interviews that uh, each of these episodes was made in five days. It's like, well, five days to shoot 40 minutes of content. And not only 40 minutes of content, but superhero shows with lots of special effects and fight scenes. Like, yeah, it, it ain't gonna pan out well. No. I can believe it, because the final thing looks terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does. By Rags. the looks of it, a lot of people work really hard like on that. A... This looks like a freeze frame on like a crane shot or something, where it's yeah. going up to down or down to up. But there was a green floor because they weren't sure of where they were going to be putting them in this final scene yet. Right. That's all I got from it, yeah. But I mean... <laughs> oh wait, hold on. Let me see if I can find another shot. Oh wait, no, that was the shot. The gravel. But it's because the, the place that they're fighting doesn't have gravel, like, later on. They moved to a different location and I guess they forgot. Like, that they forgot that they shot in- I don't know. Like, I'd be willing a... to believe nobody gave a fuck. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's um... <laughs> like... Oh god, the CGI is so bad. Yeah, I saw a webm of a fight scene. I don't know if it was from Supergirl or something else. Oh, was some... you, it was from Supergirl, definitely. I don't want you talking about <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I was laughing, crying laughing. It was so bad. <laughs> Like, just, oh my god. It's, and it's it ridiculous expectations placed on these people, you know, where it's just, you're, you like want to make any? a superhero TV show in this time frame? That's ridiculous. Of yeah, course the effects are going to be shit. I mean, and, and part of it is like, maybe it's just not a good idea to make a superhero show that needs special effects if you're making a TV show. Like, um, right. there's a reason why Daredevil is more effective as a TV show than other superhero properties would be. It's because he's a normal dude who fights people. He just beats them up with fisticuffs, so it, work it works better from that standpoint. You don't need to spend a lot and of money yet, on visual effects. these guys take right. us to multiple dimensions, portals, and yeah, time they, travel. Yeah, they take us beyond time and space, even though they're moving forward in time, and there's also space in which they exist in. It makes sense. Stop it. And there's oxygen as well, I guess, because they can breathe. Yeah. <laughs> what the only uh, superhero TV show I'm remotely interested in watching is The Boys. The Boys and... season one's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it looks like they take their time on that one, and they focus on like writing something that's actually decent. I think uh, both Muller and I are kind of concerned that season two might not be as strong. Yeah. Uh, but season one's pretty good. Right. Yeah, I'm interested. I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out, but uh, I'm gonna check out Batwoman first. <laughs> you should. The greatness that is Batwoman. Also, um, I am now getting to the point of super tiredisms, and I feel like if half of the cast is potentially like that, then maybe we should uh, save save the rest for us to catch up on uh, 
the following week. Crash and spiral into a smoke pit. I blame Fringy for not living in the exact same time that we were, so we could have started two I hours earlier. I woke up so early for this. <laughs> You're there <laughs> criticizing me. Therefore, I blame you. You could have woken up way later the previous day, and it would have been better. Yeah. Selfish uh, person. <laughs> all right, Hogging well. all that sunshine. Um, in your fake continent. But yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, like, I'd, I'll be able to fetch all of these ready for- it's, There's not actually a huge amount, we'll be able to catch up with them pretty easily. It's just that, um, I am- I am getting, uh, yawny as well, and I wouldn't wanna just be low energy, it's fine, can't be doing that. Um, but, before we- we- we do any kind of signing off, I wonder if, uh, if- John, would you like to potentially give- give- give everybody who's listening a, um, a brief intro to what you do, and then, uh, tell them where to find you? Sure. So, um, I've always made videos for YouTube. I do a show called Are Being the Chief. I started it back in 2008, I think. And I worked for Machinima for a while, and now I'm independent, and I'm trying to rebuild my channel. <laughs> And um, I'm still working on being the chief. I'm, I'm working on a video game review show. I've got a podcast. Uh, so if uh, if you liked listening to me today, or you're a fan of R being the chief, maybe you were in the past, and you're just finding out now that um, I started it back up. Yeah, there's probably um, a few people like that. Like, oh shit, it's still doing it. <laughs> it's like yes, yeah. Uh, go ahead. My, I have a website, imaginative imaginativelogo.com. And uh, my username on YouTube is Digital Fear or John Graham. You, you can type either one of those into the YouTube search and you'll find me. My icon is the same. And uh, smash that subscribe button <laughs> and uh, hit the notification bell and all that fucking bullshit. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my stuff. So, and uh, I just want to really... Thank you guys for having me on. I, this was a blast. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, man. And it's, uh, uh, it's good shit. I, I need I needed it, you know, because I was in this really. We had talked about this earlier about just being fucking depressed with everything that's happening in the world and being worried about how I feel, just isolated in my opinions because I'm hearing all these fucking seeing all these lunatic things being posted <laughs> on my social media feed, and I'm just like, oh my god. <laughs> But uh, listening to you guys, talking with you guys, and listening to your chat, and I'm really impressed with your chat and just how everybody here seems to be on the same page on, on things. Oh and it's, it's a relief to find out there's still sanity in the world right now. So um, this, this was a terrific podcast, and I really I thank you for having me on. Wow. So, very kind. You, you've been a fantastic yeah, right. guest. It's been We've great. Talked about yeah, shit to tons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we we exceeded what I even thought we would talk about. So it's like, yeah, this is good good shit. Yeah. We, sometimes we get guests and we just have to poke them with a stick to get them to make noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, you wanted to be here. Say something. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, thanks for so much input and. Uh, and, uh, and I talks about creative writing and whatnot. Yeah, it was everything that was in the title we covered. <laughs> Good yeah. job. A lot of mind suck in there. You just s absorb it through your brain hole. No problem. I'm happy to do it. I, mean, I love talking about the writing process, and I don't get asked about it nearly enough. So whenever somebody does and who has a mutual interest, I'm just like, hell yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk about the process. Because yeah, I always love hearing about the process from other people. I love but hearing I about the process, yeah. Right, yeah. So do I. I wish more people were interested in my brain instead of my body. <laughs> you need to make a, you need to make a smash hit machinima as well. Right? Yeah. So do it. Get all the questions about, about it. Um, also, Fringy, what what do you do? Why do you do it? And why should everyone subscribe? Oh. Like they probably um, know you exist. I've been trying to stream, but the internet keeps cutting out, so that's messing things up. As for what I'm actually doing, I'm working on my book. I can't really talk about that because I'm not really there yet. So yeah, legally, you can't that. talk about it. Yeah, I understand. Um, and also, I don't want to cock tease, be like, "Hey, here's an idea," and then not execute on it. So whenever something's done, you know, I'll let you know, and then you can take a gander at it. Um, 
but I don't know, just Twitter, even though I barely use Twitter, which I think is a good thing in general. Like, Wait, so, I don't know. Oh, yeah. so if there was a link to give people, you want it to be your, is it your Twitch, your Twitter, or, or your YouTube? Oh, uh, go, go, go to my YouTube. Yeah, I, and, well, uh, I figured it would be your YouTube. I meant, I meant Fringy. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Nah, no, no, no. Worries. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not. I'm on the side Twitch, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. All right. That's, yeah, sure. um, I'll, that's I'll, I'll, I'll find a link. Dubious sanity, right? Yeah. Yes, that's the Twitch channel. Let's, Re uh, last played I, Call, I Call of Duty. Mo oh, so gay. Hey, shut up. <laughs> and and I would have played more, but the, my internet got sabotaged. Yeah, there's your links. Emus, goblins. Yeah, it was something, but um, <laughs> yeah, I've been trying. I've been trying to do that once a week at least, but uh, as you can tell, with mixed results. <laughs> but uh, as for anything else, yes. Yeah. Oh, maybe I should show my Twitter. Actually, even though I barely use it, I feel like that's healthy though. You know, the fact that it's like I'm not using. I Twitter use mine a lot, it but is. like it's yeah. only ever like, hey, update on video. Hey, snarky. Like, I tweeted while we were doing this podcast, someone's, there's, all I put is, uh, confused Obama is my response, but, like, the tweet says, Mauler is one, Mauler is the one person who think critical thinking is bad. He thinks that if you want to talk about a movie's theme, then you are analyzing it wrong. That's me. What <laughs> the hell, yeah, that's what definitely, the fuck? that's I did you. not get that at all, yeah. That's the description that is... It's <laughs> such a, like, okay. <laughs> It's amazing some of the conclusions people the come to. The theme of that comment was stupid. Oof. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the... Do you mind if I plug my Twitter as well? Go for it. I forgot Air to Park. mention it. So, JCJ Graham on Twitter, if you want to follow me on there. I used to post, like, opinionated stuff on there, but I kind of I stopped doing that because I was tired of arguing with people on Twitter. <laughs> but I, I use it to, like, promote my videos and stuff. Like, if I post a new thing, I'll make a Twitter thing. I'll post it. So yeah, follow me on there if you want to stay up to date on my stuff. No, oh, there you go. Uh, what else is there, I guess? Thank you all for watching. We got knocked out of the old subscription box pretty early this time, so it makes sense that like there's only people who were aware of it to begin with that are still here now. It's nice and late, too, but uh, that would be EFAP92. 93 will be next week. Who knows what we're doing? I certainly don't. And then uh, 100 is on the way, but the, the, the content updates are that TFA Part 3, the thing I've been talking about weekly for the past half a year coming, is is really on the way now. Like, super on the way. Like, like on the on the way. Hey, guys. It, who knows what EFAP it'll be, where I'm like, nah, it's ready. And it's coming to a doorstep near you. Oh my you. god. Could be the next one. What Could if be one you... After. Let's see. Let's... You get that done, and then you premiere it, and while that's premiering, we have an EFAP and see who they really love. Me or <laughs> refined me, <laughs> we will find out. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'll need to. We're, we're stacking up on memes. I'm not sure how we're gonna deal with that if we're not doing another meme fab. We'll I don't watch know. them. No, I meant like image memes stacking up. But we, we will watch, watch those, those as well. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> we'll use our eyeballs. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, all of you, and thank you for the very generous donations. As I said, we'll we'll, we'll read the rest out probably the Thursday, Tuesday, one of the days that isn't Wednesday, or maybe Wednesday. Toy Story 4 EFAP Movies is coming out next week, Wednesday probably, oh and then Batwoman Wait. will be returning a week after that. that so, long ago. so much, so much fun on the way. I don't know what else to say anymore. Any, any, what are, thanks, thank you, guests, for not only coming but for staying for the for the. Night. How long did we stream? <laughs> what uh, we streamed? It only says eight hours ago, but it feels longer. But it's probably because I had to wake up early to do stuff before we streamed. Oh, eight, eight hours. Strum. Eight <laughs> hours and eight minutes, apparently. Not bad. Much thank like you. Swim. Past tense of stream is strum. We strum <laughs> for eight hours. <laughs> yeah. We strammed. That's the one I get. Strum. Strammed. Pl plus stram. Plus stram. <laughs> we yeah. we strimped. <laughs> um. But yeah. S anything else anyone wants to say before we close off? No, I'm good. Uh, I don't uh, think so. Oh, no, I. I think no. All right then. Well, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you all for watching, and we shall see you next week. 
uh, good night. Absolutely. See ya. Thank you so Thank much, you guys. Later. Thank you. Thank you, chat. Thank you, everybody. This